Good morning, everybody, and welcome along to a bright, sunny Brands Hatch for the final day of racing in the 2023 season uh, for the TCR UK Championship. We've got our uh, championship finale coming up with two races later on in the day. Six drivers doing battle for the crown. It's a full day of racing, though, because along with being the final round of TCR UK, uh, we are also sharing the bill with the Formula Ford Festival, the 52nd running of this famous event. Uh, the winner's list reads like a who's who of motorsport through the decades, and we will be adding someone else, uh, perhaps a new name, perhaps an existing name, back onto that list of winners towards the end of the day. Two semi-finals. We've got the historic final to come, a last chance race, and, of course, the grand final a little bit later on in the day. That is not all of the racing, though. We've got action from the Mini 7 Winter Series. The BRSCC Fiesta Junior Championship will be out for their championship decider as well later in the day. Uh, but first of all, a qualifying session to decide the grid uh, for the uh, penultimate round of the Miltec Sport Civic Cup. They will have their final two races uh, here today. All of their on-track action coming in one day, so qualifying this morning, two 15-minute races later on. And again, we've got a very, very close championship battle. Three drivers in contention and only 15 points separating the top two. It's going to be a real nail-biter, as indeed it was last year at uh, Snetterton in slightly worse conditions, admittedly, but it was a thrilling final round of the Civic Cup a year ago. And, uh, well, we've got exactly the same points margin between the top two drivers this year as we had going into Snetterton last year, so that perhaps bodes well uh, for what should be an entertaining pair of races. Andy McEwen up here in the commentary box all day. You don't have to move. You don't have to switch channels. All of the racing here today on in the uh, same place, either on the TCR UK uh, YouTube page or the BRSCC one. So wherever you're joining us from, uh, we thank Thank you for tuning in. And throughout the course of the day, I'll be joined by a, a few different co-commentators. Scott Woodwist will be with me a bit later on for the BRSCC content. But we're kicking off uh, with everyone's favourite scouser, Paul O'Neill, who joins me for what is going to be, Paul, a nail-biting day. I can feel the tension starting to rise already, chatting to a few of the Civic Cup drivers in the um, hospitality awning earlier on this morning. They're up for the fight. I just love a good championship decider. And last year, we had one of the best. Yeah, probably one of the best uh, races I think I've ever commentated on. Um, and it was great to, to have you as lead on that, Andy. It was, um, I mean, there was nothing left on the table, was there, from any of the competitors um, at all. And, and, and me and you, I think, can agree that this is one of the strongest uh, championships and one of the strongest one-make championships that, um, that I've ever been involved in. It's been absolutely brilliant. So I expect nothing less um, than, than what we've seen at Snetterton. Obviously, the weather was was difficult at Snetterton. This qualifying session, though, mate, this is very important. I was, um, I think we were both in um, to the, uh, the the driver um, little uh, get together that they had uh, with the uh, with the chief um, director today. Just just going through things, the drivers briefing with Stuart Lines and listening to what they said and what was what was said to the drivers. Was pretty interesting, you know, saying. Still get involved, everybody, but there's championships to be won, so please don't be too rough living, <laughs> which is uh, quite nice, isn't it? That's a nice little bit of livery. So, yeah, to, they'll be too rough on, on each other out there, but at the same same time, we want the same uh, quality of racing as we've seen. So this this qualifying session, though, mate, just to put it into perspective, look at the damp patches. That's just in the pit lane. There's obviously the sun is out on the circuit. I just had a quick look out the window. Going into Paddock Hill Bend, if you ain't on the line and if you drift wide, your left rear is going to have no grip. There is going to be some tasty action in this session now. It's interesting, actually. I had a, a, the privilege of going out for a couple of laps in the course car earlier on this morning. Thank you to one of our clerks, Adam, for uh, taking me for a spin. And uh, actually, track conditions are not as bad as they looked, but that's from my perspective. I'm sure the drivers will definitely notice there's a bit of a lack of adhesion, but it is warm out there. The sun is shining. There apparently is no threat of rain uh, throughout the rest of the day. So hopefully the track conditions should improve. A relatively short uh, qualifying session this, just 15 minutes in length. So not a huge amount of time for the track to evolve, uh, but wait and see. Perhaps those quickest lap times may come uh, in the final few minutes. Cars released then out onto the grid. Before things start kicking off, let's uh, remind you of what the championship situation is. I mentioned there are three drivers in contention for the title. Two of them actually were in the championship battle going into Snetterton at the end of last year, they being Dan Thackeray and Alistair Camp. Thackeray is the points leader this time around. After all of the drop scores are calculated, he's on 412 points. Uh, Alistair Camp 
third in the championship on 371. So he's got a bit of work to do uh, to try and get onto Dan's tail. But in between them is Max Edmondson, the area motorsport driver, uh, second in the championship, 397 points. So he is 15 points adrift of Dan Thackeray. And as I said, that's exactly the margin we had uh, between, I think it was Alistair Camp and Matt Luff going into that final round at Snetterton a year ago. And really, Max Edmondson, Paul, we're seeing him on screen now, as we also see confirmation of those championship standings. Although, interestingly, they differ slightly from uh, the points I've got. I think that's because they're updating based on the uh, lap times that are just starting to come through, uh, which hopefully we'll be able to keep you abreast of as the, uh, as the session goes on as well. Uh, but, uh, yeah, Max Edmondson, Paul, He's the momentum man, isn't he, really? He's been quick all season long, but the second half of the year, he's really started driving like a professional, and he looks like he's uh, he's arriving here with some momentum. Yeah, a talk about momentum. Did you see <laughs> that did. on screen? That was Harvey Caton just nearly straight into the back of somebody. Look at the 11 uh, marks that were there. Then that's how difficult it is up at Druids. Uh, very damp up there. But going back to Max Edmondson, um, yes, he's on your screen now. That is Max coming through, and uh, the 33 has really impressed me. He's been fantastic this year and getting the wins done. Bit of controversy around him over the last couple of years, you know, um, getting, getting disqualified uh, from some races from what I remember for a bit of contact. But I've got to say this year, he's really got his, his head in gear. He's been fast, he's been fair, in my opinion. He's still a hard racer, but he's been super quick. And just watching him through Paddock Hill Bend then just shows me. Look at how damp it is up here. Yeah. Going to be a lot of lockups going into here. I really do think people are going to struggle and just looking for that dry line. It's where the trees are just stopping the sunlight. Uh, get, get to the tarmac to warm it up. And it is one of those tracks where you really lean on the front end a lot into paddock, into clearways at the end of the lap if those rear tyres aren't gripping as you need them to. Uh, then it's very easy to end up pointing the wrong way slightly. So Max Edmondson there pushing on. Uh, he has gone purple in the first sector, which means quicker than anybody so far. But of course, it's very early days uh, in this qualifying session. The area motorsport driver uh, tips his way through clearways and Clark Curve, and he's about to set the first real benchmark lap time, I think. At the moment, it's Alex Kite fastest, but this should now be uh, a uh, new fastest lap of the session. Yes, it is a 54.389, two one thousandths of a second quicker than Liam McGill, who I think is the car right behind. We've seen Liam going strongly uh, on his couple of appearances earlier on this year, and at the moment going very much toe to toe with Max Edmondson. Uh, are we likely to see drivers working together? Do you think in a qualifying session? Sometimes at tracks like you know Silverstone or Snetterton, where that slipstream is a bit more powerful, we do see that. You don't think of Brands Hatch as being a particularly slipstreamy circuit, though, do you? Look at McGill there. <laughs> Sideways, as you like, for the 62. Uh, to go back to your question, no, the only people that will be following each other round will be people who are not too sure about how fast they are around this brand circuit. And you can just get references from their braking lights and um, just from where they get on the power and obviously where the lines are as well. But there's, the straights aren't long enough to to risk getting involved in a tow from someone and then make a mistake and then you have a problem on your lap so yeah watching McGill though look at him going into Paddock Hill Bend the car just oversteering a bit oh, misses the apex Ooh. big sideways down the hill it's so treacherous out there isn't it and McGill is desperate uh, to get on the back of Max Edmonton and just try to have a reference and see you know what he's doing but if you're going to get any toe it will be literally half a tenth of a second but it looks so difficult i'm surprised no one's gone off at graham hill bend as well actually because it's very damp on the approach and it's a it's a bit of a left kink the braking zone you're not really that straight in a straight line uh, going down to, to graham hill bend to break damp that great lap three lap time disallowed trap limit yeah that's another ideal start to his session he's got time of course to improve on his lap time but this is when the tires perhaps are at their best and uh must knock your confidence a little bit as a driver if your early uh, qualifying efforts are already being disallowed. Don't forget, points on offer in this qualifying session as well. The top six on the grid will score championship points. So six points uh, for pole, five for second, four for third, then three, two, one for the rest of the top six. And at the moment, Max Edmondson on course for the maximum points from this qualifying session. He's four tenths quicker than Alex Kike, who's just jumped onto the front row. Then it's Liam McGill, whilst Alistair Camp and Dan Thackeray are only fourth and fifth so as it stands Edmondson closes in in the championship he would be 11 points off going into race one so much overstate look everyone no one's getting that apex at Graham Hill Bend <laughs> um, I will say this and I hope it happens because I'm saying it but I think it might be down to the last minute and a half actually this because it's so damp up at Druid it's getting drier by every lap look at that 
it's getting drier every lap so every time that these cars go up there they're actually putting so much energy into the tarmac that they're drying it up so i think it will be may maybe one of the last cars that crosses the line that will jump up quite significantly but it does look like it's only druids and gray mill bend um, where it's a big problem look how dry it is here so this is pretty interesting stuff. Isn't that it? was Dan Thackeray and Alan, Alistair Camp going side by side into Paddock Hill Bend. Probably not the last time we'll say that today, but uh, they are not working together. They run for different teams. They are championship rivals. Interesting that they found each other on track, Paul. Mm, yeah, I mean, to be honest, it's the last thing you need now is, is Campy's right behind mm. him. So Campy will be maybe trying to get that last little toe. You've got to remember, that these guys are as quick as each other to the thousand. So if you're the car behind and you can pick up a toe to start the lap, and that's what's going to happen now, then this uh, may be an interesting uh, next couple of laps for um, for the guys that are both in front of Alex Kite. Alex Kite's side, where he's into clearways, he's on the dirty side of the road, that's ruined that lap, which is a shame, because his first sector uh, had been a personal best. Uh, Alex Kite, somebody who's been getting stronger through the second half of the season as well. We've seen Alex racing in TCR UK in the past. He's a bit of a Castle Coombe specialist, uh, but uh, now becoming a regular feature on the Civic Cup grid, and he's looking rapid this weekend. Fourth quickest at the moment, splitting Thackeray and Camp, uh, who are third and fifth respectively. Lewis Kent back again to race in the championship is next, and there, the uh, brightest racing car in the world is his brother Bradley Kent, who uh, is not competing in TCR UK this weekend, which is a bit of a shame, uh, but he couldn't stay away completely, and he's out in the Civic Cup uh, in one of the FN2s as well, so I think we've got three of those cars out there now um, oosh, for this weekend. Oosh, oosh. Sorry, purple sector. Ooh. Um, for Thackeray now, so this could be, this could be for the 29, this could be it for Dan. Um, pole position is looming. There's a lot of purples coming up now because the track is getting so much quicker. Does he come across the line and take it? Yes. Yes, he does. Wow. Just over a tenth of a second. So well spotted, Paul. Dan Thackeray starting now to up the ante a little bit. He's sideways at Paddock Hill Bend, just gets it together. Uh, but that may well have just cost him a little bit of time. He didn't seem to lose too much forward momentum, though, so it might still be OK. So Thackeray now to pole, Edmondson second, Liam McGill third, and Alistair Camp fourth. So we've got the top three in the championship, all within the top four, as that, I think, was Lewis Kent getting sideways <laughs> into Graham Hill Bend. I've noticed they do run on that little green painted bit on the right going into the corner. That's great, because it opens up the angle going in, but when it's damp, that is a bit of a risk. A bit of a risk is an understatement, because you're taking in good speed there. It's probably fourth gear I would have thought in one of these cars and um, so you, you're going at a rate of knots on turning and you've got to rely on that right rear tire not being cooled down too much by a damp patch uh, on that green painted section so yeah not ideal Harvey Caton in the 54 he'll want to finish this season strongly this kid is a massive massive talent and you've got to remember no disrespect to his dad but they're not running as a big top team finally got back on the podium of course last time out at Silverstone his second podium of the season having uh, netted a second place finish at Croft he then got another one at Silverstone so close to winning a race these days isn't he Harvey Kate you feel like it's coming and he's got the pace again uh, this weekend it would seem sixth quickest right now uh, Lewis Kent who's the next car behind him actually is the next in the times as well then come Thackeray and Camp so they're continuing to push on but I don't think either of them now setting uh, any personal best sectors in fact Camp has a lap time disallowed that was his ninth lap though uh, not his fastest in the session so that won't affect him too badly Hated across the line is this going to be an improvement for one of the youngest drivers on the grid yes it is moves up to fifth position uh, pips Alex Kite knocks him onto the outside of that third row and Harvey Kate now gets to within six tenths of pole he looks quick here it might be an interesting one to uh, to stay with him Brennan's going to ruin this lap. Brennan, fair play, mate. Jordan Brennan, I've got to say, you don't see enough drivers doing that. That was great stuff. That was really good. And a, and a pro allies car, car as well getting out of the way. It's getting really dry now. This is going to be a good lap. Let's see where the first sector is for Caton as he comes across the, the first. He's up, he's up, he's up. This could really knock him up a couple of places. Don't know how much faster he is. Lewis Kent has had a lap 10 disallowed. Great apex. That car looks very soft, but great traction right to the edge of the circuit. Where's this going to put the 54? He's currently fifth. Does he come across the line and go quicker? Oh no, he wasn't. He was. He was a bit quicker, but just not quick enough to dislodge. 
uh, Alistair Camp. Uh, yeah, found a tenth, needs to find another tenth now in order to hit Camp, but of course that could have championship implications. It can take a point away from uh, Alistair Camp. And Paul, you touched on this a moment or two ago. It's such a competitive grid. It's not going to be a case of the top three in the championship disappearing up the road and settling it between themselves. Other drivers will inevitably have a part to play in this. And that's a difficult position for those drivers to be in because they're out there. They've paid exactly the same amount of money to come and race. They want to end their season on a high. They won't want to get involved in contact with the championship contenders, but they ain't going to roll over and let them through either. No, but I think this championship and its drivers have enough respect within the paddock not to uh, not to cause any grief. Edmondson across the line. Has he swapped places? No, he'd gone green in sector one. His second sector, not an improvement. He was uh, in the end. Uh, what was his time? A 53.2, so two tenths off his previous best in the end. But it did look good, and he's now behind Liam McGill. So these two have swapped around. We've saw, we've seen how quick McGill is. In fact, these two are only separated by a tenth and a half as it is. So with a nice toe from another quick driver, this could be Edmondson uh, having another big push for pole position. Yeah, this is uh, this is hotting up. This is hotting up now because the damp patches that were causing grief are now drying up. But they're starting to get into each other, aren't they? As uh, we see a few more greens, but there's greens followed by yellows and there's no purples. So I don't know whether the tyres are just getting too high pressure now. And there was a surface flag going into Surtees, I noticed. I'm not sure what that was all about. It won't be because of a damp track. That will be that there's something else on the track. Debris, dirt, a bit of fluid maybe. It's probably dirt. People starting to... Uh, take that apex as they can get closer to it at uh, clearways. Have a look at the front grille of McGill's car. It's full of grass, so I think he might have been across the uh, runoff area there. Full of grass? Uh, yes, that's like not a John good. Deere. <laughs> Cold day today, but, I mean, these engines, they will overheat pretty quickly if that grille is, is covered. He'll get an alarm on pretty soon, but to be fair... I think it's cold enough ambient that it shouldn't be a problem. It should not be a problem. So we've got a couple of green sectors. Marshall's going a bit quicker. Dave Marshall is going a bit quicker. But it's that second sector doesn't seem to be doesn't seem to be uh, getting the grip uh, that that it's promised. Look how wide they're running out here. Ooh. Uh, sorry, Paul, personal best first sector for Alistair Camp, so he's starting to uh, work at an improvement. Needs to find a couple of tenths to move ahead of uh, Liam McGill as two of the FN2s make their way towards us up at Druids. Dave Marshall, who has been one of the revelations this year, really, finding some uh, major pace in that car. Had a race win at Cadwell Park, his first ever in the championship, and two solid podium finishes last time at Silverstone. And behind him, Bradley Kent. How's young Brad getting on? 13th fastest at the moment. I mean, if that doesn't prove just how difficult this championship is and how competitive it is. We know what a good driver Bradley Kent is from his uh, exploits in TCR the last couple of years, and actually he's just been demoted down to 14th place. Yeah, just shows you, doesn't it? I remember speaking to Ryan Bensley, and he he believed that this was one of the most, and I agree with him, difficult championships in the country, and I, to a point where he said it was the hardest one make. It for me, it is one of the hardest one make championships. So fair play to anyone that's kicking about in the top six and. Lewis Kent is that person uh, who is sixth on the same tenth as, uh, as Ryan Bensley down in eighth. And he's just improved in the first sector, Lewis Kent, as has Alex Kite as well. I think those two might be circulating quite close together. Lewis Kent improves his lap time, but not his position. 62 thousandths of a second slower than Harvey Kate. And there is Lewis, the uh, double TCR UK champion, making his second appearance in the Miltech Sports Civic Cup, having debuted at Silverstone, really enjoyed the racing, got stuck in, and uh, said it was really nice to get back out on the track. He's obviously been on the track since he stopped racing in TCR with uh, test days and whatnot, does some driver coaching but there's nothing quite like that. Uh, the thrill of competition is the ball when you've been out of racing for a little while. Uh, that bug, uh, you, you've sometimes just got to scratch that itch, haven't you, and get back out there. Yeah, exactly. Just get get it done. Get You know, you can't let your uh, your passion die away. You've got to be out there and, uh, yeah, absolutely Ooh. flat out. Oh. Lewis is pinned, didn't he? Someone gone straight off in the gravel. Yeah, I think they were following Lewis's line and got it slightly wrong. I'm not sure who that was. It was... Uh, the car behind him, number 20. It, it is Thackeray, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. so Dan Thackeray with a bit of a moment. Shows how hard he's pushing. He clearly doesn't believe that that 53.0 is necessarily enough to guarantee pole position. Mm. So then, that is the checkered out. Who's on a lap that's green? Marshall. Dave Marshall's into the 31s now in the first sector. So Marshall will come across the line. That's Bensley, isn't it? Yeah, yes. Bensley comes across doesn't make any inroads. Where's Marshall? We should see him. Here he is. Marshall probably could move up. Oh! 
Well, just a bit. Fifth place, Dave Whoa. Marshall. Oh, go on, Dave. <laughs> that was a 53.5. Big improvement for wow. Dave Marshall. It was a, only about a two tenths of improvement, but I think he gained in four or five spots on the grid and, uh, and knocks Lewis Kent down to seventh place as well. So Dave Marshall will score a couple of championship points for that. Uh, but once again, Dave Marshall on the pace, isn't he, to qualify near the front and could be a genuine threat for more podiums. Yeah, fair play. Um, I think someone who's had big trouble is actually Charlotte Birch. She's last. Uh, yes. By a long way. That uh, is a shame and ended the session in the pit lanes. So you have to imagine that Charlotte has had uh, some issues and uh, have been asked to mention actually that her team received some support and help from Pro Alloys to get her car ready after an incident in Friday testing. So uh, they've got the car out there. Uh, but not uh, necessarily working as it uh, should, really. But, uh, yeah, Charlotte Birch uh, with a couple of dramas. Hopefully they get that sorted for the race. The other side of Dan Thackeray's car looks like it's been in the gravel. Yeah, that was at Clearways, wasn't it, I think? That's what it was, wasn't it? Yeah, so uh, so he was pushing. Uh, it's easy to do that, I suppose, in a front-wheel drive car. You come over the crest, it just wanders out to the edge of the road. But, uh, yeah, Dan Thackeray on pole position, but not a trouble-free qualifying session then for the championship leader. But, provisionally, he has scored another six championship points for pole uh, and that means that if uh, he now wins race number one with Max Edmondson towards the back of the top ten could be enough to wrap the championship up with a race to go I don't think that's going to happen though I think this is going to rumble on until the afternoon Dan Thackeray though will start from pole for race one Max Edmondson will start right alongside him and they were separated by 46 thousandths of a second game on for the championship then Max is going to be well up for the fight going into race one. Liam McGill will start third ahead of Alistair Camp, third of the championship three, uh, with Dave Marshall fifth after that late improvement, and Harvey Cape in sixth. Lewis Kent, Ryan Bensley, Alex Kite, and Jack Riddell uh, will complete the top ten ahead of Louis Housel, Travis Chapman, Tommy Knight, and Jordan Brennan. Fifteenth place then will be Sam Nicolau, Bradley Kent down in sixteenth. He'll be a bit frustrated with that, only a second and a half off the pace, but round Brands Hatch Indy, uh, that is as good as two or three seconds at some other circuits, so he's got a bit of time to find. Harry England, ex-Fiesta Junior runner, seventeenth on the grid ahead of a, a struggling Owen Hillman, Anthony Gannon at nineteenth, Simon Welk twentieth, and yeah, as Paul said, Charlotte Birch uh, in the end only completing four laps compared to the sixteen or seventeen for the majority of those ahead of her, so clearly a few little issues still uh, with the number twenty-seven car. So, provisionally, that puts Dan Thackeray ahead by a decent chunk in the uh, championship standings. He's uh, managed to outscore Max Edmonds by another point, so 16 there should be uh, between the two of them. Alistair Camp, of course, only managing to score three points out of that session, so he's going to be that little bit further back, uh, but it's all still to play for as we head into their first of two races later on. That first Miltech Sports Civic Cup race of the day uh, will be taking place at around about half past one, but it's a full day of racing, and uh, with the Civics now vacating the track, we'll uh, turn our attention shortly to our first First Formula Ford action of this Formula Ford Festival weekend, and it is the Avon Tyres semi-final one. In fact, the two semi-finals uh, coming up next. So these will decide the drivers who get through uh, into the um, grand final automatically later on in the day. So those cars head out onto the grid. Let's very quickly, though, head down to Anthony Jordan in the pit lane, who I believe is catching up with our pole sitter and championship leader. Thank you very much. Yes, I am indeed down here in Park Bay with our pole sitter, Dan Thackeray. Well, that certainly helps you out for a championship fight. I think if you uh, if you win this next one, as long as your main rival, Mr. Edmondson, who sits over there, finishes seventh or lower, you could be champion in the first race today. Uh, how does that make you feel? Oh, that's a very big if. A double well, big get, if. Thank you. Get the hat on, lad. Um, yeah, it was a tough session. It was really slippy to start with, and it was quite slippy in places and grippy in others, so it was quite hard to um, get a good lap in, and I could see I got one or two quite fast laps in, but I couldn't really seem to improve, even as the track seemed to dry, so I wasn't 100% sure where I was, but I thought I was there or thereabouts, so to pull in the final P1, it's a great start. You had a moment out there as well, I think, nearly kissing the gravel as well. What happened there? Yeah, I mean, I knew I needed a better lap, and I was on a better lap, and I just got a bit too greedy on the throttle in the last corner, and I thought... Just got to keep my foot in and hope it grips, but I didn't on the gravel, but that was another good loss. So luckily I had one in the bank and it was already enough. Yeah, it certainly was a good lap as well. So uh, you hold on to that title lead at the moment with another few points in the bags now. It's all down to race one, really, and uh, starting at the front as well, especially at Brands. It's looking good and, uh, yeah, game plan, really. Elbows out and just hope for the best. I mean, it's, you can have the best game plan you want in the Civic car, but it never comes to fruition. <laughs> uh, obviously, just try and get off the line well. I mean, it's going to be probably still a bit slippy when we go out. Hope to be leading really at the end of lap one and then go from there. Hopefully, um, 
I can keep them behind because uh, as long as I, if we, if I lose a place on the first lap, it's going to be pretty, pretty tricky. I think to be fair. So, hope for the best on lap one. Hope to be leading lace, race one and go for there. Yeah, that's what we need, isn't it? Well done, mate. Congratulations. We'll see you out there in race one. Thank you. Cheers, mate. Excellent stuff there. Congratulations, to Dan Thackeray getting away. Solid, solid time for him, but very, very close, which means a lot of things could happen in the first race. The championship certainly isn't decided yet. We'll head back up to the commentary box because it's time for some Formula Ford stuff. It is, and the first of our Formula Ford stuff is the first of our two semi-finals then uh, for the 52nd running of the uh, Formula Ford Festival here at Brands Hatch. And uh, the uh, cars are just about to head out onto their green flag lap ahead of a 14-lap semi-final. Uh, at the end of this race, there are 28 starters, the top 12 finishers automatically progress into the grand final. Those who don't uh, will then be entered into a last chance race that takes place a bit later on, a six lap dash for the cash, uh, an eight lap dash for the cash, sorry, uh, with the top six finishers uh, getting through into the final then, but we'll cover that a bit later on. For now though, should we take a look at how the cars are gonna line up for our first semi-final, sponsored by Avon Tires, and it is uh, the uh, two of the three heat winners from yesterday who will start at the front. Uh, the pole position man, Nolan Alea, uh, was the winner of the fastest of the heat races, which I think actually ended up being, was it the second of the heats was... Uh, Nolan's heat, I think it was, wasn't it? So not when the track was at its best, but because heat three was uh, stopped early, uh, that meant that uh, Nolan Alea was given the jump for pole position. So he will start from pole. Alongside him will be the uh, 2021 champion of the Formula Ford Festival, Jamie Sharp. And uh, Jamie Sharp arguably should have set the fastest heat time, uh, but uh, safety cars and uh, an early ending to that race uh, meant that he wasn't able to, so he will start from second. So it's Nolan Alea and Jamie Sharp on row one. Uh, then on the second row, we'll have Chris Middlehurst and Ayrton Hauk, one of the Team USA scholarship drivers, uh, with Tom Nippers and Jack Sullivan starting on the third row. Then it's Hugh Esterson and Vincent Jay, row four. Row five, J Jason Smith. He's been pretty rapid, but a bit uh, accident-prone in the uh, heats yesterday. And likewise, really, Jordan Kelly, actually. They both got front-running pace, but ended up slipping off the road on a couple of occasions. Then it's Rick Morris and David MacArthur, row six. Row seven, Drew Cameron and Harry, uh, Henry Sandblom, uh, with Sam Street and Henry Chart on row eight. Row nine, Stuart Kestenbaum and Callum Grant. Dan Rennie Larson and Tim Fitzgerald will complete the top 20. Then it's Bob Hawkins and Ben Maludi. Adam Fathers and Ben Hadfield with Gerhard Hauschelt, uh, Brandon McGorgan, Morgan Quinn and Murray Shepard at the back. And at the back of the grid, therefore, a couple of quick drivers, actually. McGorgan's been rapid. Morgan Quinn has been rapid. He had a truly bizarre end to his heat race yesterday when he had a little bit of contact coming out of Paddock Hill Bend with uh, Jeremy Fairbairn. Uh, sort of just touched the back of Jeremy's car. It flipped the nose cone up off Morgan Quinn's car, but it didn't detach completely. If it had have done, he'd have been fine, but it just flipped up and rested on top of his head. He couldn't see where he was going, and he had to head into the pit lane to retire. Thankfully, he managed to get the car back to the pit lane uh, in what could have been quite a scary accident, and ended up just being a slightly bizarre end to his race. So there are some quick drivers from the back. The main priority is to get into the top 12 by the end of the 14 lap. Avon Tyre's semi-final one, which gets underway now, and it's a good start made by Jamie Sharp from the outside of row one, and Sharp will get the advantage on the run into Paddock Hill Bend. So he may not have had the best of the track position, but he is going to have uh, the lead at turn number one. Uh, Nolan Alea slots into second position. Chris Middlehurst, I think, is there in third place. Hauk is fourth as they head towards Druids for the first time. All cleanly through the first quarter. Ayat and Hauk, though, very uh, circumspect on the brakes and charging around the outside. I think it was Tom Nippers was that uh, to move up into fourth position. So the Team USA scholarship drivers are now together. Ayat and Hauk and Jack Sullivan as they drop down through Graham Hill Bend for the first time. Down the Cooper Straight, then towards Surtees. A clean start, but a dream start it was for Jamie Sharp, uh, whilst Nolan Alea seems to be struggling a little bit for pace. Chris Middlehurst right on his gearbox as they turn their way out of Clearways and Clark Curve for the first time. Well, as promised, I'm joined by Scott Woodwiss to talk you through all of the Formula Ford and BRSCC action today. And Scott, that uh, start of the race couldn't have gone much better for Jamie Sharp. He's got the lead, and whilst they battle behind him, he's already starting to march clear. Yeah, and also the scrap, the scrap that's going to help them is for second place between all up, which I was told is pa apparently it's pronounced all up by Richard John Hill, so we'll go with that. Ah. Uh, all up against Middlehurst. Middlehurst is having a little peek as a lock up all line in the inside right front as he goes into Drews. That's going to push him a little bit wide. Here comes Middlehurst up the inside on the exit. This will give the inside line a little bit of damage. Oh. The touch was too much. We saw that yesterday with a couple of the cars tangling. We've seen that all too often. 
But now all I just uh, all I just holding on to defend for Middlehurst, who again looks up inside this time, forces the issue into Surtees. He might have to give it up here, Nolan, but again he sweeps across and chops the nose of Badol and Van Diemen. Back up towards McLaren and Clearways for another time, oh. and that's a wave to uh, the back of all. There's a red flag. There's a red flag. Red flag yes. race has been stopped. Not sure why. Looking out of the window to see anything obvious and not yet finding anything so there is a race stoppage for some reason and uh, well JB Sharp will now have to do this all over again but uh, hopefully we won't be looking at too lengthy a delay uh, before the race gets resumed once more so JB Sharp uh, because we hadn't done two laps yet we'll go back to original grid positions as well as and when we do get a race restart so uh, it will be What's more, uh, Nolan all out on pole position. As we await news on the uh, race restarts, we believe something has gone off at uh, Paddock Hill Bend. That's the scene of the incident, so we're not sure who it is, but that is leading to uh, the red flag stoppage. So we had a lap and a bit of good racing there, but uh, JB Sharp, as I said, is going to now have to line back up on the outside of row number one. But Scott, we've had this conversation so many times. This Oh, there is uh, somebody, driver out of the car. That is... Uh, ah, there we go. It's 19, uh, it's uh, Bob Hawkins. Bob Hawkins, yeah. Oh, dear. And he's hit the wall at a fair rate of knots, by the looks of it. Lots yeah. of damage done. Key thing is he's out of the car. He so is, yes. That, obviously, and, uh, that damage, I'm sure, will be uh, fixed. But that's one of the like, casualties in terms of the semi-finals, and that means mm. he'll have to go through to, to their last chance race later on this afternoon to even stand a chance of make it through. And also, to be reminded, it's only the top six that go yeah. through because the top 12 in both of the semi-finals sets the first 24 cars. We can start 30 in the final. So maximum grid of cars we can have for the Formula 4 Festival, given what's de denoted by Motorsport UK for uh, grid sizes at certain circuits. And for these kind of cars, the maximum is 30. So it's the top 12 from each of these semi-finals. Then there's only six that will go through from a, a field of what could be, could be potentially as many as... I think we've got, we've got two... Yeah, we've got, we've got, it's essentially top 12. It's about sort of roughly sort of a 26, 28 car field. And that in itself is going to be battling over eight laps for six spots. So that's usually one of the more energetic races out there towards the end of the day, when, especially when there are drivers that have had one or two dramas that need to pick, pick their way through. The interesting thing will be in terms of two drivers that we need to keep an eye on are going to be Morgan Quinn and Brandon McCorkin, who are starting from the back. They have their own dramas, as you mentioned yesterday. And they've got to read. This is where their really hard work starts because they had the dramas went. Brandon McCorkin, we still didn't really figure out exactly why he had that damaged left rear suspension, no. but, but it was a damaged left rear suspension that then eventually forced him uh, to go off up the hill towards Druids. Thankfully, he backed it into the tyres at, at slow enough speed that it was relatively uh, unscathed. He got away from it. Um, it wasn't a, a, an incident that was too serious, as far as I could tell. And then, as for Morgan Quinn, we talked about the uh, the cowling over the, the front suspension of the shocks that he has uh, came up after uh, tagging the back of Jeremy Fairbairn's car, and then from that he had to pit in with that damage and come in. So those two guys have already had their own dramas and have to pick their way through. They're going to get a second chance to try and pick their way through if they didn't make the best of starts. But of course, for them the big challenge, of course, is starting way back in 26th and 27th respectively for both Brandon and Morgan. There's Callum Grant, who's in the, a, a very classic, typical uh, Formula 4 livery. The Duckham's colours, of course, are blue and yellow. Good to see Duckham's back in motorsport again these days, particularly uh, sponsoring the uh, Porsche Carrera Cup team that they is, have, have got quite a bit of success with. And Callum Grant is someone who is quite a successful driver in his own right. Anytime I've ever seen him in, in any kind of a Formula 4, he's always quick and always rapid. And he was, uh, case in point, he came as a guest for the uh, Super Classic Formula 4 race at Croft and blitzed both races. I mean, he's always been incredibly quick. He also won, if I remember so if you're right, he won the Moose Trophy at last year's race at Alton Park. That was a non-championship race. And he came in one of the, old, one of the older cars in the field. And he, he was blitzing cars that were in Super Classic A and Super Classic B that are cars from the 90s and, and sort of early to mid 80s. And it just, it just shows the Formula Ford. It doesn't matter to a certain extent what age the car is. If it's engineered well enough and the guy behind the wheel, or guy or girl at the wheel behind of it can pedal it quick enough, then... It's, it's a quick enough car. Um, these some, I'll tell you what, on the, these are some great shots we're getting from that yes. one, some of the close-ups. Oh, oh that's nice to see. As well, well, that's a great shot too. And this is just for the semi-finals, of course, because yeah. we've still got the, the crowd that I hope will stick around, not from TCR UK, that will stick around for the festival final, of course. That's going to be quite a double whammy in terms of yeah. potentially, if it's not wrapped up in race number one, potentially title deciding race in TCR UK going straight then into the festival final. That's going to be a real proper double hit of 
some quite fantastic racing action that we're going to get to. And then Civic Cup, which could be perhaps yes. race of the day, because yes. <laughs> that's almost certainly going to go down to the wire, I think. Absolutely. So what a, what a great event this is, though. I mean, the real winners this weekend are the people on your screen right now, aren't they? The fans. If you want to come out and have a day in the sunshine enjoying some of the very best motor racing that the UK has to offer, Brands Hatch is the place to be, and you don't need to take out a, a second mortgage on your home to avoid a ticket for the family. You can come along, bring the kids in for free. This is how motorsport should be. Yeah, it's a brilliant event because it brings, it, it does bring two kind of rather sort of, uh, TSR UK, which is still building its stock and continuing up and up and getting more popular as the seasons go on. And for it to be, if it's a compliment the Formula Ford Festival that's obviously sport, so sporting its 52nd running, and of course going forwards there's more anniversaries coming up, such as the 50th running of the festival at Brands yeah. Hatch, but the 50th festival between two years ago outright, and it's the 50th Brands Hatch festival coming up in two years. After that, if further two years' time in 2027, it'll be 60 years of Formula Ford, which is quite incredible. So that's going to be something which will be quite uh, amazing. Oh no, will it be? Uh, yes, no, it will be. Uh, yeah, yes, it will be. It will be 60 years. I'm getting my, 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 my years mixed up. <laughs> But yes, it will be 60 years of Formula Ford, and incredible. Those will be some anniversaries that I'm certain will be fairly well celebrated. And it is a fantastic event, and it, just a great, great example here. We still get mm -hmm. drivers that come across from America, Canada. Typically, it's quite a well-supported uh, event with the Irish. They always love to come to the Formula Ford Festival. Uh, and again, we've had even last year we looked at some of the entries that we had from Brazil, from Australia, from New Zealand, anywhere else. It's fantastic. Um, I think you're looking around because you're trying to figure out where exactly Brands Hatch that is. Yeah, if I disappear for a, a race or two later, Scott, that's maybe where you find me. I've not seen that before. I haven't either, to be I honest. Think it might be up near Clearways, in which case, cracking vantage point when we're racing on the indie circuit, particularly. That's that's a real action hotspot up there, but uh, a couple of photographers making the most of an elevated position and uh, a chance to sit in the sunshine on what is quite a mild, pleasant day. Oh, no, I'll tell you where it is. You're getting a zoom out now. It's up at Druids, isn't it? So it's just another uh, good vantage spot. Fair play. That's a really good vantage spot. Yeah. I can see it from there. Obviously, you've got some of the faithful trackside watching uh, right down beneath the, the speakers. Um, there's a great... Um, we should give reference because one person who sadly isn't here with us anymore, but someone who's also synonymous with this and, of course, has a trophy named after in the historic final is the very late great Brian Jones. There's a great video which I found somewhere. Someone took some footage of Formula 4 back in 1986. It wasn't the festival, it was a more general Formula 4 race. And where the, where the camera's positioned, it's underneath the speakers, you can clearly hear the beautiful, <laughs> booming, dulcet tones of Mr. Brian Jones himself. And there's a great bit in there. I think there's a quote he says, which I think it typifies Formula 4 to Brands Hatch in many cases, or just Formula 4 in general. There's a bit of an incident that takes place. You can hear him talking about it, and I'm not going to try and impress his voice. That we <laughs> I can't do his voice, but um, the simple quote he said, chaos, confusion, mayhem, that's Formula 4, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. And I thought that was a perfect um, quote to kind of sum it up in the best possible way, because though, because it is in sometimes a bit of a chaos, confusion, and mayhem, but in the best possible way. When you, Case in point, the, the festival final two years ago, one of the all-time classics, let's not even beat about the bush with that. We both of us in the box on that one. I'm always going to remember that because it was just fast, it was frenetic, it was, I can use all different superlatives, but it was just a wonderful example of just how good Formula Ford racing truly can be. I mean, in the end, the top 11 covered by, what, 2.2 seconds in the end. That just said it all. And, of course, Jamie Sharp was the one that won it. Mm. And also to win the 50th Formula yeah. Ford Festival was quite amazing. Um, I believe, according to our race, we actually have some grid data to give you so we can actually show you on, on now with the restart. We'll be able to run you through the grid here in terms of uh, running up there. So, of course, the restart is taking place. If you didn't complete two laps, everyone's back in their original grid positions. So, as we get set to go on another formation that once more, we've written Morris, at least for this initial <laughs> getaway, is quite far out of his, um, his box. Uh, we'll be getting underway once again, although Rick Morris is a little bit slow to get under the getaway too. But to go off on the formation lap, let's uh, run you through again how they look for this restart of semi final one. Yes, we will be minus Bob Hawkins, but hopefully still 27 cars set to take the start. And they will be headed once again by Nolan Orla, who had uh, not the best of getaways the first time around. But sometimes these red flags, they can uh, allow drivers to really hit the reset button and, uh, and go again. He not only didn't get a great launch, but also uh, perhaps seemed to be struggling a bit on cold tyres so maybe now he'd uh, now he has got uh, another chance to do this so it is Nolan Orla and Jamie Sharp on the front row Chris Middlehurst and Ayrton Hauk on row two and uh, Ayrton the first of those two uh, Team USA scholarship winners uh, who are entered this weekend the USA scholarship uh, has been going on since 1990 and uh, Scott we've been provided uh, as always actually by the Team USA scholarship some really good information on the drivers but also a list of the past scholarship winners and I think uh, there's uh, so many drivers on there as a big American motor racing fan in particular that I'm familiar with 
and I had no idea they'd come through the scholarship. Drivers like AJ Allmendinger, for example, who of course gone on to have a very uh, successful career in NASCAR. Jerry Nadu, even before yeah. him back in the 1990s, twice a winner actually of the uh, scholarship. JR Hildebrandt uh, was a winner back in 2005. Connor Daly and Joseph Newgarden uh, about so 15 years ago now, that's a terrifying thought. Uh, but uh, again, a real who's who actually of American motor racing stars to come through the scholarship and uh, many of them of course with that scholarship coming over and sampling the festival at one point or another too. Indeed, and we could also point out, I'm sure that Jeremy Shaw is watching, and hi to Jeremy if he's either watching on the live stream or I think he's here this weekend as well, so yeah. good to see Jeremy back here and hi to Jeremy if he's watching on the live stream. Um, of course, you have to remind as well that uh, Joseph Newgarden has actually t has actually has won a festival. Yeah. I say a festival because he won the uh, at the time obviously that was when there was a split between the Kent and Zetec and the Juratec of the, at least Kent and Zetec if not Juratec on top of that, and there was always a separate Kent festival. So while it wasn't the main formula, Joseph Newgarden can claim a Team USA scholarship festival win in the Kent portion of the festival in the year he did it back in 2008. I think he's the only Team USA driver. Well, no. Sort of tell a lie with there because Joseph Newgarden won the Kent Festival. There has been another Team USA Scholars driver that has won it, yeah, yes. but it wasn't in the year that he was a scholar. And that's Max Esterson, who was a who was a 2021 Team USA Scholar, but he came back last year and won the 2022 festival uh, to kind of make up for just missing out on it last year because he came in the year before because he came second in 2021. And that was after Neil McLennan had been uh, disqualified for overtaking the yellow flags, which I must recall was uh, in plain view on the live stream <laughs> for everyone to see. On that side. Um, so yeah, Team USA do a fantastic job. That's well supported every year, and I think they picked. Two fantastic scholars in Ayat and Hauk and Jack Sullivan this year, proving their quality so far. Both, of course, in the semi final one. We've got a car waving. Who's that? It's on the fourth row of the grid. Vincent that J, is I think. Vincent J, I think you're right. Yes, Vincent J, the blue car 122. He is waving. That is, that's going to you know, start delay because of that. Have to which be. means they're going to have to go into another formation that wants to go again. So Vincent looks as though he's lined up in his grid spot, and that suggests that he's possibly stalled the car and can't get it going again. So either that or something has not quite gone right with the 122 machine. Because of that, he's now got to. Uh, possibly be pushed off the grid or pushed into a position where he can, I believe it has to be started from the pit lane, I imagine, if he can't sort of get a refine. thought so, and uh, that's a shame for Vincent. Uh, he was due to start eighth on the grid, good starting position actually for, for Vincent J. Uh, but uh, yeah, he may now not be able to take his original starting position. It could be something as simple as he stalled the car and can't mm. get it fired up. So the marshals have actually left him alone on the grid now. So I wonder whether he has now got the uh, problem resolved. But either way, yeah, we are going to have to have a second green flag lap, and I suppose it will become evident in a moment or two whether or not he's got the car fixed, because if he has, he'll head out on that green flag lap with everyone else, and if he has until we left behind and uh, recovered by the marshals. But um, whether we will lose a lap from the race, I doubt it, because, again, the... Uh, distance the race goes and the amount of time it takes them to do it is significant because the faster of the two semi-finals the winner will get the pole position for the grand final but as we've seen not always a huge advantage to be starting from uh, that pole position and uh, so it might not matter either way really but uh, for the uh, in the interest of fairness then i'm sure race control will try and make sure oh Oh, well, Tom, Tom, Tom Nippers has a problem now for some reason. He's gesticulating to the marshals quite frantically to give him a hand, but as to what the issue might be, I'm not sure. Uh, there's Ben Maloudi, who is looking rather moody in uh, car number <laughs> 11. He is starting in uh, 22nd position, which is quite far back. Uh, they're going on to the formation lap, and. I think a few are stalling, aren't they? That's and crucially, that's no law. All of it's obviously not got away. Yes, from so, pole position. So pole sitting no longer all like not actually getting away for some reason. Looks like the engine's running because I can see the smoke coming out the, the sort of the steam or the uh, coming out the back, and he's punching the, the steering wheel. Ugh. So pole sitting no all like with a problem. I think he's trying to refire it. You can see there's yeah. smoke. There he's go. now got it refired, but I suspect if he's at the back of the field, he is. I think he is. So he will now have to start from the back of the grid. So another front-running contender hits problems on Festival Sunday. I hope he knows that he has to start from the back because a penalty for driving up through the field is going to be worse than just starting from the back of the grid. Because we saw that yesterday with Andy Charsley. Yes. He uh, start, he's stalled on the grid. He actually picked his way back through to his grid spot, which he shouldn't have done, and was given a 10-second time penalty as a result of that for an out-of-position start. He should be starting his original grid spot when he should have been right oh, in the back. And guess what Nolan's doing? He's oh coming up dear. the inside of everybody into Druids, and you cannot do that. If no. you fall to the back of the group uh, on the green flag lap, for whatever reason, you have to start from the back. Even if you just keep one car behind you, that's fine. But he didn't. I'm 99% sure from the glimpse I saw out of the window yeah. that he fell to the back of the field. And this, I'm afraid, could now Ooh. do more damage to his festival chances than simply starting from the back. Oh, that was, and, and that's the reason why you don't do that. That was 101 Henry Chart, and well, that could have it goes without saying, really, what could have happened next if Henry Chart hadn't spotted uh, driving up the inside there. 
And so ultimately, um, everyone will take their original grid spots. There's uh, 42, which is Hugh Esterson. That's another one of the Ammonite cars. There is Nolan Orla, who is, well, incorrectly Ooh. picking his spot and just picking his way past Vincent J as well. It's, yeah. I, I, Unfortunately, his efforts here are going to be pretty much in vain, unfortunately. The one person he doesn't want to tangle with is another one of his stable mates in the, either the Team 2 or Team USA car, who also are run by Ammonite Motorsport, which is a legacy of the work that Cliff Dempsey did, of course, and Cliff is here this weekend. So this is a legacy of what he did. So, yes, Nolan might be on pole position, but unfortunately, at least with the time, time pedal, this he gets away by 10 seconds. Unfortunately, I think we can sadly early discount him as being a potential winner for this final, unless he does pull away by 10 seconds, which would be very unformal Ford-like, but I think there is an uh, imminent penalty incoming for our pole centre. He could well get 10 seconds ahead of 12th place, though, couldn't he? Oh, hello, this is uh, if, if, Vincent but, J again. Yeah, Vincent J waving his hands, Chalky Kelly behind, putting his hands in frustration, saying, Really? Goodness <laughs> sake. Right, OK. So uh, the race, by the way, has been shortened down to 12 laps from mm. 14. And I fear we might now be on for another delay uh, to the start because of whatever the issue is with uh, Vincent Jay's car in the drama of covering Nolan uh, Orla's issues. I missed the fact that Vincent did actually get going. So the reason for the delayed start was Vincent Jay. He then got the car fired up, but he's now being pushed out of the way uh, by the marshals. But I'm fairly certain that if we saw the other side of that LED starting gantry notice board we'd see start delayed once again uh, written across it because they're not going to be able to start the race with the marshals still uh, there and of course they can't leave the car stationary for too long because cars don't really like that engine start to overheat and uh, the that's i think is what was causing a bit of uh, frustration amongst a couple of the drivers in the first place well case in point of course there was st st station was so long and there was one or two yeah. drivers tom nippers and then no and all had issues so it's one of those things where it's either clutch control or trying to keep it in the position to keep the car ro rolling or running without something, having something going wrong. Now, playing devil's advocate here. <laughs> as, as, as you always like to do. Uh, yes. <laughs> Technically, that race never started. Can Don and all be given a penalty for a race that never started? Might he actually get away with this now? I mean, they're really not happy, are they? That well, is... Well, it's just Tom Nippers again, for some reason. He's... I'm not sure what he's just stipulating about, whether he's stipulating about something to do with his car, or it looks like his car, because one of his team members has come through, start delayed again, so... And race shortened again, Scott, we're down to 10 laps now. Yes, right. So they're going to push laps. him out of the way, what's going to go on? I think we also put, the key thing to point out here is, I think automatically, this is going to be the slower of the two yes. semi-finals, because of course it's point. not the full length, it's only 10 laps rather than 14. Yeah. So automatically, whoever... <laughs> Tom is still not happy about something, he's, he's still... I'm not, I don't know what he's just, he's just dictated about. I think he'd restart his car, but what, what is he upset about? Really, I think I'm not sure it's, why. he wants the start procedure to, to begin. He obviously, obviously, his car does not like being sat on the grid for this mm. length of time, but unfortunately, Tom, uh, there are things that the marshals and race control have to and deal with. I can now see the fact that Jason Smith also went as well. So. Yeah. There's only so much that can be done here, though. They, they can't yes. start the green flag lap until they know for certain that the car and marshals are into a place of safety, because should they then have an issue with the recovery and they've already sent them around on the green flag lap, yeah. this could further delay the start. So a difficult position for race control to be in here, but uh, important that they don't panic and make the wrong decision just because the drivers are starting to get a bit antsy down on the grid. Now I can see one of the Team USA guys waving his hands. That's 21, which is Jack Sullivan. So why he's waving his hands, I'm not sure. There's an awful lot of hand waving, but not quite clear it's exactly why there's hand waving going on. And admittedly, there now isn't an awful lot going on either. I mean, I do think they've got the car out of the way, so um, there, it must be some other reason that they've not started the uh, the green flag lap this time around. But yeah. there is a Jack um, who will be starting eventually, we hope, from sixth on the grid. With a gap behind him now where Vincent Jay was uh, due to start. That could benefit Jordan Kelly. Uh, he's been pretty quick this weekend so far, but has to come from the fifth row of the grid. More waving towards yeah. race control. It's Hugh, it's Hugh Esten. There's also something on the grid looking after Jason Smith at the back of the grid behind him as well. So, but again, there's a, it, it's almost d difficult to tell exactly what, whether they're waving at the procedure or they're waving at what's going well, on Well, the here. cars keep cutting out. I think this is certainly that's Nipper's issue. His car keeps on stalling, I think. Um, which suggests maybe he's got a clutch issue or something. He's having to hold it there physically on the uh, on the grid, but they've got it sorted again pretty quickly. I think team members have now been allowed out onto the grid to assist with this, because of course what we don't tend to see when uh, before the races get underway, cars line up in the assembly area surrounded by the teams. They only fire them up just before they're about to be released uh, out onto the track for this exact reason, really. So only fair that the team members have now been allowed out to deal with uh, this and help get the cars fired up. We're eating into the time now. We don't have a lunch break today. It's racing all the way through because, of course, we're fighting at this time of year. Uh, the fading light come day's end. 
so uh, important that we try and get a move on through the uh, through the races as quickly as we possibly can. So frustrating start to the day for our Formula 4 drivers, but I'm sure we will get this rectified and uh, manage to get uh, the race restarted in good time. That, I think, is Vincent J running back to wherever his car's been left to assist with the recovery. And he'll be hoping, of course, that he can uh, perhaps now get back out there for this one, although I doubt it because he was technically the cause of the uh, initial red flag. So a uh, little bit of confusion here at Brands Hatch, but uh, I'm sure we will get the uh, green flag lap underway in a 10-lap semi-final now for Avon Tyre's semi-final one uh, is the plan as and when we get there. Yeah, so just a reminder, because the race has been shortened, it means that this will automatically count as the slowest of the two semi-finals. So essentially, whoever wins semi-final two coming up next, which is uh, sponsored by Quantum Race and Suspension, uh, that will be essentially your pole sitter for the final later on this afternoon. So ultimately, whoever wins this race is going to be on the front row alongside them. There is the safety car, which has been rolled back into position. So maybe that's one of the things they were waiting for to get the safety car in place as well. Uh, get uh, ourselves sort of once again. There is Morgan Quinn, who started right at the back of 27, right at the back of the group, 27 position. Although, technically, given those that stalled it, that is a good point you raised whether or not Norman Orla is allowed again to take his group position. There's Vincent J's car, which I think, I think what they've told them is to get Vincent J back in the car so they can properly push him off the circuit behind the barrack. Because they pushed it across to the track, it's now being wheeled backwards, as you can see, into the pit lane, which means it's completely off the road. I imagine that car will at least go back to the outer paddock, which is squad can go to uh, prepare whatever the issue is and get it ready for the last chance race, which is scheduled later on this afternoon uh, to take a foot pace over eight laps at around about 25 to 3 at that point. So I was going to mention Tom Nippers, actually, for, despite all his hand waving, because actually he's been one of the more impressive independent drivers uh, yes. in the festival because he had put a really good performance yesterday to get himself up there on the podium in third place. So that's a really good run for him. And he now uh, is looking at a good chance to get himself through automatically, which I think, he, or given if his right, right, his race runs well enough, he should do without too many issues. Um, he's now sort of sort of bouncing out in the cockpit, kind of psyching himself up a bit. More he's an animated bit, fellow, uh, isn't he, Tom? <laughs> he's a little bit, yes. But I, I think it's because he just loves he loves the race and wants to go for it. Um, right, let's, here's the game. Let's figure out who that driver is because uh, it's quite close up on the car. The, the car might give us an idea. That is car 14. And we still don't know. Oh, it's... Um, Gerhard Hauschult. Okay, that Might sounded be better old. than my attempt. I think you're probably closer to <laughs> and the... And alongside uh, is car 47. That is Ben Hadfield. You can yes. see that Hadfield in the mix as well. Some of the Hadfield family get out quite regularly. Um, now, here's a familiar surname, but not the, the, the person that you're thinking of. There, it, that is an Esterson, but it's not Max Esterson last year's winner. That is Hugh Esterson, which is his younger brother, I believe. So he is uh, taking his first run through. Uh, the right semi final has been shortened ever so slightly even more to now nine laps. So it's a slightly shorter one. Uh, and this run to the uh, semi-finals. So again, as it's not a full leg, I'll, I'll, I'll stipulate, it will not be the faster of the two semi-finals because, of course, it's a shorter race, but automatically it's not the full distance. So automatically, I would imagine at least, it will become the slower of the two, which means whoever wins semi-final two is effectively guaranteed pole position for the final later on. And of course, the people who really aren't happy about this race being shortened, apart from us, because we want more Formula Ford racing, uh, but the other people are those at the back of the grid who had progress to make. People like Brandon McGorgan, but like uh, Morgan Quinn, who are aiming for that top 12 as a bare minimum. Now, they should still be able to do that just about, even with a short race distance, but the further inside that top 12 they get, the further up the grid they will then start for the grand final. And realistically, the winner of the final rarely comes from outside of the top two or three rows of the grid. It can happen. This is Formula Ford racing. But generally speaking, you're wanting to be inside that top as a bare minimum, top eight on the grid. That means being top four in your semi-final. That's going to be difficult to do from the back anyway. Over 14 laps, they had a fighting chance. But over nine, that's now looking less and less likely. It's not impossible. It is festival weekend. Anything yeah. can happen, and it usually <laughs> does. So uh, you see that there's Jamie Sharp getting the last uh, congratulations, uh, sort of good luck wish before he goes off to what will be the restart. I saw Jamie actually out on track this morning, uh, yes. wandering around the final sector and uh, making sure that the, uh, the track conditions were... Uh, to his liking, or just making, just seeing, I guess, how they changed perhaps after some of the uh, racing action that took place yesterday after his uh, his heat race. That's good, good to see that dedication from the drivers. You know, you can learn a lot from getting out there on track, especially on foot. You can really sort of investigate 
where maybe some fluid had been laid down the day before, you know, and, and just see how the track has evolved. So he's, he's taking this very seriously as Jamie Sharp, winner, oh, winner as we said, of the uh, 50th anniversary festival a couple of years ago. But he would love to add his name onto what is a very select list of multiple winners uh, of the Formula Ford Festival. There aren't a huge amount of drivers who have achieved that over the years. And if Jamie could add his name to that list, that would be quite an achievement. So uh, one thing I should mention on the live stream, there is the moment, at least on our BRACC live stream we've got, there is a, a thousand people watching. Oh, so, wow. see. so thank you to everyone Welcome who's tuned in everyone. for those watching. And hopefully you guys will stick around. There's a lot of good racing coming out today, of course, including uh, the Formula 4 Festival. Of course, we've got the finale of TCR UK and Civic Cup and Fiesta Juniors. And of course, the last Mini 7 Winter Series race, which of course is coming up after the second semi-final, so after these two semi-final races. Right, 30 second board is in the air then, which means the cars will be able to get out for another green flag lap. And all being well, hopefully we can get this first semi-final sponsored by Avon Tires. I should mention, give a thank to all of our... Uh, they're going to also get two green flag laps this time around as well. So probably just a... Whether it's an assessment or whether the conditions have changed a little bit, because it's mostly dry, but I think there are one or two still in the, sh in the shady parts, one or two slight, ever so slight damp patches from some overnight moisture or overnight light rain or something. You can see, it's particularly on the inside of the um, run down towards up towards uh, Paddock Hill venue, so there's a couple of patchy areas there. So I think in the sunshine, whilst they've been waiting, the track has dried up a tiny bit more. It's still a little bit greasy, and you can see here as well, that up to on the run towards Bexting Paddock Hill Bend, up towards Drury's, there are still damp and, and greasy patches on the circuit from where there's been some, a little sprinkling of overnight rain uh, through the middle of the night. So it's slightly trickier conditions, and I imagine that as it continues to get better throughout the day, which is what I'm thankful of is that it's wonderfully bright sunshine on this festival Sunday, which is, is, is good omens for later on today in terms of the weather for the later on in the afternoon. But of course, as the contractors have changed ever so slightly whilst it was out on the grid, it means they've got a slightly different circuit to be tempted. Yes, sort of. Uh, <laughs> right, OK, well... You, 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 you don't like you're in agreement? I don't particularly see what's changed massively but anyway I'm, I'm thankfully I don't make these decisions so uh, we will simply wait and see what happens and uh, when we do get racing I promise you it's going to be worth the wait because we've got a few drivers at the front of this grid all have the potential to uh, to grab the win we saw Jamie Sharp get that really good start the first time around and uh, it will be interesting to see whether or not he can achieve the same thing now whether Nolan Orla will escape a penalty or not it waits to be seen for now will just pretend that he isn't going to get a penalty because he's very much going to be a factor in this race regardless and he will want to try and have as clean a run as possible uh, to get uh, out into the distance if that's something that he can do and of course those coming from further down the field may have some overtaking to be done keep an eye to Brandon McGorgan to uh, Morgan Quinn from the 26th and 27th positions on the grid. Of course, they'll gain a couple of freebies as, uh, as other people uh, have failed to uh, to take the restart. I'd also be throwing that Adam Farber as well. He's not too bad around here at Brown's Hatch. No. Well, he's a quite a local favourite one by one. He's way back in ahead of those two in 23rd place, so he's got to be an option to go forward to do that. So on their second green flag lap now as they go around. So as the pack went to trade three, you can see the car 42 there is Hugh Esterson. You've got Jason Smith. There is the national champion, Jordan Kelly. Way, way vigorously. He had quite an odd day yesterday. He was off. The, he wasn't completely off the pace, but he was very error prone yesterday in the sort of mixed conditions, and had a, no fewer than about three or four different uh, excursions off the road. As um, I think it's a rather weird kind of looking at the a word I've never come across, and there aren't many of those, Scott. That, I'm quite impressed for uh, for this stage of the weekend for you to come up with that. That's, um, that's I'm pretty impressed. I'm confused. What, what word did I use? Error. What did you say? Error, error prone. Error prone. Yeah, that's a new one to me. Care okay. to elaborate? I was referring to Jordan Kelly, his uh, his day yesterday, in terms of he was off the road several times. Is that the one Toby heard before? No, 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 I have, I have not. I see every day is an education when you've got uh, Scott Woodward in the commentary box with you. Yeah, um, yeah, usually stuff that's incorrect, but there you go. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's, yeah, to go back to Jordan Kelly, <laughs> before I was, because he looked at the question of my grandma, why I was still curious, he was, it, it, Jordan had a bit of a strange day yesterday. He was definitely on pace, but there were points when he was making, I think, one too many errors and mistakes which is quite unusual for the national champion to do so. But Jordan, of course, it's, it's only his first season racing in Formula 4. His previous experience is racing in a slight equivalent to this, which is Formula V um, uh, over in his native island. But he was he actually made his debut in Formula 4 in last year's festival with Team Dolan and then decided to do a full campaign this year and picked up seven wins along the way, uh, if I'm correct in that one. He actually, in fact, including, no, I think he won at least five, five races, including the, winning the last four races on the bounce, both races at Knock Hill, in which one of those won the David Leslie Trophy, and then won both races at Silverstone to uh, claim the title uh, to, on the national circuit. So it's good to see that Jordan's in, in, uh, at least in some kind of good form. He just mind that he starts in 10th on the grid. He is the just the top of the shot, the blue Van Diemen, the number 99. 
Irishman. And also quite shouted was Rick Morris. He's starting up P11, of course, the, the evergreen Rick Morris, who has been in probably more formal for festivals than I think we've had hot dinners in many cases. And he's yes. uh, been in, he always comes every single year. He's, he's once again in his trusty Royale RP29. And he could be a possible dark horse for going well in the uh, Prime Jones Memorial Trophy. You, you're giving them another, another look as well. What's I, your, I, what I finally cottoned on to what you said. I was only half listening at the time. In, in, error prone, not one word, two words. Right, good, we've got it. English language, A level coming into uh, well, wait, wait, good wait, use, it seems. Up. It's, it's only 5 <laughs> to 11. Wake up, come on. I but, was um, busy fixing the uh, hastily redecorated commentary box that my uh, TCR co commentator right. was uh, <laughs> rather hastily putting up earlier on this yeah. morning to keep the sun off us because it is baking hot here today uh, yeah, uh, in the commentary box. Actually. Perhaps not so warm outside, but uh, we are slowly melting yeah. in here so right uh, should we get the semi-final underway <laughs> yes let's give this another go shall we nine laps of racing we have got the front row set and off they will go and another good start made by jamie sharp but not quite as strong this time Waller has learned from the first one and he's going to go toe to toe with the 2021 festival winner into the first turn and he beats jamie sharp through paddock hill ben jamie tries to get the switch back though and looks to the inside line that's the damp side of the road nolan tries to come over and cover but gets there too late and jamie sharp will bully his way through watch out for middlehurst trying to find a gap on the inside as well out of Druids they go. It is indeed going to be Jamie Sharp to the lead. Nolan Aller slots into second place. There's cars on the grass further back, but that was a very feisty start. It really was. Top three trying to get away. Good start from Tom Nippers as well. All that hand waving's done something because he's up to fourth at the moment. A bit one of the best independents in the pack this weekend. But Jamie Sharp then, 2021 Festival Champion. He wants that second title. He missed out on it last year. But he's now going to go for it here in 2023. The two Team USA guys are up in fifth and sixth. There's also Jason Smith battling with his team. Though. And teammate, that's one of the Team USA guys to the ground. Well, that's 22. That is Ayrton Houck, who started ahead of Jack Sullivan, but he's now dropping down the order. The key thing is, where can he go? And that's one car off the road. That is, I think, possibly Henry Sandblom, I think. Yeah, 55 Henry Sandblom in the uh, in like one of our Scandinavian drivers across from the continent. As for the leaders, it's now Jamie Sharp still leads us, battling behind Hugh Esterson with, with J Jordan Kelly up the inside. And Hester tries to come across, they're touching wheel to side pod. And somehow Kelly gets through and they break away with that somehow unscathed. That was quite that was quite tricky. And there will be yellow flags that will be covering the car that's off. There was a spin somewhere, and that is Hugh Esterson. So that's off camera, but it looks like he's tangled possibly Jason Smith or the car he was around as well on top of that, which was uh, I think that was around about Jordan Kelly or maybe David MacArthur in the mix thing he was battling. But either way, they carry on. There goes Kelly. There goes for MacArthur. Now the graphic you'll see here is the safety car is deployed. This is. If it wasn't confirmation, it's definitely going to be slower of the two heats. Yes. Uh, Semi-finals, excuse me. Now, the graphic you'll see on the screen here was, oh, it's safety car, so you can't be able to take. And uh, I don't know how, I think Sam Street both saw that later than they should have done, really, as they come back across the line. Now, the line that you'll see on the screen, you can see there's a separator between the top 12. That, of course, is due to denote that the top 12 are going through. So essentially, the car that's on the bubble at the moment is I and how in car 22. The first of the non-qualifiers is Brandon McCorkin, who impressively in was that two laps has gone from the back of the 26th up to 13th. And Morgan Quinn's gone with him. He's gone from th um, 27th to 15th. So that's quite a good run so far. But if they get this race underway relatively quickly and recover Henry Sandblom's car, there's still every chance, particularly now there's a, a safety car to help them, but they could even climb themselves up into the top the top 12. A shout out I should also give as well, Henry Chart and Rick Morris, the, hot, the, the, the highest two place class, the super classic cars, eighth and ninth overall. They yeah. could, on, on the track position alone, provided that they don't get caught by Smith, Cameron Howe, and then possibly even McCorkin and Quinn, could find themselves with automatic spots into the final. What a story that would be for Rick Morris to automatically progress to the final and not need to use anything like a, um, a last chance race to get through. That's quite extraordinary. Actually, no, exactly. That. that would be a great story, and uh, they may well be able to do that. They've been a bit fortunate with... Uh, some of the expected front runners having difficulties, but uh, yeah, they are looking strong within the top 10. So Jamie Sharp leads them across the line. Then this is three laps of nine being complete. So one third race distance is completed. And hopefully we won't have too many laps behind the BMW safety car. Sharp leads all a second. Uh, then it is Middlehurst in third, Nippers fourth, Jack Sullivan fifth, Jordan Kelly sixth, David McCarver seventh. 8th Henry Chart, 9th Rick Morris, 10th Jason Smith, 11th Drew Cameron, and 12th Ayrton Houck. So Ayrton is still within the transfer spots, if you like, but only just with Brandon McCorgan just one away from getting into that all-important top 12. But uh, he and Morgan Quinn, they didn't want to see this safety car. The more laps of green flag running we have, the more chance there is that they can gain some positions uh, in this race, and therefore on the grid for the grand final later on but at least they are knocking on the door of the top dozen now and that was their um, main priority if you like from this race but quite a few expected front runners hitting dramas and of course Hugh Esterson another now who looked 
pretty nailed on, really, to transfer automatically into the grand final. Has it all to do from 25th. Now, the safety car allows him to catch back up. That's a good thing, uh, but it now reduces the amount of laps that he's going to have to try and make up what is a, a good number of positions in order to get into that top 12. So perhaps we're looking towards Hugh as the first of our sort of expected front runners who may have to rely on that uh, that last chance race later on today. They will do. And again, impressively enough, as I say, I've mentioned it again, Henry Chart and Rick Morris probably taking advantage of some of the slightly trickier conditions given it's slightly damp out there. And rain or slightly wet circuit, there's a bit, a bit of a performance leveller. And so it seems that those two have taken advantage of getting up there in order to get themselves in a good position. It, it, if, if there are going to be two cars that will drop out of the top 12, admittedly, if that's not, I don't like to say it, it probably will be Henry Chart and Rick Morris because ultimately the two cars that I expect that they can pick their way through the next few cars to get up there into the top 12 transfer spots is going to be, I think, the favourites are Brandon McCorkin and Morgan Quinn. There's no doubt about it. Um, also, it looks like it's showing Vincent J is 22nd. So I thought he pulled off the road. So he's back in the race by the looks of it. And it's quite intriguing. Yes. I, um, thought, I, I thought him not uh, starting the race meant that he, he couldn't start the race, but that's interesting. Now, remind me, was he the... Did he pull off at the first attempt to restart on the second one. Well, on the second one, but he, yeah. he waved his hands on the first one, and then they went and off again for a second restart. Then he was pushed off the track, and then he was pushed back into the pit lane. Right. So, I don't think. Pass. Uh, let's just be happy for him that he's yes. on track yeah, <laughs> and still has I'm, half I'm, a chance. I'm happy he's there. Just, it was just, I was wondering sort of how he'd made it in, given I thought that as he'd been pushed off the road that he wasn't able to yes. restart. But. There is a potential that he would argue it was because of the delayed start that the car stalled and he needed to yeah. say, you know, force majeure maybe Possibly. starts to come into it. But uh, again, not our decision to take, thankfully. Right then, the safety car lights are out. The safety car has disappeared, which is a good thing. It means it's headed into the pit lane and we're going to resume racing at the end of lap five. So there'll be four laps of the Avon Tyre semi-final one to go. And Jamie Sharp, having made two really good standing starts, now needs to nail a safety car restart, something that he's got plenty of practice of over the years. Nolan Orla will be trying to go with him and trying to challenge, I'm sure, on the run into Paddock Hill Bend uh, on the race restart. The field trickles through. Hugh Esterson there at the back is one to keep an eye on. But he's only got four laps to try and gain 13 positions to break into the top 12. Away we go then. Good start made by Jamie Sharp. The battle is on though for second position. Nolan Orla and Chris Middlehurst jockeying for position as they head for Paddock Hill Bend. A little look up the inside there by Jordan Kelly trying to get past Jack Sullivan. They almost tangle wheels at Paddock but he does have the overlap just about heading up the hill. Look at the spray kicked off the back wheel. There's oh. a Druid where there is contact and around goes the pole sitter. Nolan Orla off the track of Druids after contact with Chris Middlehurst and that is major drama Scott. That's another drama for Ammonite Motors. Well that's two of their cars that won't be in transfer spots. So this now helps. It helps that well, it helps Brandon McCorkin at least because he's up into at least before he gets the, the timing graphic. He'll be up to 12th now, so he gets the final transfer spot. He's 11th now, so it's now Morgan Quinn and Drew Cameron are on the bubble. That's now it's Middle oh, Second no. Thomas is third, and that's now Jordan Kelly elbowing up the inside of Jack Sullivan. So they go wheel to wheels. He's now up into fourth position. But I'm sure Jack will be just sick thinking, come on, Jordan, that wasn't cricket. It's only a semi-final, everyone. You know, this is the kind of stuff that you tend to see at the end of Festival Sunday. But they're starting early with a very dramatic first Formula Ford race of the day. It is a successful pass, albeit perhaps a slightly rough one for um, Jordan Kelly. And he's up into fourth position now. Further back into the transfer spots go Brandon McCorkin and Morgan Quinn, 11th and 12th respectively. How much further progress can they make with two and a half laps of racing to go? stuff but they're both the places they want to be and that everyone that's from the back of the grid that's 26th yeah. and 27th originally so they are carving their way through and that safety car's done them a favor because they've managed to punch the pack up with all the progress that they made early on and they've gone through now J jason smith there's mccorkin and he's got so he's got him behind him that's a i and Hout going with him now this could be rick morris could be in the final transfer spot but if he's not careful he might lose the spot to drew cameron henry chart though he's having a bloody race <laughs> seventh <laughs> overall he's gonna make he's to be the by far the highest based classic car and also should i dare as well one to watch all spots for the historic final later on which he could want to look for this is side by side for third now into the wow. semi-final into a podium place goes jordan kelly past tom nippers he's got two laps now dare i ask the question does he catch the cars in front maybe a bit too far ahead i think but He's not, never say never. He's not made many friends in this race, but he's demonstrated that he has got some real, real speed today and is definitely now establishing himself as a contender when we get to the final. Side-by-side -side action here further back, and this is all around that transfer spot, isn't it? The black number 12 car is Drew Cameron. He was 13th. Is he still Scott? I think he is. I think he is. I think the one on the bubble, crucially. Yes. Bite your fingers. Is, Nick, is Rick Morris. He's in 12th position now. He's a wide on Fox. He's got plenty of experience. If he can get his elbows out, he'll try and do so. If not, at the very least, he'll be towards the front of the last chance race if he can get through. I'm certainly he'll be one of the potential ones to get through. 
Now there goes the 22 car of Ryan Hauk. At the moment, it looks as though all being well. If we go into the final lap of the race, it will be both Team USA cars through. And here goes Jack up the inside of Tom Nippers looking for four. Oh. Then Nippers closes the door as they turn into Paddock Hill Bend. But the key thing is, as well, I'm not just at the front. Middlehurst sets the fastest lap of the race. Key thing is that transfer spot in 12th place. Can Rick Morris hold on to 12th place, or is he going to hold on? What have you spotted? Uh, well, I was just uh, looking for where Nolan Orla is. He is 16th. He's about two, uh, one and a half seconds away from Rick Morris, but there are plenty of cars between them. I don't think that Nolan is going to make it back into that top 12, is he? It's been a very dramatic, a shortened, but a very dramatic Avon Tyre semi-final one here at Brands Hatch that looks like it's going to be won by Jamie Sharp and Chris Middlehurst in second place. Jordan Kelly with a charge in Drive to third, Jamie Sharp using all of the road as he exits the final corner. He will claim victory in the first of the semi-finals at the Formula Ford Festival. Jamie Sharp's second win of the weekend. Second place goes to Chris Middlehurst with the fastest lap at the end of the race. Then it's Kelly Nippers, Sullivan MacArthur, who is going to get the final transfer spot here. They come towards the line. It's going to be a drag race to the line. And here comes Rick Morris. Is he going to hang on? No! no! Sam Street gets him on the line. What? Sam Street by, by 16 thousandths of a second. second gets into the top 12 oh. and Rick Morris misses out by a nose. But front row for the last chance race. That's going to be a key one. But how close was that uh. for Rick Morris? 16 <laughs> thousand of a second away from an automatic final transfer spot. Wow. Oh, that's got to be agonising. Oh. But that's the fun of the festival. It is. Well, I certainly line, enjoyed that. Street. That was fantastic stuff. Nolan Orla, by the way, did get up to 14th, so he'll be starting towards the front of that last chance race. As long as he keeps out of trouble, should be able to progress to the final, but he will be off the back of the grid. Right then, uh, Jamie Sharp gets the win, but Chris Middlehurst was quicker than Jamie once he got himself established into second place. That's interesting, going into that final uh, a little bit later on. Jordan Kelly came home in third. When did Jordan start that race? He was 10th on the grid and fought his way up into a podium place. Impressive stuff. Then it was Tom Nippers in fourth, Jack Sullivan fifth, David McCarver sixth, Brandon McCorgan seventh from the back of the grid. And Henry Charles, what a drive that was from Henry Charles as well. Rick Morris may have missed out on the top 12, but Henry's top 12 position never really looked in doubt, having started 16th, so eight places gained. Uh, for Henry Chart, who is the Class C winner as well. Then it's Jason Smith, Ayrton Hauk, Morgan Quinn, and Sam Street, who got into the top 12 by 16 thousandths of a second. Rick Morris will have a front row starting spot for the last chance race there. Uh, likely second on the grid, but we'll wait and see what the second semi-final uh, time is. Nolan Orla will be in the mix in that race as well, but the pole sitter for that uh, first semi-final will not be pleased with the way that his day has gone. Ben Maludi, 15th, Drew Cram Cameron, 16th, then it was Alan Fathers, Callum Grant, Hugh Esterson, 19th after his spin down at Graham Hill Bend, and Vincent Jay completes the top 20 ahead of Dan Rennie Larson, Stuart Kestenbaum, Gerhard Hush, uh, Tim Fitzgerald and Ben Hadfield in 25th position and then two not running at the flag. They were Sandblom and of course Bob Hawkins who unfortunately didn't take the initial start. Well it took a while to get there but the fans in the end Scott were treated to quite the race. And the crowd's getting bigger down it the tactical bend. I, I would hope we can get a point where we can get proper old school shot of a hopefully completely f near full grandstand at Panic Hill Bend because that was that's the old school shot of the best yeah. we'll pick you on the grand final the main grandstand at Panic Hill Bend packed to the rafters waiting for the action and hopefully we'll get that done um, yeah that was an incredible <laughs> first semi-final we eventually got there in the end and as I have a chat to our top three down there after a very intense first semi-final spots by Evan Tires of the Formula Ford Festival let's cross down to the top of the pit lane with our ever, ever roving reporter at the top of the pits Richard John Neal Thanks very much, Scott. Not so much roaming at the moment, but uh, we are here. Jamie Sharp will be here. We may only have time for the one interview, I'm being told. Uh, I want to say a quick hello and get well soon, Garrett Van Cowen. We said it yesterday, say it again, Garrett, get well soon. Car's on the grid already. I'm going to go over here. Jamie Sharp's having pictures taken. Jamie, I'm going to gate crash because we want to have a quick word with you. I don't think anyone wanted that race to get going in the end, did they? No, it was a bit of a... Oh, I'm not going to make any comments about what happened. It's, it is what it is now. It was, uh, I think it was everybody's own fault that they were boiling over. You just Everybody was revving all the time, yeah. um, and it was a bit silly on their part, but I'm not going to make any more comments on How this. difficult is it for you as a driver? Obviously, you had a red-flagged race yesterday. You won that heat fair and square. Great move, by the way, to, to get into the, the lead twice, um, but you don't get any race rhythm going over the two qualifying races up to the final. No, it's, uh, um, yeah, no, it's, it's a bit tough, knowing that we've not had any actual race can't get my words up. Uh, any actual racing on the upcoming to the final, but we've got good racecraft from the past, and we know that, so I'm comfortable, ready for it. 
boss man's here now, so he'll want a hug. Um, but no, I'm, I'm ready for the final, I think, still. Yeah. That's good. Um, and going back to those two moves, you had to do it twice. Outside, wasn't it, first time? Inside on the, the slightly damp side on the inside. So um, great work from you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, the first one was easily just because of the, the start. I can't deny that. But the second time, I got a massive wheel spin off the start. Uh, I think it was just because I didn't burn out as I come across the second time. Um, but that was my own fault. Um, but still good start, just not good enough to get myself in the same position as last time. So, Jamie, many congratulations on the Avon Tire semi-final win. We'll see you next time. I apologise to the other guys. We're not going to have time to interview P2 and 3, Chris Medalhurst uh, and Jordan Kelly. So apologies to them. We need to go up for the grid for semi-final two. So back to Andy and Scott in the commentary box. Yeah, thanks very much, Richard. Understandably, after the delays that we've had so far today, we're keen to get on with the programme. So our second semi-final uh, for the BRSCC Formula Ford Festival is already upon us. This race sponsored by Quantum Racing Suspension, uh, and the grid is as follows. It is Luke Cooper who won in a very soggy first heat yesterday, and probably the most convincing winner, actually, of a heat, I'd say, uh, in uh, the three races yesterday. He will start from pole position alongside Rory Smith, who will give him a run for his money, as will... Um, Niall Murray, who has been bumped up third on the grid, that's a different grid to the one I had. Uh, possibly some adjustments have been made, but Niall Murray came from sixth on the grid to finish third in his heat and will start third again alongside Jordan Dempsey. Then it's Alex Berg and Logan Paxer to complete the top half dozen. Charlie Mann starts next ahead of Porter Aiken. Then it's Sam Harrison and Tom Hawkins with Kevin McClurg uh, starting in 12th position. And in fact, that's where Jeremy Fairbairn's got himself to eighth on the grid. Uh, so obviously an amendment with some sort of penalty for Jeremy. I'm presuming that's after his contact with Morgan Quinn uh, in the heat yesterday. So then it's Donald Downey starting 13th ahead of Guy Skin. Guy Shepard and Drew Stewart share the eighth row. Uh, row nine for Andy Charlesley. Want to watch, I think, uh, from 17th on the grid. And Sigblom uh, and Malum starting 18th. Row 10, then for Richard Higgins and Oliver Chapman. Alan Slater and Dieter Hackle uh, share the 11th row. Row 12, James Buxton, uh, Buxton sorry, and Jonathan Nash. With Isaac Canto da Silva, Felix Fisher and Johnny McMullen coming from the back. We've got a couple of additions there as well. Shepard and Baker uh, at the back of the grid. Uh, clearly having been added on the post uh, heat races. So those three at the back in particular we need to watch out for. Johnny McMullen uh, failing to finish in his heat yesterday. That was a big shock. He pulled off the line and the car immediately ground to a halt. So uh, suspected a drive shaft issue. Hopefully he's managed to get the car out there. And he will be uh, one to keep an eye on. So too Felix Fisher and he's at Canto da Silva uh, from the back of the grid. And uh, those three all should have progress to move forward. This should all being well, be a 14-lap race, and they ought to have time to uh, get into the top 12. We saw Brandon McGorgan and uh, Morgan Quinn achieve it in significantly fewer racing laps just now in Heat 1. Uh, but what can those three do as they try to salvage their 2023 Formula Ford Festival campaign? So, pole position, Luke Cooper. Different conditions now to those that he faced in the Heat race yesterday, but we know that he is going to be up for the fight and uh, is a very, very good driver when he's out in the lead. Very good at controlling a race, Luke Cooper. And uh, we've seen that for years in his Castle Coup racing, also in his uh, exploits in the National Formula 4 Championship. What can he do, though, from the front row of the grid here today? Luke Cooper and Rory Smith starting from row number one. Keep an eye to those red lights which go on now. And when they go out, our second semi-final will get underway, which happens now. Is it a good start from Cooper? It looks like Rory Smith is way slightly better on the outside line, gets his nose just fractionally ahead. They almost tangle wheels heading for Paddock, but he has done it. Rory Smith sweeps around the outside, and for the second semi-final in a row, the pole sitter does not lead into Paddock Hill Bend. That could be telling for the grand final later on. Smith leads up into second place, goes Niall Murray, so Luke Cooper drops down into third position. Not an ideal start for the Heat 1 winner uh, from yesterday. He is down into third, not a complete disaster, but he would have much rather been out in the lead, of course. All of them cleanly through the first few corners, though, despite some very close quarters racing there between the front row men. Yeah, if Smith really did force the issue and forced Luke Cooper out of it. He took it, pushed the back out here. And Nile Murray, after being a little bit off the pace yesterday, he's on his toes this morning. He's right on the back and the two former festival winners and her nose to tail. This is what you want in the festival. Two former champions ready to slug it out for the next 14 laps. Essentially, this is for grand final pole yes. position. Of course, the shortened race won't count to a pole position. And Nile Murray almost Ooh. pushing the 
that uh, knows with Van Diemen up against the gearbox of the Medina Sport. They're very similar chassis, but it's a slightly more developed car by Medina Sport and Andy Brickles and the guys down at BM Racing. And here comes Cooper back again as Murray runs a little bit wide, and Cooper thought about going up the inside but couldn't make it. We should mention the two Team Canada guys are in this race. We've got Logan Paxer and Alex Berg. Now, Logan Paxer came across line eight, Alex Berg in fifth. So at this point in time, it stays as it is. All four of our North American scholarship drivers yes. will get through to the festival final if it stays like this for the next 13 or so laps. You can see Alex Berg, there's the fifth car. He's the white uh, Ray chassis with the maple leaves all over. He's car number eight. He's the son of former uh, F1 driver Alan Berg. That's at Andy Charsley. So he hadn't such a promising start to qualifying yesterday. Then he had a, a, a stall on the grid, had a time penalty after going back to his grid spot. And a spin up at Druids means he's going to have to pick his way through the last chance race if he wants to make it through. This is now uh, Charlie Bang having a good run so far. He's up into seventh, but he's now under pressure from both Logan Paxer and also in there, Porter Aitken. He was the last year's USF 1600 champion. That's Jeremy Fairbairn slipping up the inside to get past Logan Paxer in the other Team Canada car. It's all going off for semi-final two, and it's only lap three. Yeah, it's hot racing, this, isn't it? Looks a bit more competitive, oh, arguably, than the first one. Number 35 is... Uh, Marlum, I it think, It is, Malum. yes. And stationary at the exit of Graham Hill Bend. Now, if he can get out of the way, there is the access road into the paddock uh, there, but uh, where he is at the moment... Oh, oh he's no, not going to get anywhere, That's is he? He's missing a left front wheel, so yeah. contact somewhere for him. I wonder whether he was involved with Andy Charsley, maybe, up at uh, Druid's Corner. That Possibly. could make some sense. Unsurprisingly, the yellow flags are flying, and the safety car is scrambled once again, which is good news for Rory Smith because he was starting to really come under pressure there uh, from Niall Murray out of the car gets um, Sigram and uh, his festival perhaps is over now as well. That's a bit of a shame for, a big shame for him. Uh, now, what progress from the back for McMullen and Fisher? Fisher 16th, McMullen 17th. So again, they are working through the field as one. Uh, Isaac Canto da Silva is 21st, so not making quite the same sort of progress as those two who he started just in front of. But again, the safety car, yes, it punches them together, but it also now reduces the number of racing laps available for Felix and Johnny to break into that top 12. So Rory Smith leads the way, Niall Murray second, third Luke Cooper, fourth Jordan Dempsey, fifth Jeremy Fairburn with Alex Berg in sixth, Sam Harrison, Logan Paxer, Porter Aitken, uh, Charlie Mann, Tom Hawkins and Donald Downey at the moment would be the 12 automatically progress into the grand final but uh, I'll tell you what Scott Niall Murray is putting together a really strong festival weekend isn't he didn't qualify terribly well in the wet yesterday started sixth for uh, his heat race but was on his toes straight away gained some good places early on and in the dry he looks like he's really quick and uh, I, I don't know sometimes we see drivers come into the festival and they dominate they win their heat they win the semi they win the final other times you see drivers have a bit, a bit of a slow burner weekend they start off all right but then every time they hit the track they get quicker and that for me is what Niall is doing yeah there was a suspicion that Niall wasn't as quick because he hadn't done as much track running for the people throughout the season but it seems as though that at the very least he's been able to go away make some tweaks to the setup now that he's in the drive rather than the wet and Niall knows his place and was not the back of his hand he's done that many festivals he'll know it better than anything so he he's confident in his abilities and what he can do so he will look to try and pick up as much of uh, an as possible as he can Charles leaves the pit lane no further car out of the race hopefully he'll get out for uh, the last chance race a bit later on but uh, Andy Charlton's car going no further for the time being that's massively frustrating you sit around waiting all morning for your semi-final opportunity and Andy starting 17th would have definitely had aspirations of breaking into that top 12 it just wasn't meant to be in the end so four laps complete how's the recovery getting on at Graham Hill Bend not, not really at the moment the car is still there so I think we're going to have at least one more lap after this, of course, the problem is they can't tow the car. Uh, they need to uh, get it lifted, uh, presumably, onto a flatbed truck. And the frustration is it doesn't have to go very far. It only has to go up that little uh, access road that the marshals are stood on, and then it's out of the way. But it will need a full lift, I think, in order to be uh, able to do that. So that means that we are in for perhaps a slightly longer delay to uh, resumption of racing here. No red flag at least this time. We are continuing to circulate though. And uh, we'll just keep on ticking off the laps. We'll get some racing in, I am sure. So Rory Smith then leading the way, the 2020 winner. A bit of historic F3 racing as well has uh, Rory over the years. Well, Murray behind him, of course, is a double festival champion, 2013 and 2016. So got two in relatively quick succession. Hasn't won it since, but every year is a contender. We always know that he's going to be in the final. He's probably going to make the podium uh, and is always a danger uh, to get a win. He has uh, been 
uh, twice a champion as well in the national championship 2016 and 2018, uh, which was back when the national championship was a support series to TCR UK. And I remember him putting together a really strong campaign against a very competitive grid that year uh, and coming out on top at the end of it. 2016 was, was a particularly monstrous year for him because he won practically everything there was to win. He won the Ford Ford Festival, he won the national championship. If I remember correctly, he also won the Walter Hayes that year right. and the Martin Donnelly Trophy at Kyrgyzstan. He was, you couldn't stop him. He was one of those proper put together years where anything he touched in the Formula 4 just literally turned to gold. It was all, it was like, all, all like the, 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 the quad that he managed to pick up. Both the, yeah, it was, but all forward pretty much. It was national championship and it was the, the Kyrgyzstan title as well. And then it was also of course the two main races in the end of the season, the festival on the Hayes. He was just, 2016 Nar Murray was untouchable in the Formula 4. He really was that good that year. And he still is. Uh, it's good to see him. And I reckon yeah. Nar just keeps going back because he wants that third festival win. He wants to he wants to match, at least match uh, you know, Joe Foster G. But Joe Foster has won three festivals, two main ones and one Kent festival. Uh, but uh, when it wasn't the, the, the prime festival, so to speak. But he wants to try and get himself to be, I think he wants to be the first three time main festival winner. But Joe Foster can claim three festival wins. So he's essentially the, I don't know you don't like this word, but the winningest <laughs> festival driver uh, out there in terms of what he's done. And I don't think anyone since 2016 has become a two time winner of the festival, no, have they? I haven't. think he's the last driver to do it. So uh, right. already has the two, and maybe a third could come later on today, but uh, it's not a foregone conclusion. Starting from pole position would help him. Potentially, we keep saying that actually starting on pole isn't a, a great thing, but if he finishes second in this race, he still won't start second, he'll start third because uh, this will, uh, assuming it does end up being deemed the faster of the two semis, which I think it will, um, the results, the top 12 from this race will fill out the odd numbers on the grid, first, third, fifth, seventh and so on, so they'll fill out the inside, semi-final one will fill out the outside, so uh, actually it, it could be that Jamie Sharp is in the pound seat uh, when it comes to the uh, start of the final, of course he started second for his semi-final and led into Paddock Hill Bend on both occasions, so that sort of tactic does play out slightly, but actually for Murray, better to start first than third, he's going to be gunning for the race winner, isn't he? Yeah, if, if, despite where he is, he's going to be able to try and pick as much as he can a chance to possibly start from the front row of the grid if he can pick his play past Roy Smith which will get a chance to be in second because we come up to the end of what will be half distance in this second semi-final sponsored by Quantum Race and Suspension safety car lights are out safety car making its way in which means that Roy Smith now gets the turn to essentially pull the pin and decide when to get the semi-final back underway in the Cooper looks pretty racy so does also Jordan Dempsey shouldn't forget about Jordan Dempsey last year's national champion mm. came third on the podium last year and he's not in a Kevin Mill Spectrum this weekend he's in a Van Diemen as that's one of the other cars going very slowly on the restart and heading for the pit lane. And I think somebody overtook them before they got to the line. Well, there could be some leniency, but we'll yes. wait and see. We'll the clerk of the course decide that. We're back underway racing conditions at Brands Hatch in the second semi final. And I think it was one of the Hawkers, I think it was, was in the mix there as they go through. Towards Paddock Hill Bend. There's Johnny McMullen. He's now boxed in behind Felix Fisher. And also that's Guy's again, I think, in car 61, just because gone, gone beside. And up the hill they go towards uh, the left hander at Graham Hill Bend. There's Nuri. Murray, and Murray in second place. It's Cooper in third, Dempsey fourth, and Fairbairn in the top five. Good to see the two Team USA cars. Still sixth and eighth at the moment, sandwiching Samuel Harrison and the Joe Foster racing run. Uh, Furman car, Joe Foster essentially taking over from Don Harbin these days and running the Furman chassis that Joey's been so associated with over the last few years. Not a great restart there for Nar Murray, and again, maybe that is that little bit of race rustiness just starting to show up. It's his first safety car restart all year, uh, and he really wasn't on his toes, was he? He dropped back from Rory Smith, who then got the jump on him, so Rory's now gapped Nile to the tune of three quarters of a second, although Nile, of course, then immediately sets the fastest lap of the race. I'm not suggesting here that Rory Smith is going to have this easy, but uh, yeah, Nile Murray just gave him a lap or so's respite, maybe. Uh, we are on to the ninth lap of 14, and we are watching here, I believe, the battle that's going on just behind the top 12. Johnny McMullen is up to 14. Felix Fisher in the number seven is up into 15th position. Donald Downey at the moment, car number 33, uh, has the 12th spot. So uh, it's all getting pretty tight at just outside the top 12. A move being made up the inside there uh, into Graham Hill. Ben, that was Johnny McMullen past Kevin McClurg, was it, into 13th? Yeah, so one more place. Donald Downey's there on his own. So I'm yeah. sure that Johnny McMullen will think he's there for the taking. He's got five laps to catch him, five and a bit laps to catch him. Meanwhile, this lot is still scrapping over exactly where they're going to sit if they finish where they are in the final. But it depends on which order. I have to say, really impressive stuff again from the two Can Canadian guys, Alex Berg and Logan Paxer. Because Paxer looking up the inside, he's forced Samuel Harrison to go on the attack, <coughs> attack to defend. 
and slips his way past Alex Berg. So the two T Canada guys are now nose to tail. Also, in the two is Porter Aiken as well, because he's this year's US F2000 champion. There goes Paxer up the inside of Berg. And Aiken might so, try and pick his way through. I think these three might be quite familiar because I think they've all raced in F1600 this year, I think at least in North America. So they'll all be quite familiar with each other in a sense, I'd imagine, if they have raced against each other. Porter Aiken, of course, was this year's US, US F1600 champion, so he's not too ad ad adverse to these cars either. With Oldfield Motorsport. And so the running motor is held back with the twitch of the steer there in typical form of a Ford fashion from Alex Berg. And in there too, as well, of course, is Tom Hawkins, having a Charlie Manning, in fact, as well, having a good run here. Had a sporadic campaign in National Formula Ford up there in the top 10 for a transfer spot. And the last two spots at the moment are taken by Donald Downey and Johnny, uh, Johnny um, uh, Tom Hawkins and, and Johnny. Tom Hawkins, Donald Downey, John McMullen is trying to catch him. He's only three tenths away, so we might need to look, look at that in a second. He's done it. In fact, he's gone three, he's done it. So Joe McMullen from literally the back of the grid in 27th place, up into a top top 12 transfer spot, he's got through. Yes, he has. Now, can Felix Fisher follow him? That's the next question. Felix a few seconds further back, interestingly, not going really at the same sort of pace as the race leader. Here are uh, the race leader, sorry, the uh, number 50 car, which is broken into 12th place. Leaders suddenly absolute together, by the way. That gap was eight tenths at the start of the lap. It's down to two tenths by the end of sector one. So Roy Smith must have had a moment somewhere. And Niall Murray, who has just set another new fastest lap, He's on his tail. There'll be three laps to go at the end of this one. And Niall Murray surely is about to try and make a move into Paddock Hill Bend. No, he pushes Rory Smith down the pit straight, then pulls out at the last second. Surely not right round the outside, Niall. Not yet, but it might well be the switchback manoeuvre. That's covered off beautifully by Rory Smith. It backs Niall Murray up, and here comes Luke Cooper around the outside of possibly the pair of them. Go on. As they go into Druid's corner, he's cleared Niall Murray, and he might still have an overlap on Rory Smith. Rory slams the door in Luke Cooper's face. Terrific racing between the top three as they drop down into Graham Hill Bend. It is still Smith who leads the way. Murray on the outside line. Luke Cooper trying to force his way through into second as they go wheel to wheel towards Surtees. Murray had a slight toe for Smith in front of him. That's why he got the better drive up towards Surtees to pick up second place again. So two laps to go. This is proper semi-final race between the top three. All together as they come up through McLaren and Clearways and back through Clark Curve onto the Jack Brabham straight once again. Now with two laps to go in this second semi-final. At the moment it seems though it's either going to be Smith, Murray and Cooper that will win it. The question is in what order they're going to stand on the podium. Across the line they go for fourth and fifth. It's Dempsey versus Fairbairn and Fairbairn moving around having a look. They've been having a really strong festival so far. Was up on the podium in second place in yesterday's uh, uh, heat, up in the top five in the semi final, defending from last year's, defending, making Nash, last year's national champion defend up towards Druids. And behind them, it's the scrap going on between Paxa, Berg, and Aitken for sixth, seventh, and eighth. And the rest of the transfer spots are still Charlie Mann in ninth, Samuel Harrison in the Joe Foster racing firm and in tenth position, then Tom Hawkins and Johnny McMullen who is only six tenths behind Tom Hawkins, so he's not too far away from going back another spot. That'll put him up another place for the festival final. Indeed so. Through Surtees come the two uh, Team Canada drivers, meanwhile. As they head for clearways, they are still continuing to battle over that sixth position here. Come the leading three, though. Niall Murray holding on to that second place. What are the lap times like this time? They start the final lap. The gap comes down by a tenth that time. As here, Jeremy Fairbairn tries to go the long way around the outside of uh, Paddock Hill Bend, trying to wrestle fourth place away from Jordan Dempsey. Again, the outside line on the way in is the inside line on the way out. Dempsey crowds him over to the edge of the road, the wet side of the road as well. And Jeremy Fairbairn had no choice there uh, but to lift off the throttle and and, uh, and leave the position in Jordan Dempsey's hands. Uh, through Graham Hill, Ben, they will go. The leader's already heading along the Cooper straight, though, for the final time. And Rory Smith, the 2020 festival winner, looks as though he is on course, perhaps, for a semi-final victory here. Now, Murray busily defending second place. They have caught Rory on this final lap, but they're just going to run out of laps. I think Rory Smith uh, will negotiate one of the lapped cars. That is Chapman, I believe, that they're putting a lap on heading to the line. But Rory Smith will get there first and claims the victory in the Quantum Racing Suspension semi-final number two here at Brands Hatch. Second, Now, Murray, third. Third, Luke Cooper, the top three covered by four tenths of a second. Now, what about the transfer spots? We're looking at Sam Harrison. He had a decent cushion, actually, uh, over Felix Fisher, who I don't think is going to make it. Felix will have likely the pole position uh, for the last chance race later on and does indeed come through in 13th place, a second and a half or so off Sam Harrison, as it was. Uh, so Harrison ends up getting into 12th position uh, with Felix Fisher, 13th. 
and looking further down. No major surprises, really. Uh, Isaac uh, Canto da Silva maybe would have expected to do better than 19th. Don't know whether he had uh, some sort of niggly little issue with his car. And also telling there, Scott, that the top 14 in that race all entered into the pro class there. The newer cars, the, the more experienced, faster drivers. Uh, that was definitely the more competitive of the two semi-finals. And, uh, well, those drivers going straight through into the final. It, it's shaping up nicely, isn't it? You said to me this morning you had a good feeling about today, and I think I'm starting to agree with you. Yeah, I think apart from Fisher and Isaac, Isaac Cantor de Silva, who I, I might have expected to get through automatically, everyone else is in through that I expected to be there. A good, the good surprise is Charlie, Charlie Mann and Tom Hawkins getting there in ninth and 11th place, and good to see again as well. Both Team Canada cars 6th and 7th in the end, so all four of our North American scores are into the final automatically. That is going to please both... Uh, um, Brian Graham and Jeremy Shaw, no end, I'm sure, for the final later on this afternoon. Indeed so. So Rory Smith then gets the race win in semi-final number two by over a second in the end. Uh, oh, that's not what our time has been saying, actually. I wouldn't necessarily say that's 100% correct. Rory Smith gets the win by a quarter of a second, according to our time screen, over Niall Murray second and Luke Cooper in third. Jordan Dempsey fourth, Jeremy Fairbairn fifth, and Logan Paxer comes home in sixth. Then it was Alex Berg, Porter Aiken, Charlie Mann, Johnny McMullen, Tom Hawkins, and Sam Harrison completing the top 12, who automatically progress to the grand final. Then it's Felix Fisher and Donald Downey. They will start towards the front of that last chance race along with Richard Higgins, Drew Stewart and Gaius Ginn with Kevin McGlurg, Isaac Canto da Silva, Dieter Hackle completing the top 20. Then it's Guy Shepard, Jonathan Nash, James Buckton, Alan Slater, Oliver Chapman uh, and uh, Montoya Baker who was I think one of those uh, late additions to the grid. Andy Charles that we saw had his dramas but was classified as a finisher, was he? No, I think that's another glitch on the timing screen because Chapman, uh, Baker, Charlesley, and uh, of course, uh, Malum all were classified officially as non-finishers. So, a mm. bit of a glitch in the timing system. But anyway, the result still stands. It was a victory for Rory Smith. Uh, and uh, in, in the end, a fairly convincing one. I'm not convinced he was the fastest car on the track, Scott, but he had that track position and knew exactly how to defend it. Yeah, definitely. One thing I want to point out as well is the, is the, is the highest placed Super Classic cars, Richard Higgins, and he also set the fast too, which means essentially, when we get the race parts historic final later on, he should be on pole position alongside Henry Chart. So it's going to be Higgins versus Chart, but also one to watch from certain. It's going to be Rick Morris too as well. He was second best classic car in the, in that one. Let's head down to the top three for the semi-final two of the Formula Ford Festival down at the top of the pit lane with Richard John Neal. Thank you very much, Scott and Andy. The Quantum Racing Suspension semi-final produces a win for Rory Smith. Let's hear it for Rory. We'll get you on the spot there, Rory, and we'll, we'll grab a, a quick word with you. Congratulations. That was uh, some classic Formula Ford racing, which we were very much looking forward to. Again, blighted with the safety car, but you got a great start ahead of Niall there. Yeah, I mean, um, it, it went pretty perfectly for me, apart from one quite large mistake. But other than that, it was, um, it was all good. Yeah, the safety car is always a bit of a, a troublemaker. But like you said, I um, had a really good launch, so that gave me a bit of breathing space. But whenever you got... Noel Murray behind you, that's never going to last for very long. So I knew I had to maximise my chances as much as possible. Um, and I also used Luke a little bit to try and, um, you know, make things more difficult for Noel. So that's what then gave me the breathing space for the last few laps towards the end as well. You traded fastest lap, I think, towards the end of the race with Noel. I think he managed to edge it in the end. But it, it sets up what could be a fascinating final with the results of the other semi as well. 100%. I mean, Jamie's been on fire uh, all week. So obviously he's my teammate. But, you know, part of BM Racing, we've been smashing it, I have to say. So, um, But, uh, yeah, he's my teammate. But, you know, it's a, it's a one-off event. So all of that sort of thought process goes out the window and it's it's all or nothing now so he'll be the, he'll be with the same thought process and he'll be going for it and then obviously got Nile and Luke and also Jordan as well all you know amazing drivers all got some great history so it's literally anyone's game in the final I think that's what we're here to see with many congratulations on winning uh, semi-final two and we look forward to seeing you for the final thank you very much cheers I think we might have time. I'm going to I'm going to try and squeeze in one. We're getting so we can get Niall Murray over for a very quick word. Niall, we've got the minis on track already. Congratulations! Fastest lap and taking the race to uh, Rory, the winner, but also having to defend from Luke. Yeah, um, look, that was all I wanted in that race, really, to just 
get a good finish to get into the final. Um, last year was a bit of a disaster with the heat in the semi. Um, so I just wanted to get in there, starting now in third and the, the second the inside of the second row. Um, look, I knew I knew I had loads of pace, so even safety car just backed off and let, let Rory have a bit of a lead because um, I kind of thought I'd be able to pull away from Luke and leave him and, and catch Rory and just kind of stay in the middle. Um, then Rory made a mistake halfway through, which put me right onto him, which meant he defended. Um, with that brought Luke back into the, into play. So, yeah, look, we're happy. Um, I had loads of pace there, me. Um, just wanted to stay there. I didn't want to do anything stupid and try to try pass Rory to, you know, could have could have knocked both of us off. So, it was a cracking race. Great to see P2. See you for the final. Thanks, and good luck. Enjoy the bit of a break. I'm going to grab a very very quick word if we can. Luke Cooper. We got the minis on track, Luke. So I'll try and keep it short for them because we need to respect them. But well done. Great to see you yesterday and today. Good race. Yeah, great race. Um, didn't get the best the first laps there, but really good pace. Um, wasn't able to find a way through, but still in the mix for the final. It's going to be a heck of a final, isn't it? Definitely. Yeah. Can't wait. Oh, we look forward to that. Well done, Luke. Thanks for the word. Really appreciate that. So a quick word with our top three we had there. And now we've got our very welcome guest, the Mini 7 Racing Club. And we'll go back to Scott and Andy to give you the grid and a look forward to their third race of the weekend. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Looking forward to this one then. The first two uh, Mini 7 Winter Series races have been uh, really good, as you'd expect, really, for Mini 7 and Mini Melia racing. Aaron Smith has claimed a pair of uh, Melia class victories within the sevens. Uh, Glenn Woodbridge has been uh, doing battle uh, with Ross Billison all weekend. They've had a win apiece within that class. And then in the seven S's, Fraser Hack victorious by a nose, uh, 19 thousandths of a second, his winning margin in the first race uh, of the weekend in the seven S's over Matthew Ayres uh, and then in the second race it was Matthew Page who came through to not only claim the S-class victory but almost won the sevens overall uh, finishing second just behind Ross Billison in that class. Cars then making their way around on the grid uh, and uh, this one again based upon the results from the early race but with a partially reversed grid across both classes. So it is Josh Canning uh, who gets the pole position, Bob Howard starting alongside him, Colin Peacock, who was on the podium in yesterday's first race, will start third, ahead of Rupert Deep, who retired, finished laps down anyway after mechanical dramas in race one. Uh, he will start from fourth this time, ahead of the double Melia winner, Aaron Smith, and Julian Copter at the back of the Melia grid. Just the six Melias, unfortunately, making it through to this final race of the weekend. We then miss a row, we get into the mini sevens, where again we have this partially reversed grid. So it's Mark Simmons on pole, Paul Woodbridge starting alongside him. And then Danny Thomas and Arnold Duncan with Glenn Woodbridge and Robert Payne together on row seven. Kate Fraser Kerr and Bertie Bullard are next, ahead of Andrew Page and Callum Perfect on the next row of the grid. That's the fifth row, essentially, of the sevens. It's Fraser Hack and Matthew Ayres with Matthew Page, the three pace setters really in the seven S's. Again, the seven S's have their own reversed grid, so they're starting towards the back uh, with Giles Page bringing up the rear. Uh, it should be hopefully a 20 car grid. So, entertaining first couple of races, good track conditions for the minis again now, and uh, I'm looking forward to this one. I think Rupert Deeth's going to have a bit of a point to prove here, Scott, isn't he? Because really, Aaron Smith and Rupert Deeth have been as evenly matched as always this weekend. It's just that Aaron Smith in race one had the mechanical. Um, good fortune that Rupert Deeth didn't have and then in race two Aaron seemed to have better luck in the traffic and that really was the only thing that could split them. Yeah really and if, if Rupert could get a strong start here he's not he's basically starting in exactly the same spot he started pretty much in race two yesterday because of the fact that he had that issue in race number one so this will be an issue if a, a, a key opportunity for him starting ahead of course of Aaron Smith this time to try and get ahead and stay ahead and of course I was talking about yesterday those two had such a back and forth at Croft it's kind of like a continuation of that rivalry a little bit didn't see quite so much of it at the final rounds at Silvers in a couple of weeks ago uh, but Aaron and Rupert will be certainly enjoying it Phil Bull and Brown of course will be in the mix there too as well uh, he's a bit further back I can't see him he's, I can't see him there one person over isn't here also as well is Ross Billison reason being as he said on the broadcast yesterday on uh, yes. you're watching, he's on holiday <laughs> he's going on holiday so he's yes. not actually here so he's probably on a jet to think it's the turkey he's going yes. somewhere already but um, if he's got wide if I'm watching the stream, then if you're watching, then or watching it back, hi to Ross and thanks for you have a good holiday. Uh, never mind, never about my turkey. This is Brown's access to the minis, and we're about to get set for race number three, and away we go. Oh, well, most of them do. Josh Canning with a slow start from oh. Paul gets a hip and shoulder there from Colin Peacock for his troubles. Colin Peacock challenging for the lead, but Rupert Deeth comes around the outside of them all, 
to claim the lead from fourth on the grid. Aaron Smith looks as though he's going with him. In fact, Smith is very sideways through uh, Paddock on cold tyres. He's already up the inside though. Look at this, Aaron Smith from fifth on the grid, looking for the lead into Druid's corner. He skates through on the inside line, that damp side of the road. But Rupert Deeth is hanging tough on the outside again. They almost lean on each other. Now the next corner is a left-hander. That favours Rupert Deeth, and he will get the early advantage as they head down the Cooper Strait for the first time. Uh, towards 30, Aaron Smith is back on the inside again though. They're leaning on each other. This is really Really close racing, a bit of paint traded there down the back straight, but Aaron Smith has got to the front of the pack. Rupert Deeth into second position, and Colin Peacock sits there in third place. Phil, uh, no, not Phil Bullen Brown next, it is Josh Canning next uh, in the uh, black number 36, because Bullen Brown uh, not out there for this race either, which is a bit of a shame. Slipstream starts to bring Rupert Deeth back onto the tail of Aaron Smith. He looks to the outside line into Paddock Hill, then neck and neck they run into the braking zone of Rupert Deeth, supremely brave under braking goes around the outside of Smith, misses the apex slightly, but then gets across to the inside line to cover heading up Halewood Hill. Game on between these two. They are playing for keeps in this final race of the season. Here they are, and again, it's better that it's that rivalry once again. Of course, it's good to see Colin Pico up there, giving a little bit more rivalry as they come down towards Graham Hill Bend. It's practically bone dry condition there because the sun is beautifully shining here this morning, uh, here at Brands Hatch. They get the way back down towards Surtees once again. It's getting pretty close now between the top two. Pickham's gone with us. This is the main top three, it seems. Canning in the mix now, along with Rob Howard. A, a, bit, a little bit further back in fourth, a bit having their own battle. You think Brock, of course, the sole Libra class car. And behind them, we saw some great racing in the sevens, which we saw Matthew Page challenging for that overall win against um, that was, it was mainly Paul Woodbridge, I think, one of the Woodbridge, I think it was, was towards the front. Either way, this is the main battle at the, at the, the, between the top two. It's between Rupert Deef and Aaron Smith, and back down towards Paddock Hill Bend they go. Smith just keeping in the wheel tracks of Deef as they just cock a wheel each through. Getting up on the suspension, and now Smith's got a good run. He was on the damp part of the circuit on the inside line, but he breaks on the dry section. They're wheel to wheel in towards D Druid's Bend, and he forced Deeth to turn out of that. He went to go for the apex. Deeth was fully along, uh, Smith was fully alongside him. He turned out of it once again, and just like that, a lead change between the pair. And I wonder if these two are going to start possibly working together temporarily, call a truce, and try and pull away from Colin Peacock. Because if they do, they can have their own battle later on in the race. Not a chance. Not a chance. <laughs> you don't think so. This is Mini Melia racing. They're going to fight for every position as they are in the sevens. That was close into Graham Hill Bend. Inside line for Glen Woodbridge. The car trying to go around the outside uh, is the 725 of Fraser Hack, who was the winner of the 7S class in seven S class in the first race yesterday. He's trying to go right around the outside of Woodbridge at Surtees. That gives him the inside through McLaren and Clearways, and that will work nicely. Charging through on the inside further back was Matthew Ayres was that. Uh, trying to make some ground up as well. I know that Matthew Ayres has been rapid as the track has got drier over the weekend. As uh, Woodbridge waving at someone, was he there? I'm not entirely sure what he's waving at because he's certainly not working with Fraser Hack. He pulls to the outside line into Paddock Hill Bend and will move not back through, actually. Fraser Hack manages to defend the position. The seventh class, by the way, being led by Darren Thomas in the green number 20 car. Way wide there goes Callum Perfect. Bit of uh, track limits, perhaps, there um, on the exit of Paddock and he will lose out to Matthew Ayres as they head into uh, the right-hand hairpin up at Druid's Corner. But yes, Darren Thomas leading within the seven class. Fraser Hack second, but leads the S's. You can see the different coloured number backgrounds on the left-hand side of the tiring screen, denoting the different classes. The yellows are the Melias, uh, the pinks, the uh, sevens, the reds, the seven S's, and then Julian Proctor, the only Libra class car, uh, winning sixth position overall. But good battling going on here amongst the sevens, who really have stolen the show a little bit this weekend. A little bit, but they're certainly they're at least adding to the spectacle. Of the Look at all the other facilities going on around the track. But there is Fraser Hack. You can see the sevens put on a fantastic second race. If you haven't seen them, go and watch it back after this uh, broadcast. Then, if there's a break in the mix, because it certainly was a brilliant race, particularly with the seven and seven S cars, who are probably in, a, in regular competition, probably aren't that close in terms of performance. But it was Brands Hatch Indy here. You can see here the Fraser Hack car is in there in second place overall, and he's actually holding off some of the cars, which essentially are that little bit faster. Around Brown's Hatch here, they're very evenly matched, the two categories, if they kind of are that, that well performing. And the star to watch out, of course, is Matthew Page. He was right up there taking second overall and a definitive 7S win. He's there just at the top of the shot in car 703, just behind Arnold Duncan, who has a little look up the inside of Glenwood Bridge. They're not afraid of making lunges and going for chances, are they? Because these, these minis really do go for it when they get a chance. As for Darren Thomas, who just checked out, he's having a casual Sunday morning drive, thinking, see you, boys. 
you scrap amongst yourselves to have a go at it. Speaking of scrap amongst themselves, this is the scrap for the leading Mini Melias and for the overall lead. And here comes Rupert Deep with a new fast snap of the race up the inside, saying anything you can do, Aaron, I can do just as well. Back up the inside he goes, and for the time being, I'll say at least, back into a lead. But I'm sure with these two battling as hard as they are, that won't stay like that for long, will it? Uh, no, likely not. We're about five minutes in, and it's this middle portion of the race in which Aaron Smith has sort of asserted his dominance in the other two races. So I uh, wonder whether we're going to see the same thing happen. To do that, though, he has to get the lead back, and he couldn't quite do it into to uh, Surtees corner. So Rupert Deep hangs on. Aaron Smith will take the wide line into clearways. Defensive line taken by Deep. The hope here for Smith is that the wide line in gives him extra momentum on the exit. He's already going to pick up a nice slipstream uh, heading towards Paddock. And I'm sure he's going to try and pop out of that slipstream to make a move into the braking zone. It's the second part of the straight where that toe really starts to bring them together. Although actually Deeds can't work well in a straight line. Oh, there's contact further back. That's that Matthew is Page. Uh, Matthew Page off into the gravel. He just avoids getting buried. Who's he tangled with? That That's looks like Matthew Ayres, I think. I think it is. So two of our contenders uh, in the 7S class getting together. And oh, he might just have that. And I think if he hits reverse, he's he to reverse be okay. that. Yeah, reverse that rather than go forwards. Otherwise, he's going to find himself in a world of trouble in the gravel trap. Yeah, so uh, hard to see, I suppose, from where you're sat, exactly where that front axle is. But he is okay as long as he doesn't drive uh, any further forward. I think he has now found reverse and he's starting to uh, extricate himself from the grass. But that's a shame. That's uh, split the 7S pack a little bit and uh, perhaps opens the door for Fraser Hack now to take what could be a fairly easy victory, as easy as it gets anyway, uh, in Mini 7 racing within the 7S class itself. Paul Woodbridge putting Callum Perfect under pressure. As he's turned through Druids, all side by side. This will put Callum Perfect back on the inside line. Going to Woodbridge, he's going to give it up though. This is the small diminutive enough minis. He's going to try and get around the outside and he might well try to hold on. Just outside the window, I think, and, and because the seven the media cars have gone past, and the spin sets a new fast snap of the race. And there's still 0.151 between them at the front, so that battle still continues to rage on. Let's take a look at Fraser Hack here, who's uh, top of the 7S category, still being chased by Woodbridge and Duncan. Little Darren Thomas that still leads the way by about two seconds now in front of Hack. So the two category lead class leaders in the sevens are currently sixth and seventh overall. And there is, in fact, uh, Duncan Thomas putting a lap on, I think, possibly. Matthew Page has recovered it. So yes, it is. Yeah. Matthew Page is putting a lap on Matthew Page, who how 24 hours changes the thing, but he was up there back for the overall win, and now because of his off, he's now right at the back and about to be lapped by the current seven leader, Darren Thomas, in the front of the field. Uh, we've lost Rob Howard, by the way. There were briefly yellow flags on the pit straight. He pulled off, I think, into the pit exit and was uh, pushed out of harm's way by the marshals. Good work by the marshals to uh, get that done without us even noticing, actually. So certainly no uh, major... Um, impact on the race, those yellow flags. Uh, oh, oh, that's no! contact for the race lead, though. Aaron Smith into the side of Rupert Deep. They get tangled together up at Druids, and both of them now stationary. Colin Peacock <laughs> comes through, rubbing his hands with Glee to claim the race lead. What on earth happened there? Just, I think they're just to, to be looking at each other, I think, and just came to blows for the same piece of con that tarmac up at Druids and both came together and they got the, had that incident where they just both came to a stop. They got into locks and they came to a stop before we looked at each other and thought, <laughs> what are you doing? And just then got going again, and Peacock just looked around the outside, probably laughing to himself, thinking, all right, see you, boys, I'm off. <laughs> well, let's see if he can now uh, make good his escape. The good news is that Smith and Deeth have both carried on with minimal delay and minimal damage, it seems, so they probably still will have a shot at winning the race, but Colin Peacock is going to be only too happy to enjoy his moment in the spotlight here. If one of these two still wins this race, I'll be staggered, because that's quite <laughs> extraordinary. They've got the pace, I think, but Colin Peacock, Cock now, if he can hold on for the next 11 and a half minutes, could be the one that gets all the glory in the end. Well, let's see. He's only 1.8 seconds up the road, and his fastest lap of the race, 54.8, is about three tenths slower than anything that Deeth or Smith have done. So they sure and have the pace to close in on him. The question is how much damage, if any, has been done to the two cars. You'd imagine Deeth is probably okay, but is the steering maybe out of line slightly on uh, Aaron Smith's car? We'll watch the lap times with interest. Just looking at sector two times alone, both of them are still half a second quicker in the second sector for Colin Peacock, so they've still got the pace. It's the case of when they catch them, I suppose, rather than if they do. And they've both just done personal best first sectors. In fact, now right fastest first sector for Rupert Deep. I think that's that question answered. Uh, right then, uh, we've had all of a lap and a half without something kicking off, so now let's throw in some lap traffic, Ooh. shall we? Colin Peacock squeezing up the inside of Andrew Page there, who I don't think had seen him coming. A graphic example there, Scott, of the speed difference between the two classes. Absolutely. The Minions are, the minions are uh, definitively the faster of the two. You can tell the Mini Minions because they have that slightly wide, almost go-kart style shape with the wide 
wider arches on them. They are Great looking good. cars, aren't they? They are fantastic. And they, they do breed fantastic racing. They're, they're some of my favourite race cars out there because when you get a massive pack of them together, I'm sure Mr. Paul O'Neill knows exactly what they're talking about when they've been on the, uh, on the other packages that they've been on as well, that um, they've put on a fantastic display and the race they've put on is just second to none and, and wherever they've gone. We've had them, of course, three times this year on the BRSEC package at Salt and GP right at the start of March. I think way back in March, also like yesterday in March, that thought they were back in a crop and of course then for the final rounds of the Silver the International Circuit. And every single time, regardless of how many cars they had in sevens and in medias, brilliant racing all round, as they typically tend to do. So brilliant stuff here. Could be brilliant even more for Rupert Deeth if he can pick his way back past and get back into the lead as if nothing ever even happened at Druids. He's going to go possibly ste steaming down the outside up towards Paddock Hill Bend. He's going to break that a little bit later. Will he, get to, will he take the high and wide and handsome line? He looks like he's going to try it. Ooh. He could force the issue as much as he can. Holds the inside line, but Dieter's now got the outside line again for towards Druids, but it'll be on the slightly drier part of the circuit. Looks down the outside again, it will bring Aramsmith back into play. Still goes around the outside of Colin <laughs> Peacock, doesn't want to let it go. And Colin Peacock then has it covered off all just initially towards down Graham Hill Bend. But up the inside goes Rupert Dieth, and what collision with Aaron Smith, he's back into the lead. Oh uh, well, but that does now mean Aaron Smith is right with them. There had been about a two second cushion between Deep and Smith. Smith is now at the inside of Peacock, but they both have to then slip up the inside uh, of the 765 car there into Surtees. That's Callum Perfect. He does his best to stay out of the way, but uh, in the end has to enter the corner at some point. Peacock out wide. Smith sees a gap on the inside. Colin, I think, tried to wedge him in there behind one of the slower cars. They're absolutely inches apart as they head past the pits. Aaron Smith on the inside, Colin Peacock uh, waving, I think, there at Aaron Smith as he goes by. And Aaron, I reckon, is about to move into second place. Yes, he is. So Smith into second, about a one-second gap now to Rupert Deeth. Has Aaron Smith got the pace to close in? Let's see if he can work his way through the traffic clean enough, he might not have a proper chance here as they work their way past Paul Woodbridge, currently setting fifth in the Mini 7 contest. Down the hill back towards Graham Hill Bend they go once more. Gone past half distance, just under eight and a half minutes to go in this final Mini 7 race of the entire year. Of course, they finished their regular season a couple of weeks ago at Silver's International. You probably would have watched that on the BRSCC live stream. And of course, they're here with the final rounds of their winter series, which again began all the way at Silverstone GP in March and of course the next rounds were ooh, last time at Silverstone and back at Brands Hatch and damn, they really are going for it <laughs> outside of his back mark around the outside of Arnold Duncan as Andy McKean shakes his head in disbelief as he grimaces <laughs> to watch them go past and I share the sentiment because they're picking their way through the slower traffic here whilst battling amongst each other this is again mini seven racing at its finest but also showing how traffic management is oh so crucial in the multi-class series because that closing speed is astonishing isn't it for cars that look so similar from the outside the, it's the performance under the uh, bonnet that really makes a big difference of course but the, the extra speed that the Melias have coming out of clearways corner but deep there has a bit of a miscommunication with uh, Matthew Page as they drop down the hill and then almost another one with Darren Thomas who by the way is only three quarters of a second clear of Fraser Hack now for the lead uh, in the mini seven so Fraser Hack uh, starts Starting to uh, maybe move up to challenge, although he's now dropped way back in the first sector. So Fraser Hack, perhaps as the uh, leading Melias came through, has dropped a fair chunk of time. So actually, Darren Thomas now in a pretty comfortable position at the head of the seventh field. The same cannot be said, though, for Rupert Deeth. We're two thirds of the way through the race, seven minutes to go, and the top two are once more separated by only a handful of minis lengths. Yeah, the gap between the top two and the sevens is now about three seconds or so because Fraser Hack lost, you actually think you're right, as you said lost quite a bit of time in the pack. He's now, let's say, 2.8 behind now, because the gap is between them, uh, yeah, 2.9 seconds behind the leader and then on the five point. So that's, that's between cars, actually, isn't it? So that's, yes, no, it is, that is between seconds. So the gap is at the moment between them. Let's have a quick look. It's now gone to 2.8 seconds, yeah. So between them, that's looking quite close there. As Harris Smith, again, getting almost too close to the back of Rupert Deep and looking up the inside again. Remember what happened last time you see Kent had a battle? You came to blows. Let's not have all the same, please, boys. Well, the Peacock was sat there thinking, well, you could if you want to, because I can have a lead back again if you don't mind. But um, I'm sure, in, in general, you'd love to see them just back towards the end without having to uh, rub door handles or more. As they come now past 778, that's going to be Kate Fraser Kerr, who Richard spoke to in the assembly only yesterday. And it's got kind of a racing history, particularly short intervals, I believe. And has to come back towards Paddock Hill Bend again. Six minutes left on the clock in this final minute seven race of the entire season. The regular season's finished, of course, this is the final rounds of the winter series. Still, Aaron Smith pushing Rupert Deeth, almost practically literally up the hill. And one way than the other, forced Deeth to go to that defensive line on the damp part of the circuit. The outside line's a bit more dry, which means there'll be more traction and grip for Smith to take, take advantage of. And they come back down the hill again towards Graham Hill Bend. There's an opportunity here to possibly have a look up the inside, but Smith doesn't want to send it and risk more um, coming together as a Rupert Deeth. Now down the back straight, they go once again. He's in the toe. 
point Kipi got just keeping the powder dry in third place, watching on. He's not dropping back too far, no. mainly because these two are scrapping so hard, it's giving him a chance to stay in touch. Yeah, I was about to make the point actually. Peacock's going faster now than he's been at any point this weekend. He just did a 54.8, which was a bit quicker than the race leaders. Leaders then come out of Clearway's nose to tail. They may well be side by side by the time they get to the other end of the Brabham Strait. Let's see, into Paddock Hill Bend. Smith peeks to the inside, but he's not really close enough, is he? Surely to commit to the move, thinks about it, but maybe just trying to force a mistake out of Rupert Deeth, which he sort of does. Deeth misses the apex fractionally, and Aaron Smith sees a gap on the inside. No, the gap is closed very abruptly uh, by Deeth as they head towards Druids. Just under a quarter of the race to go. Peacock is right back with them again, and this is proper Mini Melia racing, the best race of the weekend, definitely, that this class uh, has put on. And Rupert Deeth, Aaron Smith, and Colin Peacock, Peacock are going to duke it out here over the final few minutes to try and claim the final victory of the season. Up through Surtees Corner, they will head. And Rupert Deeth, with a little bit of damage to the right hand side of his car, continues to lead the way as they head towards the conclusion of another lap. So, oh, to go and oh, no. it again. They're side by side. There's more collision between the two of them. Hammersmith gets through. This gives Peacock a chance to get the run here. But these two can't leave each other alone on track. And Colin <laughs> Peacock gets the run. He thinks, right, try this for size looking down the outside. And they're going to go side by side again. They're not looking at each other. But I imagine it probably would be if they were side by side looking look at the two of them. I imagine afterwards there's probably going to be some handshakes and some hugs after between. I imagine it's all friendly banter on, on circuit in many cases. Down the outside looks Rupert Deeth. Right, can we try it this time? The Peacock's there, he knows, he the two of them trip up over each other, he's right there to take full advantage as he did several laps ago when they came to blows at Druid. Down the hill once again, quickly cut away to our seven, uh, that's our, our second placed Mini 7 car, that's Glenn Woodbridge ahead of Arnold Duncan, there's Fraser Hack behind him, leading the 7S category, and fourth in the 7s overall. Now, in fact, look, look at there, look, it's now Peacock closer to Deep, and Deep is to Smith, intriguingly, so close back in the braking, though, is, is Rupert, can just lift that inside rear well they're good at doing that quite stiffly sprung i remember seeing a great picture that uh, uh james robertson photographer took at croft of andrew jordan and i swear it's the highest i've ever seen a rear wheel in the air because <laughs> andrew jordan was throwing the car into the final hairpin and the thing was like two feet off the air there's they're stiffly sprung and they're just taking the mickey that was just <laughs> unbelievable so they really are stiffly sprung these little me's they're prop, like proper little go-karts these machines and they race like them just as much as they look like them they do indeed right then three minutes to go Smith has got back to the lead, can't shake off Rupert Deeth though, here comes Glenn Woodbridge meanwhile at the inside to put a lap uh, on Kate Fraser Kerr, now Woodbridge is catching I think Darren Thomas, let's see what the uh, lap times are between the two of them, Thomas does a 59.9 and actually Woodbridge was slightly slower in the end on that lap so never mind, the gap had been coming down. Uh, but not on that particular lap. Maybe the traffic just uh, playing a small part in that. Personal best first sector, though, has just been set by Colin Peacock. So, again, he's going quicker than ever. He's right on the tail of the leading two. And as we head into the closing stages, if he's going to have any chance of winning this race, he might have to start making some moves pretty quickly. Possibly. Smith continues to lead across the line then. What's the gap this time by? It's only 0.126 per second. And he's coming back at him once again. I thought he was about to make a last-minute dive up the inside of Paddock Hill Bend, but he thought better of it at the last moment. Going to stay in the slipstream. Of course, these cars are incredibly boxy. They're almost like just in, like almost like cubes in a way. So they punch quite a large hole in the air. Hence, when you get a massive pack in them, particularly on a high-speed circuit, they really do race like well, NASCAR in many cases, like stock cars. They're all together in packs of two and three and more. And you always get into the draft, and you can find a drafty partner pretty easily. And we come back down the straight towards Surtey. Deep is slightly off the back of him. That was the fastest second sector of the race for Rupert Deep last time by. And wasn't the fast lap of the race. Meanwhile, that is still Darren Thomas. That's the head of uh, the recovering Matthew Page. So Matthew Page, if, this, if he wasn't on that behind, it would be <laughs> almost a carbon copy of what happened yesterday. But it'll be, it's, it's Darren Thomas rather than Ross Billerson. I think he's probably halfway in the air in, in, towards <laughs> Turkey somewhere, possibly, at this point in time. But Darren Thomas then looking to try and finish off the Mini 7 season with a 7 class win. Back Ooh. down the hill they go, and they're closed up again through that traffic. This is now the tailors. That's Julian Proctor, the only mini Libra car. And now we're towards the tail enders in the 7S category. You've got Andrew Page in there as well, at top of that with Bertie Woolard as well. Down the hill once again. Just over a minute left to go, so I think next time by with the final lap. It's now or never ready for Rupert Deeks. He's going to try and make it happen now, if not on this next lap. Otherwise, he'll have to resign himself for second place. Yes, indeed so. Oh, oh. now this is drama. That's the number 36 in trouble. Oh. Uh, Josh Canning 
bits of bodywork going flying. He's obviously had a tangle with someone or something, and luckily finds a gap to head into the pit lane. Right, leaders about to start the final lap of the race. They'll have to dodge that little uh, bit of front wing that's been left in the middle of the road, which they do. But Rupert Deef has the slipstream. He's only a car's length behind. He's closing, closing all the time. Looks from the outside. He's going to try to sweep right around the outside of Aaron Smith. He might just be able to do it late on the brakes. He goes into the first corner, and I think he has managed to find a way through. Uh, Colin Peacock sits in third, but I reckon Rupert Deef, yes, he did it. He's now defending the inside line into Druid's corner, and Aaron Smith tries to come back at him, but that was perfectly timed that from Rupert Deeth that is the best place to try and overtake here at Brands Hatch particularly in these cars and he managed to execute it perfectly now he just needs to try and fill the road as best he can for another half a lap Aaron Smith gets a good exit from Graham Hill Ben Deeth closes the door Smith goes back to the outside again into Surtees one more realistic overtaking opportunity to come and then it's the drag race home defensive line taken by Deeth Smith goes way wide and looks to try and carry the extra momentum through the corner he's had a better run off the turn he's in the slipstream Get that photo finish camera ready. It could be a very close finish, this one. Rupert Deeth, I think, is just about going to hang on, though. He heads to the line and wins the final Mini 7 Winter Series race of the weekend by, in the end, just under a tenth and a half. Aaron Smith in second. Colin Peacock comes home uh, in third, with Julian Proctor finishing in the end in fourth position in, as we said, the only uh, Libra-class car in the field. He was a lap down, uh, unlike what the timing tower is uh, suggesting. Meanwhile, back in the sevens, this is unfortunately not a fight for the class lead. It would be nice if it was, really, certainly for Matthew uh, Page, but he is going to have to settle for a slightly disappointing final result of the weekend. It will not be a disappointment, though, uh, for Darren Thomas, who is going to become the third different seven-class winner of the weekend, I believe. Uh, heads across the line, and Darren Thomas, in the end, takes a relatively uncontested victory in the Mini 7 category, uh, and a fifth-place finish overall. Fraser Hack, meanwhile, next car across the line. He is very happy. Look at that slamming the roof in celebration as he comes through to claim another victory in the 7S class and second place of the 7s overall. A brilliant way uh, to complete the weekend's racing for the minis. And uh, it is Rupert Deep who gets the race win. Fantastic stuff. So under the autumnal sunshine here at Brands Hatch, we see the best mini race of the weekend, definitely. Rupert Deep claiming victory in the Melias in the end. Uh, by only just over a tenth of a second, again, contrary to what that timing graphic is telling you. Uh, Aaron Smith second, Colin Peacock third, and Julian Proctor comes home fourth ahead of Darren Thomas. Proctor the only Libra car, Thomas the winner in the sevens ahead of Fraser Hack, winner of the seven S's. Then it was Glenn Woodbridge, Arnold Duncan, Paul Woodbridge, and Matthew Ayres uh, to complete the top ten. Callum Perfect 11th, Charles Page 12th, Mark Sims 13th, and Andrew Page comes home in 14th place. 15th for Bertie Woolard, Matthew Page was 16th after his spin down at Graham Hill Bend, whilst Josh Canning we saw was a late retirement, Kate Fraser Kerr was 18th, and Ron Howard unfortunately retired to the pit lane uh, early doors as well. So great racing from the Mini Melias, and uh, for more information on 170 of course, more information on their uh, 2024 campaign, uh, then do be sure to head over to their website and social media pages, give them a quick follow, and we may well be seeing them back at a BRSTC meeting in the near future. Right, next racing action here at Brands Hatch is the first race of the weekend for the TCR UK Championship, perhaps a race in which Carl Broadley could be crowned the champion. We'll have all of the build-up on the grid from Anthony Jordan and Paul O'Neill on that one in a few minutes before that though let's head down into part verme and hear from richard john neal and our mini podium finishes thanks very much andy well, yesterday we respected all the classes today we've taken a decision to have a word with the top three so if we can get aaron and rupert over first of all because i want to get the take between the pair of them on that race rupert aaron let's get you over here we've got tcr to do as well so um, apologies it is going to be quick but not as quick as you guys were on track absolutely superb racing what's the take between the tangle and the tagging up there and i'll go to rupert first because you won you get the first shout uh, um thank you for that um i don't know I'd obviously um i thought i'd given him plenty of room and i think it's a case of typical mini miglia wheels locking together and spits the other one round and you got going and managed to, to catch Colin between you and, and we'll have a chat with Colin in a moment. Aaron, your point of view? Uh, I reckon there's definitely two different views on that, but uh, uh, yeah, it was a good race other than that. But yeah, no, I'm pleased to be on the podium with Mini Sport. You know, like they've done a mega job this year. So yeah, thanks very much. So is this banter now in the paddock? Do you shake hands and, and give each other a little hug? There we go. Superb stuff. Brilliant racing. What's the plans for the winter? Uh, well, a uh, bit more development on the car, hopefully. Um, and, yeah, hopefully come out strong next year. Aaron? 
Uh, get a new bumper. <laughs> <laughs> Good, thank you for a super race and a great season, guys. Absolute pleasure. Well done on the win. Well done on two wins as well yesterday. Let's have a word with Colin Peacock, if we can, very quickly. Colin's having a very, very quick word with Josh, our circuit commentator. I'm not sure whether we're going to get time to do this. I'm just looking for the wind-up from... Here he comes. We are going to get Colin. Thank you, Josh. Sorry for hurrying. Colin Peacock, well done. Thank you, thank Lead you, briefly you. while those guys tangled. Yeah, they yeah. got your back, and it's all mini racing, isn't it? I was trying to get into the tangle again, you know, towards the end. I just <laughs> wouldn't do it, you know, please tangle again. But, yeah, no, it was a really good race. I thought we might get some opportunities in the slower traffic, yeah. but it didn't uh, transpire. But, anyway, it was good fun. Thank uh, you to everybody for the Mini 7 Club on being fantastic guests for us this year. Wherever I've seen you, you've been fantastic. Yeah, we try to put on a good show. It's, a, it's close racing, and we really enjoy it. So uh, we're glad to be here. And we'll be here for the August Festival on uh, uh, 3rd and 4th. But we're with the BRSCC. We love being with the BRSCC. So we're with you, I think, at Sneston and at Silverstone next year, as many times as we can. I know everyone in the club will... Uh, welcome you back with open arms next year and me as a spectator elsewhere very too you so. thank, thank you Colin have a great winter thank you thank you very much Colin Peacock there completing our podium Aaron Smith taking second place Rupert Deeth uh, our race winner finally so two different race wins well done to the other class winners as well Julian Proctor taking a third class win of the weekend of course in Libra Darren Thomas for the sevens and Fraser Hack for seven S. just to give them their respect I think we spoke to most of them yesterday uh, with that though from the minis thank you to them Let's now turn our attentions to TCR. So back to the guys in the comms box. Do you wonder why your competitors' websites appear in Google searches ahead of you? Then make a call to the SEO experts Woya and understand how your business can be more visible online. As the official marketing partner of TCR UK, you can now work with a trusted search engine optimization partner to increase web traffic, inquiries and sales. Speak to us for your free audit and quote by visiting woya.co.uk today. The voice and data solutions at speeds that are simply out of this world. Choose Maximum Networks. Welcome everybody, it's TCR UK at Brands Hatch, a beautiful sunny Brands Hatch. We're ready to rock and roll, we're going to see some championship titles. All done and dusted hopefully by the end of the day. But first we just want to say uh, a sombre and um, not a very nice thing to report. A good friend of the championship, a good friend of mine, Dan Kirby, uh, unfortunately lost his life while we were off air um, from the last round. And the guys and girls and everybody here at TCR UK want to send all our very best to the family and uh, Alpha Live and TCR UK have put together a beautiful, beautiful video. Please have a watch.
Dan Kirby leads into Redgate. It looks like Kirby's got the run, but he'll be on the outside for Rocket. If he gets this done early doors, that's a great pass. Side by side for the race lead. Max Hart on the inside of Dan Kirby as they head for McLean's. To the inside goes Kirby as he tries to attack and defend at the same time. This is proper racing. Two wheels on the grass for Kenton. On the inside goes Dan Kirby as well. Some more really opportunistic overtaking there from him. The third place, it's close as well. But Bradley Kent goes around the outside and there's contact. Bradley Kent is off. Toby Bird is sideways. Dan Kirby gets the lead of the race. It's just a mad, mad race. And to come through the pack like that, you know, a bit of fortune as well. Obviously, it helps. Of course, it does. But, you know, to get the first win is unbelievable. A lovely, lovely tribute to a lovely, lovely man, Dan Kirby, good friend of mine, helped a lot of touring car drivers out. Proper guy, wasn't he? Yeah, really was, and uh, yeah, such a shame uh, to see him go. A big loss, I think, to the racing community in the paddock here at TCR. Uh, he will be missed, and uh, yeah, we do send all of our best to uh, friends and family. Yeah, I'm sure we'll all make him proud and his family today. Um, and Andy Wilmot, so obviously yep. uh, driving his car um, with his name on, and obviously a tribute to him as well. Yeah, starting this one P12 as well, so relatively decent qualifying. It's in the middle of a championship battle as well though so uh, he's got a lot of work ahead of him but uh, yeah great to see him racing under uh, Dan's name out there yeah. and uh, good to see the car having a proper send off I think. Super um, very exciting today yes, isn't it? Um, it is. Let's get this championship done um, Carl Bordley and five others can win it. Yep. Can Bordley do it? 50 odd points ahead? I mean he's in the best boat but it certainly is his to lose. I think qualified P5 in this one he's not in a best starting position he's got a lot of people around him and he's got yeah a lot of drivers who want to get their nose out speaking to a lot of them before the start of this they say you know uh, yeah we don't care about the championship but when you really dig into them and be like come on seriously what do you think i'd be like oh, of course mate i'm gonna get elbows out i'm gonna get right into it this is gonna be a touring car race mate it's gonna be proper i think there's a proper twist ready yeah. to rock and roll it's yeah. gonna be very interesting and um, we've got stuart lines just at the right yes. hand side of us who is uh, the tcr uk uh, promoter do you want to have, have a quick, quick chat with him? have a quick chat with him yeah because obviously end of the season it's been fantastic stuart lines over here stuart uh well a season's nearly done, mate. Uh, two races to go, six drivers in contention to win the championship. I would say that's been a solid success. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, it seems to work out like that. They've obviously got the BOP right, which is, you know, people always moan about BOP, but every year it's been down to the last race. You know, I mean, everyone thinks that Carl's already won it, but yeah, in over until the last lap and the car rolls over the line. You know that anything can happen out there. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I've got no favourite to win it. You know, it's a fair fight, and uh, he's been the most consistent. And if he does win it, he deserves it. But uh, there's a few people going to be uh, trying to change that. Yeah. When you talk about the balance of performance, the BOP, just to, just to tell people at home, can you just explain the BOP a bit yeah, more? Yeah, BOP is like the, there's three things that these cars are affected by. One's the map, the other one is weight, and the other one is ride. Oh, there's only three things that they play with, and they tweak the cars to try and get them as equal as possible. So, uh, you know, that that's kind of like what it is. There's no magic formula. I'm not allowed to touch the cars or turn them up or mess with them. That comes from TCR World WSC. You know, it's, it's their gig to change anything like that. You know, uh, so there's no magic dust in our championship. You know, if you win, it's because you're the best driver. Yeah. So much work has happened for the development of the championship this season, and a lot's happening next year as well. Some big changes coming. Oh, yeah, yeah, there's, there's always changes with TCR, but uh, it's all about inclusion. So we've, we've got the new Gen 1. Gen 1s are now back as their own championship. So there's lots of cars out there that are quite, you know, a lot cheaper to run, and, it, and it's going to enable young, young people who have got low budget to be able to come and race with us. That's the main thing, isn't it? And I think I'm looking forward to that one the most, the Gen 1 Cup coming in next year, back to see that. And uh, yeah, it's certainly going to spice things up, I think. Yeah, a lot of people talking about the Gen 1 Cup. Um, you know, and I actually want to ask Stuart a question. Stuart, can I just ask you, what will happen with the Hyundai um, in the Gen 1 Cup? Will that be a Generation 1 car? No, no, it's too fast for, it's going to be in the top class. You know, uh, any Gen 2 cars from Audi and, and Cupra and, you know, there's, there's a few models, but all the Hyundai models will be at the top step. So uh, anything below that Gen 1, older cars, yeah, that's the only emission really, because as everybody knows, if the Hyundai's quite strangled, you know, if it was let loose 
to run as light and as low as it could. I think it would run rings around most racing cars, you know, yeah. but uh, yeah. it's where it is. So. I can imagine so. It's going to be good though, isn't it? It's yeah. going to be good. Cheers, Stuart. Um, I think that's a very fair... Um... Uh, I need... Uh, are we live now? Yeah, yeah we're yeah, still live. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I've got uh, Dan's mum and dad here. Oh. They want to come and have a chat uh, for the car at the top, if that's OK with you that's guys. That's amazing, yeah. Course, We've just yeah. been right. showing people at home about the, okay. the Dan yes. Kirby video. Cheers. So thank, thank you, Stuart. Right. So Dan Kirby's no uh, mum and dad are here uh, today. So we will we will look after them and we will uh, show them around. Um, let's just get into the middle of the track yes. here. Um, AJ, what, um, what are we expecting here from Brickley on pole? Yep. Bordley starting not very far up, but at the same time, it's his team. He's only one car, I think, behind him on the same uh, the same side, isn't he? So, will he help him out? Do you think, or is he going to go for the win? Because uh, he can't win the championship, can he, Brickley? I mean, <laughs> he's a fair few points behind. He keeps talking like he's fighting for second. He's only 13 points behind second in the championship at the moment after qualifying. So, you know, going into this one. He's still thinking about that, and I think his main focus is on second. He's not focused on first, only because he was talking to me. I'd be like, if I can get second, there's like 12 and a half grand's worth of cash prize at the end of the season for this one. So he's he's fully focused on second. It's not not all for the money, you know. He wants to get first, but. I think it's just a bit of a tall order. We'll just have to see what happens in this race. If this race kicks off, yeah. it could it could change everything, couldn't it? Interestingly enough, I was speaking to uh, Chris Smiley, who's uh, the number one car just on your right-hand side, right in front of you. Speak to Chris this morning. He was very confident of uh, doing the business today. Um, he said the car was super fast, should have been on pole, was adamant that he should have been on pole, said that had a lot of oversteer at uh, Clearways, which is the last corner, and oversteer being the car, the rear end was sliding, and he couldn't quite pick the throttle up yeah. um, to, to get across the line. But, um, yeah, very, very difficult for, for, for Chris Smiley. But I think he could go well. Callum Newsham might be actually somebody to speak to, you know, because mm. he's done a cracking job. Yeah, he certainly has second in qualifying. We didn't expect that from him. He didn't expect that as well, either from him. So it would be great to see if we can jump in and uh, have a quick chat with the... Uh, well, we'll call him the Flying Scotsman out here, out there. Let's have a quick uh, word with him. Let me open the door here. Callum, right, that is a clear view down in towards Turn 1. Uh, we weren't expecting it, you weren't expecting it, but you put it on the front row. Uh, mate, for this one, uh, are you getting fully involved in this race? Yeah, this is it. It's got something to prove here, you know. I've got nothing no, to lose, so... And we know we have pace. We've had it all year, we've just not had good, any good luck, so... Yeah. I'm hoping for... Yeah. A podium or a win today. Exactly. That's what you need. Podium or a win, that's what we want to see. But honestly, Brand Satch, it's a completely dry circuit now. There's a bit of rubber out there. It's a bit of oil out there as well, I think. The, the marshals have had to clear up. But for you, happy, confident, ready to go racing, yeah? Yeah, I'm ready to go. Let's go. Yeah, that's what we need. Mate, best of luck. See you out there. Cheers, Callum. That's getting in the way there. I'll close your door. Hopefully I don't slam it too loud for him. Hopefully they don't close it as well. Cool, but right. He seems ready, he seems comfortable. I'll tell you who isn't ready. Jensen Brickley, pole man, stuck in the garage, done. He ain't gonna get out, he ain't taking pole. Just right. found that out from Goodyear. Right. Let's go and have a quick, 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 um, let's have a quick chat to Carl Bordley. It's all happening at the minute. Carl Bordley, this makes life a bit easier, doesn't it? Jensen Brickley stuck in the pits. Oh, is he? I didn't know that. Still doesn't make it too easy, though. Nah, it's never too easy, is it? But we're relaxed. We're going to do what we're going to do. Uh, see how the first couple of laps go. See how it pans out. Go from there. You're going to go for it, mate. Got to get it done early. Be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> Seems very relaxed. I'll leave you to it. They're going to talk your wheels up and they're going to let you go. A lot going on and lovely to see you uh, guys here. Dan Kirby's uh, mother and father. Oh, this is, uh, sister. Oh, I'm Dad, this is sister. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so sorry. Your sister. Sorry, your sister. What a great guy he was. The people are coming off the, uh, the, the, the wall now to get inside for this race. What a great guy, though. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, uh, it's the, the, the response from the motivation has been amazing, you know, uh, in this industry, it's all competition, all this kind of stuff, but he seemed to have such a flair amongst people. He used to take videos, say, well, this is the enemy and all this kind of stuff, but no, great, thank you so much. For, and thank you to TCR for uh, allowing uh, the car to race with his name today. Not a problem, it's been great. Do you want to follow us? Let's come off the grid together, because yeah. um, we've got to get going. But I want to say, Dan was a great guy. He knew me very well, I knew him. He did a lot for a lot of people, and he was a lovely, lovely, lovely man. So, we're going to let everybody go, and I think, hopefully, we can get over to the comms box. We can indeed, yep. 
TCR UK. The finale is coming up next. Don't go anywhere. Wouldn't miss it for the world. Well, what drama we have ahead of our first race of the day for TCR UK. Jensen Brickley, title contender, not taking the start of the race. He was due to start from pole position as well. So this now moves uh, everybody else up uh, into uh, an extra position higher. And uh, it means that Callum Newsham now essentially inherits the pole position uh, for this second, uh, first race of two this weekend. Uh, and uh, he will be gunning now for his first victory in TCR UK. And that also benefits Carl Bordley. A top four finish in this race for Carl Bordley would be enough to win the championship unless that man there, Carl 117 Adam Shepard, can somehow engineer a race victory. If Shepard wins the race, then Bordley needs to finish inside, the, needs to finish second, basically. Uh, if Shepard doesn't win the race, then top four is enough for Bordley. Right then, cars heading up towards Druids on their green flag lap. Callum Newsham starting from now, essentially pole position, but he will still line up on the outside of row number one. Alex Lee uh, will therefore start from third. There will be no Jensen Brickley though, and that is now his championship hopes shortly in tatters. Oh, he's at the end of the pit lane, we're hearing. Brickley at the end of the pit lane. OK, so he will take the start, but from the pit lane. Alex Lee then will start third alongside Chris Smiley, who's really up for a race win today. Keep an eye on the outgoing champion, Joe Marshall, and the championship leader, Carl Bordley, will share row number three. Row four, then, on the grid is where you will find Jack Constable and Adam Shepherd. Adam Shepherd uh, needs to win this race, realistically, to keep his championship hopes alive. But coming from eight from the grid, is not going to make that very easy at all. Scott Sumpton and Oliver Cotton, meanwhile, complete the top ten. Uh, Oliver Cotton, perhaps one to watch for in the reverse grid race later on. Then it is Andy Wilmot running that Dan Kirby tribute from 11th with Bruce Winfield, third in the championship, remember, Bruce. Uh, but he started all the way down in 12th on the grid. Uh, Hutchison and Luke Sargent are together on row number seven. Luke Sargent's been spectacular in the Elantra this weekend. Uh, then we've got Matthew Wilson and Daryl Wilson, the two Wilsons, as ever, inseparable, it seems, starting together on row number eight. Row nine for Gary Townsend and Rick Kerry. Row ten uh, is then where you will find uh, George Jackson, returning George Jackson, alongside Mark Smith in the Cupra. And then at the back of the field, Jeff Alden in the Opel Astra that was having overheating issues uh, in qualifying yesterday starting from the tail of the field. Now there is Jensen Brickley. Big drama this then. Brickley having to start from the pit lane after some sort of an issue delayed him getting out onto the track. That's heartbreak for the youngster who was a long shot for the championship, but if nothing else, uh, wanted to try and end his season uh, with a race victory if he could. Uh, but that is now going to be a tall order. But Callum Newsham starting for pole position has never won a race in TCR UK. Alex Lee starting alongside him, of course, uh, got his first ever pole position and race win here at Brands Hatch. Uh, in 2022, a year ago. So we know how rapid he is, whilst Carl Bordley essentially now starts fourth, knowing that as long as he keeps Shepard behind him, that could be enough for the championship. Here we go then, back row of the grid starts now uh, to form, and we get ready to go racing for 25 minutes, the penultimate round of the TCR UK Championship in 2023. Will Carl Bordley be crowned champion in half an hour's time? Let's find out, away they go. Good start seemingly made by Bordley, good one from Newsham as well. Can he cover off Alex Lee? No, I don't think he can. The second phase of the start is not good for Newsham and Chris Smiley will grab the advantage. Smiley round the outside into Paddock Hill Bender's got the lead and the reigning champion, the outgoing champion, heads them up the hill towards Druids. Lee second, Newsham third, Bordley safe for now in fourth but here comes Shepard up the inside, place is being gained already for the man second in the points and he's inside the top five right on the tail of his rival, that was Daryl Wilson and Brad Hutchison making contact further back. They both managed to keep going vaguely in the right direction but Smiley will lead the pack down the Cooper straight for the first time with Alex Lee Paul hot on his heel. Wow, what a start. Nightmare for um, Jensen Brickley, but what a start for Chris Smiley. And Chris was struggling coming in and out of clearways where we are now, but uh, Shepard and everyone involved in this championship battle are still there. Adam Shepard has to try and get past Carl Bordley. He will be as aggressive as he needs to be here to get past the Cooper driver and try to get up into that lead group, which makes its way through Paddock Hill Bend now for the second time. It's got something further back there, defending from Andy Wilmot, but Alex Lee looks like he's got really good pace. Only one race victory so far this year for Alex, a man who many tips 
picked for the title. Oh. He's wide on cold tyres, sideways at Druid's corner though. And Callum Newsham almost had an opportunity to get to the inside. Could not quite make it work though. No, but uh, I'll tell you what, you wouldn't want a really fast, um, you really want fast Alex Lee, would you, behind you? And that's what's happening. But look now, Adam Shepard, is that down the inside of Baldley? Oh. It was, it didn't work. Audley bravely closed the door, but Shepard is not going to be backwards about coming forwards here, is he? He's got to drive, make that move, and he's up the inside in the background. Shepard, I think, had made the move stick for fourth. Has he gone through? Yes, he has. So Shepard is ahead of Audley, but that is not yet enough. He needs to try and get into the podium places. And actually, Carl Audley coming back at him to the outside. Carl Audley looking feisty in the early stages, not going down fighting, but Adam Shepard should hang on. Well, yeah, he's got to be careful here. Joe Marshall now in the back of him. This is going to be interesting if he just lets Joe Marshall go. As his, his oh. teammate was in the background there, just getting a little bit of a nibble from someone. Uh, I think it was a Hyundai. I'm not too sure who it was. Bruce Winfield. But, uh, Bruce Winfield. Oh, and that's ah. going to be a safety car, Mark Smith back in the championship and in the gravel. Yeah, there had been, I think, Daryl Wilson through the gravel as well just before that, but he rejoined after a separate incident. No safety car yet, though. They're still racing at clearways, and Chris Smiley, despite getting the lead, Paul, doesn't have the pace to get away, does he? No, that car has been a little bit too understeery, hasn't it? Uh, yellows are on our screen. That's a safety car situation, but Chris Smiley will be able to catch his breath 20 minutes plus of having those two rascals behind you and that has done nothing for Carl Bordley that because now the gap that he would have had behind Joe Marshall really closes up now and he's got people he's got three of his championship protagonists right in front of him which is nice to see out of your windscreen but he's also got a hungry uh, Joe Marshall I think it is behind him so at the moment, it would be a 46-point advantage for Bordley. Remember, there'll be 41 points available after this race, 40 points for a win and a bonus point for the fastest lap in race two. So right now, Bordley is in a championship-winning position, but this safety car, Paul, has played beautifully into the hands of Adam Shepard because he'd broken into that fourth place but was a couple of seconds or so behind the leading three. That gap now vanishes, and Shepard looks like he's got really good race pace. He really does, yeah. Them Hyundai's look like they've just got fantastic race pace. This is going to be interesting what Shepard does because will he bother backing Bordley up into everybody else to drop him out of the point? I don't think he will. Uh, they don't have team radio, so he won't be au fait with what's going on. I think someone of his stature will just be trying to go for the race win. He needs as many points as he can score, so I think initially he needs to go forwards. If Bordley then starts going with him, maybe the time to, to play those games comes later in the race, but for now, Shepard needs to try and win this race. I think he might just have the pace to do it, especially with Smiley in front not seemingly having the pace. It was all getting very bunched up, and that's the kind of race situation that Adam Shepard really relishes. He's a good racer. His overtaking skills are up there amongst the best on this grid, and he's got absolutely nothing to lose. He's got to try and make that progress, and I think he might just have a chance to do so as and when we go racing. Jensen Brickley, by the way, uh, from the pit lane. I did just get an update from Phil Kinch. It was a gear actuator that failed, apparently, on Brickley's car, um, so that is what delayed him getting out. He has gone out, and of course he's another beneficiary now of the safety car. So the gear actuator on one of these paddle-shifted cars, what that will do is ask when you pull the lever to go up or down a gear, that will ask the compressor to generate some air and change the gear. So the actuator, like a turbo actuator, um, can move around and it can, it can select um, a gear for you, so obviously big problem there um, this shouldn't take too long they'll get this out of the way maybe pull it now away f he's not going to he could drive that yeah there's no damage I don't think is there mm -hmm. so it should be okay and great work by the marshals there to get him out of the way quickly is he driving the car yes he is isn't he so that's good news, but a gravel on the track. Oh, right where you don't want it in the compression at the bottom of Paddock Hill, Ben Paul. I will guarantee <laughs> he's been told not to do that. Because <laughs> the marshals hate that. Because that's more work and that could put another lap on it because there's no way they can leave that track like it is. It's like putting it's like putting oil down. It's like I always say to people, it's like a, a Mickey Mouse, not Mickey Mouse. Um what's his what's the mouse? Tom and Jerry. It's like Tom and Jerry when they run after each other when they're and someone puts marbles down, it's exactly like that. So the cars will be slipping and sliding. The 117, as usual, looking very rear endy in its first um, few uh, few corners. But he's got it all under control now, and I think he'll be. Oh, wow. 
Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> that is not good. I mean, it, it, just explain why that's not good, Paul, because you're coming over the top of a blind crest, a quick corner, you're leaning on the car, and then at the bottom of that compression, the car is fully loaded, isn't it? Yeah, fully loaded. You'll be asking a lot out of the, uh, the left-hand sided tyres. The car will probably be losing rear grip anyway, even if the gravel wasn't there. Then the gravel will make the car slide even more, safety car lights are out. Um, but what it will do is it'll smash a lot of windscreens as well, so it's not great. But this is going to be the start of all starts. They're back together, this is it. Right, then what can Adam Shepard do? Can he win this race and keep his championship hopes alive? He's made good progress in the early laps. He's caught the leading three courtesy of the safety car, but now more work to be done. Chris Smiley hits the loud pedal, heads for clearways, no overtaking before the cars cross the timing line, remember? But Alex Lee is going to be right there, isn't he? Sideways through clearways. Shepard's had a good restart as well. He's on the tail uh, of Callum Newsham as they head for the restart of the race. 18 minutes to go, and it's all still to play for. Wow. Towards Paddock Hill, Ben, they go. Good restart from Smiley. Smiley actually Lee was close but then had that little bit of oversteer through the middle of clearways and that means that Smiley doesn't then have to defend into Paddock Hill Bend. There goes Scott Sumpton, Smiley's restart racing teammate a bit further back. They're all cleanly through Paddock. Thankfully the gravel starts to clear uh, but Adam Shepard is right on the boot lid now of Callum Newsham who has been as fast as I think I've ever seen him this weekend actually Paul. Mm -hmm. Yep he's been right on it. He's had some horrendous luck as yeah. Callum Newsham and this is where he belongs to be honest. This is He's as quick as anyone in the same car and he's proven it. He's unlucky not to our pole actually yesterday I thought he'd done it to be honest but um, yeah this is looking good oh someone was having a right old look at Callum Newsham that Shepard couldn't quite get to the inside though Newsham defended as he's uh, every right to do there's nothing here to say that Callum Newsham or Chris Smiley just because they're not in the championship fight they don't have to move aside and put the indicator on and wave Shepard through they're going to race four podiums especially someone like Callum who has had so little to smile about really uh, this season he wants to try and go after a race win himself out of panic they go Bordley at the moment quite safe you'd say at the back of this group he's got a gap back to Joe Marshall quite content I think just to let this play out in front of him yeah exactly that but look how close they all are and this is going to start concertina in up because Alex Lee lost a bit of pace on that restart flashing his lights now <laughs> so now Alex is going to be right into Chris Malley I, Chris Malley's going to get jumped here because watch the gap that closes the turning of the um, of the Hyundai is so good. He's, he's right into him, and I think that is going to back a lot of people up and cause a few people a problem. But I've got to say, Chris Mann has got a right old exit from uh, the last corner. It's getting off the corner as well, the Honda, isn't it? But it's just going into the corner. That's what he struggled with all year. Says it feels a bit lazy. He's not <laughs> turning into the turn well enough. Callum Newsham peeking to the inside of Alex Lee there for second. Did that work? No, not <laughs> quite. And Alex Lee manages to hang on, but a little bit of a battle in front of Adam Shepard is really what Shepard wants to see. It might open a door for him to break through of course these are all identical cars i30 and hyundai's different weights in all of them uh, callum newsham will be the lightest of the three presumably uh, but identical cars in theory and that will make shepherd's job even harder i've got to say the pace is so slow 49 49 dead is an, is oliver cotton um fastest lap i mean that is that is to be fair that's pretty quick that's only a few tenths off his qualifying but why i say the pace is so slow is the leader has done a 49-3. Wow. These cars should be well into the 48 by now. But the trouble is, though, Smiley is not very quick everywhere else around the track. The one place he's strong is exiting clearways, and that means that he's not then under threat into Paddock Hill Bend. So as much as I think the cars behind him have more pace, where do they find a way through? Because it takes Lee the rest of the lap then to get back within striking range. Yeah, that is the problem. But if Alex Lee can get Ooh. close enough, we know he'll put pressure on Chris Smiley, even though Chris is a is a touring car winner around the country um, in different series. But this uh, headlights are on. Problem Alex Lee's got is Callum Newsham is so fast. He's got to watch how he attacks. And this is where it's going to come. He's got to get down the inside. But that car is, is looking the strongest I've ever seen it, that FL7 Honda. Yes, it is. Look at the traction it's got out of Clearway's corner. Wow. Chris Smiley amazingly winless in his title defence year. He's not going to win the title for a second year running like uh, Lewis Kent did a couple of seasons ago. Here comes Callum Newsham from the outside to the inside. There is just a chink of an opening. Alex Lee had to leave the door Ooh. open, and that will delay them both through the apex. Still, though, Lee hangs on. Yeah. And sorry, I keep grabbing your arm. It's That's just I keep, seeing, <laughs> I keep seeing purple sectors and a 40. 8855 wow. is Brickley, Jensen Brickley, battling down there in 14th, but still he's 
he's got a gap to Luke Sargent in front of him and he's just chipping away and he'll have the fastest lap, I'm sure of it. Everyone is just in one long line, all the way back to Oliver Cottam in ninth. It's a nine car train for the lead because Chris Smiley just doesn't have the pace to break away. Lunge up the inside. That was Jack Constable against Joe Marshall. Oh, Teammates oh. wheel to wheel. Lovely move, Paul. Oh, stunning that is. And he's going to bring, is he going to bring Winfield with him? Oh, this could get tasty. Watch out now, the two Audis. No. Constable just thinks, right, well, I'll keep my foot in, and Marshall comes out the throttle. I thought I did see someone slowing on the Cooper straight, but I'm not sure. Well, you don't want to be taking too much of that curve. That'll rip a tyre off the rim. Scott Sumpton and Andy Wilmot have both pitted Paul, so I wonder if that's what you spotted. Um, they were quite close to each other. I don't know whether they've tangled or it's just coincidence, but those two seemingly out of the race, as I'm afraid, is George Jackson. Here, though, comes Alex Lee. He's closer at this part of the circuit than he has been. Looks to the inside at Surt. He's got to try and pass just to try and distract Chris Smiley, but that is where the Hyundai is stronger. There's no way through on the inside at clearways, though. Smiley knows he can go in defensive, but still get the drive off the corner. And look, the gap just grows again. Yeah, the... the Lee would, Lee would be really attacking every lap. He just can't because Callum no. Newsham is so, so close. Adam Shepard dropping away a bit. Callum Newsham looks like the quickest kid yeah. on the block here. It's the outside, at Paddock Hill Bend, looking for the switch back. Oh, that's Dan Kirby out of, uh, sorry, that's, uh, uh, that is out of the pit lane, Andy Wilmot. I knew I'd make that mistake. And he rejoins right in front of the leaders. Alex Lee goes to the outside line. Chris Smiley was delayed in all of that. And this might just work now. Around the outside goes Alex Lee. There's oh. leaning on each other, two wheels on the grass. He's going to keep on coming to the inside line. There's going to be another rope, surely, at the apex. <laughs> and watch for Newsham and Shepard. They could oh. be three wide down the back straight. Newsham. Gavin Newsham on the grass on the inside line has to bail out Shepherd. of it. Is Smiley going to hang on? No, Lee goes through Shepard around the outside for third. It's all kicking off, Paul. Oh, it is, but he's going to get in the back of him. Yeah, give him the tap. Oh. Alex Lee sideways gets the car going. Look at Callum Newsham round the outside still. Oh, Look at the first to 98,000th place. It's all together. Bordley, watch out, son. Oh. Round the outside. Don't be stupid. Oh, wow. Shall Smiley back up the inside of Lee. Did Shepard get back ahead? Oh, Bordley, they're side oh. by side at the apex of Paddock Hill Bend. These are risks that Bordley does not want to be taking, but he really hasn't got much choice. He manages to find a gap in the line just in front of Jack Constable, who's got Joe Marshall to the outside again. Chris Smiley now leaning on Callum Newsham out of Druid's corner. Well, that nearly ended in tears. Alex Lee should now have the pace to escape. Bruce Winfield comes up the inside of Jack Constable. Proper stuff, Paul. Oh, brilliant racing this is. I don't know how many times i said it. Cottam is down the inside of Winfield as well. Gets that job done. That will be difficult to get back across him. Can he get it done? No, Winfield. He'll have to come back and try and switch across because Andy Wilmot is trying to get back in, but he's lapped. Look at the overlap from that Audi. Go Ooh. on, son. Oh, oh he had to pull out. Yeah, had to there. The door was always going to close, wasn't it? So Lee leads by nearly a second now. Smiley second, Newsham third, Shepard fourth, and Carl Wardley still provisionally in a championship winning position in fifth. There goes Andy Wilmot, now a lap down, unfortunately. That pit exit always is tricky, and he very nearly sparked absolute chaos amongst the leading group. Uh, Lee for the win now looks pretty nailed on, but Callum Newsham wants to try and get oh. past Chris Smiley quickly to then go after oh. the race leader. Tries the inside at Graham Hill, Ben, but you don't see many successful passes. Is there, do you? No, you don't. That that usually ends in a car getting doored off the circuit. So yeah, a lot going on. But that that uh, that Honda's just starting to struggle. Uh, not so much on turning. It gets in it, into clearways and our clearways fantastically. And um, but it's just the, like you said, the first sector of the circuit is very difficult for it. But Bordley has now got a great run. He's going to have to make Shepard defend. Will he bother trying to get past him? You don't want to rattle that hornet's nest, but there's two Audis that are looking to get past him now as well. If you're Carl Bordley, Paul, what do you do? Fifth place is enough for the championship. He probably knows that. He'll have done the maths before the race. But you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. He's getting bunched in behind Adam Shepard. He's got the pressure from the Rob Boston cars behind. Do you attack and try and just keep on racing like you normally would? Or do you just try and box Clever? Because sometimes that can get you in more trouble. Yeah, firstly, you ring your mum. <laughs> because it's that upsetting that you've got to deal with this. Yeah, this is really... He's got to pick his fights very, very closely here. I mean, I would trust Joe Marshall, to be fair, and I would trust Jack Constable. I, I mean, I would drop two places just to get out of this melee. But at the same time, if the car's strong enough to defend, then I would be quite happy to, uh, to try and stay where I am and just make sure I get the run. It's just how desperate that these guys in the Audis, the Rob Boston Audis, can be behind them because that's going to be a big problem as Jensen Brickley comes through still with the fastest lap. He's up to 10th. That is a fantastic, fantastic um, effort, that, to get up there.
Side by side again, Callum Newsham to the outside this time of Chris Smiley. Now again, not trying to go right round the outside, but trying to get that switch back. The oh, Honda seemingly sick. struggling off Graham Hill then, but just manages to keep ahead. This is all going to bunch everything back together again though. And of course, Adam Shepard is waiting in the wings to capitalise. So oh, there's not quite a gap on the inside. It's a Braille pass, is it? Nudges Smiley wide into clearways, but then we know the Honda will get off the corner well and should be able to hang on down the straight. That brings Shepard now onto the boot lid of Callum Newsham. And Shepard has to make some progress here yes yeah, got to got to got to I mean he's gonna start getting a bit desperate now but look at Bordley's come back into it he's not dropped Marshall but he's now starting to look square at the rear of uh, Adam Shepard here but uh, great driving this I mean there's some instances where cars could have been turned sideways and put in the barrier but they've not done that and it's great to see Bordley looking to the inside of Shepard. Shepard needs to either gain some more places here or hope that Bordley loses some more places to keep the championship alive. But I think it might have to be a combination of the two, actually, because it's only really the two Audis who are within striking range of Carl Bordley. Ten-second penalty, by the way, for track limits for Darrell Wilson. That keeps on uh, racking up lap by lap, seemingly. Whilst Jensen Brickley, driver of the race by far, he's into the top ten already. I think he's ninth now, ahead of Oliver Cottam. Could he yet be a factor in this championship battle? Maybe not for himself, but could he catch that lead group? Well, I wouldn't say no because because of how fast he is. I mean, Winfield just defends. It depends how he defends, sorry. And then everyone in front is just holding each other up. Look at the gap now that Alex Lee's got. It's like two and a half seconds. So. There could be a second place on the cards here. It'd be a good effort if he gets past a load of people in eight minutes. Well, yes, but it could all kick off ahead of him, couldn't it? Because, look, Shepard has dropped away now noticeably from Smiley and Newsham. Whether that's intentional or not, I don't know. But the effect it will have is it slows Carl Bordley down and perhaps puts him in a world of bother. Worth pointing out as well that it's not just the fight for the championship that these drivers are thinking about, but second, third, fourth, fifth and sixth in the points. Very close indeed. Bruce Winfield extra motivated to keep Jensen Brickley behind because they're only five points apart at the moment as they fight. Uh, for fourth in the points. Alex Lee would move to third, whilst here Jensen Brickley tries to move up into eighth place in the race. Looks to the outside of a struggling Bruce Winfield who just has not got his head around that car this weekend. He hops over the curb, runs out wide. Should be job done for Brickley. Yeah, Oliver Cotton needs to be closer here and try to get down the inside. This is going to open up a treat. Oliver, you've just got to be careful. All Oliver really needs to do is finish in that top ten and get the reverse pole. Oh, he's going to try it down the inside. Oh. That's going to be close. He's got to be careful here because Brad Hutchison could catch them up very quickly yes he could and uh will not coming to play as well he's not fighting for position with those cars remember Chris smiley meanwhile a herculean defensive drive this has been he's really playing to the strengths of that honda but wow. he's having to work hard here to keep callum newsham behind him down the pit straight they go honda versus hyundai as they head for paddock hill bend darrell wilson's now picked up a drive through penalty wow. for exceeding track limits he's all the way down in 15th place but he's attracted the attention of the clerk of the course regardless we've got six and a quarter minutes to go and still chris smiley defends this second position while Shepard is very much still defending from Carl Bordley behind. Wow, look at that now. He's just stopping the car Ooh. in its weakest point. And Callum Newsham's going to have to just have a big lunge if he's going to get past because there's just nowhere for him to get past. From now on, there is nowhere for him to, to get inside uh, car, uh, Chris Smiley. It's got to be that late lunge at Clearways, hasn't it? But Smiley knows it's coming every lap and always seems to have it covered. While Joe Marshall back ahead of Judd Constable now after the uh, little swap around that they had earlier on. He's not really applying a huge amount of pressure to Carl Bordley, is he? So Carl will be reasonably relaxed still. Warning now for Adam Shepard for track limits as well. Just a warning, not a penalty, but he needs to be a little bit careful. Chris Smiley into Paddock Hill Bend. Callum Newsham right behind him all over the curbs coming out of the first corner. He's just not close enough then to lunge into Druids. In the background, meanwhile, Jensen Brickley on the previous lap did a 48.8. He's a second a lap quicker, Paul, than the group of cars ahead of him. That's crazy stuff, isn't it? But, you know, he is. He's got the most compensation weight. He's got 40 <laughs> kilos um, compensation weight for the, the uh, balance of performance. And there he is flashing. He is going to be on. He's going to be on these. And this could cause carnage as they all start to defend and attack. At what point should I remind everyone that he and Carl Bordley have some history this year? They've got together a couple of times on track, haven't they? And there's a chance they might yet meet again before this race is over. Uh, Brickley, of course, came into this race as an outside bet for the championship. Into Paddock Hill, Ben, they go. Smiley, Newsham, Shepard, Bordley. Uh, then it is uh, Marshall Constable and Brickley, who that time around does a 
28.9, another eight tenths quicker than the car ahead. He'll be with them within the next couple of corners, but then he's got to try and work his way through a very, very tightly knit bunch of cars. That is absolutely crazy, that is. The speed and the... the the slicing past people. That oh. Car. oh, Chris Miley's got a problem. Lights are off as well. Oh, oh, lights come back on. Did he lose power for a second? I the think car he's down, didn't yeah. it? Yeah, there's an electrical problem with that FL7. He's had this before, hasn't he, as well? Remember back to Croft, a similar thing kept happening. That caused a non finish, and uh, oh. Oh, it's cost him seconds. Will he hang on to a podium? It all seems good for now, doesn't no, it? No, it's oh, gone no. again. Oh no, heartbreak for Smiley, through goes Shepard, through goes Bordley, and the fairy tale comes crashing down around the reigning champion. Chris Smiley drove his heart out in this race and is not going to be rewarded for it. Uh, through goes Newsham into second, he's 5.3 seconds behind Alex Lee. That is too late, unfortunately, for him to challenge for victory, but your heart bleeds for Chris Smiley. He does not deserve this. Not at all, no. And look, you can just see now, Carl Bordley is just coasting this home. He just needs to stay behind Adam Shepard. Adam Shepard knows he's got nothing else in his locker now, and Bordley will be happy just to maybe even let an Audi through at the minute behind him. He's 46 points clear, needed to be 41 ahead at the end of this race, so he could afford to lose a position or two, maybe, but not much more than that. There is Smiley limping through Clearway's corner within the final five minutes of the race. It's heartbreak for restart racing. Now, what can Jensen Brickley do? Remember, he started from the pit lane instead of pole position where he should have been, and he's now into seventh place on the tail of Jack Constable, and if he can clear Jack quickly, he might yet have chance to gain some more places. Yeah, and it's coming, isn't it? Brickley is now. If you can clear one of these Audis, he'll have a chance at the next uh, the next three cars bunched up in oh. front. Oh, that could be a difficult one. Is he going to try and get back on the switch back? Oh, he tries it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> clever driving that from Jack. Very clever driving. But it's going to drop him away from the pack, and Brickley ain't going to get uh, any more positions now. Adam Shepard really seems to be down on pace as well. He's also got a load of leaves or grass or something in his radiator grill. There then, provisionally, is the way that the championship looks at the moment. Carl Bordley on 379 points would be in an unassailable position over Adam Shepard. So right now, Bordley on course for the title. Shepard would be 12 ahead of Alex Lee, who's moving himself right back into contention uh, for a top two spot come season's end. Whilst Bruce Winfield, Jensen Brickley dropped down the order ever so slightly. That is with two minutes of racing still to go. And here comes Bordley to the outside of Shepard, there was almost a bit of paint trade in there. Shepard is really, really low on pace, and that backs Bordley up almost into Jack Constable. Brickley has gone, sorry, into uh, Joe Marshall. Brickley's past Constable, and Adam Shepard, all of a sudden, his pace has deserted him, Paul. Yeah, very much so. That's, yeah, that ain't so good, is it? But now Bordley will know. He'll know that the people in front of him and the people behind him, they'll know, he'll know where they are, and he'll know that this should be enough. Yes, but we're going to have two more laps of racing here, and Brickley is with them. If Shepard keeps on running at this sort of pace, Brickley is perhaps the man to watch then. He's flashing the lights now at Joe Marshall, who so far has been quite content, it seems, to just follow Carl Ward. He doesn't seem to want to get involved uh, in the championship fight at all, but you can bet your bottom dollar that Jensen Brickley won't be of the same opinion. So keep an eye to the car fourth in this group, Jensen Brickley, who has uh, put together one of the comeback drives of the season here to get himself into sixth place. He's all over the back of Joe Marshall. Carl Bordley again nibbling at the rear bumper of Adam Shepard as they drop down through Graham Hill Bend and head along the Cooper Strait for the penultimate time of asking. It is still Alex Lee who leads the way, remember, by four seconds. That gap coming down quite quickly, but Callum Newsham, I still think, is going to run out of time. Here comes Brickley almost into the back of Joe Marshall as they head for clearways. Mm. I'll tell you what, Br the last thing that Bordley will want to see is, is Brickley <laughs> flashing his lights to get an Audi out of the way to have a go at him. Uh, I don't think that would actually do much to the championship points, would it, if he got past Bordley? No. But, uh, yeah, he won't want to see that. <laughs> no, but of course, the danger is that if Brickley did have a go at Bordley, it could open the door for the Audis to come through as well. But I don't think he's going to get there, really, because uh, that little bit of a gap between Bordley and Marshall is just a little bit too big. Through Druids they go. Shepard understeering quite badly, it seems, out of Druids, taking a very slow, wide line but they're managing to cover it off into Graham Hill Bend. The lead gap came down to 3.4 seconds this time around. Callum Newsham charging after Alex Lee, but the chequered flag will await at the end of this final lap of what's been a scintillating opening.
opening race of the weekend, the penultimate round of the championship, a second victory in 2023 for Alex Lee, who moves himself into the top three in the points with that victory. Callum Newsham second, third will be Adam Shepard, but fourth place is enough for the championship for Carl Bordley. Carl Bordley is provisionally your 2023 TCR UK champion after a nerve-wracking 25 minutes of racing. What a performance that was from Carl. The pressure he was under there, Paul, to not put a foot wrong. You can see the witness marks on the front of the car. He's not had an easy 25 minutes, has he? But it was worth the effort. It really was. I mean, you could say he's had a pretty easy season. Um, he has been head and shoulders above anyone in the first half of the year. But then, for me, Brickley come back at yeah. him. Um, fantastic drives and everybody else had a go. Adam Shepard was superb um, the latter half of the season. It's been a great year, but my congratulations personally to Carl Bordley. I remember the phone call I had with him when he was talking about what to race. And I said, have you have ever heard of British? <laughs> have you ever heard of TCR UK? Do you want to do the circuits you know? Do you want to have a proper go at a championship? And he was like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I can get a car. He got older one and he's gone for it. So fair, fair play to him. And honestly, his enjoyment has increased as the year's gone on as well. I made the comment that he was the grumpiest man at Snetterton at the season <laughs> opener because everything was going wrong. He was really questioning all the decisions he'd made. Told me yesterday he seriously considered not coming back for the rest of the season. And yet he did come back and every round that's gone on, he's really started to realise how much fun this is. And uh, obviously it's more fun when you win races and win championships. And it really was that run, wasn't it, from sort of uh, Alton, Knock Hill into Donington, where he just kept on winning races. Four wins out of five at one point through the middle of the season. And whilst others had misfortune, that was enough ultimately to give him this lead, which he's defended to the end. Shout out to Alex Lee, though. He drove a really mature race there, actually, I thought, Paul. Whilst he was boxed in behind Chris Smiley, didn't lose his head, didn't get impatient or over aggressive, waited for the opportunity. Nice to see Alex back on the top step. Yeah, absolutely stunning. Like you said, I don't think that boy's won enough. He's, he's good enough to have been champion for me, um, but just didn't get the rub of the green. But uh, that is uh, Alex showing us what he's all about. Adam Shepard's had a fantastic year. I know it's not all over yet. He's got uh, second place to battle for in the championship, but um, it has been a great, a great year for TCR UK. I'd say probably the best year I've seen. Uh, the Gen 2 cars coming along has made it amazing. Gen 1 cars with their own championship for next year uh, will be stunning. But this will be, uh, this will be nice to see Carl Bordley celebrating this championship. I know that um, he was. Uh, some people, like you say, I'm the same. I would say he's a bit. Um, a bit boring sometimes and, uh, <laughs> and a bit uh, a bit angry but he got the anger into his car and he drove absolutely stunning and uh, he's probably just been told now that he's done it it doesn't strike me as a particularly emotional man Carl Bordley maybe he was just wiping a bead of sweat off his uh, forehead then as he pulled into uh, the pit lane but I'm sure the realization of what he's achieved is now starting to dawn on him I agree with you this has been for me the most competitive year of TCR racing so far and for him to come out on top means the world finally he gets the release he gets to celebrate uh, a fantastic season long performance that he's put together a champion's drive uh, today and throughout the rest of the year Stuart Lyons the championship promoter is there to give him a hug best prize of all quite frankly he gets the Goodyear winner's cap as well and we will I'm sure get a chance to chat to uh, Carl. I know he wasn't on the podium, but we will get a chance to speak to him in a moment. And uh, these are the moments that you live for as a racing driver, aren't they, Paul? <laughs> you don't live for that. Kiss off Nick Hart. <laughs> no, you're all right. No, you're dead right, mate. And uh, great to see. They work so hard on that side of the garage. And um, yeah, this is fantastic stuff. That car has been super, super stunning to watch. And Carl is a great driver, is a great thinker and he doesn't put himself in danger, and that's what's gotten a lot of points this year. Yeah, really classy drives at Donington, I thought, when the pace wasn't necessarily there, but he still managed to bank some good points. Silverstone, uh, he just sort of sat and let the races come to him, made sure he looked after his car, looked after his tyres. Uh, we've seen a lot of that this year, and I think that's his experience through the years, isn't it, really starting uh, to show. Lovely. And it means <laughs> that he has indeed won the TCR UK Championship for 2023. Let's head down there then and hear from our podium finishers and I'm sure our champion uh, with Anthony Jordan. 
Thank you very much, guys. What a race that was all the way to the flag for the championship. But Carl Bordley comes away with that provisionally. Of course, we have to say provisionally. He is everything. He's the TCI UK champion. He is the Tom Walker champion and the Goodyear Diamond champion. Carl, I know you want to celebrate with everyone there as well. Carl, let's have a quick chat, mate. 2023 was your season, I think. A big relief for you as uh, you almost put a massive dent in the top of that car. Well done. Oh, I'm not worried about the car now, am I? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, yeah, mass massive. Yeah, <laughs> it's one of them. Mate, I can imagine you're emotional out there, mate. Honestly, this season, it, the start, it wasn't going your way, but the back end of it, it all came your way. And right now, it's just been a picture perfect. And look at that, the signs out, look at that, brilliant. Yeah, it's just thanks to everyone behind me, you know, uh, parents, uh, my wife, my kids, all the team. Without them, you know, I wouldn't even be here, let alone be stood here with, um, you know, with, with this championship and stuff like that. So, yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely made up. Um, it's probably been a long time coming for another championship because I think it's, it must be a good 12 or so years since I've won, you know, won an overall championship in anything. So, um, yeah, I, it's not really a lot else I can say at the minute, mate. Um, yeah, it's just great to to come back from some struggles, some health struggles a few years back. Uh, yeah, and doing what we uh, what we love to do. Yeah, it's what you need, mate. Congratulations. I'll let you bask in the glory in this one. Enjoy it with your team. Carl Bordley, 2023 TCR UK champion. But that can't be taken away. You can't take it away from Alex Lee, though, wherever Alex is, right here beside me. Alex, mate, a P1 in that one. That was a race. We had a quick chat before the start of it as well. Just saying, mate, head down, crack on, do your best. You certainly delivered in that one. What a race. Yeah, so happy with it. P1. Yeah, I can't. <laughs> so happy. Um, it was a good race. I had hard battles with Chris. Once I managed to get through, it was just a case of just going as fast as I can every lap. But that time to do it again in race two. So. Yeah. Exactly. You got the reverse grid in that one, of course. You'll be starting a little further down, but uh, you had some decent pace out there as well. You look like one of the quickest drivers out there as well in the latter stages. So, you know, all is well uh, with the car and ready to come away with uh, maybe coming up a few spots in the championship as well. Yeah, I hope so. I, I, I just need to like, do the same again. Just try to try, try do the best I can, get the best result and then, yeah. Mate, solid result. Well done. Congratulations. And uh, I'll let you celebrate with the team as well. Brilliant result there for Alex Lee. We'll jump over to second place, Callum Newsham, uh, who also had a fabulous race. Callum, uh, the sun was shining on you today. Not the start you would have wanted, but still, you came away with that one. A brilliant result, P2. Yeah, I'm happy with that, but a shocking start from me. <laughs> Just got tons of wheel spin and yeah, I got all bottled up behind Smiley for the rest of the race. So I couldn't get, couldn't get past him, but he had an issue which set me free a bit. But he was far too gone ahead. So, But yeah, I'm happy with that. First yeah. podium of the year, which is good. Championship's pretty well, oh, well it's settled now. Bordley's won that one, which means race two's coming up uh, soon. Uh, it's going to be all elbows out in that one, maybe a few more positions, because like you say, it's still, uh, still a great track to go racing on here, isn't it, Brands? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a brilliant track. But I think everyone's going to be out for the win now, or out for a podium now, aren't they? Because it's all finished now. So well, congratulations to Bordley. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was a good race. Brilliant. Well done for you as well, P2. I'll let you celebrate with the team and enjoy that one. Cheers, thank you. Excellent stuff there for Callum. Let's jump in with uh, Adam Shepard, who finishes that one, P3. Uh, Adam, again, another brilliant result for you. Another podium as well at the end of the season. Still one more race to go. But uh, obviously, championship settled. But for you, are you still happy with the result? Yeah, pleased with the result. Um, we've got some sort of power issue, which we need to go look at. So um, fingers crossed we can get that sorted. But um, no, pleased with the result. We couldn't do much more. Started seventh, ended up third. So uh, overall, decent, yeah. Yeah. What were you thinking during that race, having obviously you had Bordley behind you from the majority of it, and it was just thinking, we think he tried to defend as much as possible, not let him get past, but it looked like yeah. a close race. Yeah, it was. Um, I was trying to stay with the two ahead. It was just, um, I was losing like four car limbs up the main straight. So it was uh, them battling wasn't doing me many favours because it was slowing me back up but I was it's a mixed bag I didn't know whether to push forwards and try and attack and get more positions or back Carl into the pack, pack behind and um, yeah we just didn't really have much more pace to go forward so that's where we here where we ended up yeah certainly so race uh, two coming up later on today obviously everything's settled you still got a championship position to fight for though yes. second uh, to fight for uh, how are we feeling for that one is it still uh, fingers crossed for it yeah fingers crossed we go um, see if we can go get the car sorted uh, make some tweaks and then uh, yeah again fill attack and try and secure second now 
That's what you need, isn't it, mate? Uh, we'll let you crack on with that one. But uh, congratulations on that one. Another podium, a great way to uh, start the weekend here. Yes, yeah, yeah, Brent. Cheers. Excellent. Cheers there for Adam Shepard. Well, there it is. Champion crowned. Are your top three out there as well? A brilliant race for uh, Alex Lee and for Callum Newsham and for Adam Shepard. We're going to cut to an ad break. Don't go anywhere. There is plenty more racing to come up today. wonder why your competitors' websites appear in Google searches ahead of you? Then make a call to the SEO experts Woya and understand how your business can be more visible online. As the official marketing partner of TCR UK, you can now work with a trusted search engine optimization partner to increase web traffic, inquiries and sales. Speak to us for your free audit and quote by visiting woya.co.uk today. The voice and data solutions at speeds that are simply out of this world. Choose Maximum Networks. Well, it is finals time here at the Formula Ford Festival. Not the grand final just yet. That's coming up towards the end of the day. But uh, the historic grand final, the historic final, uh, is about to uh, take place here. 15 laps around the Brands Hatch Indy Circuit for some of the cars uh, that are not the latest specification Formula Ford. Uh, but we give them an opportunity here uh, to compete for their own trophy, to compete for uh, their own title of festival winner and always a really competitive race this. Richard Higgins has got the pole position, Henry Chart starts alongside him, they've completed the green flag lap already, and we're away and racing in the historic final, and a great start made by Henry Chart from the outside of row one. Is it enough to get the lead though? No, it's not. Richard Higgins uh, is gonna hang on in the white car on the inside line. Dan Rennie Larson there in the yellow number 40 further back, getting stuck in. Higgins leads the way, and up into second place comes Gaius Ginn in the number 61, but up the inside, well, in fact, they're three wide at Druid's corner. Ginn ends up sort of sandwiched in the middle. Henry Chark goes around the outside, and I think Sam Street was the other uh, in that group, looking to try and move forward. Down through Graham Hill, at Bend we head for the first time. And a clean start is made by the historic final grid. Uh, will Richard Higgins be able to break away at the front of the field? I wonder, Henry Charter has shown some good pace this weekend, and there are a few further back who we also know to be pretty quick. 
uh, who didn't have the rub of the green in their semi-finals earlier on, which helps to dictate the grid uh, for the historic final as well. So one lap in the books, a clean start to the race, and Richard Higgins doing his best to try uh, and escape out in front. Side by side here behind him, though, this is for second place. It's Sam Street on the inside of Henry Chart, who hangs tough around the outside, ends up way wide into the gravel slightly with the left-hand side tyres, and that means that Sam Street's going to have a good opportunity on the inside at Druid to move through into second, which he does. So Sam Street, uh, having started fourth on the grid, up into second place already. Now, does he have the pace, I wonder, to chase after Richard Higgins in front? It's hard to tell sometimes because they've come through the heats and the semi-finals. They may not have been in the same uh, heats and semi-finals as each other. So um, it means that we haven't really seen a lot of Sam versus Richard directly together on track. So uh, we'll have to look towards the lap times to see uh, what, the, uh, what the pace is that they've got. This lap time, the first full flying lap of the race about to be completed. Richard Higgins does a 50 51.8, Sam Street a 52.1, three tenths slower, but of course he was battling for that position uh, through the opening couple of corners of the race. So down through Paddock Hill Bend comes the leading gaggle. I would say that gap is maybe starting to creep down now slightly though. 17 there, Dieter Hackel in fifth position, the yellow car. He's got the Duckham livery machine, Duckham's livery machine of Callum Grant behind. Now Callum Grant started eight, he's moved up a couple of spots into sixth there, one of the older cars on the grid, but a bit of a giant killing performance as we're used to seeing really from Callum, more than capable of mixing it with cars that were built a couple of decades later in some cases. Uh, and uh, maybe could be a contender for a podium finish. In fact, he slips up the inside there of Dieter Hackel and does move through uh, into 15th position. So leaders come through then. What was a 1.2 um, second gap comes down to 1.1 seconds. A fractionally quicker uh, was Sam Street. Uh, here, meanwhile, is Callum Grant back on the inside of uh, Dieter Hackel, whose car, I think, is a little bit quicker down the straights. But then uh, Callum Grant, better on the brakes into Paddock Hill Bend, manages to reclaim that fifth place had briefly taken uh, up at Clearways a moment or two earlier. Out of Druids, four laps, on lap four of 15. Purple first sector, by the way, for Henry Chart that time around. So Henry Chart, who started on the front row, seemed to get a good initial jump, but again, was maybe then outpowered by uh, some of the cars around him. And, um, now starting to build up some pace again, trying to reel in those top two. And in fact, he is now on the tail of Sam Street, but it's going to be difficult for him to pass Sam, uh, because again, Sam, in a much newer car, should have that advantage in the straight line. It's not a big advantage, though, in fairness, is it? And uh, Henry Charles uh, is starting to ask some questions of him. Sets another fastest lap this time, actually, Henry Charles, 51.6, three tenths quicker than the race leader. If he could clear Sam Street quickly, he might yet have a chance to go for a race win. Looks to the outside through Druid's corner, cuts back to the late apex. They'll be side by side down the hill towards Graham Hill Bend, but Graham Hill Bend is a left hander, and so Henry Chart tries to get to the inside line. It doesn't quite pay off, but a spirited effort nonetheless there to break through into uh, second spot. Scott Woodward once again joins me in the commentary box to uh, talk through this historic final. We're a third of the way through already, Scott. Richard Higgins not miles ahead. I think Henry Chart's still thinking at this point that he could be a race winner. I think so. Also, maybe not count at Callum Grant either. He's just managed to get around Guy's Ginn to see what his lap times are like as we come on to lap six of this historic final, of course, for the Brian Jones Memorial Trophy, named after the great man, the voice of Brands Hatch himself. I'm sure that uh, he was still around. He would absolutely love seeing these older cars battling out amongst each other. There goes Callum having a look up the inside. Ginn goes back around the outside and repasses Callum Grant for fourth place. Now they're coming with the threat from Dieter Harkel from Germany. Now up the hill they go towards Druids once again. Because Callum Grant in that distinctive Duckham's livery. That's exactly the same car that a certain Mark Goosens ran in last year's festival. Now, of course, renumbered to Callum's regular number 43, but still sporting the old school Duckham's livery. Coming up to put a lap on car 29. That's Montoya Baker. She's making her festival debut. There's a, there's a black and white track limit, so I've gone out for 169. Oliver Chapman, who's back in 14th place. As Callum Grant now is being a little bit frustrated by Guy Skinny. He has a big dive up the inside in towards Clearways and McLaren. Meanwhile, for second, it's still Harry Chart pursuing Sam Street. Richard Higgins now has a lead of what looks to be 1.4 seconds. He comes across the line, looks a little bit quick, bigger this time by. It's, it's come down slightly to 1.3, in fact, actually, on the contrary. 
So they're trying to chase after him here. Fast snap of the race. Henry Charts. Three abreast for four for Dieter Harkel. Dives past Guy Skin and almost gets past Gallon Carp, but Callum gets past Gin as, as a result of that. And then the 61 car runs wide over the curb, and that is gives Harkel the perfect chance up the inside. Gin fights back around the outside. This is a proper historic <laughs> final, isn't it? Particularly just for fourth and fifth place. And what's fascinating as well is the variation in car performance. Of course, we're used to seeing amongst the pro drivers contesting for the outright uh, festival honours, the cars a couple of years between them, but really not a, a lot of performance difference. Whereas here we've got cars from very different uh, eras, different decades in fact, and some of them will have slightly more horsepower, some of them might handle a little bit better, might be a little bit lighter, and so you do get that thing in Formula Ford racing that we don't see too much these days, of some cars accelerating in certain areas and some uh, in others. So we're seeing, for example, Henry Chart, very good through the corners, doesn't have the straight line speed though to draw level uh, with Sam Street down the pit straight, and then conversely, Callum Grant behind, struggling to defend his fourth position uh, from quicker cars behind him, quicker down the straight at least. He is still fourth, in fact, he's now getting away slightly from Dieter Harkel and uh, Gaius Gim. So they make their way up through Druid's corner again. The lead gap, 1.1 seconds. A good lap, though, that time by Sam Street. A 51.7, two tenths quicker than the leader, Scott. It is. It's getting closer. Looking at lap times, it was a personal bet. It's the fastest second sector of anyone for Sam Street. And it's the fastest first sector for Henry Chart. So they're catching up that now. We're past half, going to half distance now into this second half of this historic final. Sponsored by Race Parts. Big thank you to Matthew Wright and everyone at Race Parts for supporting the festival and the historic final once again. And Henry Chart looks as though he's trying to get himself in the toe. It's almost like they're working together a little bit here between these two. Because Henry Chart's not... I think he's got the pace to be fast on the street. But he's not purposely attacking because he's trying to help push himself and Street close to Higgins. So we can make it a three-car battle for the lead. And Chart's getting... And Street getting quicker now. Chart with the fast snap of the race. So the gap has come left. What was 1.3 two laps ago to six tenths. It is a real trio for the lead now. Higgins, Street and Chart. This is the fight for the Brian Jones Memorial Trophy between these three. It is also a 91 Van Diemen versus a 92 Swift versus an 81 uh, Van Diemen. How good would it be for a nice 81 car to beat the 90s machines up here? Of course, the youngest car you can have, as Oliver Chapman gets a five-second track, track limits penalty, oh. is that um, is uh, 98 as off the track is gone, Oliver Chapman. That's quite far beyond track limits. It's off into the gravel. So... Now, though, the question is be, what does race control do? Because they're doing that in a position to possibly go for a safety car, if not cover it with double-waved yellows. This is going to be very interesting. Uh, is it Paddock Hill Ben? I think it's Paddock. Yeah, I think it is. Oh, oh, it's contact Sam Street into the back of Richard Higgins. And he backs off now, then. Is that because Richard Higgins was trying to back off because of the yellow flags? Yes, Sam Street's put his arm out to recognise there is yellow flags down there. That was a very confusing and intriguing instance to why that happened. Yeah, I'm not sure the yellow flag had anything to do with it. I think it was just a miscalculation, really, on uh, Sam and Richard's part there. I think Sam thought there was going to be a gap or maybe didn't realise he was gaining quite so quickly on uh, Richard, but very, very lucky to get away with that and seemingly undamaged as well. Uh, but yes, Paddock Hill Ben, not an ideal place to be doing a live snatch recovery. The circuit is licensed to do those, but uh, whether or not uh, Race Control decide to do it, there's a flag there, there was, at uh, Surtees. I thought it was a board as well. Safety yeah. car. You're right. There we Safety go. Safety car with five laps to go. This really does throw a spanner into the work, doesn't it? Yeah, it's a shame, really. It was building up quite nicely anyway. We hopefully will get a couple of green flag laps of racing to conclude this. I'll tell you who this does benefit. Callum Grant in well, fourth yes. place because he was trying to chase after. He managed to get he has to get away by about a second from Dieter Harkel and Guy Skin as they were battling over fifth. And I said he might be one to watch out for as well. So now that he's in fourth, he's just at the back of the shot there in the Duckham's uh, Van Diemen, which is only a year older than Henry Chart's Van Diemen RF81. Yeah. Yet there's si very similar design concepts. You can see the kind of the, the hole in the nose between the two of them. If you look at the two cars almost front on, they look practically identical, but the 81's got a slightly more, I can see just ever slightly more rounded edges on the front of the nose, I can see. That's just me being an anorak and observer. <laughs> <laughs> in that case, but, um, but taking stock of where we are then, so Higgins leads then at the moment. It's Sam Street in second place, Henry Chart in third. Callum Grant gets back into contention here in fourth. I tipped him as one of the favourites, but potentially for this in pre-race, because, of course, Callum Grant, whichever form of just to give into, he's genuinely quite quick. Peter Harkel, P5. Guys, Ginn, P6. The rest of the top ten is Guy Shepard, Dan Renner Larson, Henry Sandblom, and Andy Charles Lee. We should also point out class lead is also, because technically there's, I think that each of the class winners gets a, a, a trophy winning yeah. their class as well. So at the moment, it's Richard Higgins winning Super Classic A. We've called it Super Classic A. They're called Class A, B, C, D, but it's the same class structure as Super Classic Formula Ford. So it's Super Classic A, we'll call it, which is Richard Higgins. Super Classic B is being led by Klaus Dieter Klaus, Dieter Harkel. He's been called Klaus Dieter Harkel before. Class C being led by Henry Char. And back down in 13th place, which is James Buckton in the Eldon Mark 8. And there's quite a few people here with Alan Bowles and the collective down here. So at the Eldons. If they can get a class, he can get a class D win. That'll be their journey to the festival worthwhile. And yeah, absolutely. Looks like it might well, uh, might well happen as well. We'll see what the final couple of laps have in store for us. 
So safety car out, we're on the 12th lap, so four laps remain. It's gonna be a two lap shootout, maybe three, uh, but they'll have to get a real move on getting the car out of the way. It looked pretty well buried in the, uh, in the gravel trap, didn't it? Well, there is driver, Oliver Chapman, chatting away to the marshals. You can just see about the uh, recovery vehicle there to the left of shot. And have they got the car attached yet? I don't think they properly have, have they? So I think it's gonna be another lap possibly uh, after this one before we uh, get racing back underway. Good news really for Richard Higgins though, who had really good pace in the early stages of the race, but then does seem to have struggled a bit mid-race. This just gives him a chance not only to hit the reset button, but also uh, a few less laps that he has to uh, defend for and uh, perhaps just cool everything off, catch his breath, reassess and figure out how he's going to defend that lead for the final couple of laps. Yeah, I think the recovery we've got here should be enough to get us going next time, but not yeah. this time, but the next out, which means it will quite literally be a two-lap sprint to the side who wins the historic final. If you wanted proper festival drama, that will give it to you. Two laps at the Indy circuit, 2.4 miles to the side who gets their name to go alongside Matt Rivette in 2021 and Cam Jackson last year as our third recipient of the Brian Jones Memorial Trophy because it was commissioned with the blessing of the of uh, Brian's family called Charlotte Park, Tim Evans and all that, Ros Jones, uh, Tim Evans, sorry, Tim Jones and Ros Jones, forgive me, um, and the entire Brian, uh, Brian's, uh, tied to Brian's family to give the blessing to have that trophy thing. I know Alan Bowles is also a uh, instrumental person within that too, alongside them as well to get that put together. And it's quite a magnificent trophy, I think, befitting of the man himself, I think, and you certainly approve of that kind of trophy. Some people do refer to it a bit as looking like the FA Cup, which is, <laughs> it has a passing resemblance, but I think it befits the, the occasion in terms of the older cars. And of course, you know, Matt Rivette, of course, the first winner of that one, and then Cam Jackson, 2022, last year. That was quite a final last year, the historic final. That yeah. was a battle particularly between um, it, it, Cam Jackson, in particular, went ahead and won that one. I think that it was him and Tom McCarthy who went back and forth on that side in that race. This might be this is slightly different here. There's no Tom McCarthy this weekend and no Cam Jackson to defend it. So there is going to be a different winner this year, but exactly who it's going to be, we'll have to wait and see. Is it going to be Richard Higgins? Can Sam Street, Henry Chart, even Callum Grant or somebody else do it? Well, we'll find out in the next two laps or so because safety car lights are out. So two lap sprint then to the side who wins the first of our finals for the Four and Ford Festival this weekend. The historic final sponsored by Race Parts. Richard Higgins has it at the moment, but Street, Chart, Grant and Co, they all want it. Two laps to go. Hold on to your hats, folks. Here we go then. Has Richard Higgins been able just to formulate a plan here behind the safety car as to how he's going to claim the victory? Sam Street, Henry Chart, ready and waiting for the restart. As uh, Richard Higgins, I think, has gone now, hasn't he? Accelerates his way out of clearways and Clark Curve. Good restart. Not such a strong one, really, for Henry Chart. So he's got Callum Grant uh, right behind him. And remember, those two fighting for the Super Classic Class C uh, honours in this race. Up towards Paddock Hill Bend. The gap comes back down again between the top two. Dan, uh, sorry, uh, Dieter Hackle there has a little look at the inside uh, Paddock. But we need to focus on the leaders. Here comes Sam Street looking to the inside. Has to go back to the outside because that lane was covered. They almost tangle wheels at the entry to Druid's Corner. Just over a lap and a half to to go and Richard Higgins is going to have to get his defending boots on here. Sam Street clearly looks the quicker of the two, but can Richard Higgins keep him behind for two laps? This is going to be a real test lap and a half now. Rich Higgins under pressure. Here comes Sam Street up the inside. Got he's him. got the room, he's got the space up the inside of towards 30. Job done. He goes to the lead with a lap and a half to go. So Sam Street leads in the historic oh. final. There goes Rich Higgins back up the inside. It's side by side. They're going to be wheel to wheel. Oh. Pratsky wheel to wheel. It's side by side. Streets all over the curb. And here comes Henry Char and also Callum Grant on the final. Final lap of the historic final, it's side by side for second, but it's going to be Chuck gets the toe from Street, it's now across the line, one more lap to go, who wins, it's anyone's guess, down towards the Paddock oh. Hill bend, South Street looking to the outside line, looking for the high, wide and handsome line, but he can't find it, he holds on the second place, it's fourth of the lead now, Higgins, Street, Chart and Grant up towards Drew, it's anyone's oh. guess, oh it's side by side, there's contact, oh, goes, out goes South Street, wide off the tarmac, through goes both to Chart and Callum Grant, and they could possibly snatch it here, down towards Greyville Bend, half a lap to go, who wins this final? is anyone's guess. Out of Graham Hill Bend they go. Richard Higgins in front. That's twice that he and Sam Street have made contact with Sam ending up at Airborne on both occasions. He's still fourth but perhaps not for much longer as up the inside of him goes Guy Skin. Into certain two uh, clearways we go for the final time though and Richard Higgins after that bold lunge up the inside at this very corner a lap ago is going to somehow hang on to claim the victory in the race part historic final here at Brands Hatch. What a race that was. What a drive for Richard Higgins. He claims the chequered flag. Henry Chart is a Last winner, but on the overall podium as well, as is Callum Grant behind him in third, while Sam Street has to settle for fourth position after a battle 
for the ages between those two. That final two-lap shootout was always going to be entertaining, and it certainly turned out to be so. Richard Higgins is rightfully delighted with that. An incredible defensive drive it was. A little bit of contact into Drew. It's a shame that it uh, sort of ended that way, uh, but he got away with it. He managed to hang on to the win, and uh, he will be, as we've said, the recipient of the Brian Jones Memorial Trophy uh, after a race that I'm sure Brian would have thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed himself. Brilliant stuff. And Richard Higgins is uh, the race winner. But uh, my word, did he have to fight for that one? And yeah, Henry Chart and Callum Grant very nearly came in and stole it from him at the end. Both hands off the wheel in celebration momentarily there for Richard Higgins. <laughs> I think it's starting to dawn on him uh, what he's achieved there. But what a fight that was. And that moment through Paddock Hill Bend where they went side by side, you could tell that neither of them were leaving anything on the table, weren't they? They were absolutely, they were going to push as hard as they had to. And ultimately Higgins won out. It goes without saying, that's literally just classic Formula 4. Just yep. leaving it all on the track. And Richard Higgins got his, got really got defensive. He held on for as much as he could and it just benefited him in the end. And it's unfortunate for Sam Street, but again, that's motor racing. He just held on for as much as he could. And Henry Chart and Callan Grant, they'll at least be quite happy. Henry Chart with a second place. And of course, third place going to going the way of uh, Callum Grant, so that would be pleasing. And a Duckham's fall and fall of Van Diemen on the podium. That's quite fitting. There's celebrations all around, unsurprisingly. Richard certainly worked hard for that one. And quite fitting, he's also wearing a helmet, but, but from our grandfather sponsors, Head Tech. So that's a even further test for them. It's a Head Tech sporting driver who wins the historic final, which is quite fitting, I suppose, for them. But Richard, I think, almost can't, be almost can't, can't believe it. He's still sat in the car. Callum, there's, there's Alan Bowles, of course, who's been helping out Callum Grant and a couple of other drivers this weekend. As also as well being Super Classic 4 and 4 champion. But I think Richard Higgins is absolutely beside himself. Quite literally. I don't think he can quite believe what he's just achieved. Finally clambers out of the car. And I think, yeah, there is a look of disbelief slightly uh, on his face. We'll uh, have a word with him uh, momentarily, uh, I am sure. Uh, so Richard Higgins then claims the race win in the race parts historic final here at the Formula Ford Festival by three tenths of a second in the end over Henry Chart and Callum Grant with Sam Street having twice been airborne in that race, still managing to come home in fourth ahead of Gaius Gim after a late challenge from the Van Diemen driver. Then it was Dieter Hackel in sixth. He claims victory in class B. Dan Larson at seventh. Uh, Henry Samblom was eighth. Guy Shepard ninth. And Andy Charlesley after some troubles early on in the semi final ends up in tenth place. Stuart Kesterman. Jonathan Nash 12th, Gerhard Harschelt is 13th, and it is James Buckton uh, in the number 60 uh, Eldon who claims the victory in Class D. Alan Slater, Ben Hadfield, Tim Fitzgerald, and Montoya Baker uh, complete the 18 runners. Only the one non finisher, that of course being Oliver Chapman, who ended up in the gravel at Paddock Hill Bend. So, fantastic uh, first final of the day. Don't forget the grand final for the Formula Fords coming up, not at the end of the day, as traditionally has been the case. Uh, it will actually be the penultimate race of the day after a little tea break uh, following our second TCR UK race uh, of the weekend. Uh, we've also got the last chance race due to kick off at about half past two to decide the rest of the grid for that final. Right then, let's head back down to Richard John Neal this time, uh, who is about to talk to a very pleased, I'm sure, uh, Richard Higgins. Thank you very much indeed, Andy. Uh, we, we don't like safety cars, do we? But what a grandstand finish we had. And um, you guys did a super job. Brian would have been proud of you. And that was worthy of the Brian Jones Memorial Trophy, wasn't it? That will be presented, that trophy, in the Kentigan at the end of the day as part of the live stream. But we will get to present to our uh, the, the race winners' trophies and class winners' trophies to our winners down here. Richard Higgins just posing for the cameras at the moment on our first big trophy of the weekend for the festival side of things. Richard, can we grab you and grab a quick word? Um, no hands to free to shake hands. I'll give you a, a pat on the shoulder. Well done. I'll get you on the spot here if I can just clear you folks out of the way just so we got a... Um, first of all, warmest congratulations on winning the Brian Jones Memorial Trophy sponsored by Race Parts. What does that mean to you? I, I can't even put it into words. I can't believe what just happened. It's amazing. It's, um, it's been coming all year. It's my first win in Formula Ford, so to do it here is just, I dreamt about it last night, so, wow. and it come true, so I can't, I can't thank my brother enough, Beastworks, can't thank my family enough, everyone, it's amazing. That's the reaction and the emotion in which I can see on your face, um, and let's go back to the race, because it, it was, it was hard, wasn't it, those last two laps, talk us through what happened. 
Yeah, so I managed to break away at the beginning, um, and then I just settled in. But I seen him coming. Uh, Sam was very quick, and I see, I, I seen him coming. I couldn't go any quicker than I was going. Um, and then obviously after the safety car, I knew I was going to be in for a scrap. Uh, but Sam's fair, you know. I like me and Sam got on really well. Um, we touched a couple of times. It was unfortunate what happened at the top. You know, it was just one of them things that could have been me off, could have been him. But you know, I, we'll speak after. But it was fair. It was close racing. Um, and then I come out and told we interlock Will was coming up here and I was like, oh. Uh, but um, yeah, we come through because I knew we'd give each other room. You know, if we were alongside each other, I knew we'd give each other space. So um, it was a good race. Oh, here we go. Well done. No, 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 no. You earned that, mate. That was quite tough. Superb sportsmanship we're seeing here. Well done. Thank you very much indeed. Richard, Richard, we'll catch up with you for the main presentation in the Kensington. Many congratulations. We'll have a proper chat then. Yeah, of course. Hello, Jackson, my son. I know he's watching. I just want to say hello to him. We won, mate. Jackson will be on the grid in a few years. We look forward to that. Richard, well done. Second position, Henry Charts. Is Henry still here? OK, so Henry's disappeared. And Callum Grant in third place. Let's have a word with Callum. How wonderful is it, Callum Super, to see that Duckham's livery out there? And I know you've, you've had lots of people that you probably want to uh, thank, but a cracking drive from you from a fair way back. Yeah, it's hard work. Big thanks to Alan Bowles and uh, Cajun Engineering and Simon Langman for giving me the car to drive and the paying for everything. It's been great, great race. Um, the uh, first and second, I thought they're both going to put each other in the gravel. So uh, stayed out of it, and me and Henry just came, came home second and third. Great great weekend, thank you. And of course, a great battle for you two for the Class C honours as well, because you've got this multi class structure representing really golden eras of Pullman 4 1600 racing. Yeah, it's great. It's um, Just wish there was a few more here. Unfortunately, uh, hopefully next year we'll be uh, back up to 100 car field, and that'll be fantastic. That'll be great. Many congratulations, Callum. Thank you, Henry. Super stuff, well done, many congratulations. This is one of our big races of the weekend and congratulations on winning Class C. Yeah, thank you. It was basically, I wanted to take the win today, the overall win, but um, unfortunately these guys are a little bit too quick in a straight line, but good to get the fastest lap, I think, and uh, the win for Class C. That's absolutely well done. We look forward to seeing you for the main presentations a little bit later on. Thanks. Sorry to cut short. Another race on the grid. Thank you to our podium. Apologies that we can't get our Class D winner as well. But remember, presentations at the end of the day. Congratulations, Richard Higgins on the winner of the 2023 Brian Jones Memorial Trophy, sponsored by Race Parts. We have uh, another support race uh, on the grid. So let's go over back to the commentary team and get the grid and the look forward to the uh, championship closure for the Civic Cup. Thank you very much, Richard. Yes, uh, the penultimate race of the season for the Miltec Sports Civic Cup. They've got one more to come later on this afternoon, but this is going to be a real, real nail-biter after qualifying took place uh, earlier on this morning. And uh, that was a pretty nervy affair for our championship contenders. It was, in the end, though, Dan Thackeray, the championship leader, who took the pole position and with it six championship points. Max Edmondson, though, his nearest rival, uh, will start second uh, as they uh, come into this first race with Liam McGill and Alistair Camp together on row number two. Then it's Dave Marshall and uh, Harvey Caton completing uh, the third row of the grid. Lewis Kent has Ryan Bensley for company on row four ahead of Adam's Kite and Jack Riddell with Louis Hounsell uh, and Dan Chapman. Then on the sixth row of the grid, then we go back to row number seven, where it is Tommy Knight ahead of Jordan Brennan, Sam Nicolau and Bradley Kent making his debut in the championship, younger brother of Lewis starting uh, 16th, then it's Harry England and Owen Hillman on row nine. Row 10 for Anthony Gannon and Simon Welch, whilst in Charlotte Birch. And Reese Lewis at the back. Reese Lewis, a late addition to the entry this weekend, didn't get out of qualify, uh, but he is going to be starting at the, uh, the front of the field. At the back of the field, I should say, but uh, having not set a lap time yesterday. So we have cars lining up on the grid. Dan Thackeray leads the way to the grid. And uh, Dan Thackeray is looking to try and claim a victory. It's unlikely that he will win it in the first race because after this one, there will still be 41 points available. They run the same uh, points system as TCR UK do. And so 41 points, no dropped scores allowed at the final round. It's therefore very unlikely that it will get settled in this race. Jordan Brennan, I'm afraid, it's looking unlikely that he's going to take the start. There will be a luckless Liquid Molly sponsored driver in the pit lane doesn't look as though he's going to make the start of the race, which is a shame, but the rest of them are present and correct. Dan Thackeray versus Max Edmondson on row one, and Max Edmondson knows he has to 
try and get um, ahead of Dan Thackeray. Let's see if he can do it. The lights are out. We're away and racing, and it is a good start by uh, Thackeray. He's going to hold the lead as they head for the first corner. Then Thackeray on the inside line uh, with, as they head for the first corner, Liam McGill there on the inside of Dave Marshall. It's Thackeray leading, but Max Edmondson already challenging as they head towards Druid's corner. Max Edmondson, we know, is not afraid to get stuck in. Goes around the outside line. He's on the dirty side of the road. Oh. Does he have the grip? Not quite. Ali Camp, meanwhile, sideways. He tries to go the inside of Harvey Caton there for third. Down the hill they head into Graham Hill Bend. Harvey Caton is just going to stay in front. Dave Marshall getting stuck in as well and Camp is out onto the dirt. Oh, Camp he's having a nightmare here, isn't he? Because Marshall's ahead of him. That'll be a difficult car to, to get back past and he's actually brought McGill with him as well, hasn't he? But no, Camp he gets it all sorted. He's got to reset and see what goes on. But uh, great start. It's good to see the, the two championship uh, protagonists having a right old battle. Indeed so, across the line they will go. Camp trying to close the door on Liam McGill, who's almost squeezed onto the grass as they flash past the pits. It is Thackeray the leader, Edmondson second, Caton third, Marshall fourth, and it's all going wrong here for Ali Camp as he turns into Paddock Hill Bend, then goes for the wide line in to try and get the tight line out, which I think is what Edmondson did as well, because he's had a run on Thackeray as they head towards Druid's corner. It's so tight between these two in the championship that Edmondson knows a race win in this first race could make all the difference. He's been the momentum man, although Thackeray had a really strong weekend at Silverstone last time out as well and that's what's given him this slender lead arriving at Brands Hatch yeah he's been the man on a mission isn't he Dan Thackeray and uh, yeah Motion Motorsport doing an amazing job uh, with those guys and, and to be fair he's the only car in the uh, in the actual stable so that is difficult on its own Alistair Camp in sixth place really needs to get involved and that's going to be so difficult because McGill is in front of him and McGill can hopefully try to put a move on Dave Marshall and bring Campy into it but Campy's too far back and he's now got Bensley chomping at the uh, the back of his car indeed he has and uh, then behind him Alex Kite who was rapid at times in qualifying as well they're all bunching together as they head uh, for Druid's corner McGill gets blocked by Marshall that gives Camp maybe a chance to go around the outside Liam McGill um, not treating the championship contender particularly nicely and Camp nearly lost it completely there on the grass uh, Brian Bensley briefly gets up alongside but Bensley of course he might not be running the same colours as the other pro alloys cars but he does run out at the same warning he's not going to be too rough with Alistair Camp but uh, not an ideal start to the race for the former champion mm. Kite and Kent having it large in the area of motorsport so Lewis Kent that's TCR racer good to see him right up there actually he's right in the mix isn't he and it's uh, like we mentioned before in qualifying it's not just a plug and play you can't just jump in these things and think you're going to win even if you've been in F1 he wouldn't be uh, you won't be winning I'll guarantee you that so great to see faster slap Max Edmondson Ooh. this is getting tasty now side by side into Druids that's going to be a brave move, and how hard will Max Edmondson want to fight? Because I tell you, Dan Thackeray will not like this. He is pretty forwards and coming backwards, this Max Edmondson, but uh, Thackeray's just got to keep it all nice and tidy. Yeah, indeed so. 16 points between them coming into this race after Dan Thackeray took an extra point in qualifying than Edmondson did. So 16 points the difference, but it's a five-point swing between winning a race and finishing second. So uh, Edmondson knows how important it would be to get through. Louis Hounsel there, meanwhile. Uh, you may remember him from the production class last year. Well, little Louis has uh, moved up into the cup class, uh, debuted at Silverstone last time out, uh, really had some fun, and he's found some good pace, actually, this weekend, knocking on the door of the top ten. And remember, it's a top ten oh. reversal for race two. Edmondson up the inside of Thackeray at Paddock. That almost ended in tears. They just managed to keep it clean, but Thackeray is struggling here. That's respect, that. That's respect. That In any other championship, there'd have been a tap there, for sure. Brilliant stuff from Edmondson. Could have kept his nose in and said, he turned across me, mate. But that wasn't the case. Obviously, Thackeray is not brilliant coming into this next section and getting out Ooh. of this next section. He's really struggling with this car. It is pushing on. It's understeering the front axle. Look how close Max Evans is. They're in a different class, these yeah. guys. But <laughs> this is where he's, he's so slow. This is it. He's going to try and get back underneath him, is he? But he gets on the power too early and too soon. But... Will he be in the toe? This is where it looks like Edmondson just takes chunks out of him now. He's going to make him defend again. Thackeray did tell me at Silverstone he felt his car was down on power slightly. I'm beginning to think there's some truth to that, but he's defending the inside line as they head for Paddock Hill Bend through the right hander. Can he get the switch back this time? Thackeray just manages to close the door. That was really, really close. Again, great respectful racing, but how long can they keep this up for? Yeah, absolutely stunning. I was in 
Dave Marshall, blue, uh, black and white for trap limits. This is a great battle. This isn't just a great battle for the race. This is a great battle for the championship. The respect that I've seen in 99.9% .9 of this series should be shown to everyone, particular um, Fiesta Juniors, actually, and I'll go and say it on record because this is brilliant stuff. It is, isn't it? This is how side-by-side -side tin top racing should be. Uh, amongst youngsters, really, Max Edmondson is barely out of junior categories himself, really. He is one of the younger drivers on the grid. Harvey Kate up there doing well as well in third. A quiet performance this for Harvey, but doing well. Right, as it stands, 20 points the cushion between Thackeray and Edmondson, so 41 points will be available after the race. It would go down to the wire, but Edmondson wants to try and outscore him if he can. Crucially, though, Paul, as you've just spotted, the fastest lap at the moment going to none of the title contenders. Wow, Lewis Kent has, uh, has pulled it out of the hat, and he with a 53-4, so he must be in a little oh. bit of clear air. He's right behind, isn't he? And look at Marshall's causing grief now in that uh, in that Honda. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that car wasn't handling particularly well through Druids, was it? But uh, then Hobson skips over the curb as well. He was desperate not to run over the sensor on the exit of uh, Graham Hill Bend. He's got Liam McGill right behind him. And then Alistair Camp, who just can't get himself out of this little uh, knot of cars, can he? He's sixth place. He looks oh, to the inside of McGill, though. Little bit of paint traded. That was fair to me, though. There was a gap. He had the overlap. McGill had to leave the door open in the end, really. And Camp should now make the move stick. Yeah, should do. But uh, McGill is still quick. And look, he's pulled alongside him. Wow, that's a bit of side drafting. That's proper stuff. That, oh, look oh. at this move from Kent. Is he going to keep his nose in? No, he doesn't. But again, great racing from these two. And McGill will come back out and he'll have the overlap. Oh, if you squeeze him there, you're a brave man. And that's exactly what Campy is. But Campy really struggling now. He's got his DRS flap hanging open, <laughs> a.k.a. the fuel flap. Uh, yes, that won't be hindering him too much, I am sure. The inside now looks to go. Ooh. Lewis Kent, that nearly uh, would have ended in contact again. I think he would have uh, committed to that move. Dan Thackeray, by the way, is just set the fastest lap of the race, so another bonus point now going his way, and of course in doing so, starts to stretch away slightly from Max Edmondson. Camp now up into fifth place, needs more points than that though, if he's to keep himself even mathematically in the hunt for the championship. He needs to now set off after Dave Marshall, and really at the very least then try and get back onto the podium ahead of uh, Harvey Cape. We're nearly halfway through this penultimate round of the Miltech Sports Civic Cup, the top two in the championship are the top two in the race, and they're still separated by just half a second. Yeah, it's all starting to calm down now as the two pro alloys cars go side by side into Kill Pent. But uh, come out all good. But uh, yeah, McGill's been uh, been a great addition, isn't he, to this championship? Been fantastic to watch. Trap limits, as I say, that for McGill. So he's going to have to be uh, just backing off the mic a little bit and not uh, and not getting too too involved in uh, getting on the power too early and, and uh, running wide. Is this group catching Harvey Caton? They were about a tenth quicker than him on the previous lap, so Dave Marshall's finding him at more speed as well. I seem to recall having a conversation with him at Silverstone about uh, tyre pressures and he kind of set it. Oh, hang on, someone's off. That might be Caton. It was Caton. He's oh. understeered wide at Clark Curve, and oh. now Dave Marshall's definitely caught him. He's up the inside line, and Dave Marshall is back on the podium. Now, can Alistair Camp follow him? He's got to try and do something here and the pro alloys racer gets to the inside of paddock hill bend harvey kate with dirt on his tires is surely low on grip on that outside line but he's going to keep his foot in it try and fend off the former champion and he might just do it still really carry speed into drew it's a bit too much speed though camp goes through and mcgill will now look to follow yeah he had a go didn't he looks like he's probably just got on the throttle too early and maybe i'm speculating drove into the gravel trap with that front uh, left tire. Such a shame that because his dad was only saying, can you not turn up? Because every time you don't turn up, we have a podium. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, they were keen to remind me of that fact at uh, Silverstone when he visited the podium again, but uh, easy to do that, isn't it? Clearways, it's a corner that goes on and on and on and on and on, and you go over a big crest into quite a big compression, actually, uh, as they uh, come out of Clearways and Clark Curve, and in a front-wheel drive car, particularly when that VTEC kicks in, very easy to spin up the front tyres and understeer off the track. Right, the leaders are still only half a second apart. They're sort of matching each other now, lap time for lap time, so all of the action is happening behind them. Third place on back. Dave Marshall in third position. There were the leaders. Look at the gap that they pulled. They're six and a half seconds clear of this almighty battle pack for third. Marshall, Camp, Caton, McGill, Lewis Kent and Ryan Bensley starting to close in as well. Yeah, this is all going. Look at the speed. Camp carries through. Graham Hill Ben now. And I've got to say, Dave Marshall has been uh, has been pretty special in that car, hasn't he? He really has turned up now, and uh, 
great to see that good lad but uh, <laughs> Campy having a nibble on him but look at the grip that Campy's got that looks like that car's running wide but no that uh, that shape Civic is definitely definitely better off that corner yeah the FN2 car then versus the EP3s the newer shaped car it's taken a while really for it to catch on hasn't it the FN2 not a particularly popular car as far as numbers are concerned but might we see a few more on the grid next year uh, with Dave Marshall proving exactly what it's capable of he's in third position he's had uh, a couple of podiums including a uh, race victory uh, at uh, Cadwell Park earlier on in the season and he wants now to try and claim another podium but when he looks in his mirrors he must think that that is uh, going to take a little bit of work because that queue is getting longer by the lap got a lot of race winners behind him and podium winners as well so yeah this as soon as as soon as Campy puts a move on him if it does come I've got a feeling that uh, Dave is going to struggle as Campy struggles with understeer and caton has got himself back in the fight but because of Campy just starting to back off in that 45 and uh, understeer through the corner he's brought everybody else with him but that's a big lunge oh. that's a great move that comes off he might have to pull his nose out and dave marshall gives him room but now harvey caton and mcgill are now into them look at this now three wide into drew it's oh caton so late on the brakes mcgill down the inside of caton tap oh. contact but no gets it all straightened up and uh, lewis kent wants a bit of this down the inside of mcgill oh. job done brilliant move opportunistic look at it <laughs> this is it now this is a great race bensley down the inside of mcgill as well oh mcgill's already been warned about track limits and i reckon he might have triggered the sensor again there at graham hill bend although he will say he was uh, ushered out there by uh, lewis kent which i think he might have a point in saying anyway back through clear ways we go there goes bensley uh, who had it not been for a crash in qualifying at silverstone last time out could well have been a fourth title contender uh, coming into this weekend as it is, he's looking simply for podium finishes, maybe, or uh, perhaps in race two anyway, a podium finish to cap off what has been his strongest season today. Oh! Marshall sideways backs it into <laughs> Paddock Hill Bend. Uh, that car never looks like it's handling particularly well, and yet somehow he gets really good pace out of it. Yeah, got a big red dot against McGill here uh, on the TSL time. That'll be a track limits penalty, yeah, I reckon. That's a track limits penalty, five seconds it'll be, won't it? Yeah. Um, so that'll put him down in, well, he is in eighth anyway, isn't he? He is. Uh, I think five seconds would knock him down to about 11th or 12th, and crucially out of the reversed grid then. It's the top 10 finishers who get reversed uh, to form the grid for race number two. So with that, that would put Sam Nicolau, I think, uh, up into 10th spot and Tommy Knight would join him on the front row Simon Welch here going a lap down uh, as they come out of clearways and Clark Curve the lead gap by the way up to a second now so Dan Thackeray again as we've seen him do a few times in the uh, this season quick at the second half of the race not necessarily in the first half and Max Edmondson sometimes goes the other way around. Alistair Camp, meanwhile, five second track limits penalty as Harvey Caton runs through the gravel trap. And Alistair Camp, I did think I saw him run wide at Graham Hill Bend a lap or so ago. And uh, well, unfortunately, the judges of fact agree he's picked up a five second penalty and that will drop him out of podium contention. That's him finished for his championship challenge. Yeah, well, to be fair, he had to beat Thackeray anyway yeah. and hasn't really had the pace, has he? But yeah, that's, that's the final nail in the coffin, really. Yeah, that's a shame. Camp, he's been a stalwart of this championship, isn't he? And, um, had a lot of support from the, uh, the fraternity of Honda Ooh. drivers. That's a great move. When he's come up to TCR, he's shown how it's been done, but uh, just shows you, doesn't it, side by side. One time oh. you're racing Dave Marshall and... Oh, he's at no. Dan Thackeray, That's no! the championship leader. The engine has blown on Dan Thackeray's car. He's out of the race. Surely Max Edmondson is going to pick up a race win and there are no dropped scores. This is disaster for Thackeray. He's about to lose 40 championship points to Max Edmondson in the most heartbreaking of fashion. He was leading, he was pulling away. I just noticed that they were side by side across the line according to the timing screen. And that is why... I don't know what to say. No, neither do I, but there could be oil down as well now uh. as, as Campy round the outside, hip and shoulder. Lewis Kent wants oh, a bit no. of this. Who's that on the inside? Caton's going to try and take third. This is going to be a monster move. He can't end like this. Up oh, against the curve. Oh, brilliant stuff from all of these drivers. This is superb, but please don't go on the oil. That was a 
massive explosion from um, from oh. Dak Ray. Big sideways camp into the back of Kent. And now Caton side by side. Dave Marshall will be loving this. Now, with uh, Thackeray out of the race, Camp could still be back in this now, but he needs to gain some places. It's all started unraveling for the former champion. He's behind Kent. He's behind Harvey Caton. He is down in fifth position. Liam McGill has got a 10 second penalty now. He's out of this battle anyway. So far, so good. No sign of cars losing control on the oil. That is good news. We had that at Snetterton last year as well, didn't we? They go past what remains of Dan Thackeray's car. Hopefully, they can get a new engine in that for race two. He would be 20 points behind Max Edmondson as it stands and Alistair Camp needs a couple more places to get back into it himself and this is it it's all over yeah. now isn't it yeah the race is all over but what a result this is for Edmondson and uh, wow well, is about the best way to sum that up I think Max Edmondson is a winner again in the Miltec Sports Civic Cup and that is his most significant victory to date it gives him a 20 point championship lead going into the finale now Campers up the inside of Harvey Kent can he beat Harvey to the line I don't think he quite will Marshall will get second Lewis Kent is on the podium for the first time and Harvey Kent pips Alistair Camp who had the penalty anyway remember five seconds so Camp will be seven on corrected times and I think mathematically out of the championship fight uh, if only he managed to make a bit more progress towards the start of that race he could have really benefited from that as well but Max Edmondson gets the win Dave Marshall second Lewis Kent in third and Dan Thackeray scores zero points there is Dan uh, we say this quite often in motorsport it can be a really really cruel thing Dan had driven an exemplary race there Paul he dealt with the pressure that Max was piling on him in the early stages started to pull clear and something completely out of his hands has potentially potentially robbed him of the championship it's not over yet but it's an uphill struggle that is going to be a huge struggle and uh, Edmondson just well just was going to finish second wasn't he and uh, yeah it was all done for him that's such a shame but he didn't do anything wrong and he raced the race yeah absolutely he was fair he was clean when they battled early on not a hint of contact between the two of them that's what we like to see but unfortunately Dan Thackeray ends up out of the race so Edmondson gets the win provisionally Marshall second uh, Lewis Kent third Harvey Kent fourth uh, Ryan Bensley gets into the top five having started quite a bit down the order I seem to recall uh, Alex Kite sixth Camp seventh after a penalty eighth Tommy Knight ninth Liam McGill after a penalty and Sam Nicolau tenth so actually Liam McGill is still going to stay inside the top ten after that time's added on and it will be Nicolau and McGill, McGill the front row for that second race George Al Williams there former uh, race winner in the category there to cheer on uh, Max Edmondson as he arrives slightly bemused I'm sure actually into the holding area I don't think he would have been expecting to win that race as the uh, time was winding down we'll get the official uh, points calculations done as soon as we can for you but provisionally we are saying it's actually a 23 point lead uh, for Max Edmondson going into the finale so 23 points 41 still up for grabs and uh, unfortunately Alistair Camp now out of it oh, oh wow, what word. drama I tell you what <laughs> talk about drama you've got to make sure you watch this last race yes. of civic cup and that's going to be later on today uh, last race of the day i believe it is it is yes yes so are we going to have another snetterton i know there's not going to be any rain but uh, you don't need rain in the civic no, cup no. it's it's as uh, lively as it comes isn't it well of course edmondson now has to start 10th so assuming they get thackeray out there assuming the engine works properly because that can always be a bit iffy when there's a, a rushed engine change as they'll have to be because that race is due to start uh, at something like half past four so they've only got about two hours that's going to be pushing it, I think, to get that engine in. But if they can, he'll be starting somewhere around 20th on the grid. Only 10 places behind Max, but he needs to then outscore him by a reasonable amount. We'll get the calculators out. We'll work out what all of that means. In the meantime, let's head down to Anthony Jordan to hear from our race winner, Max Edmondson. Thank you very much indeed, guys. Yes, what a drama for Miltex Sports Civic Cup. Well, here, Max Edmondson. Race winner and now new championship leader going into the final round of the championship. You lead now 20 points from Dan Thackeray. Max Edmondson, congratulations. That was a tough race. Yeah. Um, I'd say I had the pace at the start uh, when the tyres were new, but uh, I sort of dropped off towards the middle. And then obviously, unfortunately, Dan, I think his engine's blown. So uh, that's unlucky for Dan. But obviously, we've capitalised off uh, his, his bad performance. Well, not performance, but bad, uh, bad luck. So I'm happy. A win's a win. Yeah, certainly is. And now this means championship decider at the end of the day, 20 points hangs in it. And uh, obviously your main rival, 
sits broken at the side of the track right now. Main thought is, is that if we can get that one ready to go racing, what, I mean, it could be a cruise to the end for you. Um, I mean, the same thing could happen to me. Uh, so I'm not going to take anything for granted. I'm just going to just see how things play. I'm not going to drive like an idiot. Dan drove well there, uh, kept me behind him. But obviously his engines went, so, uh, yeah. It is what it is, but uh, mate, honestly, uh, next race is coming up next, and uh, like you say, looking forward to it. See what you could do. Possibly could come away with a championship here. Yeah, anything can happen, though, can't it? So, yeah. just take it lap by lap, minute by minute. Let's hope so, mate. Best of luck with that one. Let's chat to second place in that one, Dave Marshall. Dave, uh, well, certainly it looked like that car was a handful for the majority of that race. A lot of sideways moments. How is it feeling from your end? I'm pleased to look out on camera. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're still, as I said, from Silverstone. You know, you, you break as late as you can, but you just can't quite break quite as late as the EPs. And when you do, the back end just starts to go. So we need a need a bias valve look now. But wow, that was some some dicey race, and I think it's fair to say. It certainly was. You're now in the middle of a championship battle. Obviously, you saw Dan Thackeray breaking at the side of the road. That bumped you up into second. Yeah. But uh, yeah, obviously for race two, it's certainly going to shake things up, isn't it? Just is a bit. Um, Ali Camp was behind us. And, you know, I, I was looking going, I'm not in this battle, really should let Ali through. But it didn't feel like I could really let him through without then losing his place to, I think it was Caton behind at that point. Yeah. Uh, Caton ran wide out of last corner on the gravel. I was just praying he was coming back on, but fair play. And John nice and uh, safely left his room. And, uh, yeah, wow, that was, that's what racing's about, isn't it? It is indeed. There's a multitude of track limit penalties out there as well <laughs> for many drivers. Yeah. You, thankfully, weren't one of them. No, but I, uh, I, I got a warning for it. Yeah. Uh, I think it must have been turn one. Uh, it's just when you're trying to push it that far on. You know, you, you, you nearly opts a lot the whole way through the corner. Yeah. So trying to judge that. And as, as soon as I saw the one, I was like, just back it off a bit. But luckily at that point, we, we were defending at that point. So it was all right. Anything you want to change ready for race two later on? Uh, might need another set of brake pads. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Get those brake pads changed Cheers then, up. and we'll see you on the next one. Yes. Excellent stuff. Let's go over to third place. Well, it's good to see Lewis Kent back in a paddock and, well, a P3 on your debut back in it. Well, mate, uh, congratulations. Thank you, yeah. Um, that got a bit hair-raising at the last <laughs> lap. Um, yeah, I saw that the guys in front were gagging, like having a little squabble. Um, they sort of slowed each other down as I went through Graham Hill. Got a run and I thought I have to pick the middle man to push through because the other two will back out. So gave Dave a tiny little nudge, a little help along the way. Um, pushed through, got through the middle of the other two. And yeah, it was just sort of a hold your defence from that point on. Um, really good to see Max up in first. You know, it's an un unfortunate for Dan, um, but you know, as my teammate, I'd like to see Max up in front. Um, hopefully that now brings it a bit closer into the last round, makes a good show for the last round as well. Um, and yeah, hopefully we can get the, uh, the silver arrow back up the front again. Exactly. Are you going to plonk yourself right in the middle of that battle as well? Uh, I'll try and stay out as much as I can. Um, if there's room for a car to come through and it's it's inviting me in, then I'll obviously put my nose in the way and, and come through. Um, but yeah, I won't be smashing people off left, right and centre for the sake of it. I, I want to I wanna see the championship go down in fairly. Um, and yeah, I think that them two are, are two great people to, yeah. to prove themselves in that. Yeah, definitely so. Congratulations on that one. Uh, we'll see you on the podium, but uh, well done, Lewis Kent. Thank you very much. Excellent stuff there. A P3 result. I don't think anyone saw that one coming. Let's very quickly jump over to Anthony Gann on this one. Good year, Diamond Award winner. Anthony, solid name from yourself. Again, you did a reaction test with me earlier on. It seemed to pay off. You come away with some silverware. Do you know what? I, I, I just can't get my head around this year at all. Obviously, I'm new to the championship. I'm new to racing. Come away with silverware full stop is just a godsend. I just, I, honestly, I'm blessed to be even being amongst these guys that are so talented as racing drivers. Um, but no, as far as the race is concerned, oh, it's quite steady for me until Thackeray, until Thackeray obviously dropped his oil on uh, down in, uh, yeah, that was quite hairy. Yeah. But no, fantastic. I can imagine so. Never a nice thing when you see a plume of smoke in the air. You always think, oh, oh, what do I do? Well, you do, it's, it's what you do. And, you, and it, for me, I think of the driver as well. I just make sure you always look at your eyes everywhere, just make it there safe as well. Um, and like when I saw him on the inside the hairpin, I thought, that's fine, we just carry on going then. But no, thoroughly enjoyed it. Brilliant result, mate. Enjoy it. And uh, yeah, enjoy the silverware on the podium later Thank on. Thank you very much. Jim. Excellent stuff there for our top three and our Goodyear Diamond Trophy Award winner. Plenty more racing coming up. Do not go anywhere. Junior Fiestas, they are coming up next.
Here we go then, yes, the final round of the BRSCC Fiesta Junior Championship. Then cars making their way out onto the grid, and great to see so many of them, because unfortunately a few of them weren't in the best of condition at the end of a bruising opening race yesterday. And uh, excellent work by the teams. I'm sure there's been a lot of work uh, in the paddock overnight to get the cars ready, and it looks as though we've got the majority of them taking to the grid this time around. It was a dramatic race, their most dramatic moment being a collision between two championship rivals, Ben Moore Ryan and and Dan Lewis, and uh, neither of them in the end scored a point, and that meant that their race car consultant's uh, teammate, um, which was uh, Hodgkinson, uh, Jacob Hodgkinson, managed to score some really good points. But it is Ronnie Smith who has got the pole position for this race because this is grid based upon second fastest lap times from qualifying. So it's Smith uh, with the pole, and alongside him is George Foxlow. Uh, then it will be Lucas Hayden and Ben Bull Ryan, row two. Jensen Mason and Wesley Swain on the third row. And then it's Sam Nessa and Jensen Bell together on row number four. It will be Billy Blockley. And Jacob Hodgkins completing the top 10 ahead of Marcel Lechitsky and Ryan Mikulev. Dan Lewis due to start 13th on the grid. Uh, he's been given a 10 place grid penalty, I'm being told, for the contact with Ben Moore Ryan. Uh, so that's why he's that bit further down the order ahead of uh, Ben Doughty on that seventh row. James Pope and Charlie Ellis are together on row eight. Row nine, Jensen O'Neill Cohen. He was on the podium yesterday, uh, and uh, that was a fantastic, uh, great first race that he's finished anyway. Maybe in the championship with Oscar Dix alongside him on row nine. Freddie Hunter Johnson and Rashan Tyler Chigarimbo are then together on row 10. Row 11, Gavin Shaw. Josh Watts is playing a regular potentially at the back. She unfortunately ended up on her lid uh, after that start line shunt in yesterday's race. Is that Flames car at the back? I can't no, that's, see. No, that's a Jasmine Shores. I can that's see the, the, the stripe going down the middle of the car. Uh, we're missing Oscar Dix by the looks of it. That's not a huge surprise. He was off a couple of times yesterday, but largely the grid seems to be there, Scott, which is good news. Mm. Uh, I'm sure there's been, like I said, a lot of hard work overnight. And knowing this paddock the way I do, I'm sure teams were helping other teams out if they needed to, just to try and get cars out there. Uh, for the good of the championship, if nothing else really, it always looks better if we can get a full grid. And we are only, by the looks of it, missing one or two. Now, points-wise, unofficially, that win for Hodgkiss with the fastest lap of the race means that he's now 34 points, we think, behind Ben Will Ryan, who, of course, didn't score anything in that race. There are 50 points for a race win, and there are two for a fastest lap. So 52 points up for grabs. That means that mathematically, Sam Nessa and Dan Lewis could still win the championship. They are 45 and 47 points back, respectively, by my maths. And this is all unofficial. We don't get official points or dates from uh, the championship for Fiesta Juniors, but based on our uh, calculations, that's the situation. It means, basically, that if Jacob Hodgkiss were to take the maximum points again in this race, that I think a 13th place finish, yes, a well, actually, probably a 14th place finish, uh, would be enough for Ben Mul Ryan to then tie with Hodgkiss, but he'd win on a count back. So as long as Ben Mul Ryan finishes in the top 14 in this race, he is champion, we think. He's got to finish the race first, though, and we thought yesterday he was going to finish on the podium. That didn't happen in the end, Scott. One of the real dramatic moments of the season, that tangle that he had with his teammate. I'm sure they've both been given a talking to by the race car consultant squad overnight. But, hey, there's a championship on the line. It's three drivers from the same team competing for the title, and they all still have a shot at it. It's just pure competition, isn't it? All yep. the way through this one. But uh, at least let's look at the positives. We're ending on a high in terms of we've still got a grid which has only uh, dropped below 20 cars once all season. We've had you know, a record number of Mark 7 cars in the field. One point we had 10 entered at Silverstone, which is great to see. Drivers stepping across from Mark 6s to Mark 7, and now we're in a position to see the Mark 7 take its first overall championship at its second attempt, because it was only introduced last year. And we only had one full season. That was Harry England, who was just out in the Civic Cup race just now. Now, of course, we've got uh, a good, healthy mix of Mark 6s to Mark 7s. Next year will be, as far as I'm aware, I believe it's the last year for the Mark 7, Mark 6, sorry, next year before they become Mark 7 only. And in that basis, it means that the cars will be able to go through as we now make the way to the grid. So, George Fox, though, then, he's been getting quicker and quicker throughout his last couple of seasons in Fiesta Juniors, particularly this year. Good to see him towards the front row of the grid. Lucas Hayden, who was last year's Jam Sports Scholarship winner, he's been running a race car consultants this year. Of course, George is on the front row alongside Ronnie Smith. Good to see Ronnie Smith back out there because his car behind the safety car mm. in the second start had an issue where it must either overheat or something because it hasn't totally blown the engine by the looks of it. So he's got back out again. And crucially, Ben Moore Ryan, championship, championship leader, potential champion elect, is standing from fourth on the grid. This is the big one, of course. Also, notice that Dan Lewis is 
carrying, I think, one of the spare front splitters or front bumpers yes. from Ben Moore Ryan, so he's running the same black and, and uh, green front splitter. So 21 of them on the grid then for the final Fiesta Junior race of the season. Let's see how it plays out, and let's see who becomes 2023 champion elect. And don't forget Jacob Hodgkiss, second in the championship, starting only 10th on the grid. He's the blue, white, and yellow car you can see on the outside of that fifth row. Red lights go on. Out they go now, we're away and racing here at Brands Hatch then. Good start made by George Foxlow from the outside of row one, but he'll have to slot in, I think, behind Roddy Smith on the approach to Paddock Hill Bend. That then allows a run for Lucas Hayden to the outside line, but they actually form quite an orderly queue this time through Paddock Hill Bend, single file amongst the leaders, but a cement dust down after that previous Civic Cup race. It is Smith who leads the way. Here comes Hayden back up the inside of Foxlow for second, with Ben Ball Ryan sat in fourth position cleanly through the first couple of corners. He'll be happy with that. Did a touchy feely stuff going on further back but they all come out of Druids in more or less one piece whilst Jacob Hodgkiss looks got is already making some serious forward progress yeah looking around the outside of Jensen Mason they're trying to pick up P5 but it is going to be Ronnie Smith who leads the way then it's Mark Six is one two and three and championship leader Ben Mulrine out there in fourth one already he's got the man he's going to try and beat him in the championship Jacob Hodgkiss with yeah. him and up the inside already Ben Mulrine I wonder if oh. both the, the connotation sideways went George Foxlow I guess the big question was, did he jump or was he pushed? But either way, they're all over each other now as they come out through Clark Curve. They're all stacking up amongst each oh. other. Careful. Is that, that Ben Ryan? Is that him with problem? That's the championship leader. He's slowing. He's got the indicator on. He is he's off the pace. Ben no, Ryan. Uh, he's back to speed. Did he miss a gear, possibly? Maybe. He I may don't have missed know. a gear. I don't know. He's certainly lost a lot of places. Remember, he needs to finish somewhere inside the top Ooh. 14 or so. That's Dan Lewis, who's gone past him now as well. Is oh. Ryan in trouble? Was it just a little blip? Maybe. He's losing more places now as they head towards Druids. High drama. Just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water, it all comes unraveled again. So Ben Moore Ryan, he's, he's got his left indicator on, but he's he looks like he's sort of back up to speed now. So whatever it was, is is almost temporary a little bit, but he's in the mix. He's ahead of Marcel Asishki, but he gets a slightly better run off the corner. He's trying to go to Fenster because he knows what it means to lose more places. He came across the line in 12th. Hodgkins meanwhile is up to third. So we've got to do the calculations now, and he's frankly getting the, the his, uh, spreadsheet up so we can work it out. And there's all, the, we have to remember, of course, there's a race going on at the front as well, of course. And actually, Ryan is coming back at it because he's now on the tail of Jensen Bell. That was really odd. It, it looked to me almost like he kind of lost a bit of momentum, didn't quite get the gear shift he needed because it looks like it's just about back up to speed. He's looking down the outside of the recovering George, and that's Dan Lewis on the, on the outside of George Foxlow. Down the straight they go, and he is now trying to chase after Bailey Blockley in 11th place. So Moran is 11th. Hodgkins is third. Jensen Mason tries to fend from Ryan McAuliffe up the inside. This is for uh, fourth and fifth positions. Sixth now for Wesley Swain in the Pro Alloys Fiesta Junior car in the mix. The Mark 7. Also, in there's Sam Nessa. He looks like he's currently on course, it looks like, to be the Mark 6 class winner. All around the outside for Nessa trying to pick up the move. Meanwhile, here comes Smith, Hayden, and Hodgkins. Of course, it's, it doesn't matter what class you're in. You score points based on where you finish overall. It's 50 points for a win, plus two for the fastest lap. You see here, Mensa really, Mason really starting to stack everyone up here because he's now got well, well, McKayla who gets it other sideways. And that's Fox, though, and oh. Nessa. And that benefits now two more places for almost three passes, one at least, for Ben Moore Ryan. He's also got past Jensen Bell and Billy Blockley. That puts him back in firmly into the top ten. As Nessa drops back outside the top ten at this point. There goes Hodgkiss round the outside oh. into Paddock Hill. Ben, can he pull that one off? He runs wide over the curve. He's got to be careful. If he does that too many times, he could be at risk of getting black and white flags and even a track limits penalty. He's got to be careful. He doesn't do that too many more times. He might be quick key for positions, but he's got to do it carefully. Yep. The Siski's through the gravel at Paddock Hill. Ben, he gets back on the road unscathed. And there's still 11 and a half minutes to go. Back up the inside for second goes Hodgkiss into P2. That'll give him 46 points. And he has the fast lap of the race. That's 48 points he'll get from this race. As for Mon Ryan, he's back up to eight. He's back up to eight. That's okay. So he's gaining a few more places now. He is, at the moment, 16 points to the good for the championship over Jacob Hodgkiss, who does look like he's got the pace uh, to potentially go on and win this race. Ryan Mikalev up the inside there uh, at Clearways and uh, tries to find a way past Jensen Mason as they battle for fourth position. Mikalev having a really good race here. He's on the inside. There's drama behind. I think that was Nessa in the gravel trap again. Uh, as they went through Clearway's corner, but as they head towards Paddock Hill Bend, Jacob Hodgkiss is in the lead. Jacob Hodgkiss gets to the front and looks now set to recreate his win with fastest lap result from yesterday. There's drama further back. Someone uh, with a, is that another engine? Is, is that think, Mason? Jensen Mason. Work, I think yeah, Jensen Mason bodywork rubbing on the right rear tire. I think he was a bit sideways through Paddock Hill Bend, and this all going on right in front of Dan Lewis and Ben Ball Ryan, who at the moment is on course to win the championship by just 12 points. Well, Ryan cannot afford. 
to lose too many more places. Particularly after what happened towards the end of the race yesterday. You think that one place could be very careful behind is Dan Lewis after what happened. Obviously, it's not a funny situation, of course, but it's quite interesting that he's found himself at this point in time as uh, Hodgkiss now wheeling his way through. And Riley Smith is trying to give it a good go here. And this is also a good example of how it's been good all season where the Mark 7s and the Mark 6s have been very evenly balanced throughout the season. That was been the objective of these new cars, to make them as evenly balanced as you could. And as you come down through towards Paddock Hill, Ben Hoskins has got the advantage, but Smith and Hayden, that is literally a race car consultant's one, two, three. It's the McKenna from fourth for Jam Sport. You've got Jensen Mason up there in P5. And uh, no, Wesley Swain, in fact, looking down the outside. So Wesley Swain is having a fantastic weekend in the Pro Alloys car. All up the inside of Jensen Mason. There's a bit more bodywork rubbing. Swain's over the curb on the inside. There goes Ben Wright, who's now inside, crucially, of Dan Lewis looking for another place. That will put him into seventh place. Swain goes out wide. Through goes Mason. Ca he's careful now, Ooh. Ben. Look, Dan Lewis slow. Yeah. Dan Lewis Sewing has an issue, he's got a problem. And that's Dan Lewis who, after the incident yesterday, was pretty much out of it, but that might well be his final shot of the championship gone, I'm afraid. So that will be Dan Lewis who's possibly pulling off the road. He's up the inside line, so possibly that might be his title contention over, I'm afraid. There's still nine minutes to go as, as Wesley Swain continues to push the, uh, onto the rear end of Jensen Mason's car. This is over fifth and sixth, but Moraine's up to seventh now. And this currently would give him the title by, provisionally by 14 points at this point in time. If you can get a couple more places, that would be certainly quite handy. And here he comes. Yeah, he's going to try it, isn't he? Swain to the outside, but then uh, Ben Moraine gets boxed in behind Jensen Mason now. So he's got to be careful here. He wants to keep moving forward, but doesn't need to. But it's whether he's been working out the maths correctly from within the car. It's almost impossible to do, really. He just needs to try and concentrate on the race and not get caught up in unnecessary contact. Looks to the inside at uh, Druid's corner. Uh, now that, of course, backs him up into Ben Doughty. So Ben Doughty tries to go to the outside, where Swain is slow off the corner. And look at the gaggle of cars behind. Some of them pretty quick cars as well in that next group. Well, Ryan will definitely be wary of that. He doesn't need any more cars joining in this battle who could potentially find a way past him. It's two points per position, basically, at this part of the uh, order. And so every place that he potentially loses would cost him another two points. He can therefore afford to lose about six or seven, but he won't want to be cutting it that far. And out of clear ways of Clark over they go. There is Dan Lewis still limping round, but uh, looking unlikely now to score any meaningful points. And that will probably mean that he has to settle for fourth in the championship towards Paddock Hill Ben we go again and Wes Swain on the attack once more a brilliant sight they make as they fan out into lots of different lines uh, through the breaking zone of Paddock Hill Ben good scrap going on further back that's Ellis up the inside of Billy Blockley and manages to make that move stick quite nicely heading through the first corner through Druids come Wes Swain and uh, Jensen Mason. Mason climbs the curb, just leans on Wes Swain slightly and then defends nicely, actually, heading down uh, into Graham Hill. Ben, he's been given a bit of an assist there from Swain as they head through the left-hander, but uh, Wes Swain doesn't ultimately take any big advantage out of that. Jensen O'Neill going, joining in this battle as well. Now, Jensen was second in yesterday's race, got on the podium, which was an astonishing result. So we know he's got pace and he's up the inside already of Ben Doughty. And he's going to go through. So Jensen O'Neill going now, the Jamsport driver. Son of Jamie going, man behind the Jamsport squad. Very much a part of this scrap as well. And he might now start to put some pressure on Ben Mulryan as they head up towards Paddock Hill Ben. Mulryan once again has a face full of this Wesley Swain and Jensen Mason battle. As they go side by side again into Paddock. Swain on the outside, inside for Mason. This is nervy stuff for Ben Mulryan. If these two were to tangle, he could so easily end up getting caught up in it. He tries to go to the outside. There is contact just in front as they head for Druid's corner. And Ben Mulryan is going to lose out to Jensen O'Neill going through the right-hander at Druid's. They go. And Ben Mulryan is on the outside line heading for Graham Hill Bend. But remember, Jensen O'Neill going to guest. So even if he gets past, yes, he won't lose right. any more points. It means he'll still be 14 ahead at this point in time. So for Jensen O'Neill going, eventually he's being a bit of a nuisance at the moment. He's a bit of a nuisance that he needs to uh, car 20s in the pits which is Freddie Hunter Johnson. Yeah. And apparently we've been told now is, is he was linking a little bit of fluid out of that car as he got Jensen Hill going on the back of Jensen Mason. He might give him a slight no. little nudge. That was Bessie Swain getting all oh. sideways. That in the back of it was Charlie oh. Ellis. Is this fluid? Is this fluid it might down, well be, That might be the fluid that Freddie Hunter Johnson's put yeah. down because that's uh, Josh Watts in the background. He went sideways. Also so did Charlie Ellis. I think that was, that, that was genuine. That was fluid down, I think, from the uh, leaking car of Freddie Hunter Johnson that's in the pit lane right now. So Emble Ryan survives again. He's down to ninth, but that's fine. 28 uh, championship points going his way. He would be 10 clear as it stands, but how many near misses is he going to have to dodge in this race? It seems that around every corner there is a potential threat to his championship hopes. A lot of damage there to the front of Rashan Tyler Chigarimbo's car. He runs 11th at the moment. 
So down the hill through Graham Hill Bend, where Swain being warned about track limits. He's still just in front of Ben Bull Ryan, who's got Billy Blockley closing in behind. So as they make their way towards Surtees Corner, remember 14th place we think would be enough uh, for Bull Ryan. He is ninth at the moment, but it's not inconceivable that something else like that could happen that ends up uh, with him losing some more places. Back towards the front, meanwhile, uh, Jacob Hodge is getting away. One and a half seconds clear of his race car consultant's teammates, Ronnie Smith and Lucas Hayden, who themselves are doing battle for that second spot. Is Lucas Hayden going to have a go here into Druid? He is going to have a go into Druid. Goes to the inside line. Ronnie Smith tries to close the door. Little bit of levering aside there. It was quite a late move by both of them, really. And in fairness, Ronnie Smith, uh, uh, Lucas Hayden, I think, was letting Ronnie back through as they went down the hill. Bit of, uh, That's Charlie Ellis and George, George Foxlow, Foxlow going slowly. Yes. Hmm. Very okay. slowly in Foxlow's case. Yeah, that's a shame because George was up on the front row of the grid, which is unfortunate. Um, I thought yeah. just also there, Ryan McKay, if he's, he's some six seconds back, but I thought he was also sort of going a little bit slowly as well in the background. Maybe just him exiting out of Graham Hill Ben trying to get back up to speed. But still, four and a half minutes to go. And there's still, as it is, it's now side by side. This is now Ben Moore Ryan trying to get past Wesley Swain. This will be to put him back into eighth position. But Swain's a little bit wayward over the curb. He's now got Billy Blockley behind him. Good to see Billy Blockley up there in the top ten. He's having a decent enough run in there. It's one of his better runs of the season. So one or two elements of bad luck himself. But even so, he's still having a good run so far on the top ten. He's in the mix there too. Just ahead of them, you've now got Smith. He's got O'Neill going. Now gets a five second, gets a sorry, black and white for track limits. But again, if he was to get a penalty, it wouldn't really change how many points that Ben Moore Ryan gets back. Because remember, he's one of a handful of guests in, the, in this weekend. So Jensen O'Neill going is invisible for points as this is now between Jensen Mason and Ben Doty on the outside line. Doughty goes for it into uh, Druid to the back end. Then into the pit leg over Charlie Ellis and George Foxlow. So they, they were going slowly earlier on. They managed to trundle away back to the pit lane. Thankfully out of um, harm's way too much. As Hayden and Ronnie Smith continue on in second and third. Hayden of course in, Hayden on course of course to win here in the Mark 6s. Battle here is looking pretty tight, though. It's Mason's three to battle. You've got two battles you've got to look out for here. This is Mason, Doty, and Jensen O'Neill going. This is over fifth position. And then eighth, ninth, and tenth between Swain, Mul Ryan, and Blockley. And Blockley's the key, and Mul Ryan's the key one. He's right in the middle there as well. Eighth position, sorry, ninth position. If you can get past Swain at one more place, and he won't gain another uh, couple of points until he gets past both O'Neill going, or at least Oga or going, and then possibly Ben Doherty or Jensen Mason, one of the two. But at the moment, as it stands, Touchwood, he's three minutes away from potentially provisionally wrapping up the Fiesta Junior title. But he's going to survive these next three minutes on the Browns Hatch Indy circuit. And if he can make up a couple more places with moves that certainly make sense, he can certainly will do it. Ooh. Well, that was Jensen Mason getting caught in the middle. He sort of gives a little love tap to the back of Bendo. So they're all over each other. And oh, Jensen O'Neill going was right over the, over, the, over the front bumper of Wesley Swain there. But now the two groups have come together. Is that Jensen going back round oh, the outside? Fair play. That was a great move from Jensen. He'll go round the outside. Look at that. Mason so busy defending from Wesley Swain. Here comes Ben Moore Ryan down the outside. Oh. Is he going to get squeezed out? He does. Looks at the inside line to try and get back through again. They're all stacking up. Ben Moore Ryan. This is nervy. This has been nervy times for both his, his, his parents and the race car consultancy thinking, please, just get to keep it together and get it home to seal the title provisionally. Please. I, I think he very much jumped out of the throttle there, wanted no part of that as they went down the Cooper Strait. He's already had a bit of uh, damage to the front of the car. Hopefully that's not going to uh, cause any major problems. He certainly still has some good pace in a straight line, doesn't he? Closes in on the two cars ahead, who again go side by side. These two have been locked in combat all race long, Jensen Mason uh, and Wesley Swain. They've been battling for a few different positions as the race has gone on. Again there, Swain tried the outside. That leaves the door open Here now for Mul Ryan. Jensen O'Neill going, goes past Ben Doughty. What's going on behind? Mul Ryan up the inside of Wes Swain, who will hang tough on the outside. That's the inside line then for Graham Hill Bend. And he should get the better of uh, Ben Mul Ryan. But does that then allow Billy Blockley up the inside? It might well do. You've got um, Marcel Lejitski uh, closing up on this group as well. So more cars arriving behind Bull Ryan, who could have the potential to pass him. In fact, uh, Lejitski uh, goes past um, Billy Blockley there around the outside at Surtees. And so he now becomes the man applying the pressure to Ben Bull Ryan, for whom ninth place we think should be enough. Dan Lewis still going slowly. Yes, it was. They're all just going to... Go around the outside of Dan, whose championship hopes very much now uh, have started to dissipate. So, Lechitsky up into the top ten. 
It's a 3.1 second lead for Jacob Hodgkiss though, over Lucas Hayden, Roddy Smith third, all of the action happening behind. What a performance this has been though from Jensen O'Neill going, Scott. I mean, I really enjoy watching Jensen. He's exciting to watch. He is aggressive, but always seems to have it under control, doesn't he? And uh, he has emerged in this first full weekend of racing that he's done with us as one of the fastest drivers on the grid and surely a contender for the championship next year. You'd certainly think so. And he'll certainly want to do, if he does If he does go in for a full season, that will certainly be his aim, to try and get up there and be towards the front if he can make it. I just noticed that Dan Lewis is still circulating around, it looks like, but some two laps down. And he looks like he'll still finish in 18th position. 18th gives you 10 points. Oh, but no. Billy Block is off the road. That's true. So that's think. interesting. And Russian Chicken Rembrandt gets a trapped penalty. Now then, the question you'd like to ask, really, is did he jump or was he pushed? And he was in that big gag of the car, so that would be intriguing. We didn't see the outcome, but we'll wait and see how that plays out. Meanwhile, though, there's Jacob Hodgkiss literally doing just everything he can, really. He's, he's literally done, not really put a foot wrong in this case. He's driven as, as hard as he can. He's got out into the lead, got the fast snap of the race, practically left most of the way. And he's literally all he can do now. Literally everything is uh, the fate is, is, in, is, is in everyone else's hands right behind them, really. That's, that's where it comes from. Uh, it's Mulrine in ninth that will give him... Uh, Mulrine will give him 28 points, and we put it in, on by uh, 10. Now... There's a little bit of damage to the front left of Mo Ryan's car by the look of it. So yes. on the front left. Meanwhile, Jacob Hodgkiss will <laughs> weave from side to side. As he knows, he's done all he can. He will end the weekend with double victory in the Fiesta mm -hmm. Juniors. Cross the line, and he just about tensely comes across. Second place, Lucas Hayden. He wins the Mark VI category as well. And third to Ryan McKellar. But for ninth place, he stays where he is. We know what's going to happen. Should be the championship for Ben Ryan. But what a nervy way to win it. After the drama of yesterday, he's got a damaged car. He's got the indicator flashing. He was well out of the top ten at one point. But he is going to cross the line in ninth position to claim provisionally the Fiesta Junior Championship in 2023. Uh, well, ninth place, not necessarily the way that he would have liked to have wrapped the title up, but hey, it gets the job done. There is Sam Nessa. He had a trying time uh, in that one as well. And Sam uh, will still, I think, secure third place in the points. Yes, just about over Dan Lewis uh, by about 10 points or so. But Ben Will Ryan, deserving champion, really had the edge all season long, came into the final round with that lead and arguably should have been a bigger one uh, coming into this race. In fact, he almost wrapped the title up yesterday. It ended up going down to the final race and he has survived, survival definitely being uh, the operative word, I think, in that one. He survived to claim the championship provisionally. Of course, this all depends on any post-race uh, judicial uh, procedures, but uh, hopefully he wasn't involved in anything. He has got that little bit of damage, but uh, I think that was just incidental, really, from the very close racing that they were enjoying. So Jacob Hodgkiss wins the final race of the 2023 season in the Fiesta Junior Championship by 6.4 seconds over Lucas Hayden second, and Ryan Mikalev comes home in third. Then it is Ronnie Smith and Jensen O'Neill going. O'Neill going, capping off a fantastic weekend. Driver of the weekend, actually, for me, uh, Jensen here at Brands. Ben Doughty was sixth, Jensen Mason was seventh, Wesley Swain was eighth after their race-long duel, and Ben Will Ryan in the end had to settle for ninth, that is, we think, enough for the championship. Marcel Lusitsky uh, was 10th ahead of Rashan Tyler, Chigarimbo, Jensen Bell, James Pope, and Sam Nessa in 14th. Josh Watts, Jasmine Shaw, and Dan Lewis were next, whilst it was uh, not finished then for Billy Blockley, George Foxlow, uh, Ellis, and for uh, Hunter Johnson as well. So just the four of them failing to get to the flag. We did get 21 of them out uh, for that race. We only lost a couple, actually, after yesterday's shenanigans. Well, Scott brilliant end to the season actually a fantastic race had it all yeah. didn't it? it was a great race just on its own a brilliant drive that by Jacob Hodgkiss to come through from where did I say started 10th on the grid I think something like that to win the race uh, and then what drama behind as uh, Ben Mulryan just about got it over the line yeah and I think that caps off what's been let's look at the positives I mean it's been the biggest season of Fiesta Juniors today it's their first year running as TCR support series lots of interest lots of support lots of incoming new drivers for next year we've seen we've got the brand new Fiesta Junior scholarship which is happening in the middle of February next year if you want more information on that head to the BRS see website there's a tab at the top that says junior scholarship if you want to enter that and possibly win a f if you have your junior driver you are a junior driver or a parent or someone who knows someone who could race in it then that could be a possible uh, win in the scholarship to race a mark seven for the full season in a prize package worth sixty five thousand pounds with all the trimmings on top of it you want more info on that check it out but i think for the final time for yes juniors we can head down to the top of the pit lane to have a chat with our top three and hopefully our, cha our provisional champion ben moore ryan they'll be at the top with richard john neal down in pit lane Thanks, Scott. Apologies for, for being away from the BRSEC backdrop, but as you can see, we've got Ben Mulryan being congratulated. Jacob Hodgkin is here as well. It, it's difficult. Who do we congratulate? Jacob, first of all, you're nearest to, to camera. Well done on the win. We'll grab a quick word of you in a minute. And Ben, 
Every, this has sorted itself so well this weekend with the incidents of yesterday. Ben Mulryan, congratulations. How does it feel to be champion? Oh, it's unreal. I'm just so happy. Oh, let me get my helmet off. Well, we will let you do that. While you're doing that, pause for thought on what I was going to say. I spoke to you youngsters in the holding area before the race, and the way you've all dealt with the incidents from yesterday, you're, you're a credit to, to the formula. I've got to say, the way you dealt with it, and there's some real honesty around the paddock. Well done on the championship. What, what are your first thoughts? Wow, I can't believe it. It's just that we've worked so hard for it this year. You know, through the highs and through the lows, weeks especially. You know, ended it with the, in the gravel of Paddock uh, Race One. I, I, I'm not. I can't believe it. <laughs> and that was with your teammate, wasn't it? And you guys have sorted that. Out, I think in a pretty mature way. Yeah, definitely. I mean, between me and Dan, obviously there was the. There was, um, there, was, uh, there was a little bit of anger between us between the first part of it, but then we managed to sort it out. Just spoke about, so, spoke out, and uh, I know there isn't a bone in Dan's body that would do, try to do it intentionally. So I see it was completely an accident, and it, it all ended well either way. So, Well done on, on the championship. I'm sure we're going to hear a lot more of you. Any, any thoughts about what's next at this stage? No plans for the moment. Um, yeah, no plans for the moment. And uh, we, I'll tell you what, I don't know if you were doing the sums in your head and getting the pit signals, was that the case? Yeah, uh, for some reason I couldn't see my, my, my guys on the pits. So I came in and I had to speak to Laura, did I get it, did I get it? Because it was kind of the in-lap and I, I could kind of feel like I got it, but I wasn't 100% I wasn't sure, so yeah. Ben, ben Moran, 2023 Fiesta Junior Champion, one of uh, so many great names that are coming through this wonderful championship. Well done, we look forward to seeing you. I hope you'll be at the scholarship in uh, February. Jacob Hodgkiss, the race winner. Jacob, great to see you, congratulating. I'll tell you what, I'm going to get you by the backdrop, just so we've got a little bit of a money shot with the logos and, um, and pull you away from the celebrations there. It's wonderful to see just how well you're all celebrating uh, together. We'll get you forward a little bit more. No, uh, well, congratulations. What a weekend for you, though. Obviously, two wins. You had a win earlier on in the season. Um, your words to us after yesterday's race were very measured and calm and uh, pretty wise, I thought. And uh, you've gone and done it again today. Super result. And you, you took the, the championship as far as you can. Yeah, come in, Laura. Let's have the, the spoils of victory as well. <laughs> Laura, championship coordinator. Sorry, I'm wittering on too much. What are your words on, the, on that double win? I mean, I did everything I could with Ben. You know, I had a bad start to the championship. He deserves the championship, but all I could do was get to the front. And that's what I did. I'm really happy with my results. I mean, a double at Brands Hatch, I can't really ask for much more. But vice champion, you know, he doesn't have the same ring, but I'll take it. <laughs> Very well done indeed. The camaraderie we've just seen, that's real, isn't it, for the juniors? Yes. Yeah, 100%. Ben deserves that. And uh, to congratulate him. Everybody should. I mean, he's worked for it. The future of this championship is based on what you guys do. People come and look at it. What's your message for anyone thinking about joining or thinking about coming to the scholarship? Anybody thinking about coming at, like, anywhere near this championship, it is a team. It is, the paddock is just friendly, unless obviously it's a bit heated after, the, after you get out of the car sometimes. But the paddock is friendly, the racing is amazing, and the teams are phenomenal as well. You should really come to the scholarship or just give it a try on the test day. Jacob, well done on a double win for being a great ambassador for the championship. Our second place man, Lucas Hayden. Let's see if we can get Lucas over. Where is he? We're having a look around. We've got... Lucas Hayden met this guy on another scholarship a good while ago. Let's get you onto the Thank spot you. here. And uh, many congratulations. Is that, uh, oops, break the pot. <laughs> is that, I think that's your first podium, is that right? Um, no, we had a podium last year at Cadwell and we got in class at Donington, but it's just what a way, to, yeah, this year and what a way to round out the year with the winning class. Couldn't quite get Jacob, he was so quick today, but yeah, unreal result. Proper. The team clearly put a lot of work to get the car together as well when I was looking closely at it in the holding area before the race. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, after yesterday's incidents, we were involved, unfortunately. We did get collected, but the team have put in an unreal job working overnight to get it out for today, and it's still just as quick as it was yesterday, and we managed to bring home the result. Not a bad way to finish the year, is it, getting up into the top three? Nick Jacobs' trophy. Laura's going to give Lucas his second place trophy. That's great. We get to see the presentation as well. Um, it's a good way. It's nice to finish the year with a pot, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And it's just to, I mean, we can take the momentum into winter testing and push towards next year. So hopefully more of, the bet, like, more of this next year. Same, same championship? Uh, not same championship, but front wheel drive, so... Okay, can you say or? Uh, that front wheel drive is all I can give. Okay, we look forward to seeing your social media. Lucas, great to see you again. Many congratulations on getting that. Fine race for second position. Our third position man, Ronnie Smith. Let's get Ronnie. 
Where's Ronnie? I'm, I'm scanning around doing the panorama shot. Ronnie. <laughs> Here's Ronnie. Congratulations. Thank you. I think Laura wanted to shake your hand and give you a hug. Right. Let's get you on the spot, Ronnie. Um, a few podia over the course of, of the season and uh, another one to, to wrap things up. Third position, not too bad. Second in the Mark Sixes as well. Yeah, it was all right. Um, last five laps, we only had fourth gear only. Uh, gearbox blew up, so <laughs> quite happy at the end. But um, yeah, not much else I could have done with only fourth gear. That's good. What are your first thoughts when, when you realise that you got that problem? Because presumably you have to adapt and you've got to adapt in a split second. Well, yeah, I, I basically just tried all the gears and fourth was the only one. So I was like, well, it looks like I'm driving with that. So, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think we've secured second in the championship now. So uh, that's more, more than good for my first year in cars. Many congratulations. Thoughts on the future? Obviously, we all look towards budgets and yeah. things like that. But uh, reflections on the year as a whole? Yeah, first, for a first year, I've, I come from karting last year, so done a lot of learning through the year. We've gradually improved and improved. And hopefully next year we can find the money to be doing something quite big. That would be good, Ronnie. been great to see you. Great to meet you. look forward to seeing you as you continue your journey up the, up the ladder. I don't know if we've got Sam Nessa here as well. Is, is Sam here? We'll grab a quick word with Sam. I think he's Mark 6, top Mark 6 runner. We've got a bit of time before the last the chance. All right? How's it going? Let's have a quick word. I mean, I said, I said to the team and staff, we're just going to go have a bit of fun because that's all I need to do. Didn't quite mean to that extent, but can't complain. Third overall Mark 6 champion. Yeah. Championship's been frenetic, hasn't it? And uh, but he's come through with a very, from my point of view, very positive race at the end of the year. Yeah, yeah, I'd say so. Um, yeah, it's, just, it's been such a chaotic year. Had so much, so much bad luck throughout the second phase of the year. Just over the moon that we could actually bring it home where we wanted to. Sam, good luck. Thanks very much for chatting to us. Well done. Is our Mark Six winner? Mark Six is, of course, the past. We look to the future with the Fiesta Junior Championship. The Mark 7 is very much now the car that's going to be to have next year. We've got a Mark 7 champion this year. We have now got the last chance race for the festival, top six of whom will go through to our festival final. So let's go back to Scott and Andy in the commentary box for a look forward to who is going to get those last six, last six slots on the grid. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Richard. The last chance race, always a highlight of the weekend, actually. It's the shortest of the Formula Ford races, just eight laps, not a lot of time to get the job done, and not a lot of opportunities, really, to get the job done either. Only those top six finishers will progress to the grand final, and, of course, they'll have to start off the back of the grid for that grand final, which is not ideal, but a couple of drivers towards the front of this grid well, arguably could have, should have been looking at front row starts maybe uh, for that grand final later on, namely the likes of Felix Fisher and Nolan Orla, who we saw start on pole position for the semi-final earlier on and ended up going off the road at Druids, if memory serves, uh, and fell out of those all-important transfer spots. Only just missed out on an automatic transfer, but certainly not uh, on the front of the grid, as he would have been expecting. So a nervy time, this, for the drivers. They're out on the grid. So before the green flag lap gets underway, let's take a look at how they're going to line up uh, for our last chance race. It is Felix Fisher on the pole, Rick Morris starting alongside him. Uh, then Donald Downey and Nolan Arla uh, on that second row of the grid. Then it's Richard Higgins and Ben Maludi. They will share row three. Higgins, of course, fresh off winning in the race parts historic final earlier on. Uh, then it will be uh, Drew Stewart and Drew, uh, Dave uh, Cameron on... Sorry, Drew Stewart and Drew Cameron. Two Drews together on row number four. Row five, Guys Ginn and Adam Fathers with Kevin McClurg and Callum Grant rounding out the top dozen. Then a couple to watch for, perhaps Isaac Canto de Silva and Hugh Esterson. Hugh Esterson also should have been a lot further up the order than this, uh, but had a spin in his semi-final earlier on, so he's got uh, some work to do for the 14th, definitely one to watch for. Then it's Dieter Harkel and Dan Renning Larson. In the eighth row, whilst Renning nine is shared by Guy Shepard and Stuart Kestenbaum. Then it is Jonathan Nash and Gerhard Hauschultz with Jane Buckton and Vincent J on row 11, row 12, Tim Fitzgerald and Lauren Chapman. Ben Hadfield and Montoya Baker uh, on the 13th row of the grid. Then we get Andy Charsley. He should make some forward progress from there, you would imagine. He's got um, uh, Sigmund Marlam next to him. Then it's Harry Samblum and Murray Shepard to round out the field. We get Murray should make some progress, whether he can make it to the top six. 
tonight to be a bit of a long shot. We have seen it before though, Scott. Uh, certainly the two years that I've previously covered the festival, there's always been someone off the back of the grid who we know has the pace to get to the front. It's just whether they have the time to get to the front. And um, there's often a big disparity in pace in this race. You've got a lot of the historic cars naturally find themselves in this race. And then some of those newer uh, cars running in the pro class coming from the back they can make quick work but what they don't want is a safety car and what they certainly don't want is to get tangled up with anybody because you just don't have time to bounce back that's the magic of the festival though that's what it is it, even with the last chance race you have to work as hard as you can in that short space of time it's just eight laps it's you have to bear in mind that the uh, the shortened semi-final one that we had was 10 laps so that would mean two laps cut more than what the two laps that more than what they're going to get here in this last chance race it really is going to matter in terms of making the most out of the time that you've got as the, as the way you start on the grid and just trying to pick your way through. Yes, it's going to be frantic. Yes, it's going to be frantic out there, but ultimately it's going to, it's going to be key to make that happen. It looks like I think CPU on Malin is having one or two car issues because that car is looking rather slow. It's sort of jolting along. It's trying to keep it going, but either something on some drive-wise or gearbox-wise or something. Was this the car? It's been a long day, Scott, so forgive me. Is this the car that lost a wheel at Graham Hill Bend? Yes, it on was. the outside. So yes. perhaps a legacy of, of whatever that was. Potentially, but that was a front left wheel. So it looks like yes. that was more mechanical sure. in terms of getting drive or getting along, whether he's trying to select a gear or get drive somewhere. But either, either that was just taking his time. But either way, he's. It doesn't look healthy, does it? Yeah. <laughs> Particularly. Does he head for well, pit that lane? It, it doesn't, that doesn't sound healthy. I can just hear it in the background. Yeah, yeah. he's heading for pit lane. So unfortunately, that will be Sig Bjorn's festival. Sadly, prematurely over, but good to have it have at least one of a handful, a small handful of Norwegians and Scandinavians through uh, to come across the festival and hopefully we'll welcome them back and a few more Europeans back on the grid as well. Indeed so. So he will pull into the pit lane and unfortunately not take the start. Looks like there's a couple of gaps actually towards the back of the field, but everyone at the front is there who we expected to see. The top six finishers will progress to the grand final. Who will they be? We'll find out in just a few minutes' time. The eight lap last chance race gets underway with a good start made actually by Rick Morris there from the outside of row one he's going to try and challenge felix fisher into paddock but doesn't quite manage to draw level into third place already has gone at nolan ola uh, and he will look now to try and close in on the leading group up towards druids they go then morris still in second position and nolan looking to try and find a way through as soon as possible few moves and shakers further down the order including one of the other uh, red and white ammonite cars cleanly through the first couple of turns down through graham hill bend and already scott lots of shuffling through the pack including near the front where nolan ola, ola tries to get ahead of rick morris for second place so rick morris is not interested at all in letting anyone through unless he really has to because he would love to go, and i think I, all of us would love to see him get into the get into the the, uh, the final oh. on this last chance event he's just in third place he's got donald downing in, uh, along alongside it that might be an uh, possibly uh, i think an ex cliff dempsey or Amalite Motorsport car, but he's holding on to fourth place at the moment now at least. We can at least only need to lose two more places. We've got to be careful. He's got a lot of modern cars around him. Richard Higgins also fresh from the historic final. is also holding on to Ooh. for that place. And that is that's Murray Shepard who I think is trotting around. Ooh, there was Hugh Esterson getting sideways there too. Getting past that was guys again. He's also fighting with Callum Grant. So they're all over each other here. And Adam Fathers is not too bad. Where did Adam Fathers start? He started in tenth position at the moment. He's going around the lap Murray Shepard. Adam, Adam Fathers up to eighth. You can see the graphic on the left-hand screen where the blue bar is. That is the cutoff point. So on the bubble right now is Ben Maludi. And a fair place for Rick Morris. He's keeping with the top three. We can do this for the next six laps. He'll get through to the festival final. And that would be some story if he can do that. Well, he's a good couple of seconds up on that transfer spot as well, isn't he? So he's doing well. Ben Maludi there, the blue card running wide. He's on the bubble. As, uh, again, we've got uh, Marie Shepard there sort of limping around back to the pit lane, you would hope at the end of the lap. Yep, that's where he goes. There is Maludi, though, and Drew Stewart behind him. So this is the battle for sixth position. The two blue cars heading towards us, whilst behind Adam Fathers under threat from Drew Cameron, who looked to the inside at Paddock, but wasn't quite able to make that move stick. Adam Fathers then holds on to eighth place for now. What's going on in that fight for sixth just ahead? They're still in the same order. They've got Richard Higgins just ahead as well. So it's actually fifth, sixth, and seventh running nose to tail as we're already onto the third lap of eight. There is Higgins, the uh, historic uh, champion for this year, having won the historic final probably only about an hour ago, if that. He turns down then into Surtees' corner, whilst there, look, is Hugh Esterson. Now, Esterson is the other one that we said would make some progress. He started 14th, actually, only just inside the top 10. Yeah, he could be the one who could possibly score the party for likes of Maludi and maybe Higgins at this point, so we have to keep an eye on him and see how much more progress he decides to make. He's now on the back of Adam Fathers. That will put, you think he's got past Drew Cameron in car 12. Yep, he's past the BM racing car. Now getting wheel-to-wheel -wheel with Adam Fathers. Down on the outside goes Hugh. 
course, he would love to make the festival final in the same way that his brother Max has done the past two years. Of course, Max won it last year in 2022. He's trying to battle his way through, and he's found his first kind of proper adversary here because Adam's not really interested in letting him through that easy. And why not? Because, of course, they're trying to get towards the final transfer spot, and Fathers defends and holds on to the place. Yes, he does. Down through the left-hander at Graham Hill, Ben, they go. It's a fascinating battle then. Maludi and Stewart, either side of the transfer line at the moment. They're also catching now Rick Morris and Donald Downey slightly. So that could very shortly become a fight for third as Hugh Esterson nips up the inside of Adam Fathers, moves into eighth position and now sets off after that group of cars ahead. Look at that beautiful tight line taken by the Ammonite Motorsport driver. The punching going on ahead though, was that Rick Morris under threat? Yes it was, to the outside goes Higgins, to the inside will look to go Maludi, who doesn't really want to get too involved in this, because it could back him up into Drew Stewart again, but he commits to the inside of Richard Higgins, and now Richard Higgins is the man on the bubble, takes a tight line, tries to cover coming out of uh, Paddock Hill Bend, to the outside will go Drew Stewart, is that one going to work this to try and get into the grand final later on today, sideways for Higgins off the curb, but just about manages to stay in front. This is tense stuff. I, th I, th I think I'm not, probably not the only one. I shouldn't have picked favourites, but I'm probably not the only one that actually wants Rick Morris to do this. He's holding on to fourth. Oh, he's got three more laps to hold on. That's a massive ask when you've got cars stacking up behind. And if, look, he's joined the party now. Mm. A certain Hugh Esterson, he's getting involved. Ooh. But that was Maludi and Higgins in the mix as well. This is now uh, Felix, F Felix Fisher versus Nolan All Eyes. This has been a change for the lead here. All Eyes leads across the line, but Felix Fisher coming back to him. The Carlson Coombe Forward and Forward champion. Go for the lead round the outside towards Paddock Hill Bend. He slots back in behind All Eyes. He's going to try and replicate what he did in his heat. As for the top six, it's still Morris in fourth, Maludi fifth, Higgins sixth. Yes, they're still holding on to eighth position. This battle continuing on. So there's the two key, there's the two key battles then. It's the battle for the lead and battle for that final transfer spot. The current top six at the moment as it stands. There's Rick Morris. He's still oh. there. This is helping him because he's now got Higgins, uh, Higgins in fifth position. This is now Maludi, Stewart, Esterson in there as well. He's got to try and get around at least these two because and, and then get after Higgins if he can. Uh, no, no, in fact, if he, get, if he gets past both of us, he will be in the festival final. He's got two more laps to do it now. If he can pass Stewart and then pass Maludi, that will be him as the top oh. six. And there goes Stewart looking up the inside, but he covers the line nicely. So two laps to go to the side. Who gets the final couple of transfer spots? <laughs> They're putting a lap on. I think that's Montoya Baker. Yes, it is. Here comes Fisher again to the outside line. No, 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 holding on with that fast lap of the race for what it's worth. Over the curb, holding on. Fisher will keep on pushing. If he stays there, it's another. If you get hand the place high, it'll be 25th to the 26th. And this is going to be very close indeed. But it's that battle for the 4th, 5th, and 6th spot. Rick Morris, legit by far. And I say he's politely the oldest man in the field, the most experienced man in the field. No. He's holding he's holding back the entire tide of all of them. Look at this. They are two by two. Hurrah behind him. But Rick Morris, the wily old fox, is holding on. Come on, Rick. Hold on. Oh, and where does Esterson go? He's up the inside almost of Higgins. He does go past Stewart. That puts him seventh, but he needs one more place. And in fact, Stewart comes back at him as they head down the Cooper straight. Wheel to wheel into Surtees corner. Does Drew Stewart commit? He tries to, but Esterson just hangs tough on the outside line and stays in seventh place. One more lap to go and one more place to gain there goes uh, Isaac Canto to Silver as well he's not completely out of this as they go on the inside of Montoya Baker onto the final lap of the race Mick Morris defending this fourth position to his outside goes Ben Maludi and uh, meanwhile for the race lead Felix Fisher looking to the inside of Nolan Olaya as they head for Druid's corner you don't know where to look as we start the final 1.2 miles of racing in this last chance race it has been everything we expected it to be it's all kicking off behind that's Esterson out wide at the inside goes Higgins as uh, any three, I think, of these six cars are going to oh, make it no! through. Oh, there's contact. That is Esterson over the back of the car in front of him. And that will be his festival done with, unfortunately. A big drama as they came out of Druid's corner. Esterson is out. And it was Maludi, I think, wasn't it, that he tangled with. Meanwhile, at the front of the field, Nolan Orlier comes out of the final corner. And he will claim the victory in the last chance race here at the Formula Ford Festival. Nolan Orlier wins just from Felix Fisher in second position. And then third position Donald Downey fourth position Rick Morris fifth Richard Higgins and Drew Stewart will get it uh, the sixth position and make it through into the final wow what a race what a dramatic conclusion drivers putting everything on the line uh, there are Ben Maludi and uh, Hugh Esterson both walking away unscathed after what was quite a scary moment there with uh, Esterson clambering over the back of Maludi's car
thankfully they both emerge unscathed. Sadly, their festival over, but at least they are okay. What a dramatic race that was. We sort of saw it coming. Brilliant battle for the win, actually, between Nolan and Felix. Could easily have been a battle for the final victory, actually, coming into the weekend. Uh, but they'll both have to come now from the back of the grid in the grand final with Donald Downey, Rick Morris, Richard Higgins and Drew Stewart making it through with them. First of all, it's good to see that both Ben Maludi and Hugh Esterson are out of that incident. Of course, it's never you want to see, everyone see an incident like that. Second thing I got my moment, getting Rick Morris fourth place in the festival, in, in the last chance race, and he makes the, the back of the festival grid final in 28th place. That is a story and a half for the festival to get into it. And I know how, how he's tried on that year after year to get into the festival final this year. He's driven superbly all weekend, and I'm certain he'll be one of, and end he's one of the top uh, classic cars in the mix. But that's a good stuff. So the six cars then to confirm: no, all I, uh, um, 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 Alla, Felix Fisher, Donald Downey, Rick Morris, Drew Cameron, and Richard Higgins. They will make up places 25 to 30. As <laughs> Hugh Eston almost loses his uh, crash helmet down the hill. That's a bit of an extra little unnecessary thing he didn't need, but uh, understandably, both Hugh and Ben look a little bit fed up after that. But I hate to say the phrase, but that's motor racing. The main thing is they're both okay. That's the key thing out of all of that. Obviously, you never want to see one car on top of another, but ultimately, they've both gone out. They're both okay, and obviously I'm sure they'll come back if they can next year and try all over again. But essentially, what that means now is once they add to the back of the grid, we have a festival final grid. We have 30 cars preparing for the final later on this afternoon. We've still got uh, uh, literally, well, two more races, one more race in between this. It's a big one. Of course, it's the second TCR UK race coming up. That is going to start by the timetable. I've, been, I've learned from the car, okay. of course. That's going to start at five to three. So there's going to be, yeah, so they're sticking at five to three. And so they're running a little bit ahead of time. Of course, they're doing that so they can keep it ahead because, of course, after the final TCR UK race of the season, you then have two more races, which is, of course, the all-important Formula Ford Festival final, sponsored by HeadTech. Big thank you to Ed and Natasha and everyone at HeadTech and Motorsport Events Limited, the parent company for them, to uh, sponsoring that one. And they'll be involved in the presentations later on in the Kentigan, both for the final and for the uh, special prize. There's a special prize they're putting up as well for the most places gained in the festival yeah. final. So there's a couple of drivers in there that could get it. Felix Fisher, I think Poston Nolan Orla could be a contender as well. He could be that one. Um, I know as well that we've agreed that if there is a tie between the number of places made, so if two drivers make up 10 places, it's whoever finishes higher of the two right. because obviously when they're done, one's done better than the other. So obviously that, they'll get it on that side. And the prize of which, very kindly uh, um, provided by HeadTech, is a HeadTech crash helmet. So yeah. that's quite handy for them. That's a, If they're looking for a new, a new crash helmet uh, for the next season, then whoever wins that can take that away and use that and put that to good use for next season, hopefully. Good stuff. Which is good stuff. And of course, uh, of course there's... Uh, on top of that, there's the other trophies we've got. We've got the John Nickel Memorial Trophy, the Roger Pedrick Trophy. The John Nickel Memorial Trophy is for the uh, it's for the most outstanding performance by a British driver. It's chosen by John surviving widow Deb, so she will choose the most outstanding driver. There's also the Roger Pedrick Trophy, which is uh, presented to the highest placed Englishman in the festival final. There's a couple of contenders in there, possibly Jamie Sharp, Robbie Smith, Chris Middlehurst could be in the mix as well. Uh, and then, of course, on top of that, we have the main, the, the main award, which is the Neil Shanahan Trophy, and that's, of course, for the winner of the festival grand final. And given the group we've got now, with a few cars towards the back picking their way through, I've got, I've got a feeling. I've got a feeling about this final. <laughs> I'm getting vibes of 2021 a little bit, and I hope I'm proven right, because the 50th one was an all-time classic. Even if it's not exactly the same thing, I hope we get a nice, clean, good, solid race, and we get something that just befits the grand final. And also, in, in all honesty, something that makes up for last year, because, of course, it was disappointing last year, of course, it was the circumstances that fell in that one. But hopefully we get a race that, that not only makes up for that one, but also befits this year's event as well in terms of the quality of the racing that we've had and the quality of drivers on top of that as well. It's been pretty mega all round on that side of things. So, yeah, um, three exciting races to come up next. Of course, <laughs> TCI UK finale, grand final for the festival, and then a dramatic Civic Cup finale to end it all as well. <laughs> I said, bring it on. Absolutely. It's been a fantastic weekend so far. It ain't over yet, as Scott Scott quite rightly says, that's easy for me to say. Uh, we have three races left, TCR UK up next for their final round of the championship. And uh, we will have Paul O'Neill, I think that's what he was signing to me, then heading down to the pit lane uh, to have a chat with, either to have a chat or have a drink with some drivers. I mean, maybe leave that till after the second race, Paul. I'm sure there'll be <laughs> some, uh, some celebrations <laughs> to be had. And uh, we look forward, as always, to hearing Paul's insightful uh, comments down on the grid with Anthony Jordan as well uh, who uh, will be talking to a few drivers ahead of what still is quite a nervy second race after the championship may have been decided 
But uh, we uh, still have a fight for second place in the championship. There are cash prizes for drivers who finish within those top three positions and uh, lots uh, still on the line for our TCL UK drivers, many of whom just want to end the season on a high. Although some uh, unfortunate news to come out between the two races, we will not have uh, Chris Smiley on the grid for this race, I believe. He has withdrawn from the final race, the issue that took him out of race number one, sadly taking him out of uh, race number two before it even starts. So the outgoing champion uh, in the final race of the season is sadly going to be a non-starter. And that is a crushing shame, really, because Chris has been a great supporter of TCR UK the couple of years that he's raced with us. We don't yet know what his plans are for next year, but it may be that he looks to uh, move on and race elsewhere, in which case it'll be TCR UK's loss, very much so, and a particular shame if that's the way that he has to bow out. But we'll see. We might not have seen the last of uh, Chris Smiley here in TCR UK. We shall have to see what his plans are for the future are, but uh, yeah, fascinating fight for second in the championship incoming, and uh, we will have all the build-up for that race coming up in just a few minutes' time. So we are waiting for drive for cars to be released. I think there is a small delay as they pick up the uh, Ben Maludi and Hugh Esterson mess that's been left on the uh, run down towards Graham Hill Ben. The spectators basking in the sunshine here late in the weekend. And uh, it has, we've been really spoiled with the weather actually. Uh, to be honest, all weekend actually, I know it was wet yesterday, but it could have been a lot worse. We were told it was going to be a lot worse and actually turned into quite a nice day yesterday too. Bit of overnight rain last night, but that had all cleared up by the time we got here this morning. And today it's been a picture perfect day really. Blue sky, only a few uh, white clouds above and uh, perfect conditions for racing. And that's why I'm, I'm sort of inclined to agree with Scott, actually, about uh, that Formula Ford Festival final to come. It's ideal conditions for racing, really. Uh, and uh, yeah, that is one not to be missed. Right then, uh, we are going to be back in a few minutes' time with the build-up for our final TCR UK race of the season. Championship may have been decided, but there's still plenty to race for in the final race of 2023. Do you wonder why your competitors' websites appear in Google searches ahead of you? Then make a call to the SEO experts Woya and understand how your business can be more visible online. As the official marketing partner of TCR UK, you can now work with a trusted search engine optimization partner to increase web traffic, inquiries, and sales. Speak to us for your free audit and quote by visiting woya.co.uk today. The voice and data solutions at speeds that are simply out of this world. Choose Maximum Networks.
Welcome back to Brands, it's TCR UK and uh, the sun's going away. It's getting a bit colder. Um, what do you know, AJ? I know many things uh, <laughs> about TCR racing. I know even more. Uh, plenty of things happened over the course of that one. Race one, very exciting. I think one point we had about 10 cars fighting for first place. Uh, dramatic moments as well. Dramatic exit for Andy Wilmot, leaving the pit lane right in front of the race leaders. That was a big drama, I think, and uh, a big shake-up for Chris Smiley, who unfortunately, as you saw in that race, dropped back. He's now retired from the meeting, which is a big shame. <laughs> As uh, Mark Smith's wagon firing up, he had a trip of the gravel as well. But yeah, for Chris Smiley, um, yeah, disaster for him. Power steering failure. Uh, it oh, then wow. melted some wires, uh, and then it cut all the power. Wow. And it stalled several times. He brought it in, and, and yeah, I think it's just for him. It's just yeah, I think we're done. I had a good chat with him. He is going to stay. He's going to watch the next race. But yeah. yeah, big shame for him. Yeah, that is not good, is it? And I was just thinking, I think, I think um, Andy Wilmot's car is actually. A bit further back, I want to the show. Yeah. Is it? Actually, sorry to put you up and down the paddock, but if, if the car We're is there, I would, I would like to. Um, I would like to show you uh, the tribute to Dan Kirby on the actual car. Sorry, Mickey. Um, Mickey Butler from uh, from Goodyear behind me. He's. Um, they've done a great job this year, haven't they? The uh, the winner of this. Um, the winner of this championship. Um, oh, sorry, the Civic Cup actually gets uh, a Jazz Honda. Uh, drive, don't they? And, they, and, and they a test. Do. Yeah, in the FL5 as well. Yeah, so uh, looking forward to seeing who's going to be taking that one. And uh, yeah, that certainly shaped it, uh, yeah, shaped itself cool. up, but, hasn't uh, it? But the support of but the support of, of Goodyear is always awesome, isn't it? It is. Yeah, it is always good to see. And uh, here at uh, yeah. Andy Wilmot, and uh, yeah, obviously you can see on the front of the car there uh, the fantastic tribute to uh, to Dan Kirby. Yeah. Uh, his dad's here, sisters here as well watching the action and uh, yeah you got to think they've had uh, an exciting uh, weekend to watch haven't they yeah they have and we'll just get a little we'll just get a little shot of the Dan Kirby tribute just here hello kids and um, just on the front of the bonnet obviously carrying his name as well which is uh, which is lovely but um, yeah I've actually not seen um, Andy Wilmot uh, kicking about today I know he's always um, usually around and about but uh, he is not He's not uh, been really around today, but we will try and catch him on the grid because we have got a bit of time. I know we're, we're a bit ahead of schedule today, but uh, a lovely gesture from, from Andy Wilmot and also um, a lovely gesture from the team as well uh, who are running the car. And a great car it is, but I think we should maybe explain to people uh, what this tribute's about. Obviously, Dan was a very good friend of ours in the paddock in TCI UK, uh, a stunning lad. I knew him pretty well. He helped a lot of drivers get onto the grid in different championships, um, and he was a fantastic guy and unfortunately uh, lost his life um, between transmission um, to to, uh, to here at TCI UK at Brands Hatch. So we'll show you a little video if that's OK and uh, just show you, uh, you know, what Dan was about. Kirby leads into Red Gate. It looks like Kirby's got the run, but he'll be on the outside for Rocket. If he gets this done early doors, that's a great pass. Side by side for the race lead. Max Hart on the inside of Dan Kirby as they head for McLean's. To the inside goes Kirby as he tries to attack and defend at the same time. This is proper racing. Two wheels on the grass for Kenton. On the inside goes Dan Kirby as well. Some more really opportunistic overtaking there from him. Third place, it's close as well, but Bradley Kent goes around the outside and there's contact. Bradley Kent is off, Toby Bird is sideways, Dan Kirby gets the lead of the race. It's just a mad, mad race, and to come through the pack like that, you know, a bit of fortune as well, obviously it helps, of course it does, but, you know, to get the first win is unbelievable. So there's the new champion. Thanks for that, Stuart Lyons. Yeah. He isn't the new champion. Legend. Just walking through our shot there. Um, yeah. Well, that's not Carl Bordley, is it? Oh, Looks a not. bit like Carl Bordley. But uh, the new champion there on his uh, not looking like he's going anywhere. Yeah, still on the jacks. Carl Bordley in the background. 2023 TCR UK champion. Now. And uh, yeah, he's hiding now. He doesn't want any more press coverage, does he? No. But uh, yeah, what a great what a great year. And I know we've spoken about him quite a lot, but a deserving champion. Oh, definitely so. You know. Uh, thought it was all over for him didn't he you know leaving the world of motorsport then coming back joining TCI UK and and I don't want to say 
dominating the championship because it certainly wasn't a, a dominant performance but at the tail end of the season that's where he really started to come into it and apologies for uh, Stuart Lyons again he, he, he does get does he get paid to do come here these weekends what I find interesting is that I'm more professional than Stuart Lyons which is just the weirdest thing to say, isn't it? No, I don't think that's strictly true, but it's close. It's close. <laughs> but yeah, for Bordley, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I think it's definitely been a season to remember for him. You saw him after the uh, the race. There was some emotion there. Um, yeah. He got choked up as well when I was speaking to him. And it just shows it means a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does mean a lot. And, uh, you know, so it should. You Winning any kind of championship is, uh, is is not an easy an easy feat, but he's done a great job. Um, should we go and have a little look at Jensen Brickley next door? Oh, um, there's a wall see. between these two cars now, but they... they uh, they were quite close in some of the races at Silverstone, weren't they? They certainly were. Well, in fact, too close. Uh, but, yeah, no, um, for Jensen this weekend, oh, I mean, fighting for the championship. And, yeah, unfortunately, it didn't go his way. Pole position, he lost it. It, was, it wouldn't go into gear. That was the issue. It wouldn't go into gear. Uh, the gear actuator had failed or something like that. They, the team had to... They found a fix for it. It's not repaired, and they're not replacing anything, but they found a solution to the problem. So... The issue is still there in the car, but hopefully they can do the race. And the race, the race one was Mackie he came through the field. Yeah. I mean, you'd be a you'd be a brave person not to bet against him being on the podium for this one. Oh yeah, yeah. He's got nothing to lose. But the, the battle in for second place in the championship is is pretty impressive, isn't it? We've got you know. There's still second place to be uh, to be sorted. I know that Adam Shepherd is uh, is going to go out all guns blazing. He was telling me in an interview that you know he was struggling for power halfway through. There was a there was a problem with his car as well. So so yeah, it's all to play for. But uh, Jensen won't be going out there just for a bit of crack. He'll be going out there to hopefully finish second. You can see them just talking the uh, talking the wheels up on the car. These these cars have five and six um, wheel nuts that they need to make sure have a. Very, very cool. To, to tell you exactly what's going on, um, Alex Lee, now third in the championship, mm. humps himself up 15, 11 points. I think it's 11 points behind Adam Shepard going into this final race. Yeah. So, yeah, 11 points separating then second and third in the championship. And it's not like, you know, that's, oh, it's only second. Yeah. The cash prize for second in this championship is still mega. Well, this is the thing you've got to think about. There's a lot on offer, isn't there? The cash that TCR UK are giving to drivers for winning, for being second and third, for being on pole position. There's all sorts of cash prizes on offer, and also where you finish in the championship is uh, is, is a cash prize as well. So yeah. that's something to, to bear in mind. And they won't, you know, there's, there's, there's quite a bit of a difference in how much you will get for second and third and things like that. So pretty cool. Shout out, though, to, to Oliver, who's going to be on the front row, uh, yeah. Cotton. And obviously, Paul Sheard Racing and Pep and the team have been working hard to get that car working. Um, the Audi has been a great car, but it's a car that really does work well in the World Series on longer, longer tracks. Yeah. So they have had their work cut out trying to get this car um, to perform how how it has been performing here uh, this weekend. So I wouldn't be surprised if that if that lad was on the podium this week this this in this race too. Yeah, yeah, it should be good. I mean, if we can make that wide Audi as wide as he possibly can, uh, I'm sure he'll be absolutely fine. But yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there. They really do uh, prefer the longer circuits, and uh, yeah, Brands Hatch is just one of those circuits where it's not a long track very short very technical the Audis have struggled just that little bit but I'm sure the guys who are running in the Gen 2s as well as the guys at uh, Rob Boston Racing as well uh, Joe and uh, Jack you know they've all been working hard to make sure that they've been working uh, well around this track and I think they've done a great job yeah definitely if we just have a quick look at Oliver actually he's been left on his own in the car so he's just guiding himself into his thought process and making sure that uh, everything's ready to rock and roll engine isn't running on the car it's just time to get the circuit in your head this is a big opportunity for him starting on the front row of the grid yeah um, car was fast enough I think he had second or third quickest lap in the race yeah so you know that's, this could be the one for me. It'd be great to see him end on a high. It Shall we have be. a little walk down? Yes. Let's go to the. Uh, let's go towards Adam Shepherd. Adam's got his engine running, um, and obviously all the drivers are in now. Alex Lee's in, in there. Looks yep. like he's just sorting his belts out. 
He's and, focused, uh, ready to go. Brilliant result for Alex, taking yeah, a race win. Solid, uh, solid for him. Good to see him again, shining yeah. at the end of the season, like he yeah. did last year as well. Which is which is pretty special stuff, isn't it? The cars are starting to leave the garage now, so if we just come a bit further out of the way, because I know we'll either get pinwheeled or we'll end up starting the race on the front of the bonnet, which is uh, we don't I, want that. I mean, to, uh, I mean, what a reporting angle that would be. <laughs> uh, <laughs> to turn one, oh, no. That would be some journalism, <laughs> that wouldn't it? Taking one for the team. Yeah, they're um, they're going to get they're going to get sent out. It'd be interesting to see what kind of tyres these uh, these guys run. I know on the front of Bruce's car. Wow, Bruce is going for new fronts. So I'm just looking behind you guys. There's, uh, there's, a f there's a few cars that I can see with, they've got brand new rear tyres on the car and they will be changed to the uh, front, front yeah. yeah, when they go to the grid. So, yeah, there will be some people who won't have that opportunity because you only get six new tyres yeah. in TCR UK. So, But yeah. it's the last race of the season, so why not? Yeah, why not is right. So should we head, uh, should we head onto the grid while we can? I think we can. Yeah, we can we do, do that? that, can't we? So let's let's, uh, let's go and have a wander around. I always hate... There's just... a gap in the fence up there. There's also a gap over there. I think we go for that gap. Yeah, let's I go down go the bottom gap. here. We'll just let Rick Kerry come past us. And that's Rick in the 72. Don't want to get run over. I mean, OK, let's talk about it. Championship, the, the actual championship itself has been decided. Yeah. For the rest of these drivers here right now, it's kind of all to play for. Yeah. How wide are they going into uh, turn one? How many? Four? Well, Five? I'm, I'm going to say that when it's the end of the day and it's the last race of the year, everybody just goes for it because these cars don't need to be fixed anymore. I think they will just have it large. It's at the last day of school. There might be a few little niggly moments that they've had in the, in the earlier part of the season and people will be getting paid back. I say, I say we go and have a little walk. Should we go yeah, and do that? Come on. Do it. Go on. I bet you any money it goes green now and we all... Yeah, exactly. Like, it goes green while we're over. in the middle of the pack. Let's but, quickly... Uh, yeah. Hopefully Mark Smith stays on the track for the first lap. Yeah. He caused a bit of grief, didn't he, before? He did. Well, I think he helped out Jensen Brickley a little bit to get through the pack, didn't he? Yeah. So, go on after you, mate. Bit. Cheers, mate. Cheers, mate. Squeeze through. Uh, oh, it's a bit more space out here. I feel a bit safer on yeah. the track. A bit weird, though, isn't it? Mm, yeah. Mate, round 15 of this one. It's, it's been a year, hasn't it? It's been yeah. a year. Hey, Ashley Gallagher, I think you've got to have yeah. a word with Ash, haven't Why you? Why not? Why not? Get in there. He hates this, doesn't oh, well, he? We'll, we'll Ash Gallagher, don't we'll swear. We'll him. Um, I nearly did then, sorry. Um, I haven't seen you much today, mate, but... Um, I've been I'll... hiding from you as soon as you keep door stopping <laughs> me on the TV. We always, we always wax lyrical about your impact on the championship, mate. End of the year, were you expecting it to be as successful as it has been, mate? It's difficult to say, really, Paul, what my expectation was at the start of the season, I guess, because it's, you know, a new job for me. Uh, you know, the championship was going through a big change with coming onto our own weekends and, you know, headlining. So it, uh, it always talks on my ear when I'm on this. But I think, yeah, we're, we're really pleased, you know. Um, there's still a bit of work to do. We've got a lot of changes planned for next year, but I, I'm, I'm pleased, yeah, for sure. This Gen 1 Cup will be quite cool, mate. Whose idea was that? I'd love to take credit for that, but yeah, Stuart did, uh, you know, he dreamt that one up. I think that's going to add another dynamic to it. It gives people opportunities to bring cars out that aren't currently racing. You know, there's no downside to it. It'd be great for the championship, so. There's a lot of people asking me about it, mate, so it's a good thing. Maybe we can get you out in one. Nope. Right, cheers, Ash. I don't want to be beaten by a load of people. Um, AJ, who have you got? He looks like I, a nice fella. I got, I got Michael, the friendliest man with the biggest beard I've ever seen in my life. Uh, Michael is looking after the, well, the entirety of uh, the pretty much the start line. Michael, this has been a tough day. We've got a busy bunch of drivers here with uh, Formula Ford and the Fiesta Junior Civic Cups and, of course, TCR UK. Uh, the final race of this one, um, certainly, it's going to be a busy one. What do you think? Yeah, it's definitely going to be busy, especially as race one championship was over so it's all uh, it's all gloves off for race two so it should be should keep us busy all around the track obviously you guys do an absolutely fantastic job of making sure that these guys stay nice and safe you're you're one of the volunteer marshals here and you know we can't thank the marshalling team and uh, yourself enough for all the hard work you do but uh, i mean it must be an experience being a marshal oh i love it i've been doing it for about seven years now and you cannot get closer to motorsport um, than a marshal's job your hands on fantastic mates that you meet around the circuit and around the country going to various circuits absolutely love it yeah. 
Uh, would you, uh, what would you say to anyone who wants to maybe be a marshal? What would you say to them to do? Uh, log on, uh, BMMC, marshals.co.uk, do a taste today, and I believe you, me, you'll be coming back for years to come. Awesome. Cheers, Michael. Have no a good worries. day. Enjoy much. it. Thank you very much. Top Paul. money. Yeah, great beard. It is great, but it looks I'm like the lead. I'm very jealous. Look, look like the lead singer of ZZ Top. I just don't <laughs> want to get in the way. Here. Let's uh, let's just get to the front of the uh, of the grid. Um, I don't know what else to say really about the championship. It's been it's been that good this year. Even that even that first race today was was what tin top racing should be about. Close, yeah. no massive contact, um, and just respectful racing. It they've done a good job, haven't they? They have. I think the respect has grown between the, the drivers in this paddock dramatically since the start of the season. And I think it's only going to grow even more. Like you say, the change is going into next year as well. I'm really hoping, I'm really excited to see new drivers come into the championship. I know there's a couple of younger drivers, maybe a couple of even Civic drivers coming up uh, with the new reg changes that are coming in. Also some brand new cars that are being announced as well. Uh, I think there's a Peugeot that's uh, coming into play as well that's being built in Australia. That's possibly coming into as well. I know about this. Did you not know about this? Are you sure you're supposed to be talking about it? I am allowed that? to be talking about it because it's been announced already, so you can't talk <laughs> about it. Uh, but uh, yeah, honestly, lots of cool stuff happening. So uh, really looking forward to seeing what happens. And uh, you know, this second race today, plenty yeah. more action. I reckon so. Right, we have got cars coming to the grid. I think it would be nice for you to go and speak to Oliver Cotton yep. and see what is going on. He's just nearly run over Pep, uh, good. his chief mechanic. So good. That's quite good. So do you want to head over? And I then can. maybe I might be able to get a quick word with Brad Hutchison after that. But we'll see. But I'll let you crack on, my man. Excellent. Thank you very much, Paul. Yes, uh, let's do go have a quick chat with Oliver Cotton because, like I say, he could come away here with his first ever TCI UK race win. I'm going to jump the door open while the guys work on the car doing the tyre change. Ollie, mate, you could come away with a race win here. You're starting on the front row. I can imagine the pressure is on your shoulders a bit here. Yeah, uh, obviously we can be pressure on the front row, but see what we can do. We can move forward and move back, and hopefully we can move forward. Honestly, mate, it's going to be mega. These Audis always been a handful, haven't they? But uh, you certainly look like you've got the thing dialed in here this weekend. Yeah, we got it dialed in this weekend. I think qualifying wasn't the best. We could have been at third up in the grid would have helped us. We would have liked, but we have got a good pace, but just not in the right position. Yeah, awesome, mate. Uh, best of luck. We'll see you out there. Uh, all the best to Ollie Cottam. Nothing worse than uh, a car going down office jacks at the end of that one. Paulo is with Brad, starting on pole position on this one. Paulo, what's he saying? Nice one, fella. Sorry, I couldn't quite hear you there. But uh, Brad Hutchison, um, what car is this, mate? You're in a different car again. Uh, we're back in the uh, in the dinosaur for this one. <laughs> um, yeah, we uh, we thought TCR end of the year brand hatch Indy probably best to uh, limit the repair build to something we actually have spares for. Uh, so yeah, so far so good. But uh, yeah, we'll see. She ain't let you down though, mate. It's not bad having a reverse pole, or not, but battling for ninth and tenth in this championship uh, in a race is not its not a mean feat, is it? Especially in a Generation 1 car. Yeah, yeah, it's certainly not easy. Um, it just uh, we, the, the Generation 2 cars that we were battling last time, they're, uh, they're behind us now, so hopefully they can hold up some of the, uh, some of the front runners coming through, but we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll make it interesting. Top man, listen, have a cracker. I am now going to go throw to AJ. Thank you very much, Paul. Hopefully you can hear me and it's all good. Yeah, Bruce Winfield, last few words of encourage, uh, encouragement there from uh, Josh Files. I want to see if I can grab a quick word uh, well, just as the klaxon goes. Uh, Bruce, mate, this has been a tough weekend for you and the, uh, the, the car itself, it looks like it struggled out there. What's your take on that? Yeah, definitely not our best weekend, but, um, you know, we've got a good position for this race. So I think, uh, well, the championship's out of the window now, but... All I can do now is do my own thing, finish as high up the uh, high up the grid as I can for this you know this race, and obviously we want to win it and let them lot battle it out behind us. Yeah, do you reckon you can get away with a podium? Absolutely. Okay. Best of luck. Enjoy it. Thank you. Stay safe out there, mate. Where did Paulo go? Did he disappear? He's he's run off. He's run off. Here we go. Then they're clearing the grid. This is going to be exciting. Plenty of action coming up. Jack Constable as well starting on that one. No real damage from him. Whistle blows. TCI UK. It's round 15. It's the finale. Championships decided. What's going to happen? Let's find out. 
Anthony Jordan has managed to achieve something quite impressive. He's done hardly any talking all day, and yet he's losing his voice. But uh, clearly the excitement getting to him uh, as he's down on the grid, soaking up the atmosphere ahead of what is set to be a fantastic final round of the 2023 Championship. It's a reversed grid race at the end of the day at Brands Hatch. It doesn't get much better than this, really. It's the kind of race that you just feel it could all kick off in a few scores to be settled and still this fascinating fight uh, for second place in the championship to be decided as well coming into this final race of the season Adam Shepard is second on 333 uh, points that is 12 points clear of Alex Lee but of course Alex Lee was the winner of the first race looked like one of the fastest drivers on the track he is then in turn nine points clear of Jensen Brickley who was absolutely the fastest car on the track no doubt about it in that first race had he started from pole as he was supposed to rather than the pit lane he could have been a real threat for the race win then you've got Bruce Winfield a further uh, three points back uh, and Jack Constable is a further 12 points behind so we could well see a bit of chopping and changing of the order uh, in that second placed battle uh, but we'll try and keep you up to date with that as the race wears on it's another 25 minute race top 10 finishes from race one reversed so we've got Alex Lee starting 10th and we've got Brad Hutchison starting from pole position. Hutchison then makes it an all Audi row one, but it's the Gen 1 Audi of Hutchison on pole, the Gen 2 example of Oliver Cotton starting second. Neither of them have ever won in TCR UK before. Then it's Bruce Winfield looking to try and end what's been a difficult second half of the season on a high with Jack Constable in the Rob Boston Racing Audi for company on that second row. Row three then for Jensen Brickley, star of the show really in race one and perhaps the pre-race favourite this time. Joe Marshall starts alongside him on row three. Row four then is where you find the top two in the championship. Carl Baldy now provisionally is crowned the champion after that race one result, whilst Adam Shepard will come in from eight. Has to try and score well to hang on to that second place in the points. Top ten then completed by our top two from the earlier race. Callum Newsham, what a revelation he's been this weekend. Alex Lee starting tenth on the grid, the race one winner. And those two are going to be interesting to watch as they try to put their way through the order. Luke Sargent in the Elantra just missed out on a front row starting position. He will start 11th ahead of Rick Kerry in the Gen 1 Cupra. Uh, then we have got Matthew Wilson and Andy Wilmot in two Gen 2 Cupras sharing seventh row of the grid. Row eight uh, is shared then uh, by Jeff Oldham with no Chris Smiley. Unfortunately, if you're just joining us, Chris Smiley withdrawn from this race after the technical drama that took him out of race winning contention in the first race. Daryl Wilson's Astra and Scott Sumpton's Honda line up on the ninth row of the grid. Then it's George Jackson and Mark Smith rounding out the top 20. Barry Townsend hopefully will be out there. He had a collision in the earlier race, uh, uh, I believe, with Andy Wilmot, uh, so I've heard, and uh, he will hopefully be starting from the very back. Right then, Paul O'Neill joins me in the commentary box. Championships decided, second place still up for grabs, but I've got a feeling that we could have a real fight for the race win here. We've got two drivers on the front row who have never won a race in this championship. They've both shown potential this year to do that, though. What do you think? Who's going to grab the uh, grab the victory? Oh, you put me on the spot now. Um, yeah. Do you know what? Good answer. <laughs> <That's a> very, <laughs> yeah. I actually don't know. Um, I I would like to think that Bruce Winfield or Jensen Brickley is going to come through, but don't count out Oliver Cotton. No. Honestly, if he just gets his his start sorted, it just depends if he's second on the first lap whether Brad Hutchison just holds him up uh, too long. But. Brad in his own right is proper and I thought Brad had actually won a race he did on the road didn't he at Donington was then excluded him. so he's won on the road that was in the Cupra that he was doing a one-off entry in but yeah hasn't yet won a race properly oh. let's see if he can do it then in the final round of TCR UK for 2023 the revs start to rise the red lights go out now and we are away and racing three Audis there in the top four positions on the grid which of them will lead into Paddock Hill Bend it should be Hutchison nothing from pole position Cotton's got Bruce Winfield up the inside of him and there goes Carl Bordley around the outside of Ed everybody into fourth place what a brilliant start from the champion that was a big moment for him they're three wide for the race lead though and up the inside goes Bruce Winfield Winfield leads at Druid's corner Bordley scything through into fourth Brickley is out wide they're all banging doors proper last day's goal caught him around off the front of Carl Bordley though in front of the pack that is Matthew Wilson and Scott Sumpton oh, no. big damage done as they come down the hill others get involved as well what a terrible
terrible way for them to end their season. Big damage, surely a red flag coming. Oh, so unfortunate oh, now. Brickley, Brickley sideways as well. Jensen Brickley around the certes. Can he save it? Yes, just about. Big wow. drama. The red flags have flown, Paul. Not a huge surprise. Not what we like to see at all. No, not at all. And uh, very surprising to see a car with a wheel coming mm. completely off. That is a lot of damage. Um, all set yeah. off by, I think, uh, Oliver Cottom getting a little bit sideways as he come out of Druids. Um, the right call and a very quick call to finish and stop that yeah. uh, that that uh, race. I mean, yeah, that's such a shame. And you don't ever want to end a race full stop like that. But um, th that was um, that was quite scary because mm. the car of Matthew Wilson's went over the top of its own wheel and nearly went over. It was yeah. horrible to watch. Not nice at all, and uh, all triggered, I think, by a, a bit of a strange moment going into Druids. As uh, I think Hutchison must have had a moment at Paddock that let Winfield up the inside. There were three abreast, and from there, disaster written all over it, really, because it's a narrow part of the circuit. They're on cold tyres. Uh, we've discussed this a few times this weekend. In the start of a race, it only takes one tiny little miscalculation, one little movement left when someone else goes right and unfortunately can have those sort of consequences yeah exactly i think what happened was to be fair to bruce winfield it was a brilliant clean pass into paddock i'd just seen the back end of the shot of the cars going down paddock and he got the switch back on right. hutchison who was running wide out of the exit of paddock hill bend and then uh, oliver cotton went around the outside of brad hutchison quite hot in he was sideways on entry and then there was a couple of cars down his inside, and I don't know if somebody has, has tagged him um, and spun him round, or he was just a bit leery on the exit and um, and had a big sideways and then, then got hit. But then Matthew Wilson, I think, hit him pretty hard. A couple of cars missed him, and then Matthew yeah. Wilson was... Uh, was into the back of him so that's going to be big damage for both cars that which is not the best way to uh, to end um, a fantastic TCR UK season for some of these drivers no exactly that's a shame you can see Matthew Wilson there just catching his breath on the banking Scott Sumpton chatting to the marshals and the medics as well so they're both out of their cars they're both more or less okay a bit shaken though I'm sure I mean we can get a little bit blasé about these things sometimes we're so used to the cars being so safe and you know we do get accidents every now and again not a nice part of motor racing but we do get used to it but you i'm sure have been behind the wheel sometimes when things haven't quite gone to plan and it shakes you up especially if it's you know one of the first times you've been involved in something like this mm, yeah exactly because that that was a high impact accident you, you're pulling for you're probably pulling just for fourth gear as you come down that hill so you're well over 80 miles an hour and to have um, an impact like that you can see where the ambulance is placed at the mm. top of your screen that's where it all kind of kicked off and started um, but it does it knocks your confidence and the worst thing is now they won't get back in a car for quite a while yeah. so um, yeah it's not ideal no, absolutely big shame but the cars doing their job to keep the drivers safe and as we've said they're all out of their cars they all appear to be fine it's now just a case of clearing the track up whilst they're doing that let's see if we can piece together exactly what happened then at the start uh, of the race because it was a dramatic opening few corners that sort of led up to this crunch point quite literally uh, but uh, it was uh, the action through the first couple of corners that sort of set that all up didn't it it was a, uh, a very very good start Start actually by Brad Hutchison initially from the front of the grid. I don't think Cotton got away all that well. Let's take a look at it then. So here's the launch, Paul. Talk us through it. Yeah, so you can see there that the 17 of Brad Hutchison really does wheel spin in the first phase, but then gets it straight and he's away. Bruce Winfield down the inside of Cotton, but then watch as, as I think Hutchison was left foot breaking because he was sliding down the hill. So Brad um, was was opening the door, but watch Cotton now around the inside. He then on the outside, he goes sideways. Does he come back across Bordley? Bordley's got Marshall. Ah, that's what's happened then. That's Marshall coming down the hill in the in the Audi, and then you'll see Matthew Wilson unsighted and bang into the back. So there was contact from Bordley who had nowhere to go. Um, and he got squeezed by Joe Marshall into uh, Oliver Cotton. So that's why Cotton was involved. But that that hit from Matthew Wilson, mm. that is going to be a very expensive um, repair bill for, for Cotton, I think, and uh, for the, um, the Cupra of, uh, of Matthew Wilson. They're struggling to get that. That car has been, that car's been hit so hard that they're struggling to get it on the flatbed. 
Yeah, well, this is what the marshals have to assess when they arrive on scene. Obviously, first thing, prioritise the drivers, make sure they're OK. Once that's been dealt with, how do you clear the cars out of the way? And depending on the state that you find the cars in, that makes a big difference as to whether they get towed, whether they get lifted. Um, there is, are three cars, I think, that need recovering, so you need to get three of the appropriate um, recovery vehicles down there. And uh, that uh, is thankfully what they've been able to do, but it's going to take a little while. I think we're hearing maybe about 10 minutes or so uh, to get the track cleared on the uh, on the exit of Druid's Corner. Scott Sumpton was involved in that as well, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Yes. Yeah. So his car was, um, was that was the car that was sideways on. I, to be honest, I forgot that he was involved in that melee. But yeah. I mean, to see that wheel go underneath the car, that's how hard it was hit to hit to knock a wheel yeah. and a hub and a wishbone coming out as well is. Uh, that is a massive hit. These cars are so strong, like you alluded to, um, but when they get hit at a certain angle, <clears throat> you know, you're always going to, the law of physics says, that's it, I've had enough, and um, parts will start coming off. But, uh, yeah, big hit, and uh, just shows how strong the cars are because the drivers got themselves out of the cars. And uh, hopefully, with this grid reforming so quickly, I would say they know how, how quickly they're going to get this done. Like you say, it's probably going to be eight or nine minutes, I think. Yeah, I think they are. They've got recovery vehicles in place. There's a bit of fluid that's going to need to be cleared as well, so they'll be cement dust down uh, at that part of the circuit as well. I'll tell you who is an absolute winner in this whole situation. There's two. There's Brad Hutchison who will retake the pole. Jensen Brickley will not believe his yes. luck. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because that didn't exactly go to plan, did it? Really, that uh, first start. He found himself uh, running wide just before that all kicked off. That kind of put him behind the accident, but then he picked his way through it. So, uh, yeah, that was uh, a lucky break for Jensen Brickley. Right then, teams, uh, team personnel being uh, welcomed back onto the grid just so that they can check over with their cars and drivers. And they've also allowed Anthony Jordan out onto the grid. And he, I believe, is about to have a catch up with our newly crowned champion. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Uh, well, I'm, I'm surprised they let me on the grid. But uh, yeah, here with Carl Bordley, you can see probably at the front, you can see the guys from Goodyear just checking out the tyres. Bit of damage on the front there, bit of rubbing, bit of front damage as well. Carl's in the car, though, here. Carl, obviously, you got a front row seat to, to what happened there. Uh, a very dramatic start. What can you tell us from your point of view? Uh, I made a demon start and just thought I'll just go for it. Bit of a bit of a lunge around the outside and made it all the way. Brad on pole got a bit loose, so I just backed off and let him have it. He come in, I think Bruce got into the lead. Uh, Brad second, and then Ollie Cotton was on the outside. I gave him loads of room, and then the next thing I just got a massive whack in the right-hand rear corner, which put me into Ollie. And at that point, we're just a passenger, so I eased off. I don't know what happened to Ollie in the end. Um, and everyone came past, so it was a bit of a, bit of a hectic lap one. Yes, very hectic indeed, but obviously you don't need to worry about any championship dramas out there. You're, you're racing as a champion right now, but uh, you get a second chance at this one again, and uh, yeah, we'll see what you can do this time. Yeah, ho hopefully we're OK. I'm a bit, bit concerned that the, the rears took a bit of a whack, so we'll see how it feels on the, uh, on the formation lap and go from there. Yeah, mate, we'll let you chat with the team. Uh, best of luck for the restart on that one. Yeah, very obviously very dramatic there. Uh, Carl getting a front row seat to that one. Here you can see the bonnet up on uh, Adam Shepard. What's going on here? Uh, got some of the scrutineers over as well, just to check to make sure it's all OK. Want to see if I can jump in and have a quick chat. He's uh, having a look at some data at the moment, so uh, can't really have a chat. Uh, Adam, if you're free, uh, bonnet's up. What's up, mate? Um, got a power problem from race one, so we're just, um, we changed the turbo actuator. Just um, seeing if it secured it or not. I'm, we're okay. not sure at the minute. <laughs> yeah. Did you see much of the incident at the start of that? Um, it was a bit chaos. I think um, Carl hit someone and it turned someone else round and it was all a bit of a mishmash. So I'm um, not sure what will happen with that. But yeah, just try and stay out of trouble and go again. You're fighting for second of the championship still. Do you still feel your hopes are there? Yeah, we're, we're running second at the minute. We just need to get a nice clean race now. Um, I would have liked that one to carry on because Jensen, I think he spun going into 30s. So all I had to do was then follow Alex round, really, and it would have been it. So, um, yeah, let's see what happens now. Yeah, second chance at another start. Cheers. Best of luck uh, to Adam Shepard on that one. Let's see if we can try and chat to uh, Jensen Brickley out there, because he certainly had a dramatic start, not the start he would have wanted. I think he had a quite a bit of rear damage as well. It looked like one of the rear wheels had locked up. 
Uh, but just having a quick look on this side, it looks okay. So, uh, yeah, I think it may have just been my eye that caught in. Jensen's dad just here. My right to uh, jump in and have a quick chat with uh, Jensen. Jensen, um, you're probably the luckiest lad on this grid right now. You get a second chance at fighting for second in the championship. What happened at the, uh, the start of that race? Uh, I got a really bad start, just got wheels, but I don't think the tyres were hot enough. Um, and then obviously went wide at Druids and lost the back a bit. Lost a few places there. Then obviously carnage happened down towards Graham Hill and I left a bit of room for Alex and he just dived on me. Yeah. Left me no room and then obviously I was on the grass and the right rear was covered in grass. That's why I lost it at Surtees. But yeah, like you say, not an ideal day so far for me. But <laughs> yeah, I think if we would have started on pole in the first race, we probably would have won it by looking at the pace that we had coming through from the pit lane to P6. Sorry. Um, yeah, starting fifth, get two green flag laps now, get some proper heat in and restart and go from there. You may say you could have been a bit more lucky because if you'd have started a little further back, if you had won that race, you may have been involved in that coming together there. So I think you can count your, your, your lucky stars on that one. But uh, no damage reported from the team. They say the car's all good? Yeah, the car looks all good. Awesome. Excellent, mate. Best of luck. Uh, have a good attempt at this one. Restart. Now, Bruce Winfield, he had a brilliant start to his race. And I heard a quick word from the team on that one saying, mate, just do the same. Uh, see what he can do. Obviously, now for Jack Constable, there is a huge gap here where Oliver Cotton's car is now gone. And uh, Brad's in there just chatting uh, away. If you can get the camera in there just to see. Obviously, uh, we won't chat to him. I I'll let him focus, uh, get himself ready for this one. But he certainly uh, is hoping for another good start. Brad Hutchinson, who starts this one on the front, he gets a second chance of this as well. Didn't get a good getaway, but crucially this time around, he's got no one around him. He's got a clear run in towards turn number one. He is all good at Paddock Hill. No real drama. Looks like we're nearly ready to go. Claxon's blowing. They're clearing the grid. It's attempt two then at round 15 here for TCI UK. The finale will give it a go. Boys, back up to you. Thank you very much, what are you uh, laughing at? Nothing at all, Paul. Uh, just enjoying <laughs> the moment. Uh, final race of the season, take two, will take place over 18 minutes uh, with two green flag laps. So they're going to get two green flag laps. No tyre rotation, it's just an extra green flag lap to make sure they've got heat in their Goodyear rubber. Uh, and uh, to check out the track conditions, because I believe there's a little bit of cement dust possibly that's been laid down uh, on the exit of Druid, but brilliant work by the marshals and recovery crews to get those cars out of the way as quickly as they did. I think it was only about a 10 minute pause in the end, and we are now pretty much good to go again. So Brad Hutchison will have the front row all to himself. Brad didn't make a bad start, in fairness, first time around. He, as he said, had that moment to paddock kill Ben, but he'll have learned from that as well now, won't he? Uh, there is Ollie Cotton's car, by the way. Um, it's that, that's not going anywhere, by no. the way. The wish button's hanging off the rear. Yeah, <coughs> oh, yeah you can see, can't you? Yeah. So that's, uh, it, it's just behind the pit exit, but it's uh, it's not going anywhere, unfortunately. So he will be in on the start. But yeah, Brad Hutchison, he'll have learned from that first start. The actual launch was okay, but now without Cotton alongside him, there's more space for other drivers to come up and challenge him. So he'll have to have his, his wits about him here. Yeah, uh, Joe Marshall on the uh, right-hand side there, starting uh, fourth place, um, middle of your screen in the Audi. He'll have a nice, he's got nothing to lose now, so loads of gap in front of him. He could maybe get down uh, the outside and um, and not be, you know, maybe block in Bruce Winfield if, if Brad does make a bad start. But that where Brad is, I have this conversation all the time. It's so cambered. That's why you always see loads of tyre smoke because people wheel spin and the car just drags itself to the wall, to the right hand side. Then, then you have to come out the power and then you have to go back on it. That's why most pole position people make a terrible start. Um, didn't make much wheel spin then, to be fair to him. Brad on his uh, on his, on his his first go at a start, um, so he should be okay. They're gonna get two green flag laps because they need to heat those tires up um, and they haven't got chance to what they call rotate uh, the tires again. So the tires are in place. There's not gonna be any stopping on the grid. Only stopping on the grid will be to uh, extinguish the red lights and get on with this fair race. Indeed so, so off they go on to the green flag lap. I think we can 
and uh, maybe take a second look at how they're going to line up, minus a couple of drivers, of course, for fairly obvious reasons. But Brad Hutchison will be there on the front row of the grid. Uh, but, of course, no Oliver Cotton, unfortunately, with that extensive damage done to the Porsche and Racing Audi. Row 2, though, will be all present to correct. That's Bruce Winfield, who was on his toes at the initial start of the race. He's got Jack Constable alongside in the Rob Boston Racing Gen 2 Audi. Still lots of Audi presence towards the front of the grid at a track at which they said that they were probably going to struggle. Jensen Brickley will start fifth, a very lucky boy indeed, after going off at Druid and then had the spin at Surtees before the red flag flew. Joe Marshall uh, will start from sixth position alongside him. Then Carl Bordley, he came from seventh on the grid to fourth at the initial start. What can he do this time around? Adam Shepard hopefully has got that uh, turbo issue sorted and will start alongside him in eighth. Then it's Callum Newsham and Alex Lee, the top two from the earlier race. Fascinated to see what progress they can make. Newsham's long run pace, particularly in that first race, was very, very impressive. Then we have Luke Sargent, who by the skin of his teeth managed to avoid the spinning Oliver Cotton uh, at that initial start to the race. Rick Kerry is going to be starting next in his Cooper. And then it is Matthew, uh, not Matthew Wilson, but Andy Wilmot on his own on the seventh row of the grid. Great. We will have Jeff Alden. We will not have Chris Smiley because he was a non-starter anyway after the tech issues in the first race. Uh, then Daryl Wilson and of course Scott Sumpton absent as well. So sadly we start racing. Not going to have any presence at all uh, in this final race of the season. George Jackson and Mark Smith will bring up the rear. But that's a real shame. Isn't it? We start racing. They've been such big supporters of TCR UK. To have neither of their cars now ultimately taking part in the final race of the season. Not what we want to see but uh, I certainly want to thank them for their support over the last two years. They have stood by TCR UK. They really believe in this championship. And Chris Smiley has been a very gracious uh, champion throughout the season, even when things haven't quite gone his way. And, uh, yeah, fingers crossed it's not the last we've seen of them. No, hopefully it isn't. And, uh, yeah, I'd like to add to that and say that they've upped the game of this whole championship. People have had to do more testing. They've had to work harder uh, because they, they upped the level of competition when Chris when Chris won it and uh, even when Chris couldn't win some of the races and, and was uh, was struggling a bit with the new FL7 Honda, he didn't throw his toys out no. of the pram, he raced, he did his best, he was very professional and it's uh, it's good to see um, a professional champion outgoing now and uh, and, and see Carl Bordy and like you say, very gracious and that's uh, a lot of championships and a lot of drivers could take uh, some, some leaves out of that book. They certainly, certainly could. So the second green flag lap then underway, and uh, hopefully the drivers will be well prepared. Uh, what difference does this make then to your tyre warm-up cycle, if you like? Because obviously they have that rotation initially for a reason, and they uh, have that all well prepared, and they know what they're doing with a, a certain way of heating the tyres on the out lap, and then on the green flag lap as well. Now slightly tweaking that system by not having the rotation, what are the drivers really looking to do on these two laps? So there will be a delta difference <clears throat> and by delta difference, I mean there will be uh, a bigger spread of tyre temperature across the front tyres as opposed to the rear tyres. Rear tyres will always be colder than the front because the, the driven wheels are the fronts on all of these cars. So what you don't want to do is heat up the fronts too much and not put as much temperature in the rear. So you're always going to have a temperature difference and you're always going to have cold rears at the start of a race. But now they've got these two laps. They're not going quick enough for me to uh, to, to get tyre temp. I was here testing on Wednesday in uh, in an Audi TCR, and it it honestly took a long, long time. It's a little bit warmer than it was on Wednesday, but it took a long, long time, and I'm very surprised how slow these two laps have been. Yes, and uh, you could say that the pace is dictated a bit by Brad Hutchison, but even those behind, Jensen Brickley, they're crawling through the uh, through the final couple of corners. So, uh, well, we'll see. They might live to regret that in a few moments' time when they all go barreling off into Paddock Hill Bend on cold tyres. The other thing to look out for is people missing their spots on the grid because of the big gaps. Now, hopefully, uh, they will. They, you, you use the reference of what's on the pit wall and where you should start, but sometimes if there's cars that haven't turned up in front of you, like, for instance, Joe Marshall and his two spaces in front of him, you can miss your spot. But it looks like, it looks like they've mostly all got lined up. But it's difficult as you get further on the yes. back of the grid. You can easily do it. I've done it and got a drive-through penalty. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it uh, went down like a lead balloon with 
my team and I got fined. Oh, really? <laughs> I deserved it. <laughs> uh, well, indeed. Right then, here we go. Let's try this again. Final round of TCR UK for 2023. 18 minutes on the clock. Brad Hutchison on the pole. What will happen in the final 18 minutes of racing this season then? Revs start to rise. The red lights will go on. Who gets the hold shot? Into Paddock Hill, Ben. Brad Hutchison away reasonably well. Not such a good start from Constable this time, I don't think. So Bruce Winfield will clearly move up into second place. And Jensen Brickley might even take third. Gallup Newsham takes to the grass there to try and get up the inside. Side, whilst Bordley has a bit of an oversteer moment, almost oh, the same thing on Ash Shepard no. goes around, and that is Joe Marshall towards the barrier. Did he make contact with it? Yes, he did. Shepard bounces back on as well, and another messy start to the race. It's continuing up front. Look, Hutchison leads, oh, no. and now always Brickley getting turned around. Alex Lee, where is Alex Lee come from? <laughs> Tenth on the grid, and he is fifth with a lovely lunge at Graham Hill Bend. The safety car is being scrambled, not a huge surprise. Messy, 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 Paul. Cold tyres and end hot of heads. the season <laughs> yeah hot heads you're dead right you called it the, you know the, the reverse grid is great but sometimes so, you know when you've got cars that oh uh, he ain't happy. happy he ain't happy that's gonna be oh that's that's broken a rear right toe link that that's he's gonna be lucky if he gets that back also he's gonna fall apart yeah but he he was lucky you know because joe marshall it was Joe Marshall, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, that he got hit like across uh, left to right of, of Paddock Hill Bend, and I thought that was going to be a monster impact, but it must have slowed down enough, and it did hit it quite hard, but not as hard as I thought. I hope he gets down the pit lane, because it might, it might just conk out before he gets down the actual uh, pit lane entry. It's had a hard life, that Hyundai, hasn't it, really? It's, uh, it's not been without trouble over the years. There is Joe Marshall getting out. Uh, not very happy, as you can imagine. And uh, yeah, he's just made contact with the tyre barrier there, but not too much damage done to the barrier, which is normally a good sign that it wasn't too significant to hit. But uh, from memory, we might see it again, but Shepard, I think, was going to spin completely, and then Marshall sort of straightened him out a bit. Yeah. So if Shepard had lost it in front of the pack, that could have been another multi-car incident. So I think we dodged a, a bit of a bullet there. Brad Hutchison, though, managed just about to hold on to the race lead. Bruce Winfield second, Brickley up to third, and Jack Constable, poor start from Constable. Strangely, we were just saying that pole position's the difficult place to start second place sometimes an advantage not the case that time no brad actually hutchison made a fantastic getaway didn't have any wheel spin his first um practice start just before he went to the two green flag laps looked absolutely nailed his first start which was the um the red flag that was actually an awful start with loads of wheel spin and then um, him having to come out of the power so yeah really good to see uh, brad um, still leading this race and it'd be great for him to get imagine if he got a win going back to the old car on the road and, and it obviously uh, come true just to remind viewers he had a, a different car he was in the cupra one first time out in it at uh, donington park but it was a it was a short-lived one because the ride height and a few other people got uh, pinged for ride height when they measured the um, the splitter to the uh, to the tarmac on the ground it was too too short yeah, which was a shame because he dominated that race. It was a brilliant performance in the wet conditions, of course, the weather changing. Right, here's a replay of the start. So it's all going to kick off between Joe Marshall and Adam Shepard. They're the second and third cars on the outside line as we look at it. But as Paul said, a dream start here for Hutchison from pole position. It's Jack Constable who seemed to pick up a little bit too much wheel spin. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? Look at that banging already there. Joe Marshall um, into the side of... I think that was uh, Callum Newsham, isn't it? So Joe Marshall, 99, on the inside, Shepard. Ah, oh. oh, right, there was contact. The, it wasn't meant, but Joe Marshall... Ooh. God, that's a big hit, that. Joe Marshall was sideways into Paddock, left foot braked, and then he tapped Adam Shepard into a slide. Then, they, then Adam Shepard come back across him, str got straightened out by Joe, but Joe was the byproduct of... Uh, of that contact and, and Joe ended up in the barrier. So that's a racing incident that yeah. there would be no malice at all in that. Safety car lights are out. Yeah, top job by the marshals. They've got the car out of the way and they are getting ready then to start to restart the race with what's going to be about 13 and a half minutes left on the clock. Brad Hutchison now needs to nail a safety car restart, but he's got a hungry pack of very rapid TCR drivers behind him. Winfield, Brickley, Constable, Lee, Bordley, <laughs> all multiple race winners. And it's a very bunched up restart wow. here. Hutchison almost tried to cause a bit of havoc behind him. He steps on the loud pedal. Clever. And well, it didn't 
really work though, did it? Because Winfield has anticipated that well and goes with him. There's well under a car's length between them. And as they head for Paddock Hill Bend, Hutchison immediately has to go on the defence. Bruce Winfield on the outside line. Look behind Jack Constable, steams up the inside of Jensen Brickley. Brilliant move back the third. Oh! Hutchison sideways, Winfield to the outside. They're picking up exactly where they left off as they all arrive at Druids together. Winfield on the outside line. Hutchison, is he going to leave him space on the exit of the corner? Not really. Oh. Onto the grass goes Winfield, onto the grass goes Lee. And it's still Hutchison, the race leader, Paul. Wow, how's that happened? He's down to fourth, Winfield now. Brickley <laughs> up to third. And look at the man, Jack Constable, second. Side by side, Alex Lee and Carl Bordley. Oh. Bordley thinks I've had enough of you all oh. year, mate. Oh, what's going on there? No, he's gone sideways. That's a change for the lead. Constable up the inside, Hutchison out wide as well. And Jensen Brickley, I believe, uh, is going to go through into second place. Yes, he does. Winfield now on the inside line uh, of Brad Hutchison. So Hutchison about to slip off the podium, potentially. You can tell it's the last day of school, can't you? Elbows out, no quarter. Oh. Astor given. Lee on the inside of Hutchison. Leans on him. Bordley goes on the inside. They're three wide towards Druids. Oh. Oh, it's the last day of school, and Bordley is going to get involved. He might be the champ, but he ain't going to roll over in this race, and he's down the inside of Brad Hutchison. But Brad is dropping like a stone, and the smoke from tyres locking up and all sorts going on. What a race we've got now for 12 minutes. <laughs> so, Constable leads, don't ask me how. Brickley is second, Winfield third, Alex Lee tenth on the grid, is fourth, and could be staring down the barrel of double race victories on the inside of his teammates. Oh! Contact with Bruce Winfield, out goes Bruce Winfield out wide, he rejoins the racing line once again, and as they head down to the start-finish line, Bruce Winfield is not going to be happy about that one little bit, but Alex Lee wants to try and claim a double race victory. I can't remember the last time anyone managed that in TCR UK, it's been a while, possibly Max Hart last year at Donington, round the outside goes oh! Bordley, Hutchison leaning on him, Carl Bordley wants to move forwards. <laughs> what is Bordley doing? I'd have had that thing packed up in the truck, gone on with me trophy, and uh, left it at that, but round the outside, the new champ sticks one on Hutchison, and fair play, Hutchison. You had a chance to turn him round there, Captain, and you didn't, so great driving by him. But look who's in second place, and look who's closing. It's Brickley. Jensen is now gaining massively on Jack Constable, but look at this in the midfield, and Hutchison is still in the mix. Right, OK, breathe, everyone. 11 minutes still to go. Dare I say it, things are just calming down for the, the moment, although the lead gap is coming down because Jensen Brickley just set a new fastest lap of the race. Andy Wilmot here getting stuck in, and he's got Callum Newsham in his sights. Newsham not making the progress, maybe, Paul, that I expected him to. No, I thought he'd be a lot faster than this, but, uh, yeah, maybe he's just not got them tyres up to temperature at the rear. <laughs> um, but look at Wilmot. He is not giving up. He was nearly enough in the back of Callum Newsham there. But uh, Alex Lee is going to have, uh, well, Bruce Winfield might uh, not wait for the debris for this race. And I think he <laughs> might try and ping him at uh, clearways because they're getting close now. Uh, I'm sure Adam Shepard has an opinion on that as well, but we won't go there right now. Brad Hutchison, I think he might have some damage, you know, on that right rear corner. The toe looks a little bit out to me on the uh, bonded blue Audi. We'll figure that out in a moment, though, because we've got a race, a battle for the race lead on our hands. Jack Constable leads the way. Jensen Brickley is right on his tail, though, as they head for Paddock Hill Bend. Behind them, Callum Newsham is up into sixth place now, ahead of Brad Hutchison, who does seem to be struggling now, and that's Will not looking up the inside as well. Carl Bordley has set the fastest lap. They're all bunching together at the front. I tell you what, they're brave using that curb at Paddock because I tried it by accident on Wednesday and nearly <laughs> ended up in uh, in the Kentagon at the top of Paddock Hill Bend. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but some of those oh. cars looking very well done. I'll tell you who is, he is under pressure now. Brickley was so fast through Graham Hill Bend that he is going to be on the back of that Audi as they come out of clearways. That rear right on that Audi locking up harshly. Ah, yeah, I'm t I can see what you mean there. Could just be the bodywork, maybe. I'm not sure. Yeah, Brad Hutchison. That that wheel doesn't look brilliant, but the car still seeming like it's uh, it's holding seventh place. Right then, so into Paddock Hill Bend, nine and a quarter minutes of the season left to go, and Jensen Brickley closing in on Jack Constable now as they head uh, for the top end of the circuit. And uh, Jack Constable, who's become a regular winner over the years, he's had 12 podiums in the championship, uh, has Jack, and uh, has been a regular contender really ever since he joined the championship a few years ago. Uh, he has five race wins, third actually on the all-time wins list, but to get another one, he's going to try and have to try and fend off Jensen Brickley, who in race one, Paul, looked to have the pace of anybody coming from the pit lane to finish well up the order. 
but passing Jack Constable is never easy, is it? It isn't, but if Jack Constable misses that apex again, like the, the width, he just missed it. But look at the speed of that thing in a straight line. <laughs> that will be probably the 40 kilos of uh, Jensen Brickley's uh, compensation weight that's making him struggle coming out of clearways, but he's got the measure of him everywhere else. And on the entry to clearways, I think he might have to lunge him. But uh, yeah, Jack Constable, look at this. This is a this is a fine drive. If you can hold this on for eight laps, I'll be well impressed. Yeah, absolutely. Brickley not really being caught by Alex Lee, though. Lee was actually a tenth slower than these two on the previous lap. Callum Newsham, as you can see, has now set the fastest lap. But he is a couple of seconds behind this squabble for third. That's Lee, Winfield and Bordley. Bordley not afraid now to get his elbows out a bit more. The championship is sealed as long as he doesn't do anything really silly and pick up some sort of penalty. He is the 2023 TCR UK champion, so now he wants to go out with a podium. Just missed the podium in race one, and he's running in fifth place at the moment. Lead gap down fractionally again that time, a 49-0 for the leader, a 48-9 uh, for Jensen Brickley. We've followed them for a couple of laps now, Paul. Where, if anywhere, do you think Brickley has an advantage that could lead to an overtake? Well, coming into uh, Druid will be a hard ask, but coming down, if you watch the, uh, the leaders, coming down to Graham Hill Bend, the, the speed of Brickley's car on entry is just super stunning. A bit like what you can see here with Carl Bordley. The car has got so much grip, but he needs to be closer. A bit like Bordley was doing there, and uh, yeah, just trying to get the car in. It'll be a struggle to get um, down the inside of clearways unless he makes a mistake, but he is really close now. If you can start to make him defend, this is game on. The Audi's got some waft, isn't it? Look at that. Always gets off the tight corner as well, though, doesn't it? Clearway is a perfect example of that. He parked it on the apex, but then still came off the corner quicker than Brickley. Lee still third. Another new fastest lap for Callum Newsham now, as he continues to try and close in. Only about a second now behind the uh, Winfield Bordley scrap, as Alex Lee now is definitely starting to march towards the top two. So the top three covered by 1.3 seconds at the moment, as Alex Lee tries to claim a second victory of the day. Through Graham Hill, Ben Constable's car again, a beautiful little four-wheel drift through the apex. He gets off that corner well too, and a, a car with good traction is a really difficult car to overtake, Paul, because by the time you get into the next braking zone, you're just not close enough to really have a go. Yeah, exactly. This is, uh, this is a fantastic effort from Jack Constable because that, that car is nowhere near as quick as Jensen Brickley's. There's just nowhere that, uh, that, that the Audi looks faster. Uh, than, than Jensen's car, except for uh, the traction it gets out of uh, clearways. What's going on here? That's Daryl Wilson, isn't it? Has he had a spin? It's like just up at Druids, isn't it? Um, checking the uh, checking the geometry of the car as Bruce Winfield is trying to fend off the attentions of, of Carl Bordley. But uh, Callum Newsham, I cannot get my breath how fast that kid has been. He is half a second quicker than the race leader. Most laps, half a second. <laughs> yeah, flying, isn't he? Now he's in clean air. He's caught this pair who continue to squabble. Winfield and uh, Bordley, fourth and fifth. And uh, Bruce Winfield does seem to be struggling at Graham Hill Bend, doesn't he? Bordley continues to get a good run out onto the Cooper Strait. Callum Newsham there as well, right to the edge of the road. Ooh. And Bruce Winfield's been given a five-second penalty for exceeding track limits. So in a way, this battle doesn't really matter. But he's still physically there in front of Carl Bordley, who wants to try and get through if he can. Goes to the outside line at Padder. Can he get the switchback manoeuvre? No, Winfield wow. manages to cover that off. Remember, Winfield came into this race very much fighting for second in the championship. That's slipping away now as well, as Callum Newsham sails around the outside of Bordley, who was boxed in behind Bruce Winfield. And in the end, Newsham makes it look easy. That was a great move, that was. Now, now he's got that done. I don't think Bruce Winfield's pace this weekend has been, has been very good at all, but um, he is actually behind him on the road. But with that penalty, he should... It's just a shame, isn't it? You've got to pass someone that is, shouldn't be in front of you. Uh, as it stands, by the way, Jensen Brickley would be your championship runner-up, would you believe? Having come into the weekend a long way back, he is currently 11 points clear of Alex Lee, so Lee is extra motivated to try and catch these two, uh, because if he could win the race, he could potentially still finish second in the points. There are those up-to-date live championship standings. Brickley second, Lee third, Constable fourth, Winfield fifth, and the luckless Adam Shepard would fall to sixth, having come into the weekend as perhaps Carl Bordley's most realistic championship rival. Constable continuing to lead the way but Brickley he just can't get close enough in the right bits of the track can he I think clearways is probably his best bet but Constable knows that and will always defend yeah definitely and this is the thing now he's close enough to have a little a bit of attack I wouldn't be surprised if Constable now no. missed the apex of clearways but I'm wrong but this is the closest he's been look how close he is and then look at the traction of that Audi 
that it, it reminds me of the FL7 Honda when Chris Smiley was in, in uh, his car this morning. Absolutely belting off that uh, last corner. And if it's that good there, you've really got your, um, you've got a problem trying to pass anywhere else because the only other place he's really good against the Audi is uh, Graham Hill Bend, but there's just not enough braking to do to, to pass. No, he's good out of paddock, isn't he, Brinkley? Closes in, maybe a little lunge at Druids could be an option in the future, but uh, he's really got a time. Three and a quarter minutes to go in this final race of the season. Again, that uh, was a good run through Graham Hill Bend for Brinkley. Constable a bit wide of the apex. Is Brinkley uh, maybe going to commit to the move this time? He had a little sighter up here, maybe a lap ago. Sails in late on the brakes, but Constable covers the inside and then just parks on the apex, waits until he's absolutely sure that he's uh, blocked that momentum that Brickley was carrying, and then hits the loud pedal, heading down across the start-finish line. Jack Constable leads with just under three minutes to go, but this will feel like a very long three minutes with Jensen Brickley all over him. We know how quick Brickley is. He's been driver of the day for me so far, Jensen Brickley, yeah. uh, and if he could pull off the race win, that would just be the perfect way to cap off the weekend. Yeah, I'm with you on this. Alex Lee will want to... Uh, well, there's only one point in it, isn't there? No, no. 11. 11. Yep, so 11 points for him to try and find to get second place. But, yeah, Jensen Brickley's been been a star this weekend. Shame about his actuator and gearbox problem. Um, just to um, correct myself, um, I've been saying FL700 and FL5. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, you uh, Honda nerds. Uh, yes, uh, there are many of them, I'm sure, who will be picking up on that. Darrell Wilson now warned about track limits. For the Maybe first time this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you might be right, Paul. Uh, he's had a trying race, has, uh, has our Darrell. Always a popular figure in the paddock, though, as is his uh, green and red Astra. Chris Winfield holding on to fourth. I'm a bit... Oh, hello. Someone has been off, or is off, at Clearways. I'm not entirely sure. I didn't see a car in there. Uh, I think everyone still came across the line. Not entirely sure who that was. Ah, uh, may have been Andy Wilmot. He had quite a slow lap, didn't he? A few seconds off the pace, but anyway, he appears to have... Uh, got going once again, but yeah, uh, I'm a bit surprised Callum Newsham hasn't got past Bruce Winfield yet. Winfield actually in the second half of the race seeming to uh, to find a bit of pace. Mm, yeah, starting to starting to open up for him. But yeah, these uh, these guys. I didn't notice Jensen Brickley in P2 was just starting to starting to real snag uh, mm. the steering wheel going into uh, the fast left hander. Uh, Certes before clearways, and that always says to me that the front tyres are running out and they're trying to induce uh, a loose rear axle uh, to try and get the car to turn in. So, yeah, I think people are starting to run out of tyres now, especially Jensen. He's had another little lock up there as well. Darrell Wilson emerges on the horizon to be lapped. That's going to be another little hurdle to be jumped. Bruce Winfield's penalty is doubled now from a five second to a ten second track limits penalty. And quite a bit of traffic ahead. They're going to be starting the final lap this time. Let's hope they've all got their wits about them. Meanwhile, Newsham's had a terrible run off Graham Hill Bend. And Carl Ball, he's trying to get around the outside of him. That will give him the inside line for clearways. But Carl doesn't really need to pick a fight with Callum Newsham right now and lets him have it. Carl Bordley I think, will be satisfied to round out his season with fifth place, the championship already in his pocket. Wilson stays well out of the way, good driving that from Darrell. He did slow down quite suddenly as they came across the timing line. Can Brickley do this? I think if it's going to happen, Paul, it will be into clear ways, won't it? But I just don't see Constable leaving that door open. No, but are they coming across more lapped cars? Oh, they are. Is that Mark Smith? Oh, it is. Oh, good lad. Good lad, fair play. You don't want to get involved in, in that. Oh, that's great driving by him. Perfect. This is job done. Uh, can't see George Jackson um, causing a problem here. Should be all done and dusted by the time he gets around. But yeah, another great race. And Jack Constable, that's outstanding stuff from him. Brilliant defensive drive. A defensive masterclass, actually, from Jack Constable to keep Jensen Brickley behind him. Out of the final turn he comes. I don't think he'll quite get to lap George Jackson. So it will be for Jack Constable a sixth career TCR UK victory to round out the 2023 season in style. Jensen Brickley uh, comes home in second position and it's a third place finish for Alex Lee. Not quite the double race victory then for Alex, but I think he'll still be reasonably satisfied with that. Uh, Callum Newsham finishes in fourth. Carl Bordley comes home fifth champion finishing his weekend off with a two solid top five finishes and Andy Wilmot ends up in sixth position strong result for him then Brad Hutchison Luke Sargent Bruce Winfield and Rick Kerry Winfield of course that 10 second penalty dropping him down the order but a fantastic final race of the season there Paul bit of a shame about some of the damage incurred to drive to a cars in the early stages there but once we got going some proper touring car racing and a brilliant drive there by Jack Constable yeah really good drive by Jack Constable so congratulations to him and Rob Boston racing
position. That was absolutely spot on. And uh, <clears throat> great to see a fantastic crowd here. That's yeah, the top of Paddock Hill Bend, that. Yeah, uh, so, yeah, so good stuff for Jack. I was talking to him a bit earlier and he was a bit he was a bit downbeat and saying the car wasn't the best thing in the world around here but um, you've just done it mate so well done to you Jensen Brickelo my driver of the day your driver of the day top man agreed absolutely Jack Constable then wins the final round of TCR UK in 2023 Jensen Brickley comes home second Alex Lee with a solid conclusion to his championship is back on the podium again. Callum Newsham finished in fourth. Best weekend he's had, I think, in TCR, uh, certainly for consistency anyway. Carl Baldwin, the champion, is fifth ahead of Andy Wilmot, Brad Hutchison, Luke Sargent, Bruce Winfield, and Rick Carey to complete the top ten. George Jackson was 11th ahead of Mark Smith, Darren Wilson, and Jeff Holden in 14th. Smith and Jeff Holden wasn't running at the flag, nor was Joe Marshall, nor, of course, Adam Shepard after their tangle at the restart of the race. Well, Paul, sun setting on another cracking season. TCR UK uh, has certainly entertained me this year. We've said earlier on a very competitive season of racing. Uh, lots of different drivers capable of winning races. The future continues to look bright, I think, especially with now more of these Gen 2 cars starting to come into the championship. Uh, a fitting way there to end what has been another cracking season. Yeah, great season. Great to be involved. And uh, yeah, good to see Rob Boston racing, getting two Audis and uh, it working out for them right at the, uh, the end of the championship so they'll have um, a lot going on in the background I'm sure with a lot of data and uh, yeah the Gen 2 cars have been fantastic addition and uh, the Gen 1 Cup I'm really looking forward to because yes. that is going to open a lot of doors for a lot of very good drivers who will be able to be seen on this platform. No, exactly. That's a fantastic initiative that's been brought in for next year to allow some of the older generation cars to come in, still fight for overall honours, but also have their own class uh, within themselves to uh, fight in. I think that's a terrific idea, really, from the championship promoters. So, Jack Constable, a race winner once again. And like I said, he's third on the all-time wins list. Only two behind Dan Lloyd now, the very first champion uh, in TCR UK. Of course, it's one Lewis Kent who has won more than anyone else. 14 times winner uh, was Lewis in TCR UK. He'll be out again later on today in the final Civic Cup race of the season where... We're hoping we'll have a championship showdown between Max Edmondson and Dan Thackeray if Dan can get his engine uh, sorted for that second race. So don't go anywhere. We've got that still to come. And, of course, the grand final for the Formula Ford Festival. But first, let's head down to the pit lane and hear from Anthony Jordan and our final podium finishers of the year. Thank you very much, guys. Yes, a dramatic uh, final race of the season. What can you say from that? And, uh, well, Jack Constable. Welcome to the number one spot here at TCI UK. Mate, honestly, that was a race. Yeah, definitely a race. One of the harder fought ones. I mean, Jensen was stronger in other places. We were stronger in other bits. So I just had to make sure that I kept doing the bits where he was stronger right, which is quite hard work. But yeah, definitely a good one. There was a lot of talk going into this weekend saying that, oh, the Audi's never going to do well at Brands. And here it is on the top spot here with you at the wheel of it. You were so excited when you came in, you forgot to put the handbrake on. Uh, so we've had to chock it with someone's tripod, uh, which is fantastic. But honestly, mate, in this one, what a result for you. What a way to end a season as well. Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to do to finish the season. So, yeah, really chuffed. With this uh, win, does this bolster your things for what you want to do next year? I mean, do we know what the plan is? We've got lots going on in life at the moment, so I uh, need to take the winter, get my head straight, and then come back. Well, honestly, mate, this championship wouldn't be the win. same. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This championship, it wouldn't be the same without you, mate. Honestly, we do hope to see you back, and uh, yeah, what a way to end it. Congratulations. Cheers, mate. Thanks. I really appreciate that. Honestly, really, really solid drive there from Jack Constable. Super, super impressed. Same with Jensen Brickley as well. He secures second in the Drivers' Championship as well after a brilliant weekend. Jensen, we were talking all the way throughout this weekend. You wanted to secure second in the championship. Provisionally, of course, you've done it. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, obviously, that's the aim for the whole weekend. I think the problems before race one mix that up a little bit. And, yeah, well, we knew we could do it if... We had a good result in this, so yeah, really happy with that. Obviously, Carl's supposedly a rookie, but in my eyes, I think we won the rookie championship this year because he's more experienced than anyone on the grid. Yeah, exactly that. But uh, for yourself there, you were super lucky with that red flag. You're getting the second chance uh, after that spin, but the wagon was working well. And honestly, mate, you were flying out there. Uh, obviously, I'm thinking that compensation weight, the competition weight, was uh, just holding you back just a little bit out of clearways, but the rest of it, you were looking absolutely solid, mate. Yeah, definitely. I think the only place I was struggling to catch Jack was out of clearways. He just had the acceleration on me. I think 
In qualifying, we didn't really feel the weight because it's only short stints and the tyre is still new, but when the tyre gets old and the car's getting hotter and the track's getting hotter, obviously it, it plays in a bigger part. Yeah. But for yourself right now, you can relax. Weight's lifted off your shoulders. Second runner-up in the championship as well. You can take that because that comes with a huge cash bonus as well, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Mate, congratulations on that one. To Jensen Brickley. Let's uh, jump over and chat to Alex Lee, wherever he is. I'm just trying to find where Alex is. He's right over here with the uh, white hat on, chatting away with the team. Alex, uh, mate, third on track and third now in the Drivers' Championship. You wanted second, but third, that's brilliant after you started and came into this weekend. Sixth? Yeah, um, over the moon, sixth to third. So we missed out on second, but um, still so happy with it with this weekend. So thank you very much. Yeah. Tough old race, that one. Restart in the middle of it. Obviously, red flag uh, early doors. Lots happened in that one, but you were one of the drivers who came through. And, mate, talk us about some of those moves. You were fully sending it there. Yeah, um, I think most of my moves were at the hairpin after the first corner. Uh, yeah, just going full send. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Delighted with that one, mate. Honestly, a brilliant result for yourself. And, you know, to come away with uh, third in the championship uh, and two podiums uh, in a weekend as well. Mate, that is a brilliant weekend. You've lost your bottle lid, though. You've broken your bottle, mate. Oh, look at that. End of the season, new bottle, new car. Mate, honestly, and that brings us on to that question. What is it for next season? You know, where do you see yourself going? Is it another year of this or are you moving up in the world? Who, who knows? I'm not sure yet. Uh, we're going to work hard over winter and then yeah. work on our plans. So. Awesome. Well, congratulations, mate. Enjoy that one. I know we have to wrap up very, very quickly. Just want to chat with Carl Bordley, who comes away with another bit of silverware. Carl, very quick question because we've got to wrap up. Uh, mate, a exciting race. A lot of drama in that one. Another bit of silverware for you. Yeah, another, another bit of silverware. Um, <laughs> To be honest, we're gonna we're gonna pass this one down the line. So we're gonna send this up to Andy Wilmot uh, on behalf of Dan Kirby. Yeah. So yeah. Brilliant, mate. Congratulations on that one. Well done. Uh, brilliant season as well. Yeah. Fantastic. Couldn't ask for more. Brilliant. Thank you very much. We're gonna wrap up now. Plenty more action to come. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Do you wonder why your competitors websites appear in Google searches ahead of you? Then make a call to the SEO experts Woya and understand how your business can be more visible online. As the official marketing partner of TCR UK, you can now work with a trusted search engine optimization partner to increase web traffic, inquiries and sales. Speak to us for your free audit and quote by visiting woya.co.uk today. Amazing weekend to conclude our TCR coverage and what a fantastic season they've had and thank you for the team uh, all involved in, in bringing that to us over the course of the year. We now move on to the Formula Ford Festival final sponsored by HeadTech. Big thanks to HeadTech and all our sponsors for the Formula Ford Festival. And as I look around me here, first of all we're being blessed with wonderful weather today. It was nice and sunny at the start of the day, thankfully that has remained. Those of you uh, who watched last year with us will know we got rained out. It was very, very unfortunate. But today, it's almost like we're, we're being smiled on and we've had fantastic weather to, to get us through the semi-finals, the last chance race, the Brian Jones Memorial for the Historics as well. And it's, for me, as uh, I started watching, as, as many people do in journalism, uh, as a youngster. So my passion was fired up, really, uh, at Brands Hatch from the festival for many, many years. And just looking around here at the quality we've got on the grid, is, is absolutely amazing and what we're going to do is start at the sharp end of things and uh, we're going to talk to some of the guys that have that have worked their way through a little bit out of shot there alan um we've got logan paxer 
the Canadian driver. He's actually tenth on the grid. Wasn't room to squeeze him in over there. But I'm going to come to Rory Smith first of all. And Rory, like Jamie Sharp, who lines up alongside you, starting P2 for the semi-final. Um, now you're on pole. Is that going to make a difference, or do we like the outside of Brands? Um, it's always hard to start off pole here, just the way that the, the track sort of rises there. But I mean, it's really hard to overtake around here, so pole is still the place you want to be. Um, you know, hopefully I'll get a decent launch despite going uphill and, and I can try and hold them off from there. But we'll see. It's all to play for. You've got great drivers around me, so um, I know it's going to be exciting either way. It's a real quality feel to the field right at the sharp end. And I think probably one of the strongest lineups I've seen for a final for, for many, many years. You were champion back in 2020, so looking to add your name to the double winners. What, what does it feel like sitting there waiting for the off? Do you know what? I'm remarkably calm. I wouldn't have thought I would be, but um, yeah, I guess because I've been in this situation once before, so it's, it takes a little bit of the edge off it. Um, I just know I need to go out there and, and do what I've done in the, the semi final, so I'm confident I can do that. But, you know, like I said, it's anyone's game, anything can happen, but I'll just go out and have a good race. And what are the preparations that you do after the semis before you come here? Do you, I've saw a couple of the drivers sort of praying and eyes shut and trying to, trying to focus. Is that the sort of race prep that you do? To be honest, I just try to uh, chill out, have a bit of a joke and, and relax, to be honest. Um, I think the worst thing you can do is just sit bubbling and boiling, getting all nervous for the, the hours in between. So, yeah, just chill out, have some lunch, <laughs> enjoy the gap between. Um, I don't do anything too special, to be honest. Don't watch anything back and see what Jamie was doing? or. Yeah, I mean, I do, in fairness, watch footage back and, and look at the data. But in terms of, you know, keeping your head in the right space, I don't, don't do anything too crazy. Excellent, Rory. Good luck to you. Thanks for having a chat with us. Stay safe in the race, as indeed we want all our drivers to do. As you've probably worked out what I'm going to do, I'm going to go down some of the top runners uh, and come into Jamie Sharp. Jamie, we've spoken many times, and obviously you raced with us uh, on the Toker package many, many years ago. Like, like Rory Smith, a previous winner, does that take the pressure off to, to some point because you've been in this situation before? Um, I wouldn't have said any pressures off. I think it's still the same amount of pressure as it's always been. Um, but I'm just here to have fun. I think this is the best I've ever positioned myself for the final in the festival. So I'm just here to have fun. And I'm still here to win, but whatever happens, happens from now. And the, the quality of drivers around you is, is exceptional, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Everybody's here proved themselves this year and this weekend. So, I mean, I'm just happy for myself to be in this situation. So, yeah. And I was saying to Rory about, you know, both of you guys came from P2 on the grid in the semi-finals and, and you're P2 here in the final. Does that give you the advantage? Um, yes and no. I mean, if it was a bit wet, maybe, yeah. But, um, yeah, I am can't tell that until I'm out on track. Uh, we'll have to see. I've not really, it's rare I ever start in P2, so <laughs> I'll have to see from now. Well, I hope you have a great race and a safe one, and we look forward to hopefully or possibly seeing you on the podium. Let's go round. Uh, I'm going to mess things up here. Laura's doing the camera for us, so change of tack. I'm going to go around this side of the car just to make things a little bit different for the viewers and have a chat with Niall Murray. Niall, you were the first person I actually spoke to this weekend when we were getting ready to go out to the heats, and I think I yeah. probably waffled on a little bit too long to you. We didn't get a chance to talk to anyone else, but it's always good to catch up with you. Um, a double champion up at the shop. It is such a very, very experienced and talented field at the front yeah it is look you've said it yourself I, I could hear you talking to the other guys you know the top three of us on the grid have, have won the festival before um you know chris won the championship in 21 uh, luke cooper is castle coombe champion for you know a number of times um jordan kelly won the championship this year so that's that's only just the top six um yeah so yeah look it's it's always competitive no matter what year you come to the festival you know some big names might not show up clashes with other races but there's always still very very competitive top six top eight um, and yeah any anyone up the front can win it really when we talk about festivals of years gone by we inevitably go back to well before you were born the likes of when Jolly Herbert won it and that was in the days when we had heats quarterfinals semi-finals and the grand final and I think Johnny had a problem in qualifying and he was right off the back for his heat and worked his way through not quite as as daunting as you did but you were six weren't you in qualifying and, and you've come through and find yourself on the second row so a, a good strong festival so far yeah definitely look I said it to you yesterday you know um, yesterday was just damage imitations for us um, I'm still scratching my head a little bit over our lack of pace in the wet but uh, we know we have we have the most pace of anyone in the dry um, I can easily you know bang in the low 50s on my own no problem so I, I uh, look I'm confident in these sort of conditions I, when I won it in 2013 I, I started 
sixth, I think, or fifth. Um, and when I won it in 2016, and I started second, I think. So I've started pole other times as well and haven't won it. So, um, you know, maybe starting a bit further back is better. <laughs> in terms of challenging during the, the heats, trying to make your way up and the semi-finals, how much do you, do, do, you, do you stay in reserve and think, I've got to preserve the car, I've got to make sure I finish? Oh, you have to. Um, look, it was, you know, as Jamie will tell you, I'm sure that last year both of us were probably a little bit too aggressive with each other and, and went off in the heat. Um, and that kind of put both of us obviously in the back foot, him more so because he didn't finish. But um, yeah, look, today uh, when I started that, that semi final in third and I got up to second straight away. I was just banking that, you know, I didn't want to do anything stupid. I, uh, you know, as soon as I got up, up behind Rory, he kind of was backing me up into Luke. So at that stage, I just tried to back off try to keep Luke behind me and give Rory a bit of space um, which you know worked out well I just I just wanted to get get finished get under the, f the first couple of rows of this final um, and yeah we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens now in a few minutes okay well best of luck with it hope stay safe we'll see you on the podium I say that to all the drivers sometimes we don't get to let's have a word with Chris Middlehurst another driver with podium experience actually of a Formula Ford festival finals and a multi-champion in his own right many other times uh, Chris much pressure. Is there more pressure being, say, on row three than, than there is being at the front? Uh, I think yes and no, really. Uh, I'd rather be probably a little bit of a, maybe rope one row back, see what happens at the first corner uh, in case it gets a little bit, you know, spicy. But um, ideally, yeah, you want to be on the front row. Um, it's hard to make a much better start than most people because you're so experienced. You're going to get quite an even start. Of course, you're also staggered. So, um, yeah, we're just going to obviously try and get through the first couple laps uh, if I get a chance I'm going to make the move 100% um, and then yeah just try and get out the front and yeah I've got a good feeling about this race uh, we've, you know long build up all week testing and uh, two second places so far um, second in the heat second in the semi uh, I've got now next to me so we have the speed definitely it's just a case of having luck on your side that's certainly one thing you need in the festival final um, and yeah speed and just seeing how the race pans out you just never know you can't plan anything at all you just got to just if the opportunity arises you just got to take it um, as long as you know you can get past you know and towards the end of course you can start taking more risks uh, if you're further back it's a long wait for you isn't it for the holding area we had the tcr final and uh, i've just been told we've got about three minutes before they let you go so um it, i'm i'm going to uh, I'm, I'm going to move on just so we can chat to a couple of other drivers but chris thanks for taking the time to talk to us and good luck for the final Chris Middlehurst, let's go back to Luke Cooper. And obviously, Niall was talking um, uh, about, you know, being backed up to Luke Cooper and uh, getting involved in that battle for second position in, in the semi finals. Luke, how are you feeling? It's, I was just saying to Chris Middlehurst, very, very long wait, isn't it? To, you know, from getting out to the paddock into the holding area, waiting to go out on track. Does that add to nerves or does it actually help calm you? Um, a little bit of both, really. I mean, once I'm in the car, you've got your helmet on, you just kind of get in the zone and, and focus on, on what you're doing. Um, obviously, the faster you get on track, the, the faster you can just focus on the driving while you just sat here, you're, you're left to your thoughts. Decent chance, chance from fifth on the grid? Yeah, it's in the mix. Um, yeah. Anything can happen. Um, the main thing is, is being there at the end. Um, yeah. We're in a great position to, to hopefully go forward and maybe pick up the piece if anything happens ahead as well. Nice one. Good luck. I'm going to have a quick word with Jordan Kelly uh, because we haven't spoken to Jordan Kelly this weekend. We normally get an opportunity to talk to the national champion. We haven't had a, a chance to do so. For, so for our head tech final, let's go to uh, Jordan. Uh, tell, tell us about your weekend so far. Uh, it got off to an all right start. We uh, qualifying, testing and stuff. But then whenever I came to the race, I just uh, made too many mistakes and uh, just probably were driving it a wee bit too much. And uh, kind of got my head together today and made the passes I needed to make to get up to third so I uh, got third for the semi so now we're here here in six so at least we're in the fight so uh, it's uh, it's good to get back to this position at least yeah pro uh, progression and moving forward is what the festival is about isn't it as, as much as anything else so winnable from here uh, anything could happen I know I, I, I've raced a lot against most of them ahead of me so uh, it's going to be interesting now the final wish you well thank you for chatting to us jordan kelly you heard the whistle you heard the engines pop into life so that's our top six drivers that we've introduced you to here on the grid the waiting is nearly over it's time to go and get the grid now with andy and scott in the commentary box enjoy the race sterling work richard as always thank you very much great to hear from a few of the drivers down there in the assembly area 
as they start to get pumped up and ready for what should be a fantastic conclusion to the 52nd edition of the Formula Ford Festival here at Brands Hatch. 20 laps will decide who adds their name to the illustrious list of previous winners of the Formula Ford Festival. Are we going to get a new winner or will one of those three drivers off the front of the grid who have been champions of this event before manage to do it again? Here is how they'll line up then for the final 20 lap Formula Ford race of the weekend. Rory Smith on the pole position alongside him Jamie Sharp with Niall Murray and Chris Middlehurst making up row number two. Luke Cooper, a heat winner in the wet yesterday, starts fifth with Jordan Kelly, the Irishman for company. Row number four then is where you find Jordan Dempsey and Tom Nippers, both of them still potential race winners, even though they're starting a bit further back. Jeremy Fairbairn was quick yesterday as well. He will start from ninth alongside the Team USA driver, Zach Sullivan, the first of the Team USA scholarship drivers, starting in the back of the top 10. Logan Paxer starts 11th, ahead of David MacArthur with Alex Berg and Brendan McGorgan, uh, Brandon McGorgan, sorry, together on row seven. McGorgan wants to watch, remember, charged through from the back in his uh, semi-final uh, and will be starting from the outside of row seven. Porter Aiken and Harry uh, Henry Chart will share the eighth row. The grid, Charlie Mann and Johnny McMullen are next. McMullen, another who charged from the back in the semis. Uh, 18th, not the ideal place to start. What progress, though, will he be able to make? 19th for Ayrton Howe. He should be further up the order than that, really. The second Team USA scholarship driver uh, will complete the top 20 alongside Tom Hawkins, Morgan Quinn and Sam Street. Two more quick drivers, particularly Morgan Quinn, starting on the 11th row. Row 12 then for Jason Smith and Nolan Alaya. Two more really quick drivers who are starting deep in the order after their dramas in the semis. Felix Fisher likewise with Donald Downey uh, on the 13th row. Row 14 then for Rick Morris and Richard Higgins. We're getting into those now who made it in through the last chance race whilst Drew Stewart and Drew Cameron once again start next to each other this time on the 15th and last row of the grid. Well, uh, Andy McEwen here to talk you through the action alongside me, Scott Woodwiss once again. And Scott, going down the grid there it's the first time because of the hectic nature of the day that it's been first time i've actually had a chance to properly sit and look at the grid so many drivers well down the order who we came into the weekend saying yeah they could win the festival this year uh, and they have got a big big hole to try and dig themselves out of winning perhaps not really all that likely but it's going to be fascinating to watch their progress at the order while some of the expected heavy hitters are of course going to be challenging from the front from the get-go i've said this before so many times to people recently in the last few hours and i'll say it again the line that we've got here, I can't pick a winner. I genuinely cannot pick a winner. And it feels like, quite deja vu, it feels like 2021 again. So many good drivers at the front. And anyone from at least the first seven rows yeah. has got a genuine shot of winning this. You've got, you know, the former winners. You've got, effectively, aside of Max Esterson, you've got a lot of the recent winners. You've got Niall Murray. You've got Rory Smith. You've got and Jamie Sharp in the mix. Chris Middlehurst has been a serial podium finisher here in the past. You've got Luke Cooper, who's had a fantastic festival. And would really, it would be a great feel-good story if he takes the victory. With Jordan Kelly, the national champion. He wants to emulate what other national champions have done and won the festival on the same weekend. You've got all former North American scholarship drivers, both Team USA, with Ayrton Hauk and Jack Sullivan, Logan Paxer and Alex Berg in the mix. They're going to be up there, too, to pick their way through. Some of them are deeper than they should be. You've got other drivers to come through. Nolan um, Orla and Felix Fisher from towards the back. Rick Morris in another festival final, which would be amazing to see. I think also Henry Chart's not started. So I think the next reserve is Isaac Kang of the Silver. Ah, He's it. first reserve, because I saw there's a gap on 18th place. He'd actually been drawn after the historic final, which means that the first reserve gets on the grid. So it's Isaac Kang of the Silver, the young Brazilian. He's the back of the grid, just 16 years old, wow. only about two or three weeks ago. And he's now experienced his first festival final from the very back of the grid, but he's in there too. Others to experience, Porter Aiken, USF 2000 champion, Brandon McCorkin, you rightly said in there, Johnny McMullen's in there too. I could go on for ages, Morgan Quinn, others. There's so many good drivers in this field. Once again, it's impossible to pick a winner. There is a favourite you could put there in terms of key names that stand out initially, but you've got the others in the mix in there too. This is the race where you'll have to just simply watch the next 20 laps, watch it unfold, and just see who comes out on top. It is literally like sticking your ball into, it's, it's, it's sticking your hand into a bucket of 30 ping pong balls with, with, with names on them, picking one out, and that's your festival winner. That's how close to tight it is. And it is going to be, I hope, 20 laps that are going to be, a, going to be an epitome of what the festival and Brands Hatch and this event really is. And that's a great sight. 
TCR, of course, have been here for TCR as well, but some of the here for TCR are staying for the festival. That's one of the best sites you can see. A pretty heavily packed grandstand down at Paddock Hill, and I'm certain are about to see a festival final that's going to hopefully entertain all of them and us and all of you watching at home. There's about, uh, at least on the BRCC stream, at least about one and a half thousand people already watching on top of it. All of you watching on the TCR stream, there's over 2,000 people in total. Thank you to every single one of you that is watching. You hopefully in treat for, for an absolute treat because we've got 30 drivers, 20 laps and one festival champion for 2023. I'm excited, and is excited, you should be too. Let's rock and roll. For the 52nd time then, it is time to crown a champion in the Formula Ford Festival, uh, the HeadTech Grand Final, about to get underway. The lights go out, away we go. Good start made by Jamie Sharp from the outside of row one, but Rory Smith, I think, will hold on to the advantage on the inside. Yes, he does. So Smith leads the way then. It is Sharp second, it is Murray in third, as they head for Paddock Hill Bend for the first time. Single file amongst most of the top 10 or so, with some good side-by-side -side action further back, but a cagey start to the race. No one really uh, wanting to show their their hand too early perhaps and maybe a little bit of temporary truce formed amongst those front runners to try and pull a gap on the rest of the field and then settle it between themselves they are locked together as they head down the Cooper Strait for the first time Rory Smith Jamie Sharp and Dar Murray with a gap back to Chris Middlehurst in fourth place mid place then is Luke Cooper as they turn through the left hander at Surtees and towards the conclusion of the opening lap now this next few seconds will be telling do we see anyone try and make a move down the pit straight or are they content just to sit in line for now well there's your answer Dar Murray pops out at the inside of Jamie Sharp and challenges for second place as they head for Paddock Hill Bend at the end of lap number one Rory Smith leads it's almost a dead heat for second but Niall Murray I think is going to go through on the inside line and move up into the runners-up spot you can tell already in one lap in they're not going to settle but they go for it and that was a bit of on cement dust I think that was possibly a little bit of contact I think if not on the cement dust between Smith and Murray around the outside goes Jamie Sharp the three three festival winners in the field in the field first second and third middle has Dempsey uh, Kelly and Cooper in the mix there's your leading seven the next group led by Jeremy Fairbairn in eight they head the way up the straight now towards Surtees for the second time. It's Smith in control. Murray on the outside line. There's a bit of damage to his front nose gun on the left-hand side. There must be where he tried to get past, I think, Rory Smith. It was a bit of a, a blocking there in some cases, or defensive move there from the car in front. He's holding on to third place for the time being. Fairbairn's joined that group. Now he's also got Tom Nippers up there in ninth. Jack Sullivan Ooh. ahead of them is there. Running wide there was Jamie Sharp. And through now goes to second place goes Nile Murray. And Sharp has lost momentum. He's also going to lose out, I think, to Middlehurst, who's going to get the push from Jordan Dempsey down the pit straight towards Paddock Hill Bend, down the outside to make it to third place. Trying to take the high wide enhanced line if he can. He gets pushed out wide. Dempsey in the mix as well. It's only lap three and he's properly kicking off at the front. Oh, Jamie Sharp with a rare mistake then, dipping those wheels into the gravel. Recovered well, only lost one place. But look at the distance that he's lost to the top two. Smith continues to lead. Murray second and Sharp does now manage to hang on to third place. Big lunge up the inside. Meanwhile, uh, that is the number 99 machine trying to make some progress of Jordan Kelly. Didn't quite manage to make that move stick. And now actually he's under threat uh, from Jeremy Fairbairn. The other driver who gained out of all of that was Jordan Dempsey. He's into fifth now ahead of Luke Cooper, who's just started to slip backwards a little bit more than he would ideally like. Third lap then about to be completed. Fairbairn, by the way, has the fastest lap of the race. He's down in eighth position, but he is looking rapid in the early stages. Lead margin, six tenths of a second. Niall Murray just about still within slipstreaming range, and he now steals that fastest lap back away from Rory Smith. This is going to be a real test now of Niall Murray's metal. Can he chase down Rory Smith? It looks as though he might have half a chance, and he's definitely, Scott, getting away from this almighty fight for third. And that's the key thing. If you can break away early and break that toe from the cars behind, it means you can go into a race of your own. Rory Smith has got that gap by about six tenths per second. Murray's going with him. Now at the moment, the small cork in the bottle appears to be Jamie, Jamie Sharp here. He's now trying to bring along Middlehurst, Dempsey, Cooper, and the rest as they come down towards Surtees on lap four. We're already at one fifth distance in this race already, it seems. But now it looks as though at the moment it is Smith versus Murray for, for the Festival win, unless everyone closes back up again and the rest of the pack led by Jamie Sharp can close them, bring them back towards them. There's a 1.3 second gap at the last split between. Uh, Murray is sharp at this point. Cross the line they go. It is a new fast snap of the race to Niall Murray. 50.287 is looking up the inside to take third place. Goes Chris Middlehurst Lovely. down the inside. There's a bit of wheel banging, but in classic form on a four star. Down the inside. Out wide goes Sharp. And here comes Jordan Dempsey, last year's festival ch um, uh, national champion, looking to try and take fourth place from the 2021 festival winner. Through Druids they go side by side on the exit with Jamie Sharp will have the inside line. That was forceful stuff for Middlehurst. He knew he had to make that pass if he wants to catch the top two. He's been on the podium a couple of times before. Middlehurst 
Amherst wants a first festival victory. And he had to make that move, didn't he? He could see that, as you said, Jamie Sharp was weirdly struggling for pace. I had Jamie Sharp nailed as perhaps the fastest driver on the grid, and it's just not really panned out that way. I don't know whether they've made a setup change between the semi final and the final, or perhaps they haven't made a setup change, which they should have done. It's a little bit cooler now, later in the day, a bit more rubber down on the track, and a lot of the Formula 4 drivers actually have said that the Goodyear rubber laid down by the TCR cars is really wreaking havoc, actually, uh, with their tyres, and they're not getting the same grip levels that they would be used to. Right, battle for the race lead. Rory Smith having to defend from Niall Murray, who looks to the outside line into Druid's corner, and Niall is in a dream position here, really, in Formula Ford racing. He's on the tail of the leader. He's caught the race leader, which proves that he's got good pace, and he's got no pressure from behind. Niall Murray is free to experiment here. Use whichever line he thinks he needs to to try and get the move made, and Rory Smith is going to have to make that a very, very wide Medina if he's going to hold on to the lead of this race for much longer. Certainly push as hard as he can. This is Nile Murray of, of old, really, pushing on to try and see if he can make it happen. This appears to be the battle here. If Middlehurst can try and bring the car towards him, he's going to need some help from the likes of Sharp and Dempsey. If not, this is the battle for the festival win. It's two former champions sparring with each other. D Smith wants his second festival win. Murray wants to go for three. Looks round the outside, going for the high, wide, and handsome move. He's gone round the outside. Oh. That's one of the best moves of the festival. He runs a little bit wide, almost side by side. They're almost touching. Oh, oh there do. is contact between the two. Smith goes across. Murray probably came across a little bit too much, but Nile Murray with a superb outside pass. A little wide over the curb, admittedly, but Nile Murray, two-time champion, hits the front of the Formula Ford Festival. He's going for festival win number three. Who cares about track limits? Let them race. That was fantastic stuff. Nile Murray, full of commitment, full of bravery, right round the outside. One of the moves of the weekend, certainly, and one of the best we've seen for the lead in a long time at the festival, but that does not win him the race by any means. Rory Smith now gets that slipstream, and as long as his car isn't damaged after that little knock, they've both had a few knocks in fairness in this race already, uh, he should be able to still challenge there. Meanwhile is the fight for third, Chris Middlehurst third, Jamie Sharp fourth, and Jordan Dempsey in fifth position. Three cars just starting to detach themselves maybe from Luke Cooper in sixth position, who just doesn't seem to quite have the raw pace now that the track is fully dry in the wet. Yesterday, he dominated in his heat, but in the uh, drier races that we've had subsequently, he does appear to have struggled just a little bit. Heads down the hill then towards Graham Hill Bend. Chris Middlehurst getting away slightly from Jamie Sharp, and that uh, I just don't think that Jamie Sharp is particularly happy with the way that his car is handling. It doesn't seem to be reacting in the way that he would like it to, and that's showing in his lap times. A little bit. He's coming under pressure now for Jordan Dempsey. He's Ooh. sliding out wide. I think you're absolutely right. The setup's not where he wants it to be. And there's a black and white flag for Luke Cooper track limits because he keeps on transgressing that. You will get a five-second penalty for that. You've got to be careful. He's keeping in the slipstream now of Jordan Dempsey. So all the front most expected. The rest of the top ten, as you mentioned, Jordan Kelly, national champion in seventh place. Jeremy Fairbairn in eighth. Ninth is Tom Nippers. I have to say, credit to Tom Nippers. Yeah. Really good run from him so far in P9. And, ja and Jack Sullivan, highest of the North American scholarship drivers for Team USA in 10th position, but he might be about to lose that a little bit because down the outside looks to be Brandon McCorkin, and he's having a fantastic charge from where he started. He was back in 14th. He's up to 11th place now, up three places. Now you see the rest of the pack coming through. And on that note, actually, a few others that we should point out that were coming through the order. McCorgan 11th, you mentioned, but we've also got uh, Halk up to 16th, McMullen 17th, Morgan Quinn 18th. The one that's not really made much progress is Nona the Liar. He's still down in 22nd place at the moment. Did get uh, one position on the previous lap, but he would have been hoping for a bit more progress in the early stages because we are nearly halfway through the race. We're about to start the halfway lap. It's the 10th lap of 20, and Rory Smith is right back oh, with Darby. Yes. He goes from the outside to the inside. What a move that could be for Rory Smith. Anything you can do, he says, I can do better. Now Murray, two wheels in the gravel trap. They're still side by side, though, as they head for Druid's corner. Rory Smith back to the lead. Fabulous racing, Scott. Sensation. I thought Nar Murray's move was great. That was the last minute dummy to perfection. Rory Smith, you hero. That was superb. This is a proper festival fight for the victory between two former champions. And look, Chris Middlehurst has broken away from the pack. He's coming for them. The harder these two fight each other, the easier it is for Middlehurst to catch up and remember Middlehurst hasn't won a festival no. Rory's won one Middlehurst Murray's won two could it now be three of them it's two team Dolan cars even though they're in the same team Middlehurst wants this win just as much as Murray does forget about teammates he's going to go for it just as much as Niall is but Roy Smith now might have two team Dolan cars to deal with is it here comes Murray again to the outside line down towards Paddock Hill Bend is he going to make it a repeat move can he do the switch back no Smith holds the inside line and keeps it keeps it locked in looks again looks one way then the other back to the outside line Middlehurst is coming he's coming after him in third place and it might also start to bring Sharp Dempsey Cooper because they're not too far away either I think it was a tiny bit of uh, 
body work came off the nose from the remnants of that initial contact earlier on. He's getting very close. Oh. He's practically shoving the nose of that Van Dien up the Medina Sports gearbox. And here comes Middlehurst for third place. Nine laps to go. This is on. Middlehurst, seven tenths quicker than the race leaders last time around because they are starting to squabble. So he is absolutely going to be in contention here. Luke Cooper, by the way, is back into the top five now as well. He got up the inside of Jordan Dempsey exiting Paddock Hill Bend. And he is now also trying to move himself back into podium contention. Through they go. We are 11 laps into the grand final here at Brands Hatch. And Nile Murray once again goes to the outside line into Paddock Hill Bend. But Rory Smith, I think, has figured this one out now. Ooh. He just drifts over a little bit. He's very sideways on the apex, though. And that kills his momentum. Heading up Hailwood Hill. Nile Murray to the outside line. Late on the brakes. Nose ahead. Can he go right round the outside? Does Rory Smith leave him the space? Oh, just about again. Nile Murray has to take oh, to the curves. But he's got it, the Niall. inside line for Graham Hill Bend. And Nile Murray wants more leads. And here comes Middlehurst, Chris Middlehurst, much quicker off Graham Hill Bend. The road is blocked by Rory Smith, but it is well and truly now three for the lead. And watch the cars behind, because Jamie Sharp's in fourth. You've got Cooper, Kelly, Dempsey and Fairbetter in there as well. We could end up with possibly an eight-car train. <laughs> here comes Jamie Sharp in fourth place. We've still got eight laps to go here as they come through. Murray back to the front now, but it's three for the lead. It could be four. Could be as many as eight if they all close up together. This is the magic of the festival altogether now. Murray leads the way across the line. His gap is about a quarter of a second, as Middlehurst is looking for second place here. It's now... Uh, Roy Smith's BM Racing Medina in a Team Dolan Van Diemen sandwich. He's got Murray in front of him, Middlehurst right behind him as well, looking up the inside line. He thought about it, just poked his inside to put himself into Smith's mirrors, but just tried to hold on for third place if he could. And Sharp is coming back in as to the three uh, festival winners in the mix, along with the man who's been on the podium a couple of times, are going to make it now possibly a quartet for the victory. Middlehurst the key man here, I think, though. If he starts to distract Rory Smith, that could just allow Niall Murray to break away. It's not happening yet, but if at any point Smith has to defend that second place and really starts losing them both time, that could be Niall Murray's ticket to a decent race lead. We're about two-thirds of the way through. The race is flying by far too quickly, uh, but we're getting down to crunch time now. The race will not be won in the first 15 laps. It's always what happens in the final five that really makes the difference. Rory Smith tries to sell the dummy again, but just a touch too far back that time and by going in tight again he's sideways at the apex of paddock and middlehurst sees his chance there's no room at the inn on the inside line and uh, also gaining on them very much so is jamie sharp who i discounted completely about 10 laps ago and he's right back in it but look that one defensive move from rory smith just buys Niall Murray a car length or so. It's not much for now, Scott, but it's probably the biggest lead anyone's had so far this race. Yeah, it's probably the biggest lead he's going to get because if Royce can figure out, well, he's not going to get any help from Middlehurst. Of course, <laughs> it's a different team. He's, if anything, Middlehurst, if he's going to help anyone, it's going to be Niall Murray, if that. But in many cases, it's going to be pretty close. He's just going to try and race, try, drive his own race and try and get back towards it here. All he can do is just try and chase after Murray, stay in his wheel tracks and keep after him. Now, this is critical. Murray, Middlehurst is going from the hunter to the hunted because now Jamie Sharp's coming back into play here. Cooper's mm, keeping a watch in brief distance in fifth. He's maybe a dark horse if it all kicks off a bit more in front of him. Rest of the top ten we'll give a shout-out to. Jordan Dempsey in sixth, Jordan Kelly seventh, Je uh, Je um, uh, Jeremy Fairbairn eighth, Jack Sullivan ninth, and Tom Nipper still tenth independent runner. As for the rest of the uh, Team USA and Canada drivers, Alex Berg is the next best of Team Canada in 12th. Logan Pax is 14th. And Ayrton Howe, a bit disappointed for him. Down in 18th place. Not at the best of the final he was hoping for, but in the thick of it, in the middle of the pack as well. He is indeed. Right then, we're going to be three quarters of the way through the race at the end of this lap. And Nar Murray is putting together a really big lap here. He was nearly a tenth quicker uh, than Rory Smith in Sector 1. That gap is growing out over half a second now. That still means that Rory Smith is within slipstreaming range, but he's not close enough to attack as they head into Paddock. Now that's interesting. Black and white warning flag, race leader Niall Murray. It's not a penalty yet, but the stewards are watching him. He's been pinged for exceeding track limits. If he does it once more, then a five second penalty will go his way and that will ultimately cost him a chance at the victory in the festival. So now not only does he have to defend from an ever increasing queue of cars forming behind him, he has got to be extra, extra careful, Scott, that he stays within those white lines. Oh, he put two wheels over the there at, uh, at the entry, entry Graham Hill, Ben, but that's not where the sensors are, it's at the exit of Rainville, but he's got to be careful of. Four of them for the lead now with what's coming for the final four laps. This is the final we should have had last year. It's the final we're getting this year. This is the proper festival final we wanted for. This is magic with four laps to go. This is a proper Formula 4 race. Yes, it is. Right, what can Rory Smith do? He's closer this time as they come through Clearways and Clark Curve. He's in the slipstream. 
at that stage of the race, though, where he knows that any move he makes now might be his last. If he makes a move, it doesn't work. He could spend the remaining laps trying to fend off Chris Middlehurst and Jamie Sharp behind him. Doesn't go for a lunge this time into Paddock. Much neater that time, though, for Rory Smith. And it pays off. Look at the exit speed that he had. He forces a defensive move out of Nar Murray. But Smith daren't go wide because Middlehurst is there to fill the gap if he leaves the door open. So he's got to box clever here, Rory Smith. If he goes for a move, he's got to be confident that, A, it will work. And, B, it won't leave him vulnerable to attack from Middlehurst, who's right on his gearbox now as they head down the Cooper Strait. Thinks about going to the inside of Surtees, actually. Does Middlehurst, the three of them virtually pushing each other through Surtees as we head towards clearways, after which we will have three laps to go. Three laps, longest laps in Almari's life, I'm sure. He wants best to win number three, but everyone else behind him is stacking up to try and take it from him. Roy Smith wants to take his second, Middlehurst wants a first, and Jamie Sharp wants a second too. He's going to be close as he's ever been. Which way is this going to go? He looks to the outside line. Here comes Middlehurst to the outside too. Thought about it, looks for the undercut right underneath the gearbox oh. of the Midian Sport. And here comes Jamie Sharp. Oh, this, what a th run. This, is, this is BM Racer versus Team Dolan. This is two by two here. And look at Jamie Sharp round the outside of Chris Middlehurst. Can he go for second? He was a little bit too wide. That's another great pass oh. to find. Fantastic from Jamie Sharp. He's really in the mix now. Two and a half laps to go. This is really on now. This is hotting up now. Murray leads at the moment, but it could change the drop of a hat. If Jamie Sharp wins this race, I'll eat my hat. I had properly <laughs> counted him out when he had that moment at, Graham, at to clear ways. The car wasn't handling well. He didn't have the pace, and suddenly he's right back in it. Four cars for the lead as they head through clear ways in Clark Kirk. We will start the pronouncement. Oh, Murray! And Murray's, Murray's, Murray's got his hand out of the cockpit. What's going on? No! He's got Problem a problem! For Niall Murray as we start the penultimate lap of the final, and Niall Murray could be out of it. Rory Smith inherits the race lead, and Jamie Sharp is up to second. Chris Middlehurst goes to the outside line, and Chad Challenges for that second spot through Paddock Hill Bend. Absolute heartbreak for Niall Murray, though. His chances of a third festival victory are shattered. I think that's a, that's a shade of 2015 when he had an engine failure in 2015. That's heartbreak for Niall Murray. A third festival win is snatched from him once again. He'll have to wait and come back next year. And he, he'll keep on trying until he gets festival win number three. I'm sure he will. So, lap on a half then. Luke Cooper's now in fourth in the mix as well. And so too is Jordan Dempsey. It is five for the lead with a lap and a half to go. Smith leads it. It could be a BM1-2 if they hold on to this with Smith. This is the newest Bet Medina Sport chassis, of course, with a newer point to your nose. If they could pull off a 1-2 in that car's first festival final, what a performance that will be. Now, this is where we find out just what Jamie Sharp's got. Did he catch the leaders because they were squabbling, or did he catch the leaders because he was quicker than them? At the moment, I'm, su I'm suspecting it might be the first of those options because he's dropping back, and actually Chris Middlehurst tries to get to the inside of him into Paddock Hill Bend. We are on the final lap of the HeadTech Grand Final here at the Formula Ford Festival, and Rory Smith might be about to claim his second festival title in three years. Through Druid's corner he goes, he's hanging on for now. Jamie Sharp is giving this everything he's got. The car sideways out of Druid's corner as he desperately tries to get within striking range. There is realistically one more chance to overtake, and that comes into clearways. The final corner, short of that, it'll be a drag race to the line, which surely Rory Smith will fancy his chances of winning. Into the final turn, he doesn't even have to defend. Jamie Sharp sends it in from a long way back. He can't get up the inside line. He drifts wide of the apex, and I reckon that Rory Smith might just have done enough. Out of Clark Curve he comes. The 52nd Formula Ford Festival at Brands Hatch goes to Rory Smith after a sensational 20 lap of racing. Jamie Sharp just hangs on to second ahead of Chris Middlehurst third, Luke Cooper fourth, Jordan Dempsey fifth, with Jordan Kelly and Jeremy Fairbairn also on the back of that trade. Top seven cars covered by less than three seconds at the flag. Then it is McGorgan eighth. Brandon McGorgan started that race 14th and moved up to eighth place by the flag. Jack Sullivan ninth and Tom Nippers completes the top ten. What heartbreak for Niall Murray, not the first time in recent years, actually, that he will say he's been robbed of a chance uh, to win the festival. But, oh, hello. Oh, dear. Uh, that's, I thought that was Niall Murray when I caught a glimpse of it. It's not, did it? It's the that's, that's, that's uh, Murray Jason Sh Smith on Jason top Smith. of somebody. That's David MacArthur, by the looks of it. Oh, dear. Oh, yes, they Blimey. didn't come through. They were battling just outside the top 15, I think. And they have clearly tangled the Druids on the final lap. Anyway, they both appear to be fine, so we can move swiftly on. Uh, now, our timing tower is saying Jamie Sharp, race winner, but the timing screen is saying Rory Smith, so I think we've had a couple of glitches in the system today. We'll ignore that for now and say that Rory Smith has definitely won uh, the Head Tech Grand Final here at Grand's Hatch after a storming drive. I mean, there were times in that race where it really looked like Niall Murray might have the better of him. When Niall made that first overtake for the lead round the outside of Paddock, 
Yeah. And he sort of started to get his head down and pull away. I suspected then maybe Niall had it in the bag. But Rory Smith tenaciously dug deep, didn't give in, and managed to drag himself back into contention. Made a superb move of his own as well. In fact, two superb moves of his own to get the lead. And Jamie Sharp will be the first to congratulate him as Rory Smith pulls up in front of the number one board. The team are going to be there to congratulate him as well. I think a slightly shocked Rory Smith just takes a moment to compose himself before he gets out of the car, where shortly he'll have a chat with Richard John Neal. And, uh, well, if he can even attempt to sum up what happened over the last 20 laps or so uh, in the, the short space of time that we'll have with him, that will be very impressive. But now it starts to dawn on him that he is a double festival champion with his first one back in 2020 and he managed to get a second one here in 2023. Do you know what? The way he's performing at the moment, it may well not be his last. And Mark Murray will tell you how difficult it is to win a third festival final. He waited three years as well, actually, between his first two, did uh, Nar Murray, but in 2013, then again in 2016, and, uh, well, seven years in counting now since Nar Murray lasted on the top step of the podium. And the car not broken on him, who knows, it could have been a very different story. He could have been celebrating a third festival victory right now. Them's the brakes, unfortunately. Good and bad fortune have always played a part in motor racing. And today, fortune shot on Rory Smith. So Rory Smith, victorious in the Brands Hatch Formula Ford Festival for a second time in the last three years. Chris Middlehurst comes home second place in the end. Uh, sorry, uh, James Sharp comes home in second place at the end. That result on screen is not the correct one, as we understand it. It should be uh, Smith, the winner, Sharp second, and Middlehurst in third. With Luke Cooper fourth and Jordan Dempsey in fifth position. Sixth place then goes the way of Jordan Kelly. Seventh for Jeremy Fairbairn. Eighth place for Brandon Gorgon. Ninth was Jack Sullivan, best of the Team USA or Team Canada scholarship winners. And then the top 10 completed by Tom Nippers. So, incredible stuff. And actually, of the 30 starters, 27 of them got to the flag. And all of the retirements came inside the last two laps. It was a perfectly clean race. No safety cars either, which is a bit of a rarity, actually. You can understand when the tension starts to rise and it's all on the line. We do occasionally get a few incidents in the final, but not today. Uh, Kyle Murray's unfortunate mechanical uh, failure taking him out. And then whatever happens to MacArthur and Smith also meant they, they were not finishers. Here is confirmation they're proper with the results. Smith, Sharp, Middlehurst, your podium, uh, with Luke Cooper and Jordan Dempsey completing the top five. Jordan Kelly, sick. Jeremy Fairbairn was seventh after an up and down weekend, really, for him. Brandon McGordon, eight, Jack Sullivan, nine. And Tom Nippers completes the top ten. Then was Morgan Quinn, eleventh position, having started 21st, not bad going. And Logan Paxson was 12th, Alex Berg, 13th, and Ayat and Hauk in 14th. So you've got all of the Canadians and Americans sort of... Um, sort of uh, getting together in the uh, middle of uh, the teams there. Porter Aiken then was 15th, Nolan Ali was 16th in the end, which didn't make progress early on than he needed to, really. Same true of uh, Felix Fisher and Johnny McMullen, who finished 17th and 18th respectively, Charlie Van 19th, and Isaac Canto da Silva, the uh, late entry to the final, a reserve entry, but managed to come from back to finish in 20th. Then it was Sam Street, Donald Downey, Tom Hawkins, Drew Stewart, and Richard Higgins, the uh, historic final winner, uh, managing to finish 25th overall. Then it was Drew Cameron and Rick Morris. So Rick Morris finishes another festival final in 27th place. Well, we need to go and have a lie down somewhere, I think, after that one. Let's hand over, shall we, to Richard John Neal, who is able now to catch up with our festival champion. And that will be a very well-deserved lie down, Andy McEwen and Scott Willis. Very well called. Thank you for entertaining us. And I'm going to get straight on with this. Rory Smith, our winner. Rory Smith, ladies and gentlemen. Congratulations, Rory. We'll get you there. Going to grab a... What a race. Just t tell us about it from start to finish. Actually, we haven't got that long, but <laughs> tell us about your experience. Yeah, I mean, after the semi, I was hopeful that I could keep Nile behind, but it was too quick in this one. So the toe just brought him back into the game. I think lap three or four, maybe. Um, and then it was just a real slug match from there. Just um, the both of us just trying to do everything we could to get back past each other, um, which we did. So we had some great racing and an absolute kudos to Nile. He's a cracking driver and he drove insanely well. So um, well on to him. And it's unfortunate fortunate that he, he did conk out there, I'm not too sure what happened, but um, yeah, it looked like the last few laps were going to be even more exciting and the same, same thing again, so um, do feel a bit sorry for now, um, but obviously it was an awesome race and absolutely ecstatic for myself and team and everyone involved, so yeah, it was great. Rory, well done, double champion. We'll catch up with you a little bit later on because once the photos are done, Kentigan for the official yeah. presentation, we'll see you there. Thank well you done. Much. Quick word with Jamie Sharp if we can. P2. 
Uh, Arca, the reaction to Jamie of the race. Well done, Jamie. Um, the guys in the comms box had written you off yeah. at one point early on, but you came back big time. I had as well at one point. Um, I just couldn't couldn't get the car to um, get the heat in the tyres, couldn't get it to run as, as I wanted it to. But, yeah, it come, come back a little bit at the end. The engine started getting a bit hot, but... Um, yeah, just brought up the rear and managed to pop a, a last-minute move on Chris. And it, Outside of Druids? Yeah, it paid off for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> a, a move that we savoured and enjoyed the battling for the lead and for the podium positions was superb. Um, and everyone seems happy. No one's ever happy to be second, but that was a great performance. No, yeah, absolutely. I think I'm more happy for the team and Rory. It's very well deserved for all of them. And the team have proven everything this weekend. It's just always up there. Um, and if any of us decided to do a full championship, we'd definitely be fighting for it. So that's... Yeah. Yeah, proving it this weekend. It'll be great to see you back full time, and I hope we'll see you next year for the festival. It's uh, the festival is a, a lovely habit to have, isn't it? Yeah, 100 percent. Yeah, um, I was debating it being the last one for a while, but um, we, we might see. You know, we're there or thereabouts, so we might have to might have to make a return. <laughs> You've got to go for number two, like Rory. I hope we see you in the Kentigan afterwards uh, after the uh, Honda Civic race and uh, our podium. Let's talk to make our podium complete for the Headtech final. Chris Middlehurst, Chris, another superb drive and great driving all weekend. Another podium for you in the festival, and I hope like Jamie we see you again going for that win yeah 100 percent you come back every year and you know you try to uh, you know win the race and uh, so I guess yeah try again next year uh, it was so close out there you know and um, I got boxed in towards the end of Druids and uh, Jamie managed to get around the outside of me um, up until that point I was sitting pretty in third I thought you know I've got really good speed let him battle ahead and then try to you know get past one of them as they start to battle which was working out a treat until Jamie uh, was around the outside of me and then he just sort of slowed me up really so um, that's the way it goes. It's very hard around here, you know, because it's very hard to get past. It really, really is. And you've got to kind of fall someone off the road, really, or wait for someone to make a mistake before you can get past. But, uh, yeah, obviously good to get a podium out of it, I guess, at the end. And uh, big thanks to Team Dolan for giving me a great car all week, all year. Uh, as always, and Middlehurst Garage for, uh, yeah, sponsoring me. Tall man, Chris. Many congratulations. Please join us in the Kentigan a little bit later on. As you can hear, engine sounds in the background. A full packed program, as fast as the the program going as quickly as the cars do on circuit. Uh, it's it's Civic Cup time now. So without further ado, I hand you back up to Scott and Andy for the grid, and I look forward to their last race of the year. Bite your nails. <laughs> That's exactly what we were doing, actually, Richard, as we were discussing what may or may not happen over the course of the next 15 minutes or so. It is the final round of the uh, Miltexport Civic Cup uh, Championship Decider, no less, with Max Edmondson and Dan Thackeray set to do battle. We'll get into the championship permutations in a moment. Let's first of all set the scene a little bit and show you uh, how they're going to be lining up on the grid for this one, because it is a grid uh, based upon the race result from race one, but with the top ten inverted. So it is Owen Hillman and Sam Nicolau who get the front row to themselves. Tommy Knight and Alistair Camp then share row number two. Campy, unfortunately, no longer uh, in contention for the championship after a disappointing race one. Alex Kite will start from fifth with Ryan Bensley uh, in sixth position. And uh, then the fourth row shared by Harvey Caton and Lewis Kent. Then we have Dave Marshall and Max Edmondson, top two from the earlier race. And Max Edmondson with that victory and a non-finish for Dan Thackeray has now moved into a fairly healthy championship lead. Uh, then it's Travis Chapman starting 11th, Louis Hounsel 12th. Brilliant effort from the youngster Louis Hounsel actually in only his second event uh, as a cup class racer with no production class to enter into uh, this season. Then it's Liam McGill. He had strong pace in the first race but picked up a track limits penalty whilst Bradley Kent had a quiet run to 14th from where he'll start race two. Harry England is 15th again making his debut this weekend with Jack Riddell 16th, Anthony Gannon starts 17th and Charles Birch will complete that ninth row. Row 10 then for Simon Welch and uh, with Dan Thackeray next in line. Simon Welch by the way has more or less wrapped up the Goodyear Diamond Trophy but he needs to make sure he finishes this race in order to make sure that he seals the deal. Dan Thackeray will start 20th. We've heard he is in the assembly area with a new engine fitted we believe. Fingers crossed everything works okay and he can mount a challenge for the back of the championship. Reese Lewis and Jordan Brenham will start from the back having not finished earlier as well. Right then. What has to happen for Max Edmondson to win the championship? Well, basically, Max Edmondson, if, if, if he finishes inside the top six in this race, is the champion regardless. Even if Dan Thackeray puts together the drive of the century, comes from the back of the grid with a new engine, wins the race, sets the fastest lap along the way, 
even if he does that, Max Edmondson only needs to finish inside the top six in order to win the championship. If he doesn't finish inside the top six, then Dan Thackeray still, by the looks of it, needs to finish inside the top five as a minimum. So if Dan Thackeray isn't in the top five, then there doesn't appear to be a way in which he can win the championship. But there, Paul O'Neill, is the best news we've had all day. Dan Thackeray has got the car out on track. Now, I don't know whether it's been a full engine change. I suspect it probably was. It looked like a fairly uh, catastrophic failure. But there's always a bit of nervousness, isn't there? You put a new engine in that's not been tested, not been run in. You don't really know how it's going to perform, whether it's all been fitted properly. They only had a couple of hours to do it as well. So his nerves are going to be through the roof right now. Yeah, just, just let me say... <clears throat> If you're a race car driver and you've got uh, an engine in a car and an engine spare, you ain't going to have the best engine you've got sat as a spare. Um, so it depends where it's come from. Never know. Could be an absolute snorter. Um, but he's out there and he's got a chance. You know, you never know what can happen, um, especially what we've seen in TCR UK. The, the ambient temperature has, uh, has dropped a little bit. And, um, yeah, let's just see if they can get the tyre temps up and, uh, and away we'll go then. And I think this is going to be, again... <clears throat> End the season, people want to finish on a high, they will take more risks uh, than they've been taking um, up to now this weekend. How's Max Edmondson feeling right now, do you think? I mean, we've said that he's matured so much as the year's gone on, but he is young. He's not used to being in this kind of situation. Dan was at least in the championship fight last year uh, when we went to the final rounds. Max has to start 10. That's right in the hornet's nest where things could so easily go wrong at the start of the race. If Thackeray's nervous, then describe to us how Max is feeling. Well, yeah, Thackeray will be nervous, but I don't think he'll be as nervous as Max. Um, but the other thing I will say is Dave Marshall's just ahead of Edmondson, and we know how difficult that car will be to get past, but all it needs is one of those drivers that, you know, he doesn't race against um, after qualifying, usually, that are, that's around him, um, and he's got to get past a lot of them, and there's a lot of uh, pro allies cars that he needs to get past and a lot of other cars but motion motorsport are a single car outfit and area as well i've got other cars but let's just see who's been nice and who hasn't over the years <laughs> yes time to repay some debts maybe in the final race of the season right then the sun shining here at brands hatch as the miltec sport civic cups 2023 season prepares to come to a thrilling conclusion the red lights are on and for the final time this year we're away in racing in the civic cup good start made seemingly from the pole position then by owen hillman is he going to hold on to the race lead I think he will, but uh, Sam Nicolau is going to try and challenge round the outside line. Steaming up the inside goes Tommy Knight. They're three abreast. Alistair Camp is squeezed <gasps> in the middle. No! And the race leader, Owen Hillman, is sideways in front of the pack. He saves oh. it, but they will all scatter to avoid. Watch Edmondson. He's on the outside line, and that could be in the firing line if it all goes wrong. Someone locking up right in front of him. Edmondson trying desperately to stay out of trouble as it very nearly all fell apart in front of him. Yeah, that could have been absolutely horrendous. Thackeray already oh, no. in the middle of the pack. That Tommy Knight. Oh, it is! Oh, He's no. coming back into the road somehow oh. again, saves it, and Edmondson wow. once more finds himself in the thick of it all. There's cars bouncing down the grass. That's Lewis Kent, I think, heading for the barriers, but just manages to avoid and all of that with a championship too, because actually Thackeray has had a brilliant start. He gained loads of places through the first few corners. There is Dave Marshall, Harvey Caton out wide, Max Edmondson in that fight as well. But where is Thackeray? He's only three places. Look behind Max Edmondson. Well, he's not. He's closer than that. Look at this. Now he's right there, isn't he? The, he's really, really close. It is three places but this is going to be carnage because there's still two Whoa. and three abreast and Dave Marshall has let not let him pass but Edmondson sideways past him and he needed to get that done and now Thackeray has got to follow him and got to get on with this. That was a big pass though for Edmondson. <gasps> More contact right in front of Thackeray who's just got to go where they're not really at the moment. Go for all the gaps. Gets blocked a bit there though by Sam Nicolau who was sort of recovering from that half spin and Dan well interestingly doesn't just dive on the inside of Grey Mill Bend as I think I'd have been tempted to do and that might now cost him on the exit of the corner. But yeah, Edmondson getting past Marshall was big, I think, Paul, because you made the point. Marshall's not an easy man to pass. That car is quick. Getting that job done early was crucial. Yeah, that, that was a really, really, you know... Oh, to be... That oh. is Nicolau. Nicolau has had a... Dis that is the worst couple of laps I've ever seen. He has had a nightmare. That looked like he'd been fired round. Someone's hit the back of him, actually. So, interestingly... That's him gone, but Thackeray will have got one more place. And that's Jordan Brennan in front, isn't it? So he needs to get past him. He's done it. Yeah. Wow, there's nothing wrong with that car, is there? No, good horsepower down the straight. Brennan, in fairness, didn't make life difficult for him. That is Travis Chapman running wide in the Pro Alloys car. Uh, Jack Riddell gets to the inside of him. They're in a Kent sandwich, actually. Uh, Lewis Kent just ahead. And the uh, bright yellow car of Bradley Kent in behind as well. Down the hill they head then. 
just calming down a bit. Edmondson sits in fifth position right now. Thackeray in 12th, but Thackeray, despite that early oh. progress that he made, not having the room of the green since then. No, he went into uh, Graham Hill Bend very quickly then, and uh, the car didn't want to get in and out of that corner. So, yeah, this is uh, oh. still a bit of a nibble. That Tommy Knight, isn't it? In uh, McGill having a little nibble on him there. There's cars that are drifting out of the gravel <laughs> trap on the exit of, um, wow. Edmondson with the uh, fastest lap. I don't think that's going to um, be the quickest lap of the race, but <laughs> seems to be going purple every five seconds. But uh, yeah, I don't know where to look next. Look at this now. That was, was that Harvey Caton trying to have a look at Dave Marshall in the middle of your picture headlights like ablaze. Yeah, Marshall does seem to get stronger as the race goes on, really, doesn't he? So uh, yeah, struggling a bit maybe in the early stages, may yet become a factor later on. Max Edmondson sets the fastest lap, meanwhile, worth a bonus point in the championship. So that's significant as well. And he's definitely catching the leaders. In fact, he is the first non-Pro Alloys racing car, isn't he? It's Pro Alloys 1, 2, 3, 4 right now, uh, with uh, Kite, Hillman, Camp and Bensley running at the front of the field. Then it's Edmondson, with this then the fight for six, Dave Marshall and Harvey Caton. Was that Edmondson up the inside of Bensley? He was trying it. I'm intrigued here. Does he need to keep pushing like this, Edmondson? He's in a good spot right now, no pressure from behind. He is in a good spot, and if I was him, I wouldn't start pushing just yet. Don't be messing around. Uh, getting yourself involved in any kind of trouble. Bensley is not in a straight car. That car's bent from Silverstone. They know it needs a reshell, but he's had a big lunge. I tell you what, Bensley will not wave him through. I'll tell you that for nothing. They're all the same. All them pro allies, because they will not wave him past. And Alistair Camp didn't really do Druids particularly well then, so he drops back into that battle as Bensley's car bounces, uh, sort of wallows over the curb there down at uh, Graham Hill Bend. A uh, Thackeray check, by the way. He is 11th place, or he was at the start of the lap. Yes, still is, I think. Just ahead of Lewis Kent. Not really making the steaming progress that he'd like. That's Edmonds up the inside of Bensley. Oh, wow. Bit of a hip and shoulder on the apex, and Edmonds is through. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. It was a good Good move, but Bensley will not be having any of that. Um, he will think, well, what did you do that for? You didn't need to bend my panel, but uh, <laughs> that was a clean move in my book. So let's see what Bensley comes back with him at. Ryan and, and a lot of the guys in front will not be the kind of people who will be firing Max Edmondson off because they'll do it themselves, obviously. Oh, wow. I was over Hillman taking the rally cross route through uh, Paddock Hill Bend, but uh, thankfully gathered it all together. But, yeah, a few of them seem to be uh, grip limited at the moment, don't they? A few slides going into the corners, bit of understeer on corner exit for a few of them as they all try and really extract the maximum in this final race of the season. We're a third of the way through then, just under 10 minutes to go. And Alex Kite, perhaps on course for a race victory. That'll be a real feel-good story. He and Owen Hillman are both really going to be gunning for that race win. But this, Paul, is a fascinating battle. Alistair Camp's car doesn't look like it's handling very well. He misses the apex by a bar, and Edmondson's on the inside. Camp tried to close the door. This could be disastrous if it all goes wrong, but Edmondson might just have the run into paddock. This is where Max Edmondson doesn't want to be. And look at this now. This is not good. This isn't good. He ain't giving this up, and does Edmondson want to play ball? Well, Campy gives it up, but he'll try and get the uh, the cut back, but that car just understeered past the apex, didn't it? Campy's car... Oh, now his teammates having a big lunge up the inside. But Edmondson, I tell you what, he's got he's got the dirty work done. Yep. He just need. I mean, he's got one life left out of nine. That was... He's, he's had some luck on these opening laps. And uh, he has just lost a point, interestingly, to Dan Thackeray, because Thackeray has just moved into the top ten and set the fastest lap as well. So he gets that bonus point back. You can see he's stuck behind Liam McGill in that secondary pack of cars. Even once he passes McGill, I think he'll struggle to get back on turns with the leaders as Camp understeers again there for Cleary. Almost understeers uh, straight off the track, Paul. Yeah, it looks like Bensley's got the overlap on him now as well, but I don't think uh, Campy will squeeze Bensley as much as he did Max Edmondson. But, uh, yeah, that car doesn't look good, does it, at Bensley's? It looks proper bent. They've just literally, Pro Alloys did a mega job to get that car out to race at Silverstone and have had a bit of time to get it a uh, bit, bit straighter, but I'm, I'm not sure that it's... Uh... Oh, oh wow. Dave Marshall! That was, like, proper Scandi flicking it in, wasn't it? He gets stuck in, does our Dave, doesn't he? He's very exciting to watch, and he's got Harvey Kate behind him as well. He's usually Mr. Excitement, too, so uh, this has uh, got the uh, makings of a lively battle, I think, between these four. They're being dropped by Edmondson now, who wants to win the championship with a race win. And honestly, Paul, the pace he's got, I wouldn't bet against him. No, not at all. I wouldn't uh, bet against that at all. Um, it's a bit of a shame that we've had to wait this long to see Alex Kite um, leading, because I really do rate that kid. Um, he was great at uh, Castle Coombe, 
um, a real Castle Coombe specialist, but just shows he ain't a one-trick pony, and he's doing the business here. Oh, here we go, Thackeray, another place, and McGill is a fast old peddler. That's a great move to get that done. Yeah, he's got up the inside through Clark Curve, inside live for Paddock Hill Bend. I'll tell you what, that car is performing really well under the circumstances, isn't it? Fastest lap for Thackeray, and he's in now to eighth position. The trouble is that he is about three and a half, four seconds behind that group of cars uh, that are battling towards the front of the field, and we're now past half race distance, so... In a way, excuse me, what Thackeray wants is a safety car. A safety car, a brief safety car now, would allow him to catch the next group of cars. But thankfully for us, that doesn't look like it's about to happen. Right, Max Edmondson on the tail of Owen Hillman for second. Two drivers ahead of him now who have never won in this championship. And they might just put up a bit more of a fight. Well, not even that. He's just, he won't have had to have battled against these yeah. drivers before for a position like this. If I was Edmondson, I'd be loving the fact I've got such a big gap uh, to fourth place, I'd be sitting where I am. You, you start making them defend. It's like going in your back garden and just. Oh, that's a great move. He's got oh. that done really well. It's like going in your back garden and starting to push a hornet's nest. Oh, big lock up from the leader, Alex Kite has probably just thought, I'm going to be next, <laughs> he's going to get me. But uh, this is a great drive from the champion elect, isn't it? It is. Second place now belongs to Max Edmondson then. And uh, Alex Kite, by the way, also being warned about track limits. So that's going to perhaps uh, play into all of this as well. Six and a quarter minutes to go. Max Edmondson, let's not forget, forget started 10th on the grid as well. So not only is this a great uh, drive in the context of the championship battle, but also a great drive full stop to come from 10th on such a competitive grid, make lots of really good, bold, aggressive, but clean overtakes. And he now only needs to make one more, and he will be crowned champion as a race winner as well. In towards Paddock Hill Bend they go. Just under six minutes remain. Is he going to lunge up the inside? Yes, he is. Max Edmondson commits to the move on the inside line. Alex Kite had no answer to that. And Edmondson goes from 10th to the lead in nine minutes, Paul. Yeah, that was pretty impressive stuff and got it done so clinically as well. And when he needed to get his elbows out, he got it done and scarped it off into the distance. He just needs to get his head down now. He is in control of his own destiny, full stop. And uh, Campy has just... I'm, they're like Siamese twins, these two, aren't they? <laughs> right, literally all weekend. Can't get away from each other, can't they? Dave Marshall now actually under threat from Harvey Caton, though, who I think is getting a bit frustrated. I think he believes he's quicker than these two, but just can't quite find a way past them. Thackeray, by the way, is catching this group of cars. Catching is one thing, and then making his way through them another, but he is at least going to give himself half a chance of uh, breaking into the top half dozen or so, as he is lapping massively quicker than the group of cars ahead. His previous uh, lap was a 53-4, about uh, six or seven tenths quicker than Dave Marshall and Alistair Camp ahead of him. Five minutes to go then, sun setting on the season here at uh, Brands Hatch, and Dave Marshall continuing to try and find a way past Alistair Camp for fifth. Right. So Campy on the defensive, Got to say, that car looked absolutely terrible through clear ways. He hasn't at the apex once when we've had him on screen, so real difficult times for Alistair. He'll, uh, it's a shame he wasn't in the fight to the very end. Yeah, no, absolutely. A bit like last year, really, through no fault of his own, honestly. Found himself uh, out of contention for the title. And uh, the same kind of thing happening this season. But it was just a bit of strange inconsistency. Very unlike Alistair, really, to have such an inconsistent season. He's been quick on occasions. Not would, maybe, with the regularity that he usually would be expected to. He's had a few off days where things haven't quite gone to plan. But uh, fifth place would be a solid way to round out his season. Dave Marshall, though, on a high, isn't he? He's getting used to this podium feeling and he's thinking that if he clears camp quickly he might yet be able to go after the other pro alloys cars ahead because dave gets quicker as the race wears on mm, definitely yeah it's all happening isn't it it's uh that car is uh, i was speaking to him um after the first race <clears throat> just talking about the rear beam on that car is different than the ep3 there are a, a wishbone independent suspension so there is a lot of difference and wishbone independent suspension is usually miles better than uh, having a rear beam so I remember when that car uh, come out, actually, it's FN2, isn't it? Yes, FN2. When that car come out, I launched it, and it was like, he's just nearly done there <laughs> to Campy. But um, I remember when that car come out, the FN2 was was made a little bit cheaper by having rear beams because they're just easier to manufacture. Um, and it was always said that that would never be a, a better handling car than the EP3, but there you go. I mean, I, 
wouldn't say it looks like it handles all that well. I think it's just that Dave Marshall likes a car that's a bit loose and a bit sideways underneath him. Always has done, really. And uh, uh, Dave, I think, is, is just really gelled with this car. They've done a lot of work on it to get it uh, to this level of performance. And uh, it's, it's right in the window now, isn't it, that he wants it to be in. Pro Alloys Racing setting up a bit of a photo finish maybe here for three of their cars. Anyway, it's not going to be a podium lockout, but uh, Alex Kite's knowing Hillman running second and third by Bentley behind him in fourth. Alistair Camp still holding on to fifth place. We've got two and a half minutes to go. Uh, Dan Thackeray is continuing to march up towards this group. 1.6 seconds now adrift of Harvey Caton, who will be his first target as and when he gets there. But if he gets there, it's going to be with a lap or so to go. And I just don't see him making a huge amount of progress through the order. But uh, still, a good effort this from Dan Thackeray just to get the car out there is impressive. And the fact that he's had the pace to charge through the field in this way uh, has been more than I really expected of him. Yeah, no, I'm with you on that. And uh, yeah, having fastest lap as well. He, the only thing is, is that he'll be seeing what's going on ahead of him and he'll be absolutely gutted. He can't do anything about it. And yeah, they did get uh, they did get disposed of very quickly, the uh, the Pro Alloys car. So I don't think it's the strongest setup they've got for uh, for Brands Hatches. They are understeering quite a lot uh, through that last corner. But uh, yeah, good to see Max Edmondson just gr growing older and taking stock and heed of what he has to do to win a championship and he'll fully deserve this if he wins it. Ooh, here we go, Dave Marshall. I told you he likes it sideways and still made the apex and comes off the corner ahead of uh, Harvey Caton. And uh, yeah, Dave Marshall not having an easy time of this, but that's just dropped him a length or so away from Alistair Camp now as we begin what should be the penultimate lap of the race. Harvey Caton actually sees his opportunity now to get to the inside of Dave Marshall at Paddock Hill Bend. Bails out of it at the last second, although Marshall's understeering a little bit wide, just gets across the nose of Caton's car and manages to defend up into Druid's corner. Harvey Caton has been staring at the back of that red FN2 for the majority of this race, and he's not given up yet on his chances of finding a way past it. Some great respect and respect in this championship. I always say it. I mean, there's so many people who'd have just left the nose in there and gone. I give you a choice, and you decided to turn in front of me. But yeah, Harvey knew that he didn't have enough of the uh, car in, in down the side of Dave Marshall and, and didn't do it. And that is just something great to see from a youngster. And it's something not unique to this championship, but it's definitely one of the big selling points of this championship. There is this universal sort of code of conduct that the drivers always really make an effort to stick to. They look after each other. They don't put each other in dangerous positions. And as you said earlier on, more championships, I think, could really learn from that. A lot of young drivers could learn from this man, though, Max Edmondson. What a season he's put together from a whole host of penalties that he was picking up in those early rounds. He had race-winning pace from right back at the first race of the season at Snetterton, where he battled Jack Harding for a win. He went off the track on the last lap, cut the corner, didn't give the place back, and was subsequently penalised. There were other penalties that came his way in the next couple of rounds. And Max, I think, went away, took a good, long, hard look at himself, realised that's not the way that I need to go about winning championships. And through the second half of the season, he has completely and utterly transformed. I'm so, so proud of this young man. Max Edmondson brings the area motorsport car out of Clearways and Clark Curve. It's going to be another race win, but this time it's going to be a first ever championship in the Miltech Sports Civic Cup for Max Edmondson. Max Edmondson victorious at Brands Hatch, and he wins the championship in style. Alex Kite comes home in second. Owen Hillman finishes in third, ahead of Ryan Bensley and Ali Camp in fifth position. But it is all about Max Edmondson, and we're going to see some real emotion from this kid because he is an emotional individual. You can read every emotion that he's feeling on his face at all times uh, and this is going to be a real mix of emotions I think obviously elation at winning relief uh, and having overcome everything he's had to overcome this year and the satisfaction of knowing that he has won a championship that we both know is not easy to win yeah of course and my congratulations to, to Max Edmonton as well I know that He's took a bit of flack off me in the past because I've said that he shouldn't have done this and he shouldn't have done that. But like you rightly said, he went away, he come back even stronger, had a look at himself, asked the questions, never moaned and just got on with it. So fair play to you and Area Motorsport with the cream of the crop again. And uh, condolences, obviously, to the second place man, Dan Thackeray. He didn't deserve to um, end up that far off him. It should have been a one-pointer or something like that because that's how good these guys have been brilliant stuff well done just had a message from jack hard who sadly had to sit out the the latter part of the season he says max absolutely deserves this championship but that's really nice to hear because they had that tangle back at snetterton at the start of the year i don't think jack would ever have said that uh, earlier on in the season but uh, he knows what we know that's that this man is a deserving champion
stands atop his number 3020 Honda Civic, jumps down, uh, and I think he's well and truly full of adrenaline right now. Max Edmondson is your champion in the best way possible as well, coming from 10th on the grid to win the final race. He didn't have to win, he could have just tootled around in 10th place. That was more than enough, more than likely, to win the championship, but that is not the Max Edmondson way. He wanted to go out fighting did exactly that it could so easily have gone wrong i suppose he had a couple of close moments with alistair camp but he survived them and he is going to seek out his team his family and his teammates uh, well not his teammates actually the pro alloys team he is of course an area motorsport driver area back-to-back -back championships again in the civic cup back to matt look got his first title a year ago this year is the one doing the celebrating area motorsport ready there josh files i think is part of that group rob baker team boss that's george out williams who uh, raced for the team over the last couple of seasons. Luke Sargent, TCR driver, everyone is there to celebrate with this young man uh, because they, they all know what it means to be in his position, don't they? Yeah, of course, Alex Lee as well there in the background. Yeah, yeah it's good to see that. <coughs> Nobody else deserved that. I mean, like he said earlier on in an interview with me, he said, you know, it was really hard luck and I don't like to see what happened to Dan. I didn't mean it, um, you know, I didn't do anything about that. I just got on with my race and I've done it. So, I mean, two wins, what? That's a proper champion, that. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't happen that often, does it, to see uh, the same driver winning the two races across the weekend. It's very, very difficult to win one race in the Miltech Sport Civic Cup, uh, let alone to claim the pair of them. So, uh, yeah, what Max Edmondson has achieved today is impressive uh, in more than one way, uh, really. And uh, he will be very, very happy with his race results. Right then, this is how the race did finish. Max Edmondson victorious in the end by nearly four seconds as well. He stroked it home there at a comfortable margin. Alex Kite gets on the podium, though. Solid result for him. And so too Owen Hillman. That's nice to see, actually, because Owen's had a bit of a iffy season as far as the look is concerned. Nice to see him round out the season with the podium. Bensley is fourth. Alistair Camp uh, will have to wait another year to challenge for a championship. Or maybe he's got his eye on TCR in 2024. I wonder. Dave Marshall, six. Harvey Kate in seventh, Dan Thackeray eighth from the back of the grid. A heroic effort, the unluckiest man at Brands Hatch, quite honestly. And uh, he is, uh, I'm sure, going to be gutted, but he'll also be the first, I think, to go and uh, congratulate Max Edmondson when he gets a chance. Liam McGill came home ninth, Louis, Lewis Kent was tenth, Louis Hounsell uh, was eleventh, Travis Chapman twelfth, Tommy Knight thirteenth, and Jack Riddell came home fourteenth place. Jordan Brennan, Bradley Kent, Harry England, Anthony Gannon and Sam Nicolau were next and uh, it is worth pointing out that Simon Welch, uh, despite finishing 21st and last in that race, uh, is provisionally the Goodyear Diamond Trophy champion in the end only by 26 points over Anthony Gannon who did make a bit of a run at it towards the end of the season. Uh, Max Edmondson also had wrapped up uh, already before that race the Paul Winfield Trophy which was for drivers who had not had a podium finish in the championship before this season, he says, waiting for Phil Kitchen to come and uh, tell me that I've got that wrong. I think that's what it was. Uh, anyway, for, for the rookies, or the relatively inexperienced drivers, Max Edmondson comfortably came out on top uh, in that class. So, don't forget that Max Edmondson also has that uh, prize to look forward to, the test drive in the AS TCR FL, FL5. It's a very bright future for Max Edmondson, and we can hear all about how he feels about that as we head down to catch up with him and Anthony Jordan. Thank you very much, Andy. What a race that was. You started from 10th, you had a championship at stake, and they were talking all the way throughout that race. Max, you don't need to take these places, but there was also saying that's not the Max Edmondson way. And mate, you won the race and the championship. What a weekend and what a year. Yeah, I mean, I can't thank all my sponsors enough, all my friends, all my family, everyone who supported me all the way. I wouldn't have been here without any of them. Yeah. Talk us through that race, because honestly, the car looked like it was on rails. You looked absolutely rapid out there. The start, though, a bit shaky, though. You had to do a bit of avoidance. Yeah, I went round turn one. I just saw loads of smoke and saw no cars to the left. So I, I picked up a few spots there, come out of turn three and saw like a car sideways. So I was like, oh, this is not going to end well. Uh, I think I hit the back of someone. I don't know, but yeah, I was, I was just trying to avoid everything if possible. You overthink stuff and obviously you don't want to don't want to end the championship yeah. not on the track. So, yeah. Exactly. Honestly, with the performance that you've had this year and, you know, the skill that you've shown out on track, do you see yourself in a TCI UK car next year? Because I think a lot of the drivers in that paddock certainly seem to think so. Um, it'd be nice, but obviously money is a big factor in motorsport, so um, we'll see what we can do over the winter. Yeah. 
it'll be the main thing, won't it? But uh, honestly, yourself, I'm sure you'll enjoy a celebration. You certainly did with the team on top of the car. But, mate, what a result on that one, winning and champion as well. Solid vote. Yeah, thank you very much. Excellent stuff there for Max Edmondson. What a way to end the championship. He can celebrate with his team as well. Brilliant to see that. You know, the area motorsport team, absolutely fantastic with all the work that they have over the season. Absolutely brilliant to see. Right, let's go over and see the two pro alloys, boys. We'll start with Mr. Kite, uh, who is standing right here. Alex, uh, good race. Um, honestly, do you need some oxygen? Have you ever been this high up before? Yeah, no, not for a long time. Yeah, not for a long time. But yeah, we finally got there, so... Yeah, it's been a fantastic season. So we've learned every round we've come to. Um, but yeah, just really grateful for the uh, to round it off the podium. So yeah, certainly. Fine. Is that uh, is that why it was like the start of this when you see Max coming up behind you, thinking, "Oh, I know he's going to absolutely send it." So do I just give a little bit more room than I would? Yeah, no, he's been on a different level. So, but yeah, there's no way we were going to keep up with him. So after about five laps, the front tires were just finished on my car. So it was just managing the gap, uh, managing it to Owen. Um, I think we we're all trying to work together on that one, so trying to protect ourselves, but. No, I really enjoyed it. Long old race, but it definitely felt like 15 hours, not 15 minutes. But um, no, it's been great. Uh, but yeah, just like to say a massive thank you to Prowler's Racing for a fantastic season. Um, Cross Country Co, Angus McEwen Smith and Channel Plant Hire. It's been, yeah, been great. Hope to do it again next year. That's the biggest thing, isn't it? Congratulations. Well done on P2. Thank you very much. Excellent stuff. Let's move over and chat to Owen. Yeah, Owen, come this way just a little bit. The, su the sun's over there, yeah. Um, Owen, that was... An incredible drive from yourself. The start, very, very shaky, but yeah, yeah, uh, was, you got away with it. Yeah, yeah, I was a bit nervous at the start. Like I said, um, the best I've had before this is a P9, let alone a reverse grid pole or anything even near that. So, um, you know, I was hoping for a top five finish or, you know, something in the top ten. I was hoping to hold my ground, but to be on the podium, yeah, it's a little bit of a surreal experience at the minute. I'm just trying to take it all in. Yeah. I was chatting to your mum, I think, uh, before the start of this race, and she was like, oh, God, it's been such a tough year, nail-biting stuff. Yeah. She wanted a good result, and you've come away with a podium. Yeah, this yeah. is obviously a fantastic way to end the season, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I've had a, a bit of an unlucky season, to, so to end it like this is just, yeah, incredible. So, yeah, really happy. What is the, the plan for next year? Is it another season of this? Are we stepping it up? or, or, or Tell us. Yeah, no, I'll be, be back in these next year. So, um, obviously, I outmanage the team, so... Keep pushing with the Civics. I think we'll probably have a few TCRs in the team, but not, not myself this year. And then um, see how we get on next year. And then if we keep building like this, and hopefully maybe a TCR 2025 or something along, along those lines. That's what we need. Well done. Congratulations on P3 there to uh, Owen and to Alex and to uh, Max as well. Brilliant results on that one. A couple of other drivers we can chat to in this one as well, because we have the time. Goodyear Diamond Award. We have got Anthony Cannon here, but uh, we've got uh, Anthony Gannon all the way down here. Max Edmondson winning the Paul Winfield Trophy as well out there. Come on over all the way. Hopefully the camera can reach. Right. All I'll ask is that come this way because the sun's over there. Absolutely. Anthony, another bit of silverware as well. Championship involved, but you yourself, a brilliant weekend. Brilliant weekend, brilliant season, massive learning curve. Met loads of friends. Couldn't ask for more, really. Yeah. You know, it's safe, close, fast driving, experiences, amazing. Yeah. The EP3s always look fantastic to drive, don't they? They look solid, they look dependable as well. How do you feel them? But do you know what? It's, it, it kind of gives you that like, like boy racer touring car feel. Mm. They're literally like a mini touring car, you know, on a very small budget. Um, albeit they're expensive, yes. But, yeah, if you thrive to have that touring car feel, EP3 is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So, certainly is. Plan for next year, what, what, where are we going to see you? Here. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll be back. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah, I'm not over, not over 50 yet. <laughs> <laughs> Close. <laughs> Yeah. But no, I'll definitely be back. Yeah. Excellent. Plenty of stuff. Mate, congratulations. Thanks. Well done. We'll see you on the podium a bit later. Thanks, Anthony. Cheers. Thanks. Excellent stuff. Paul O'Neill, welcome down. Good to see you down here. You're living the high life up there in the country box. Save you. Yeah, exactly. Mate, honestly, that was a storm. And Max Edmondson, he didn't need to prove himself like that, but he certainly did, didn't he? That, that was amazing. Um, me and Anthony were full of superlatives. He didn't, like you say, he didn't need to, to come from 10th and risk what was going on. He risked a lot by passing some of the people. He had side-to-side -side contact with Ryan Bensley, was it, or Campy, actually, yeah, yeah. both of them. Uh, not massive. There was nothing, uh, no intent in, in uh, hitting anybody off, but he didn't need to do it. No. But because he loves a win and he's a champion, and uh, that was the best way to, to win a championship is to win two races, yeah. proper stuff. Certainly. I feel devastated for Dan Thackeray. You know, despite their best efforts of rebuilding that car, 
new engine in it, sorted it out. It sounded amazing when it was getting ready. Nothing wrong with it whatsoever. And he flew through the field as well. It just wasn't enough. Just wasn't enough, wasn't it? Like I said to Andy, you know, when you have two race engines, one in your car and one on the shelf, your best race engine isn't um, on the shelf. It's in your car. So, you know, uh, I don't know where it come from, but there was nothing wrong with that engine because I think he had fastest lap. Yeah. Um, you know, he was rapid and looked quick, but he just needed a safety car, and I think that wouldn't have been enough either. And the championship didn't didn't deserve to have Dan on the sidelines because he battled so hard with Motion Motorsport all year to, to keep himself up there. So, yeah, I'm devastated for him, but he took it. He took it like a like a trooper, and you know, and he'll come back stronger. He's one of the best, um, you know, one mate drivers I've seen in a long, long time. And let's talk about Max Edmondson, though. Mm. That was, you know, it, for the amount of times I knocked him for what he'd done on track, and he took his medicine, took his penalties, come back and didn't moan. Could have come and had a go at me, never did. You know, um, didn't argue the toss, just got on with it. And I have to say, I've got more respect for him than I've ever had before. So fair play to him. Yeah. Obviously, he spoke to him a little bit about maybe jumping into TCR next year. Obviously, he gets a, a drive in uh, in an FL500 as well. So he has that bonus going to him. So he gets the tester. After that, do you reckon we could see him in TCR? Um, it's difficult, isn't it? Even though Stuart Lyons does a great job with Nicky and everybody involved in promoting the TCR Championship, it's still not cheap and it's still not the budget that you need to get for Honda Civic, you know, Miltech Sport racing. Um, it's more money, but he's good enough now. He's set the platform. Why can't sponsors get involved and why can't other people help him out? And, you know, we need people like him who are champions and, you know, people like Dan Thackeray and like Alistair Camp's done it. He's been a champion of it and he's shown he can win in TCR and that is the next logical step and I'd love to see him in it. Will we see him? I don't know. Should we see him? Yes, we should. Yeah, definitely. So because it's not just that as well. We're not. We don't want to lose drivers from the Civics because obviously it's a fantastic championship. It's they're really good to drive. There is talk of uh, a few of the Fiesta Juniors maybe coming up into the world of Civics and then Civics moving up into the world of TCR. It's just the involvement, isn't it, all the way throughout and. I reckon next year certainly is going to be another interesting year in all three of those championships. Yeah, definitely. You know, I've I've spoken on um, other uh, other media platforms about other championships, and you know, the tide seems to be turning where there are now big corporate sponsors and people that are looking for professional drivers, and you know, they have to look past their nose in my opinion and sometimes they don't but these junior championships and these one mate championships are at such a high level and they're operating at such a high level people are coming into them not because they're cheap it's because they know they're gonna have to drive against the best yeah. and when that word gets around and especially with this championship then people who want to put money into racing will come and see who the best are because they want them to drive the best cars that they've already got sponsors for in in, in higher up cha championships. So yeah, I think you're going to see um, I think you're going to see a lot of people, you know, uh, moving up and doing um, the best they can to get into these these faster cars. Yeah, and I think over the course of this year as well, there's been a real media boost as well in that one. And uh, to clarify of the reason why we're still here and talking, we're waiting for Andy McHugh, and you can just see a speck there coming through. The first time we've seen fresh air probably all this weekend he's just refusing to run i don't know why i don't think yeah it looks like count dracula <laughs> well glad you said that not me but honestly i think the step up this year is uh has been fantastic hasn't it you know uh the guys behind the scenes at tci uk uh alistair nikki stewart everything like that they've really bumped everything up phil kinch working so hard as well and we can finally joining us <laughs> what a day what a day you've had mate. like how many hours have you done in that comms box it's all good fun mate you know me i love it the walk over here on the other hand not so easy i have to say i don't want to do that again <laughs> i definitely so from your point of view as well we'll quickly grab that that race honestly max what a drive just sublime absolutely sublime and i don't think he was capable of that six months ago that's the that's the great thing about his story you know i'm sure you guys have been chatting about that as we have you know for him to evolve as a driver and as a person the way that he has this year makes him a deserving champion and it was max edmondson all over that last race he didn't have to push he didn't have to take those risks 
but he wanted to because he, he only has one style. That's go forward, push, attack, and try and win the race. The difference is he does it in a very different way now than he went about it at the start of the season. And uh, yeah, honestly, can't think of a more deserving champion. I'm heartbroken still for Dan because he should have at least been up there to make a fight of it. And I think he really would have made a fight of it. But um, them's the breaks. It's motor racing and Max ultimately performed on the day when he had to. Yeah, certainly. So it's been a fantastic weekend, a fantastic season as well. Paul O'Neill, Anna McEwen, myself, Anthony Jordan as well from us here at TCI UK. It's been fantastic. We'll see you next year. And thank you so much for everyone joining us throughout this season. career victory in TCR UK for Carl Bordley. He becomes the fifth different winner from the first six races this year. And this one, as far as we know, he will get to keep. Uh, winner and also Goodyear Diamond Trophy winner too, mate. Couldn't get any better. Clean sweep. <laughs> Clean sweep, mate. Well done to you. Well done to you boys as well. Well done. Bordley, see what he can do. He might have got him already, actually. There's just still a slight overlap. Newsham hangs up on the inside. Bordley around the outside. Newsham on two wheels. And again, Carl Bordley pulls it off. Carl Bordley exits out of the final turn. He's going to take another chunk of points out of the points leader, Bruce Winfield, with his second victory of the season. It's just, it's just testimony to the boys and everybody that's behind me, really, that's got it to this point. The checkered flag is waved for Carl Bordley, and the championship leader takes another big stride towards the championship. <laughs> Nick Hart. <laughs> They've done a good job with that car. It's a great partnership, this, isn't it? I'd, Bordley yeah. really happy, I think, with this team. Brad Kent does further back, and oh! comes that. Around goes the championship leader, Carl Bordley, after contact with Jensen Brickley, but another example of how quickly your luck can turn. Bordley safe for now in fourth, but here comes Shepard up the inside. Places being gained already for the man second in the points. Bordley, watch out, son. Oh. Round the outside, don't be stupid. Oh, wow. Shout smiling back up the inside of Lee. Did Shepard get back ahead of oh, Bordley? They're side oh. by side at the apex of Paddock Hill Bend. These are risks that Bordley does not want to be taking, but he really hasn't got much choice. He manages to find a gap in the line just in front of Jack Constable. But fourth place is enough for the championship for Carl Bordley. Carl Bordley is provisionally your 2023 TCR UK champion after a nerve-wracking 25 minutes of racing.